on ABC News Live. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Macedo, let's get straight to our stop story on ABC News Live first. A war is underway in the Middle East. Israel has announced a total siege of the Gaza Strip after Hamas militants attacked Israel by surprise Saturday morning. You're looking live at Gaza City right now where Israel has cut off all gas, electricity and power calling Saturday's attack their 9-11. Right now more than 1,100 people are reported dead in Israel and Gaza. Thousands injured and at least 100 have been taken hostage. Overnight, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu launched a major offensive with rockets and tanks, promising that Israel will, re will retaliate with a might. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. The big questions now, how did intelligence fail to prevent and predict this attack? Will Israel now send ground forces into Gaza? And was Iran behind the attack? And will this lead to a wider war? ABC News Live has team coverage all day long. We begin with World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. Good morning, David. The death toll rising here in Israel as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu now warns this could be a long and difficult war. After a brutal surprise attack not seen in Israel in 50 years. These terrorists have one goal in mind. It's to slaughter as many civilians as possible. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday, when a complex and highly coordinated attack by the militant group Hamas began an assault by land, sea, and air. More than 2,200 rockets firing into Israel, raining down on southern and central cities, with air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. Shortly after, Hamas video showing armed militants storming blockaded areas of the Gaza Strip. Officials say once inside Israeli communities along the border, they started killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the streets, some shot while sitting in their cars. At a music festival in Negev, young concertgoers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert after a Hamas rocket attack. Video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lighting the road. In other towns and villages, families were desperate to barricade themselves inside homes as militants raided their towns, going door to door, looking to kill. And many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. We met a young father, Yoni Asher, whose wife and two young daughters were visiting their grandmother. His wife called him. They were in a safe room in the house when militants got in. The call dropped out, and Yoni had no idea what happened until he saw this video. He says that's his wife, militants covering her head, taking her and his two daughters, who are just two and four. I recognized them immediately, and I saw the video twice. And the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because I melt down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was a nightmare. Prime Minister Netanyahu has declared Israel is at war. More than 700 killed here, including at least four American citizens. The Biden administration warning that number could rise. ABC News speaking with the mother of one of those American victims, 32-year-old Chaim Katzman. We thought at one point that he had been taken hostage, but it turned out that I didn't get official information about exactly what happened. His body was found in his apartment. We understand that he and his neighbor were hiding in a closet, and the neighbor, they found them, and the neighbor was released, a woman, and he was shot immediately. Now his loved ones left grieving, remembering a son, a colleague, a friend. You know, getting so many messages from people who worked with Chaim or who knew him or who met him during their travels and how warm he was, how open. He was very accepting person and very loyal friend, good sense of humor, he took things in stride. And new questions about why Israel's intelligence, long a source of pride here, how did they miss this? The worst assault since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the issue of intelligence with our George Stephanopoulos on this week. 
We have a very close relationship with uh, Israeli intelligence, as well as with the Israeli military, as well as with Israel more broadly. So yes, of course, this is something that they and we will be looking at. But the effort right now has to be in dealing with the aggression from Hamas. To deal with that aggression, Israel now retaliating. Hammering Gaza with airstrikes and cutting off power to certain areas. The Israeli military now saying they've struck more than 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip, releasing this video of one of their strikes. The Palestinian Health Ministry saying more than 400 have been killed, thousands more civilians injured. They made elderly people, children, and women scared, this man says. Copies of the Quran were shattered. But with Israel shaken, Tens of thousands of Israeli reservists have now been called up to join the fight. We are recovering, first of all, from the most devastating day in Israeli history. Every single Hamas terrorist that carried this out is going to have to look over their shoulder for the rest of their lives. And this young father is waiting for his wife and two young girls to come home. Uh, how are you staying so strong? I don't know. I guess when you're a parent, you have no choice. In fact, we could hear the rocket fire off in the distance just moments ago, a real reminder that this is ongoing. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The defense ministry uh, declaring just moments ago a total siege of the Gaza Strip, no power, no water, no electricity, saying we are dealing with barbaric terrorists and we will act accordingly. Diane. All right, David Muir, World News Tonight anchor, thank you. And ABC's Inez de la Quattara is also in Tel Aviv. Inez, what's it like there right now? Good morning, Diane. Yeah, and new strikes on Gaza this morning with IDF forces appearing to strike a refugee camp, the Jabalaya refugee camp, which is the biggest refugee camp in Gaza. At least 50 people are believed to have been killed, and that death toll is expected to rise. You heard it there. Gaza essentially under siege right now with Israel's defense minister saying that they are cutting off electricity, food, and fuel to the region. Hospitals there overwhelmed. And this comes as fresh rockets were fired at Israel once again this morning. We heard air raid sirens going off in Jerusalem, further south in Ashkelon. And here in Tel Aviv, we heard those sirens this morning. We had just gotten to the Missing Person Center, which is a center that's been set up near the airport just outside of uh, Tel Aviv to help families who haven't heard from their loved ones. These are people who uh, have gone missing, who may have been killed, who may have been taken hostage. And so the center has been set up to uh, try and, and help these uh, families. And just as we were getting there, hoping to speak to some of these families. The air raid sirens went off and we were forced to take cover inside that center with those families. So uh, a really dire situation here. As far as the latest in terms of the fighting here going on between uh, the IDF and Hamas militants. So the, the IDF was fighting Hamas militants essentially on, on two fronts. So uh, they're striking targets inside Gaza. They're saying that they're targeting Hamas militant targets inside Gaza. But they're also fighting, or they were also fighting militants inside of Israel. So these were militants that had come into Israel on Saturday during that breach. We saw them crossing over by land on foot, uh, carving out uh, holes in the Gaza border fence and uh, crossing over that way, coming over by sea on boats and by air as well with incredible images of militants coming in using paragliders. It's unclear just how many militants may have come in, how many could still be inside Israel, where they are. So that is very much a real concern. Uh, and some of them had taken control of some communities in the south. And that's where uh, IDF, forces were trying to regain control of the south. As of this morning, the IDF did say that they have managed to regain control of the south. That being said, they are continuing to evacuate some communities in southern Israel. So Israeli families are being told to leave. The IDF says that 15 of uh, 24 communities uh, in southern Israel have been evacuated. Unclear what, why they're doing that um, and what that could mean for the, the coming days, Diane. Now, in Israel Defense Force to say at least 100 people people were taken by Hamas. What's now being done to try to find those people and get them back? Yes, yeah, so and we're learning more and more every day about these hostages. We understand at least 100 Israelis were taken hostage. These, these are uh, civilians and members of the military. When it comes to the uh, civilians, it's people from all walks of, of life. It's, it's men, women, children. We saw uh, mothers with their children being loaded onto the, the backs of trucks and, and carried over into Gaza. We saw uh, uh, Hamas militants you know, storming uh, neighborhoods and, and going door to door uh, to try and, and, and find some of these 
these uh, people. So we're learning more about them. We're learning more about the numbers. We're learning more about that music festival as well. A clearer picture is emerging from that as well. The Nova Music Festival in southern Israel. Hundreds are believed to have attended and officials saying that 260 bodies were recovered from that music festival. In terms of what's being done to, to help these families, so th there is that missing person center that we were at this morning um, where they're encouraging families to come and bring DNA samples. So we actually spoke to one man this morning who was there doing just that. He had brought a, a DNA sample. He was looking for his cousin who was at that music festival um, and, and, and he was, you know, hoping for the best. He was he was wrapping up and he says that now he's going to be going door to, to, to every single hospital in Israel, uh, leaving no stone unturned, looking for his cousin, Diane. All right, Inez de la Quattara in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Stay safe. Former State Department official retired Colonel Steve Ganyard joins me now for more on this. Uh, Steve, how does an attack this large happen without being flagged ahead of time? Yeah, Diane, that is a question that is going to be debated within the Israeli intelligence community and the U.S. intelligence community for years to come. It is a stunning failure, a strategic failure. Uh, I think there are a couple factors here. Uh, one is complacency. There's a saying in aviation that complacency kills. Uh, and the Israelis should certainly seem to have been quite complacent that the Hamas threat was not going to materialize anytime soon. There was also deception. So along with complacency, deception that was uh, conducted by Hamas. Over two years, there hasn't been a, a significant Hamas attack into Israel. And the uh, Hamas has uh, made it very clear that they wanted to keep the, the uh, gates uh, open into Israel so that migrant workers could come into Israel. So they lulled uh, Israel into this sense of complacency that everything was fine. I've also heard another interesting theory, uh, and that is that many of the troops that were deployed around Gaza were brought back up into the West Bank. Remember that in the past year, we've had people in um, in Israel three or four times. James Longsman has been there for four times, and he has been there because of the unrest in the West Bank, not in Gaza. So pulled troops up to take care of the West Bank, and they relied on technology along the Gaza uh, border, uh, video surveillance, uh, sound, all sorts of high technology capabilities. But remember, we also saw pictures of uh, Hezbollah, uh, or sorry, Hamas drones dropping weapons onto those observation uh, uh, posts. And so very quickly, Hamas was able to take the Israeli sensors out of the picture, which added to the surprise. Uh, you said Israel will likely go into Gaza. What does that look like, and how soon do you see that happening? I think uh, soon enough uh, that the reservists, the initial call up of the reservists, they were told for two weeks. Now it'll probably be much longer than that, but uh, we're going to continue to see military movement along the borders with Israel and Gaza. We'll see troops, tanks being moved in. We also continue to see the towns around Gaza be evacuated so that uh, there's no uh, blowback in once uh, Israel does decide to go into Gaza. But Diane, there are all sorts of considerations here. It's very tough choices for Netanyahu to make. We know that there are lots of hostages, don't know how many, but lots of hostages inside of Gaza. So if you go in with a military uh, effort into Gaza, there's a very high risk that those hostages could be killed by friendly fire, or if there's an attempt to rescue them, they could be uh, executed the way that the Israeli um, athletes were in the Munich Olympics. So very, very tough situation, some tough things that have to be decided. Uh, it's also going to be very tough uh, fight. Uh, I think we've talked about this in the past, where urban warfare is particularly bloody, particularly uh, difficult because you have to go room to room. Hamas has known in the past that if they go into Israel, that Israel will retaliate by coming into Gaza. So no doubt Hamas has taken time to reinforce its defenses inside of Gaza to make any incursion by Israel particularly bloody. Now, the other major powers of the region, like Egypt and Jordan, want to de-escalate this. How do you go about doing that at this point? You don't. Um, Egypt and Jordan have no significant power. Saudi Arabia would be the only one to have power. Remember that there was a discussion that was proceeding uh, quite quite well. The U.S. government was facilitating a discussion between Saudi Arabia and Israel that was very close to being uh, accepted, maybe weeks weeks away. Iran knew that if this uh, if this treaty were come to pass, that it would show a united front against Iran within the region. And so this was Iran likely using Hamas as a proxy to derail those talks. But really, Saudi Arabia and Israel are the key here, and that's why Hamas was used to disrupt that, that uh, regional agreement.
Now, Israel also says at least 100 people are being held hostage. Why do that, and how concerned are you about those people right now? Uh, very concerned. Uh, that is a very, very dark future. Uh, hard to say how they're going to get them out. If you think about some of the uh, hostages that have been held in the past, they've been ones, twos, just a few here and there. Oftentimes, Israeli special forces will go in and try to rescue, uh, but they go in with the intent that we're going to kill those terrorists, and um, they do their best to get the hostages out, uh, but oftentimes it does not work. Uh, if you look at the uh, one Israeli soldier uh, that was held by Hezbollah for years and years, and it took so long and so much from uh, various governments in Israel to get them, uh, get that individual soldier back. So Israel's never had this many hostages held by a terrorist group at one time. It's leverage. Hamas will use it as leverage. They'll use them as human shields, and it's going to make it for a very painful process. I think what we'll see is you'll have a, a military operation into Gaza, uh, and you'll have special operations missions going into Gaza that will coordinate with the conventional military and try to go in, find where those hostages are, and rescue them. But it's going to be very, very difficult to conduct a war and go search for, for hostages as, at the same time. All right, retired Colonel Steve Ganyard. Thank you, Colonel. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We will be right back with more after the break. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, President Biden has pledged his unwavering support for Israel after it was attacked by Hamas this weekend. Earlier in Good Morning America, George Stephanopoulos spoke to Biden's deputy national security advisor about whether or not Iran was involved in the attack and about Americans who may be in Israel right now. What more is President Biden prepared to do? Uh, thanks for having me on, uh, George. I suspect uh, during the course of the coming days and, and weeks, uh, frankly, because we expect uh, uh, the Israeli uh, response to this horrific uh, set of attacks to continue for quite some time, uh, we expect more uh, U.S. steps uh, to show support and solidarity for Israel uh, will unfold. The president has been quite clear uh, that Israel has, of course, uh, every right to defend itself uh, full stop and that the United States is going to offer support at every level uh, for Israel's uh, defense. And uh, we are working through those uh, details uh, with our intelligence professionals, our military, uh, and our diplomats. Uh, we are in daily, in, in fact, many times a day, uh, contact with Israeli counterparts to see what they need and to offer it. Well, when I was speaking to Secretary of State Blinken yesterday, he said the United States could not confirm that Iran was behind this attack. But the Wall Street Journal has a pretty detailed report out this morning describing how Iran was at a meeting in Beirut, Lebanon, last Monday, where this attack was planned and decided to be launched. Can you confirm that report? Can you now confirm that Iran was behind this? So taking a step back, I think what we can be quite clear about is that Iran is broadly complicit in these attacks uh, for having supported Hamas uh, going back decades, for having provided uh, financial support, for having provided training, uh, for having provided weapons uh, to Hamas. What we don't have is direct information uh, that shows Iranian involvement in ordering or planning uh, the attacks that took place over the last couple of days. It's something that we're going to keep looking at closely. And by the way, uh, this is what the Israeli government has, has said as well, broad complicity uh, but no evidence of direct just, just support, although it's that. something so, we are both going to continue to watch. So the Wall Street Journal report is not correct, or you cannot confirm it? 
What, what I can tell you is we have no direct information to confirm uh, that report. We've obviously seen it. Uh, we're looking into it, uh, but we do not have the ability to corroborate it at this time. As Mayor reported, the president and all of you are trying to take steps to prevent this from becoming a wider war. How realistic is that? Would Israel have the right to retaliate against Iran if indeed they were behind this? Uh, so again, the president has been clear that Israel has every right to defend itself, uh, full stop. Israel will ultimately make the decisions about how it chooses uh, to go about and conduct uh, that defense. We are offering uh, support in a number of ways that we've laid out. The president was equally clear uh, that this is not the moment for other parties who are hostile to Israel uh, to seek advantage or to seek to exploit uh, uh, the attacks that have taken place. Uh, that is part of uh, why the United States has moved uh, the carrier strike group to the eastern Mediterranean to send a strong and unmistakable signal that no one else should get involved Fine. in this. We'll see how uh, things unfold in the course of the coming days. Finally, what can you tell us about Americans caught up in this conflict? Uh, what I can tell you is we strongly uh, suspect that there will be uh, American citizens among those uh, killed. We are looking, uh, obviously, very intensively into whether there were any Americans among uh, those who have been abducted and brought to Gaza. This is still uh, ongoing in Israel. There is still fighting inside Israel uh, as we speak. And uh, there is a bit of fog of war in terms of the ability to gather uh, specific information. And so we will have much more to say about this uh, at the right time. Uh, but given uh, that there are hundreds of thousands of Americans at any given moment in Israel, Israel, uh, as well as a significant number of dual nationals, uh, Israeli citizens who are also Americans. We knew that Americans would be affected by this. We will do everything possible to support uh, the families of those uh, who are caught up in it, and we will have uh, more to say about specifics as we have them. Our thanks to George and John Finer for that interview. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We have a look at the day's other top stories as well after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Israel is at war after being bombarded by thousands of rockets. It's being called Israel's 9-11 after a surprise attack by a militant group, Hamas. We have the latest in just a few minutes, but here are some of the day's other top stories as well. The House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until electing a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. A vote for the new speaker is expected later this week. At least 2,000 people are dead after two earthquakes hit Afghanistan near the border with Iran. Hundreds of people are believed to be trapped in the rubble, but a lack of modern equipment is hampering the rescue efforts. 
This is one of Afghanistan's deadliest earthquakes in two decades. The western part of Maui has reopened to tourists after the summer's deadly wildfires. That process started Sunday, exactly two months after the fires killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The move is getting mixed reaction as some Maui residents warned tourism could result in wildfire victims being forced out of hotels. And Simone Biles is still the GOAT. The star gymnast finished the Gymnastics World Championships this weekend with gold for the balance beam and floor events. She also won gold in the all-around and team competitions and a silver in vault. So far, she's earned a total 37 world and Olympic medals. Coming up, we take you back to Israel, now declaring war on the militant group Hamas. The race to rescue hostages is underway and the death toll is rising. Our team speaks with families desperate to find their loved ones right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. GMA tomorrow. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> That's a good oh, way to start. I like it. Robin Roberts with Lionel Richie back in their hometown, Tuskegee, Alabama. What's it like for you to be back? Visiting the sites of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, including Robin's father and seeing Robin's first home. That's where I came home from the hospital. It's Robin, Lionel, and a personal American Idol hometown tour like no other. No place like home. Good morning, America tomorrow. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story on ABC News Live. First, Israel has declared war after a terrorist attack by the Palestinian militant group Hamas over the weekend. At least 700 killed in Israel, including at least nine Americans. Nearly 500 have been killed in Gaza. Thousands are injured. We have team coverage all day long, and we begin with Matt Gutman on the scene in Tel Aviv, Israel. Another huge barrage of rockets from Gaza crashing into Israel just hours after Israeli forces regained control of all their Gaza border towns and are now pummeling Gaza from the air. It follows a brutal surprise attack by Hamas, resulting in the deadliest day in Israel's history. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday when operatives from Hamas stormed Israel by pouring out of tunnels, bashing through the border fence using paragliders and zodiacs to get across into Israel. It was an assault Hamas covered with more than 2,200 rockets. Air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. Israel's officials saying many hundreds of militants killed indiscriminately. Bodies left in the streets, some cantilevered out of cars. In other towns and villages, families desperately barricaded themselves in their homes as militants raided the towns, going door to door, looking to kill. Many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. At an Israeli music festival nearby, hundreds of young concert goers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say that 260 bodies were removed from the desert after Hamas attacked that concert. 
A video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lining the road. Hamas posting this video of the kidnapped. The young man in the yellow is Omer Shemtov. His mother describes watching his phone tracker trail into Gaza. I'm like in a dream, and I will wake up. I will wake up. Have it's you not woke a real thing. Have you woken up yet? No. No. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, but in, in life. And just as we wrap the interview, a commotion. Rolling. People pouring into the house. All right, so there's, there's a siren right now. And uh, we're now going into their bomb shelter together. About a dozen people huddled inside until they all clear. All right, thanks to Matt Gutman for that report. And Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel joins me live now from outside Gaza with more. Ian, there's a long history of conflict here. What's different about this attack from past conflicts? Uh, I mean, most of past conflicts have been almost national conflicts. Uh, you know, just over 50 years ago was the Yom Kippur War, the 1973 war, when Israel was attacked by neighboring countries. And so it has historically been nation upon nation, although there's always been a kind of simmering conflict, of course, in some cases uh, now and again much more active between the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and Israel, and of course Israel and Hezbollah, which is uh, across the border in Lebanon. But, but what marked this out was the physical invasion on the ground of Israel by these uh, as Islamist militants from Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Nothing like that has happened before. The scale of loss of a life for Israeli civilians was the most significant, despite all the conflicts that Israel has faced. And so it shocked the nation. This is a nation that prides itself on being able to protect its population, uh, being very, you know, other militaries around the world often look to Israel as, as a role model um, of what to do in terms of protecting the civilian population. Strong borders. As I'm talking to you, you, know, you can see these military vehicles heading down the road. It feels like an active kind of combat zone. We're seeing a lot of men and munitions. Uh, and it feels like what started as an invasion by a guerrilla group murdering innocent civilians inside Israel is now morphing into a much larger scale war. Ian, how have relations between Israel and Palestine over the last few years, how have they been by comparison to this long history? Did anyone see this coming? Well, certainly the Israeli military and intelligence didn't. Again, look at this. I mean, we're just seeing so many vehicles and people moving up towards the border. Uh, Israeli intelligence and the Israeli military will be regarded by many people as having failed its population, of not really reading and understanding Hamas and what it was planning. It's put a lot of effort into the West Bank. We've seen a lot of raids that has created a lot of anger. People have been talking about the possibility of another Palestinian interference father. I mean, certainly life inside Gaza for the population there has been difficult to terrible for many, many years. But I think Israel felt that it had just shelved that problem by essentially sealing the borders, limiting traffic in and out, and controlling the situation. It didn't see Hamas getting ready for this hugely complex, sophisticated attack. For Hamas and Islamic Jihad, this was an enormous success. For the Israeli military and intelligence, it was a huge failure. Now, Ian, I know you also spoke to witnesses from that massacre at the music festival. More than 260 bodies reportedly have been recovered there. What are the people who were there saying about what happened? I mean, we're just hearing, I mean, genuinely heartbreaking, tragic stories. Uh, we met one family. Uh, his daughter and her boyfriend had gone to this party. And we're hearing many people talk about the same kind of stories of these frantic, panicky phone calls. It started off with a barrage of rockets and, and an air raid siren. Well, Israelis are kind of used to that, and they didn't really think anything was unusual until they heard the sound of gunshots. A music festival in Israel packed with hundreds of young people ending in carnage. Early Saturday morning, Hamas rockets streaking overhead as people celebrated and danced. Yo, yo, Suddenly, yo, panic yo. spreading as Hamas gunmen close in. Festival goers seen in videos circulating online, running for their lives, desperately fleeing for safety. All the people who got away fast were shot in their, in their car. 
No Mankat survived the attack by sprinting through an open field. So you just keep running because you realize that if you don't keep running, then you don't go back home. With rockets exploding overhead, Nome running for miles without food or water. She still doesn't know whether some of her closest friends made it out alive. Yeah. Tom and his girlfriend Mai describing the chaos and gunfire as they try to escape. Bullets is, is over your head. You hear, yeah, you, you, hear, hear the, you hear the shot like, you hear the, the shot, you get down and keep running. More than 260 people were slaughtered by Hamas. Video posted online showing what is now a terrible crime scene. But many are still missing, including John Polin's son, Hirsch. He sent two brief WhatsApp messages to my wife and me. The first message said, I love you. The second message said, I'm sorry. Since then, we've heard nothing from him. The family of Idan Dor are in agonizing limbo, awaiting any news about their 25-year-old son. We all here. No one can sleep. We have no information about uh, Idan, nothing. Idan first escaped the gunfire with a friend, calling his sister in panic. When he ran in, uh, and screamed that he's... I'm running and I'm, uh, I'm running for my life. Everybody, everyone is shooting everywhere in every direction. He ran for his life as Hamas gunned people down. His family haven't heard from either of them since. Well, Tom and Mai were telling me that there were thousands of people at this festival. Some people called it a festival for peace. So some of them got home safely, uh, upset, terrified, stressed and, and, and traumatised by their experience. Sadly, uh, 260 died there, but of course many are still missing. They're now held hostage inside Gaza, and as we hear every few minutes, Gaza is being relentlessly pounded. It's hard to imagine the terror of the civilians who live inside Gaza, and now those Israeli hostages too. Diane? So, Ian, what's next here? Yeah, good question. I mean, look, while we've been talking, is a very good example. We've seen so many military vehicles moving along a road. So we've seen this heavy aerial bombardment. It's still ongoing. We're seeing helicopters flying by, fighter jets dropping bombs every few minutes. But I think the Israeli public are going to expect more, and I think the Israeli government, especially Netanyahu, who comes out of this looking bad, has to deliver more. I think the possibility at the moment is that there will be some kind of ground incursion. There's got to be a reason why we're seeing so many men and munitions on the road, military vehicles moving up. I don't think Israel would want to totally invade Gaza because then it owns the problem. It still will have to deal with Hamas militants. And here's the other thing to consider. Israel also faces a much greater threat from its northern border, from Hezbollah, which is much stronger than Hamas. Now, so far, they haven't really thrown their hat into the ring. There has been a small incursion, we're hearing from the Israeli Defense Forces today, of some armed insurgents. Uh, it's not clear who they're from into the northern border, but clearly there's a risk. If Israel puts so many of its resources down in the south, it leaves the north vulnerable, and that could then lead to Hezbollah trying to seize a day and cause at least some kind of incursion from there. This is really, really existential moment for Israel. Certainly seems that way. Ian Panel, stay safe, Ian. Thank you. And now to the rescue missions for Israeli hostages captured by Hamas militants. Israel says at least 100 people are being held. Foreign correspondent James Longman is in Tel Aviv with more. She, wants her, she just wants her to come home back safe and sound. In this video circulating online, young IDF recruit Karina Ashayev can be seen bloodied and bound, being driven by Hamas militants into Gaza. Sasha tells me what it was like seeing her sister in the video. At first I saw this and I didn't think it was her. I just swiped, swiped next. Her face was in blood. She was screaming. We identified her by her nose, her brows, her chest. And uh, we know it was her. In another video, Karina speaks into her phone, surrounded by other kidnapped women. <laughs> Families are desperate to find their loved ones. After disturbing videos like these, Palestinian militants dragging a kidnapped woman around a truck in Gaza and taking Israeli hostages near the border. Elkanah Babot's brother Uriel racing from America overnight to find him after this video emerged, showing him with a wounded face surrounded by other hostages. I can see that he's afraid. He's so scared. Hopefully he's gonna be alive. 
I don't know if he will be die or alive. Beyond the 100 hostages, more are missing, their status unknown. 22-year-old Kim Damti was at the music festival when the rockets rained down. She called her family in panic. They haven't heard from her since. Kim didn't realize that there was like seven or eight Toyota vans full of terrorists and they just shot everywhere. They just shot them, slaughtered them like ducks. And that's the reason I'm here, because I want the world to condemn this behavior. I didn't bring my children up to hate anybody. American Karen Flash able to escape with her husband and child, but last time she heard from her parents was Saturday. At this point, any people that we've lost communication with throughout the last few days, if, if we have news from them, it's not good news. Now a race against time. As Israel prepares for a likely ground invasion in Gaza, the very place where the hostages are believed to be held. Absolutely every second counts. We have innocent people who had no idea what was going on, who are now living their worst nightmare. Back at Karina's house, Sasha reads a birthday note from a friend. Karina just turned 19. To Karina, my best friend, I wish you all the best. I want to wish you happiness, health, love, money, smiles. You are the best friend ever and that I could ask for. Everything you need, remember that I'm here any minute. Thanks to James Longman in Tel Aviv for that report. An international spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conriquez, joins me now for more on this. Lieutenant, thank you for joining us. You know, uh, how did you first learn about this attack, and what was your reaction when you did? Yeah, I learned of it uh, when uh, rockets were fired at the place where I live in central Israel, uh, early morning hours Saturday. Um, and um, a heavy barrage of rockets, and immediately I was notified on the phone that this was a, a, a large-scale attack. Uh, then it became apparent, I mean, it's obvious that if they're firing at Tel Aviv and Central Israel, then something very big is going on. I could not imagine uh, at that time that Hamas would have the audacity and the foolhardiness to do what they have done to launch such, such an unprecedented, brutal, merciless attack on Israeli civilians, to butcher civilians in their homes, as they have, and to launch an attack and cause the amount of casualties that Israel has never experienced ever in its history. It is an unprecedented attack, and it will be followed by an unprecedented Israeli response against these bloodthirsty, animals that have uh, come across from Gaza and attacked our civilians. You say unprecedented Israeli response. What do you mean by that? I mean that according to the directives given by the Israeli government, the task of the IDF in this war, and this is a war, this is not another round of fighting, this is not rockets being fired at southern or central Israel, and then some retaliations, and then some half-cooked ceasefire under Egyptian assistance. This is a totally, fundamentally different situation. And what we have been tasked to do by the Israeli government is to make sure that at the end of the fighting here, Hamas no longer possesses a military capability to threaten Israelis at all, and does not have the ability to govern the Gaza Strip. Now, what that means, is, of course, for those following events and perhaps more familiar with, is that this will be a very substantial assault on Hamas's military capabilities, and that the paradigms that were relevant up until October 7th will no longer be valid. Israel is saying that at least 100 people have been taken hostage here. What more, if anything, do you know about the condition those hostages are being kept in, and how worried are you about those people? This is uh, also an unprecedented situation. We've had Israeli civilians and military uh, taken hostage by terrorists in the past, but never uh, this amount, and uh, uh, together in different locations. So it is unprecedented, it is extremely delicate, and we are talking about uh, people with families uh, that are calling out for their return. 
Um, you showed some of it, but I think it's worth mentioning. We're not talking about abducting Israeli soldiers from an IDF position. We're talking about that, that Hamas crossed into Israel, went to music festivals, to a music festival, went into houses and dragged out from Israel into Gaza, women, children, uh, infants, elderly people, and even disabled people, along with younger Israelis, men and women. So it is a, an atrocity at a magnitude that we have never seen before. And I don't think that any country has uh, suffered such a horrible situation. It will, of course, influence the future decisions made by uh, the Israeli government and the military, how to deal with the situation. The only thing I know now is that there are no negotiations ongoing. And what the IDF is doing is preparing to deliver a long and sustained, extremely powerful campaign against Hamas for the atrocities that they have done. All right, IDF spokesperson, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conriquez. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll be right back with more after the break. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. The New York Stock Exchange held a moment of silence ahead of the opening bell today to honor the victims of the attacks in Israel. Those attacks were having impacts around the world, including on the economy. Oil prices are already rising. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus joins me now for more on this. Alexis. Big picture here, what does this mean for the economy? This just adds another layer of uncertainty for global economic growth. Remember, global economies are still dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic. They're still dealing with the current war in Ukraine and, of course, an overall slowdown because of high inflation worldwide. So this, um, it, you know, is now a huge question mark for investors going forward. And we're seeing how they're reacting uh, today, which is their first response to the attack over the weekend. U.S. stocks were lower, not dramatically lower, but they're was a sell-off. Oil up about 3.5%. I thought perhaps we'd even see a larger rally there. And we're also seeing investors running to the relative safety of gold and the U.S. dollar, which is perceived as safe havens during these times. Now, the Middle East is oil rich. We're seeing prices jump on that right now. Are there other concerns in terms of 
economic impact and assets? It all depends on how long this war lasts, uh, how intense it gets, and whether or not it is no longer contained between Israel and Hamas. Does this spread to other regions of the area, including Iran? There are unsubstantiated reports that Iran was behind this attack. If the U.S. is able to confirm that, the U.S. may enforce tougher sanctions against Iranian oil, taking some of their oil off the market. We could see a big spike in the price of oil, and we know that that's inflationary. And just at, at a time when we were starting to see inflation get under wraps, it could, it could rally once again. In addition to being an oil-rich area, it's also an area that has a lot of important routes, like uh, trading routes. So our supply chains could be impacted. The Suez Canal, the Straits of Hormuz, all in that region. Uh, we could see disruption there, and we could see a big impact in worldwide supply chains. All right. ABC Business Report, Alexis Christophorus. Thanks, Alexis. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll also have a look at the day's other top stories right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. GMA tomorrow. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> that's a good oh, way to start. Right. I like it. Robin Roberts with Lionel Richie back in their hometown, Tuskegee, Alabama. What's it like for you to be back? Visiting the sites of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, including Robin's father, and seeing Robin's first home. That's where I came home from the hospital. It's Robin, Lionel, and a personal American Idol hometown tour like no other. No place like home. Good morning, America tomorrow. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Israel is at war after being bombarded by thousands of rockets. It's being called Israel's 9-11 after a surprise attack by the militant group Hamas. We have the latest in just a few minutes, but here are some of the other top stories we're following. The House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until electing a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. A vote for the new speaker is expected later this week. At least 2,000 people are dead after two earthquakes hit Afghanistan near the border with Iran. Hundreds of people are believed to be trapped in the rubble, but a lack of modern equipment is hampering the rescue efforts. This is one of Afghanistan's deadliest earthquakes in two decades. The western part of Maui has reopened to tourists after the summer's deadly wildfires. That process started Sunday, exactly two months after the fires killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The move is getting mixed reaction as some Maui residents warn tourism could result in wildfire victims being forced out of hotels. And Simone Biles is still the greatest of all time. The gymnast finished the Gymnastics World Championship this weekend with gold for balance beam and floor. She also won gold in the all-around and team competitions and a silver in vault. So far, she's earned a total 37 World and Olympic medals. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis.
She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. GMA tomorrow. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> That's a good way to oh, start. I like it. Robin Roberts with Lionel Richie back in their hometown, Tuskegee, Alabama. What's it like for you to be back? Visiting the sites of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, including Robin's father, and seeing Robin's first home. That's where I came home from the hospital. It's Robin, Lionel, and a personal American Idol hometown tour like no other. No place like home. Good morning, America tomorrow. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting on the flooded streets of Treasure Island, I'm Ginger Z. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story on ABC News Live. First, the war is underway in the Middle East. Israel has announced a total siege of the Gaza Strip after Hamas militants attacked Israel Saturday morning. We're looking live at Gaza City right now, where Israel has cut off all gas, electricity, and water, calling Saturday's attack their 9-11. Right now in Israel, at least 700 people are reported dead, and nearly 500 are reported dead in Gaza. Thousands are reported injured, and Israeli authorities say at least 100 have been taken hostage by Hamas militants. Overnight, Prime Minister Netanyahu launched a major offensive with rockets and tanks, promising that Israel will retaliate with a might. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel, and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. The big questions now, how did intelligence fail to detect this attack? Will Israel now send ground forces into Gaza? And was Iran behind the attack? Could this lead to a wider war? ABC News Live has team coverage all day long. We start with World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. The death toll rising here in Israel as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu now warns this could be a long and difficult war. After a brutal surprise attack not seen in Israel in 50 years. These terrorists have one goal in mind. It's to slaughter as many civilians as possible. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday, when a complex and highly coordinated attack by the militant group Hamas began an assault by land, sea, and air. More than 2,200 rockets firing into Israel, raining down on southern and central cities, with air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. 
shortly after Hamas video showing armed militants storming blockaded areas of the Gaza Strip. Officials say once inside Israeli communities along the border, they started killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the streets, some shot while sitting in their cars. At a music festival in Negev, young concertgoers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert after a Hamas rocket attack. Video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lighting the road. In other towns and villages, families were desperate to barricade themselves inside homes as militants raided their towns, going door to door, looking to kill. And many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. We met a young father, Yoni Asher, whose wife and two young daughters were visiting their grandmother. His wife called him. They were in a safe room in the house when militants got in. The call dropped out, and Yoni had no idea what happened until he saw this video. He says that's his wife, militants covering her head, taking her and his two daughters, who are just two and four. I recognized them immediately, and I saw the video twice. In the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because I melted down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was a nightmare. Prime Minister Netanyahu has declared Israel is at war. More than 700 killed here, including at least four American citizens. The Biden administration warning that number could rise. ABC News speaking with the mother of one of those American victims, 32-year-old Chaim Katzman. We thought at one point that he had been taken hostage, but it turned out that I didn't get official information about exactly what happened. His body was found in his apartment. We understand that he and his neighbor were hiding in a closet, and the neighbor, they found them, and the neighbor was released, a woman, and he was shot immediately. Now his loved ones left grieving, remembering a son, a colleague, a friend. You know, getting so many messages from people who worked with Chaim or who knew him or who met him during their travels and how warm he was, how open. He was very accepting person and very loyal friend, good sense of humor, he took things in stride. And new questions about why Israel's intelligence, long a source of pride here, how did they miss this? The worst assault since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the issue of intelligence with our George Stephanopoulos on this week. We have a very close relationship with uh, Israeli intelligence as well as with the Israeli military, as well as with Israel more broadly. So yes, of course, this is something that they and we will be looking at, but the effort right now has to be in dealing with the aggression from Hamas. To deal with that aggression, Israel now retaliated. Hammering Gaza with airstrikes and cutting off power to certain areas. The Israeli military now saying they've struck more than 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip, releasing this video of one of their strikes. The Palestinian Health Ministry saying more than 400 have been killed, thousands more civilians injured. They made elderly people, children, and women scared, this man says. Copies of the Quran were shattered. But with Israel shaken, Tens of thousands of Israeli reservists have now been called up to join the fight. We are recovering, first of all, from the most devastating day in Israeli history. Every single Hamas terrorist that carried this out is going to have to look over their shoulder for the rest of their lives. And this young father is waiting for his wife and two young girls to come home. Uh, how are you staying so strong? I don't know. I guess when you're a parent, you have no choice. In fact, we could hear the rocket fire off in the distance just moments ago, a real reminder that this is ongoing. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The defense ministry uh, declaring just moments ago a total siege of the Gaza Strip, no power, no water, no electricity, saying we are dealing with barbaric terrorists and we will act accordingly. Diane. World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. Thank you. And ABC's Inez de la Quattara is also in Tel Aviv. Inez, what's it like there right now? Hey, good morning, Diane. Yeah, an air raid sirens going off in Jerusalem as we speak. That's the second time they've gone off in uh, Jerusalem. They were going off uh, in Ashkelon further south as well and here in Tel Aviv 
earlier this morning. So fresh rockets being fired at Israel. We heard those sirens earlier, earlier this morning. We were at a missing person center, a center that's been set up close to the uh, international airport here to help families who haven't heard from their loved ones uh, in a couple days, uh, help them find their family members. And as we were there hoping to talk to some of those families, the air raid sirens did go off and we had to take uh, shelter inside that center with those families. The focus today, I think, is on Gaza. So the IDF is striking Hamas militant targets inside Gaza, but civilians, of course, caught in the uh, crossfire there. We know that uh, entire families were killed overnight during heavy shelling, and today a refugee camp was also hit, the Jabalaya refugee camp, which is the biggest refugee camp in Gaza. At least 50 people were killed, and we are expecting that death toll to rise. The IDF saying they are essentially laying siege to Gaza right now, cutting off fuel, uh, food, and electricity to the region. Hospitals say they are overwhelmed, um, and real concerns about what that's going to mean for uh, civilians inside Gaza, Diane. Now, and as Israel Defense Forces say, at least 100 people are, are still missing. They're believed to have been taken by Hamas. What's being done to try to find those people? Yeah, so in terms of the hostage situation, we do know that at least 100 Israelis were taken. These are both civilians and members of the military. We've seen those horrific images of, of, of people, you know, with with their wrists, uh, hands tied together, being loaded onto the backs of uh, trucks and, and motorcycles and taken away into the Gaza Strip. Uh, men, women, children, uh, the elderly as well, unclear uh, where they are and what condition uh, they are. Uh, here in Tel Aviv, there was a center that was Set up. So this missing uh, person center that I was referring to, we were there this morning uh, trying to talk to some of those families. We spoke to one man who was looking for his cousin who had attended that music festival in southern Israel where uh, uh, th that was stormed by uh, armed Palestinian militants. 260 bodies were recovered at that site. This man had brought a DNA sample. That's what families are being encouraged to do. They're being told to bring things like hairbrushes or toothbrushes um, for officials to, to try and, and find their loved ones. So this man had done that and now he was going to be going to uh, different hospitals. He said every single hospital in Israel to try and find his cousin. We also spoke to, to social workers there. One social worker telling us that in the last 24 hours they had seen uh, a, a close to a thousand families stopping by this center looking for their loved one. They're expecting similar numbers today. Um, and we spoke to, to another social worker who told us a little bit about the process and what they're hearing from families. And here's what he had to say. You need somebody to talk with. Uh... Don't be alone and talk, share. So he's encouraging people to come to the center, to, to, to come together. He says they're providing all sorts of assistance there for them, certainly helping with the investigations, but also providing mental health uh, support, Diane. All right, Inez de la Quatara in Tel Aviv. Thanks, Inez. And rescue workers say more than 260 bodies were recovered from a deadly attack at a music festival in southern Israel Saturday. Eyewitness Canadian-Israeli Shai Weinstein said and his friends raced to get away from that festival, making a nail-biting flight to Tel Aviv. And Shai is joining me now for more on this. Shai, first of all, I'm so sorry for what you've had to go through and for what your, you know, your friends and loved ones are going through. Talk me through this, because you say when you first heard the rockets, you thought... That's not so strange living in Israel. So when did you realize that this was different? Um, at some point, the rockets picked up and they just wouldn't stop. And there was a lot. There was rockets from Gaza. There was rockets from the Iron Dome. And at some point, I thought I heard gunfire in the distance. And I told my cousin, but I wasn't sure. And it made me want to pick up when we all started going a bit faster. And then uh, we heard it get closer. And we really picked up. And I just wanted us to get out of there as fast as possible. And we got our stuff packed up. We got to the parking lot. We were in the area where everyone had their camps, so to say, where everyone was resting during the festival. So we were already close to the parking lot. And, um, you know, we got there and people are starting to panic more and more. And uh, 
and I just, just wanted to get out. And we got our stuff in the trunk. And I was like, I'll drive. Because I was, I don't know, me and one friend were less inebriated than the others. So I said, I'll drive. And, and you guys can tell me where to go. And everybody was trying to get out. And there was so much traffic. I thought maybe we'll wait. And then I thought this is taking too long. And I decided to go around cars, left and right off the road, back into the line. Maybe it'd be faster. And then I noticed that some cars were empty and people were still waiting behind them not knowing they're empty. And I told my cousin, these people in front of us are waiting for a dead car. Can you yell at them to move so we can all leave? And he got out and he told them to go to the left. And they did, and we went with them. We drove up the ditch onto the main road. And the police were directing people to a field. And we drove into the field. And at some point, people were fleeing their cars. I don't know if it was on their own or if because police told them to. So there was a combination of people trying to drive away and people getting out of their cars in the middle and running on foot. And that caused people to get stuck. Uh, as we drove into the field, my cousin's girlfriend, she screams, and she says, get out of the car, get out of the car. And we all, all get out and we started running and I grabbed my friend and we ran into the field and we ducked down because there was gunfire. And my cousin ran back to the car and we were all freaked out. And he grabbed the car and he brought it back to us. And we all got in. And we started driving through the field. And we initially didn't know where to go. We couldn't see where to go. Just a, a dirt everywhere, dust. We couldn't see, we couldn't breathe. Our mouths were dry. Um, Sha, you say that you only slowed down. Sha, you say you only slowed down for checkpoints and and bodies. Can you walk me through that last, that last portion of it and how so you finally got we, out? After we, after we got into the field, I spotted up on the ridge, there was like farms or something or a grove. And they thought it was a service road. So I pointed us towards that and we went there and that's what it was. And we took the service road and a few other cars out east and then north towards Tel Aviv. And as we're driving on the roads, we see abandoned cars. We see cars with bullet holes in them. We see bodies on the road. Uh, at some point we drove through combat. There were soldiers or police, I don't remember if it was one or the other, in the road with their guns out and they're pointing towards the right and they had their guns out and there was dead soldiers on the ground and some of their cars had bullet holes in them. And we didn't want to wait there. Initially we backed up to get away from them so we wouldn't get shot. But at some point, we drove through it all, and we kept going, not slowing down except for other checkpoints. Well, Shai, I'm so glad and that just... you did get out safely. This whole thing sounds harrowing. I appreciate you coming on it and telling your story to us today. I know this is something that's going to affect you for a while, but we're glad you got out safely and, and wishing you and your loved ones uh, the best and so much strength right now. Thank you. Shai, thank you. And do stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll be right back with more after the break. Whenever news breaks, 
to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. You're looking live at Gaza, where it appears more strikes are happening as we see large plumes of black smoke in the sky. I want to go to ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang and ABC News contributor, former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Lieutenant Doug Lute, for more on the war now underway. Selena, an NSC official confirms at least nine Americans were killed in the attacks in Israel. What do we know about that? Well, Diane, the U.S. officials say they can confirm the death of nine American citizens, but they cannot pinpoint the exact number of Americans who may be missing or may have been taken hostage. The U.S. State Department says that number is constantly moving, but they are in close contact with Israeli authorities to try and gather more information. This, Diane, as President Biden has pledged that rock-solid support to Israel. Already, the U.S. is sending an aircraft carrier strike group towards Israeli waters, as well as sending more military equipment and fighter jets. This is an a show of support to Israel and as a warning to others not to get involved. We've seen the Biden administration in a flurry of contact over this weekend with Israeli leadership as well as Palestinian leadership and with other leaders in the region to try and prevent this from turning into a broader war. This already shaping up to be one of the toughest geopolitical situations of the Biden presidency. Key questions here around Israeli intelligence failures here and whether U.S. intelligence failed to pick up any indications. Uh, General Lute, the U.S. is sending an aircraft carrier strike group toward Israeli waters to show support. What's the strategy there? Well, I think the, the repositioning of this naval task force uh, into the eastern Mediterranean Sea has really two purposes. First of all, symbolically, to provide support to our closest ally in the region, Israel, at a time when it is stressed uh, like no other time in the last 50 years. So symbolic support. I don't expect direct military intervention or direct military support to Israel. Uh, the Israeli Air Force, for example, is more than capable uh, of dealing with uh, Hamas. The second purpose, though, I think is a little more subtle, and that is to provide a deterrence message um, to others who may be uh, potentially interested or see an opportunity to join this conflict and the message is essentially, uh, let's contain this conflict inside Israel, and in particular, uh, between Israel and Hamas. And General, while the administration says it's too soon to know if Iran played a formal role in this Hamas attack, officials say it's unimaginable that Iran didn't have some influence. Secretary Blinken says Hamas wouldn't be Hamas without the support it gets from Iran. So how do you go about unpacking Iran's role here, and why is that so important? Well, I, I agree that Iran 
is Hamas's lifeline uh, in terms of military support, economic assistance, uh, and so forth. The scale and the complexity of this attack on Israel over the last several days certainly suggests outside support to Hamas, and outside support leads directly uh, to Iran. All right, ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, ABC News contributor, former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Lieutenant General Doug Lute. Thank you both. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We have a look at the day's other top stories after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how? How many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Friday on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from near the epicenter of the worst earthquake to hit Morocco, I'm Tom Sufi Burridge. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Israel is at war after being bombarded by thousands of rockets. It's being called Israel's 9-11 after a surprise attack by the militant group Hamas. We'll have the latest in just a few minutes, but here are some of the other stories we're following today. The House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until they elect a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. A vote for new speaker is expected later this week. At least 2,000 people are dead after two earthquakes hit Afghanistan near the border with Iran. Hundreds of people are believed to be trapped in the rubble, but a lack of modern equipment is hampering the rescue efforts. This is one of Afghanistan's deadliest earthquakes in two decades. The western part of Maui has reopened to tourists after the summer's deadly wildfires. The process started Sunday, exactly two months after the fires killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The move's getting mixed reaction as some Maui residents warn tourism could result in wildfire victims being forced out of hotels. And Simone Biles is still the GOAT. The star gymnast finished the Gymnastics World Championships this weekend with gold in balance beam and floor. She also won gold in all-around and team competitions and a silver in vault. So far, she's earned a total of 37 World and Olympic medals. Big congratulations to Simone, and thanks to you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. 
But then the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now she's charged with felony child abuse. And all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story on ABC News Live. First, Israel has declared war after a terrorist attack by the Palestinian militant group Hamas over the weekend. At least 700 killed in Israel, including at least nine Americans. Nearly 500 have been killed in Gaza. Thousands are injured. We have team coverage all day long, and we begin with Matt Gutman on the scene in Tel Aviv, Israel. Another huge barrage of rockets from Gaza crashing into Israel just hours after Israeli forces regained control of all their Gaza border towns and are now pummeling Gaza from the air. It follows a brutal surprise attack by Hamas, resulting in the deadliest day in Israel's history. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday when operatives from Hamas stormed Israel by pouring out of tunnels, bashing through the border fence using paragliders and zodiacs to get across into Israel. It was an assault Hamas covered with more than 2,200 rockets. Air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. Israel's officials saying many hundreds of militants killed indiscriminately. Bodies left in the streets, some cantilevered out of cars. In other towns and villages, families desperately barricaded themselves in their homes as militants raided the towns, going door to door, looking to kill. Many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. At an Israeli music festival nearby, hundreds of young concert goers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say that 260 bodies were removed from the desert after Hamas attacked that concert. A video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lining the road. Hamas posting this video of the kidnapped, the young man in the yellow, is Omer Shemtov. His mother describes watching his phone tracker trail into Gaza. I'm like in a dream, and I will wake up. I will wake up. Have it's you not woke a real thing. Have you woken up yet? No. No. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, but in, in life. And just as we wrap the interview, a commotion. Roll, people pouring into the house. All right, so there's, there's a siren right now. And uh, we're now going into their bomb shelter together. About a dozen people huddled inside until the all clear. All right, thanks to Matt Gutman for that report. And Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel joins me live now from outside Gaza with more. Ian, there's a long history of conflict here. What's different about this attack from past conflicts? 
Uh, I mean, most of past conflicts have been almost national conflicts. Uh, you know, just over 50 years ago was the Yom Kippur War, the 1973 war, when Israel was attacked by neighboring countries. And so it has historically been nation upon nation, although there's always been a kind of simmering conflict, of course, in some cases uh, now and again much more active between the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and Israel, and of course Israel and Hezbollah, which is uh, across the border in Lebanon. But, but what marked this out was the physical invasion on the ground of Israel by these uh, as Islamist militants from Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Nothing like that has happened before. The scale of loss of a life for Israeli civilians was the most significant, despite all the conflicts that Israel has faced. And so it shocked the nation. This is a nation that prides itself on being able to protect its population, of uh, being very, you know, other militaries around the world often look to Israel as, as a role model um, of what to do in terms of protecting the civilian population. Strong borders. As I'm talking to you, you, know, you can see these military vehicles heading down the road. It feels like an active kind of combat zone. We're seeing a lot of men and munitions. Uh, and it feels like what started as an invasion by a guerrilla group murdering innocent civilians inside Israel is now morphing into a much larger scale war. How have relations been between Israelis and Palestinians over the last few years? Did anyone see this coming? Well, certainly the Israeli military and intelligence didn't. Again, look at this. I mean, we're just seeing so many vehicles and people moving up towards the border. Uh, Israeli intelligence and the Israeli military will be regarded by many people as having failed its population, of not really reading and understanding Hamas and what it was planning. It's put a lot of effort into the West Bank. We've seen a lot of raids that has created a lot of anger. People have been talking about the possibility of another Palestinian interference. I mean, certainly life inside Gaza for the population there has been difficult to terrible for many, many years. But I think Israel felt that it had just shelved that problem by essentially sealing the borders, limiting traffic in and out, and controlling the situation. It didn't see Hamas getting ready for this hugely complex, sophisticated attack. For Hamas and Islamic Jihad, this was an enormous success. For the Israeli military and intelligence, it was a huge failure. Now, Ian, I know you also spoke to witnesses from that massacre at the music festival. More than 260 bodies reportedly have been recovered there. What are the people who were there saying about what happened? I mean, we're just hearing I mean, genuinely heartbreaking, tragic stories. Uh, we met one family. Uh, his daughter and her boyfriend had gone to this party and we're hearing many people talk about the same kind of stories of these frantic panicky phone calls it started off with a barrage of rockets and, and an air raid siren well Israelis are kind of used to that and they didn't really think anything was unusual until they heard the sound of gunshots a music festival in Israel packed with hundreds of young people ending in carnage. Early Saturday morning, Hamas rockets streaking overhead as people celebrated and danced. Yo, yo, Suddenly, yo, panic yo. spreading as Hamas gunmen close in. Festival goers seen in videos circulating online, running for their lives, desperately fleeing for safety. All the people who got away fast were shot in their, in their car. No Mankat survived the attack by sprinting through an open field. So you just keep running because you realize that if you don't keep running, then you don't go back home. With rockets exploding overhead, Noam running for miles without food or water. She still doesn't know whether some of her closest friends made it out alive. Yeah. Tom and his girlfriend Mai describing the chaos and gunfire as they try to escape. Bullets is, is over your head. You hear, you, you, hear hear the, you hear the shot like, you hear the, the shot, you get down and keep running. More than 260 people were slaughtered by Hamas. Video posted online showing what is now a terrible crime scene. But many are still missing, including John Polin's son, Hirsch. He sent two brief WhatsApp messages to my wife and me 
The first message said, I love you. The second message said, I'm sorry. Since then, we've heard nothing from him. The family of Idan Dor are in agonizing limbo, awaiting any news about their 25-year-old son. We all here. No one can sleep. We have no information about uh, Idan, nothing. Idan first escaped the gunfire with a friend, calling his sister in panic. When he ran in, uh, and screamed that his I'm running and I'm uh, I'm running for my life. Everybody, everyone is shooting everywhere in every direction. He ran for his life as Hamas gunned people down. His family haven't heard from either of them since. Well, Tom and Mai were telling me that there were thousands of people at this festival. Some people called it a festival for peace. So some of them got home safely, uh, upset, terrified, stressed and, and, and traumatised by their experience. Sadly, uh, 260 died there, but of course many are still missing. They're now held hostage inside Gaza, and as we hear every few minutes, Gaza is being relentlessly pounded. It's hard to imagine the terror of the civilians who live inside Gaza, and now those Israeli hostages too. Diane? So Ian, what's next here? Yeah, good question. I mean, look, while we've been talking, is a very good example. We've seen so many military vehicles moving along a road. So we've seen this heavy aerial bombardment. It's still ongoing. We're seeing helicopters flying by, fighter jets dropping bombs every few minutes. But I think the Israeli public are going to expect more, and I think the Israeli government, especially Netanyahu, who comes out of this looking bad, has to deliver more. I think the possibility at the moment is that there will be some kind of ground incursion. There's got to be a reason why we're seeing so many men and munitions on the road, military vehicles moving up. I don't think Israel would want to totally invade Gaza because then it owns the problem. It still will have to deal with Hamas militants. And here's the other thing to consider. Israel also faces a much greater threat from its northern border, from Hezbollah, which is much stronger than Hamas. Now, so far, they haven't really thrown their hat into the ring. There has been a small incursion we're hearing from the Israeli Defense Forces today of some armed insurgents. Uh, it's not clear who they're from into the northern border, but clearly there's a risk. If Israel puts so many of its resources down in the south, it leaves the north vulnerable, and that could then lead to Hezbollah trying to seize a day and cause at least some kind of incursion from there. This is really, really existential moment for Israel. Certainly seems that way. Ian Panel, stay safe. Ian, thank you. And now to the rescue missions for Israeli hostages captured by Hamas militants. Israel says at least 100 people are being held. Foreign correspondent James Longman is in Tel Aviv with more. She wants her, she just wants her to come home back safe and sound. In this video circulating online, young IDF recruit Karina Ashayev can be seen bloodied and bound, being driven by Hamas militants into Gaza. Sasha tells me what it was like seeing her sister in the video. At first I saw this and I didn't think it was her. I just swiped, swiped next. Her face was in blood. She was screaming. We identified her by her nose, her brows, her chest. And then we know it was her. In another video, Karina speaks into her phone, surrounded by other kidnapped women. <laughs> Families are desperate to find their love. Welcome back to ABC News Live. We're following breaking news right now. Large plumes of smoke are filling the air in Gaza after we saw what looked like an explosion about five minutes ago. This comes after Israel declared war in response to a terrorist attack by Palestinian militant group Hamas over the weekend. At least 700 people are reported dead in Israel, including at least nine Americans. Nearly 500 are reported dead in Gaza. ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez joins me now for more on this. Uh, Louis, what are you hearing, if anything, about these explosions? Diane, what we're seeing is part of this offensive, if you will, that the Israeli Defense Forces are carrying out inside of uh, Gaza. These are retaliatory airstrikes. The number is approaching close to 500 so far over the last 48 hours. And so this has been rolling over that time frame. Um, these are airstrikes that the IDF has called in, targeting Hamas areas. Um, sometimes, in some cases, buildings where Hamas operatives, senior Hamas leaders live. And uh, you are seeing uh, a, a lot of damage being inflicted. You're seeing those plumes of smoke, uh, but there's also the human element. We are hearing from Palestinian authorities inside Gaza that about at least 500 
uh, people as, as have been killed in, as a result of what is happening here, these airstrikes. Uh, so this is part of this rolling uh, operation that you're seeing. There has been no ground operation yet. We are seeing lots of movement of vehicles uh, headed towards that area, but yet not any ground incursion as of right now, though there are hints that that is coming soon. Uh, Louis, this uh, attack over the weekend was unexpected, but there is an extensive history here. So give us a sense of, of how we got here and, and what's being looked at in terms of what led to this. Sure, the Gaza Strip is a very small area, Diane, very narrow, very, uh, very small, but densely, densely populated. Um, there was a time when there were Israeli settlers inside there, so there was an Israeli military presence. They were withdrawn in 2005, and then around two years later, Hamas won some elections and ended up becoming the dominant power force inside of Gaza. Um, there, since that time, we have seen various military operations against Hamas because they've launched rockets as retaliation. There have been retaliatory airstrikes, um, and we've seen this kind of back and forth over the last 18 years. Um, some of these operations have been very large because what we've seen is um, that the uh, Hamas militants have actually fired. Um, we were talking right now in this incident of thousands. Um, in the past, they've thrown hundreds, maybe a thousand in some uh, operations against Israeli targets. But what we're seeing now is that since Hamas took over, there was a blockade that was put in place, um, making sure that very few items went in in terms of technology or particularly weapons. Um, and it is that blockade that has inspired the ire of the Palestinians who support Hamas inside of the Gaza, uh, because mainly because they say that it is um, causing humanitarian distress among the civilian population, and that has just increased in magnitude over the last 18 years. So that's part of what the history is here. There's a large amount of really uh, resentment against the Israelis because of that blockade, and potentially what we're seeing here is a result of that. Uh, Louis, we've seen many conflicts in this region. How is this attack different? This one is very different, Diane, because uh, you spoke about these rocket attacks that we've seen Hamas launch, and then we've seen the retaliatory airstrikes from the Israelis. Some of those operations can have lasted days, weeks, um, but nothing like this on this order of magnitude, because we're talking about thousands of these rockets that have been launched into Israel and continue to be launched into Israel, and we're talking about numbers that are just significantly higher. At the same time, you saw um, militants breaking through this big fence, these barriers that is Israel has erected around the border of Gaza just for self-defense purposes, and they broke through. And they've, as we've seen, they broke through and attacked these uh, cities and towns uh, Israelis on the Israeli side of the border. And there were close to a thousand Hamas militants. That's the latest estimate. Uh, close to a thousand Hamas militants who crossed that border into these areas. Um, and then we've seen the violence that ensued as a matter of that. So uh, that's what makes this different. It's the number of rockets that have been fired by Hamas and that significant ground incursion, something that no one could have ever imagined taking place. Uh, Louis, the leader of Hamas's military wing, as you pointed out, is saying that this is a response to the blockade. But the blockade's been going on for more than a decade, so why now? Well, it appears to be the timing. Over the last two years, specifically this year, there's been increasing levels of violence in the West Bank. That's the other Palestinian territory that borders Israel. That's more on the east side. Um, but the West Bank is under a different control than Hamas. Actually, there's a split between the Palestinian leadership. Hamas is independent from the Palestinian Authority, which has control of the West Bank. But inside the West Bank, you're seeing more militant groups um, building up, and the, Israel has really really taken um, some strong initiatives this year in trying to put down some of these militant groups inside the West Bank. So I think even further resentment because of what's going on there. There's been some speculation that potentially Hamas was trying to work with Iran. Iran is Hamas's main backer of weapons and support. And when the thinking was that maybe uh, Iran was trying to prevent this linkage, this uh, movement towards a diplomatic uh, security between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia. We've been talking about this now for the last several months, that there might be some diplomatic recognition by Saudi Arabia of Israel, something that was, again, unimaginable, but was 
things were looking that way. And so there has been some speculation that potentially miss, they mean this has something to do with that. Um, but as of right now, U.S. officials are on the record saying that they've not seen anything definitive that indicates that uh, Iran has been behind this operation being launched by Hamas. And we're looking at live images there of Gaza. You can see plumes of smoke coming from multiple locations. Now we're, we're following the latest. I, I want to bring in ABC's Inez de la Quattara, who's in Tel Aviv with more. Uh, Inez, what are you hearing right now? Hey, Diane, yeah, you can see those massive fresh explosions in Gaza. It's still unclear what was targeted there, um, how many may have been killed or injured. Those images coming in live on Reuters as those explosions were happening. That's been the scene in Gaza throughout the day um, and through the night. Heavy shelling overnight, uh, wiping out entire families, we understand. And uh, mosques were targeted as well. At least five mosques have now been destroyed. And today, a refugee camp was also uh, hit at least 50 people. People dying in that uh, one strike. This is the Jabalaya refugee camp, which is the biggest refugee camp in Gaza. So a really dire situation there as the IDF really lays siege to Gaza. The Israel's uh, defense minister saying they are cutting off all fuel, food, and electricity supplies to Gaza. Um, and, and, and like I say, this has been the scene all day, and we're, we're expecting that to, to continue and get worse uh, over the coming days and likely weeks, Diane. Uh, Louis, the Saturday attack by Hamas that prompted Israel to declare war, it happened almost exactly to the day on the 50th anniversary of the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. How significant is that? I think there is some significance to that, Diane, mainly because uh, there is history here. We've talked about earlier about the history between the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and uh, nothing shows that more than what happened in the Yom Kippur War. That was a surprise attack on one of the high holy days in the Jewish faith, and that was an attack launched by uh, Syria and Egypt. And if essentially, uh, Israel was caught napping, and they did fight back um, and retake the territory that they initially had lost. Um, but there's a lot of significance because of that event. And again, you can't miss the similarities here. This was a surprise attack this weekend. Yom Kippur, the war in 1973, that was a surprise attack. And there's a, you, when you talk to some officials, some experts, um, they talk about the some significance, um, particularly in the, in the Palestinian movement, to earlier incidents. They hark back by names, you know, something like the 17th, September 18th uh, movement that harks back to a certain date in Palestinian history. So you hear, I think there's some linkage that I think is worth exploring here that potentially um, this is linked uh, as, a, as a commemorative event, if you will, uh, marking that 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. All right, Inez, Louis, thank you both. And I want to bring in Republican Congressman Mike Lawler for more on this. Uh, Congressman, I know you represent New York's 17th district. That's one of the most Jewish in the country. You're also on the Foreign Affairs Committee, so I know it's a busy time for you. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Uh, while we're talking, we're looking at images of Gaza right now, plumes of smoke all across the skyline. What's your reaction seeing these images? Well, obviously, the attack on Israel. Uh, the other day was devastating uh, and shocking. And, you know, I have hundreds of constituents that are currently in Israel. Uh, we are working with the State Department, with the embassy, with Israeli officials uh, to try and get them out as expeditiously as, as possible. Uh, but there is no question, Hamas is a terrorist organization backed by Iran. Uh, and the United States needs to stand firmly uh, with our ally Israel uh, in rooting them out. Uh, and I think Congress and the administration needs to act quickly uh, to advance legislation, to uh, provide further support and assistance to Israel, uh, including more funding for the Iron Dome. Uh, it is clear uh, that uh, Iran uh, and other bad actors in the region uh, will do everything they can uh, to eliminate Israel uh, from the face of the earth. And we need to stand firm and resolute in our support for them. Uh, and I think it is critical at this juncture uh, that we do so. Now, Congressman, you said that you've been in contact with dozens of your constituents who are in Israel. What are they telling you? Well, I think obviously, uh, you know, they're very concerned uh, for their safety and that of their families, um, you know, and 
Uh, we are trying to work to get as many uh, commercial and, if necessary, military flights uh, available so that we can uh, get them out of Israel safely and quickly uh, so that they can come back to the United States. I mean, obviously, this was uh, on a holiday. A lot of people, uh, you know, go over to Israel during the holidays. But at any given moment, you know, from especially from New York, we have thousands of constituents who uh, are over in Israel. You have a lot of people who are dual citizens. Uh, and so, you know, we are always concerned when there's uh, events uh, happening in, in Israel uh, that would jeopardize their safety. Uh, but especially here, uh, where you saw a, a brutal massacre uh, and thousands of Israeli citizens. And uh, right now we're looking at, you know, uh, upwards of a dozen American citizens that were brutally murdered uh, and injured. Uh, and so we're obviously trying to get a handle on the situation and uh, help get our constituents home as quickly as possible. Now, this all happened as the U.S. was working on a normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel. So where do those talks stand now and how do they factor into this conflict? The first piece of legislation that I passed through the House was to create a special envoy for the Abraham Accords. Uh, with the express intent of getting Saudi Arabia to the table. Uh, I think, uh, obviously, the administration has been uh, having conversations uh, and negotiations with the Saudis. Um, you know, one of the things that has been concerning to me uh, and others uh, has been the administration's is insistence that uh, you know Israel acquiesce in some respect to the Palestinians. and. Uh, I think what you see here uh, with Hamas uh, and their actions um, and what they did on Saturday, uh, obviously uh, deeply disturbing uh, and makes it very difficult, uh, certainly in this moment, uh, to advance forward uh, with any normalization agreement. But I think that the, the unfortunate part here is that the Abraham Accords uh, frankly, were the most successful foreign policy initiative in, de in decades uh, to bring about peace and prosperity in the Middle East. And I think we obviously need to keep our, our focus uh, on that uh, as this conflict unfolds uh, and, and not allow this to spiral backwards uh, with uh, the nations that have already normalized relations uh, with Israel. But this is Iran's plan. Uh, and I think people need to recognize that. They want uh, to destabilize the Middle East. They want uh, to divide Israel from Arab-majority nations. They want to prevent a uh, Israel-Saudi uh, normalization agreement. Uh, and so they will use every weapon in their arsenal, including uh, funding Hamas, uh, to, to engage in a proxy war. Could the Saudis potentially help to de-escalate this war? Well, I hope the Saudis uh, recognize uh, there is no moral equivalency here. Uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization uh, that has taken steps uh, to wipe out Israel uh, with the backing of Iran, uh, and the Saudis need to play a role uh, in, you know, ultimately uh, bringing about uh, peace in the Middle East. They are critical to that. Uh, but this, there is no moral equivalency here. And you either stand with Israel in this moment or you don't. Uh, the United States stands with Israel. Uh, and I think it's incumbent on our allies and those with which we have relationships uh, to stand with Israel in this moment. All right, New York Congressman Mike Lawler. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. And we are also now hearing breaking news that the IDF says they have struck 130 targets in Gaza in just the last three hours. This, of course, comes after Israel declared war after an attack by Hamas over the weekend. Do stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of that war. We'll be right back with more after the break.
This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. For 30 years, my brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh, my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Honored ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story on ABC News Live. First, Israel has declared war after a terrorist attack by the Palestinian militant group Hamas over the weekend. You're looking live at Gaza right now where massive plumes of smoke are spread across the sky. Israeli Defense Forces say they have struck 130 targets in Gaza in just the last three hours. So far, at least 700 are reported dead in Israel, including at least nine Americans. Nearly 500 people are reported dead in Gaza. We have team coverage all day long. And we begin with ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez for more on this. Louis, there's an extensive history here. So walk us through what's playing into this attack. How did we get here? Diane, I think this all begins back in 2005 when you see the Israeli settlers pull out of Gaza and then Hamas takes over as the government. Um, when that happened, the Israeli government imposed a blockade intended to prevent weapons from entering Gaza uh, from Egypt. Um, and so since then, there have been back and forth restrictions. Sometimes the supplies uh, that uh, cutoffs include food, it can include medical supplies, uh, technology. Uh, and what has been built up over the last 16 years that that blockade has been in place is a lot of resentment on the part of the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, you've seen Hamas claim that this has led to 
uh, significant humanitarian crises over that time. And so I think that resentment kind of may be building up or has built up over that time. And so some Palestinians who support Hamas see a justification um, in what we're seeing uh, in this violence over the last uh, couple of days. Um, but it some indications that, yes, this blockade that has been placed for so long uh, is part of the driver for that resentment and the violence that we're seeing right now. Uh, Louis, what are we learning so far about this attack that happened on Saturday, Saturday and, and the fighting since? Well, what we've seen is a significant ramp up in the rocket attacks that have come from Gaza over the last couple of years. Yes, there would be rocket attacks into Israel for varying reasons. Um, and, and I think at their magnitude, maybe a thousand rockets at one time over a certain stretch a few years ago. But what we're seeing to this weekend, we are talking about thousands of rockets and potentially as many as 5,000 being fired uh, from Gaza uh, towards various parts of Israel, even as far away as, in the, as Tel Aviv, which is about uh, 50 miles to the north, so very significant. And even more significant is the fact that you saw maybe a thousand Hamas militants break through that very tight security border, um, the fencing that has been surrounding uh, Gaza for the last 20 years, and they were able to break through and go into these villages, these towns in the border area, and uh, they, they were targeting uh, civilians indiscriminately, and we've seen the violent effects since then. Um, but it is that capability and the ability that, uh, God, that the Hamas was able to keep this secret for so long, because this is a very complex kind of attack, and to keep something secret like that requires a lot of operational discipline, and I think that's what we're seeing here right now. And let's bring in ABC's Ines de la Quattara in Tel Aviv right now. Ines, what are you hearing there? Hey, Diane, yeah, so massive plumes of smoke rising from Gaza there. Still unclear what was targeted, how many may have been injured or killed in that attack, but that is very much the scene in Gaza right now. It's been the scene uh, throughout the day and overnight as well. Heavy shelling overnight. We understand entire families were killed. At least five mosques have been uh, totally destroyed today. A, a refugee camp, the Jabalaya refugee camp, the biggest refugee camp in Gaza was also struck. At least 50 people killed there. We're expecting that death toll to rise. As far as the latest numbers in terms of the death toll for uh, Palestinians, the Palestinian Health Ministry is saying uh, 560 Palestinians have been killed and close to 2,900 people have been injured because of these airstrikes. Air raid sirens have been uh, sounding across Israel as well, twice in Jerusalem today. Down south, Ashkelon was uh, hit. Tel Aviv, we've heard sirens here as well. So uh, lots of back and forth. As far as the latest in terms of the fire I will say the uh, IDF is saying they have regained control of the south. So they were they were fighting on, on two fronts, essentially. So they're fighting, of course, inside Gaza, striking targets in Gaza, what they say are Hamas militant targets inside Gaza. But also they, they had been fighting inside Israel uh, after those, those militants. An unknown number of militants uh, came into Israel and had taken control of, of some uh, villages and communities there. So uh, the IDF saying they have now regained control of the south. Louis, what do you make of the timing of all of this? Diane, I think it has something to do with the buildup in violence that we've seen in the West Bank over the last year or so. Um, there's been a rise in militant activity in the West Bank that's controlled by the Palestinian Authority, not by Hamas. Hamas controls Gaza. The Palestinian Authority controls the West Bank. Um, and what we've seen, particularly in Jenin and in Nablus, um, uh, there's been lots of activity on the part of the Israeli Defense Forces pushing in to try to stop the growing uh, actions of what they see as militancy uh, targeting Israeli sellers uh, nearby. And so that is part of the situation that you see there. And so as the tensions have increased in the West Bank, maybe there is a misdirection on the part of the Israelis focusing so much there and away from Gaza. So that potentially gives Hamas an opportunity. Um, and again, we mentioned the blockade. So I think when you focus on the blockade, when you focus on the increased tensions resulting in the West Bank, and there's been some speculation potentially that Iran may be trying to prevent uh, diplomatic uh, contacts between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, though there is the U.S. officials are saying publicly that they see no indications right now that that is the case. But that is something that has been bubbling up uh, definitely over the last weekend. Uh, and as Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu declared war on Hamas, he's warning this could be a long and difficult one. So what happens next? 
that's the big question here. So we do know that they are bracing for a long and difficult war. I think the big question is whether there will be any kind of ground uh, offensive. As some of Israel's neighbors have warned Netanyahu against doing that. But we've also seen images of, um, you know, tanks being uh, sent closer to the border. So raising questions as to whether that could be uh, next. We're also seeing the IDF evacuating uh, communities, Israeli communities close to the border. We know that as of this morning, at least 15 of 24 of those communities had been evacuated. Israeli families are being told to leave. Unclear why that is, what the IDF is now planning. But I think that's the big concern, that there could be a uh, ground offensive in Gaza. All right. Inez de la Quattara in Tel Aviv, ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez. Thank you. And let's bring in Omar Shakir, the Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch, for more on this. Uh, Omar, thanks so much for being here. You know, you and your organization have said there's no justification for the deliberate killings of civilians and hostage taking uh, after this weekend's attack. But you also say these events may keep happening if human rights are disregarded. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is the bloodshed, you know, did not start yesterday. We need to be unequivocal that hostage-taking, deliberate killings of civilians are heinous crimes that have no justification. Um, so I think we need to say that outright. But I think there has been a perception that this is something that began yesterday, and there, is, there hasn't really been a recognition that Palestinians in Gaza have been, as your colleagues noted a minute ago, have been living under a closure for more than 16 years, including a generalized ban on travel. So 2.2 million people um, unlawfully caged in a 25 by 7 mile territory, not able to leave outside of narrow exemptions. And of course, many of the, the majority of the population are themselves refugees, generations of refugees, not able to return to their homes. They've been under an occupation for more than 50 years. There have been rounds of escalations that have wiped out entire families, reduced residential buildings into rubble. So the idea is to understand that, uh, you know, that there is a context, that what happened for, of course, Israeli families is unprecedented. It is awful. It is it is not justified by, by any context. Palestinians have also been facing unspeakable bloodshed and crimes that go back not days and weeks or months and not even years, but decades. Now, we're seeing new Israeli attacks in Gaza right now, and Israel has cut gas, electricity, and water there. So what's it like right now in Gaza? The situation in Gaza is harrowing. Um, you know, you have families going to sleep soon that aren't sure if they're going to see the sun again because these strikes, there's nowhere to flee. There are no shelters. There's nowhere you can go. Uh, families have a few hours of electricity a day. Uh, we regularly hear the terror. You know, um, we, when we talk to people in Gaza, you hear the bombs going off in the background. We see images uh, on the screen of, of, of that. And, you know, you, you know that you could be targeted at any time, anywhere. Many families have their life possessions in a suitcase, knowing that they might have only a couple of minutes to, um, you know, survive an airstrike. Um, electricity, water, food. You have to understand that Israel maintains control over virtually every aspect of everyday life. And the statements, including today, coming out of the defense minister, saying, I mean, that is a call to commit a war crime. To say that no food, no water, no electricity. This is a strategy to starve the population. It is unlawful, and it is a reminder of why the International Criminal Court should accelerate their uh, investigation into serious crimes being committed. Palestinians face a reality of apartheid, of persecution. That needs to end, and there needs to be accountability for abuses by uh, all parties here. Uh, what can the international community do to help civilians in this conflict? Because I'm sure we could bring on many of guests that would refute some of what you're saying, and you guys could have a whole political debate. But one thing I think everyone can agree on is the civilians stuck in this conflict. Nobody wants to see that. Look, this is not about politics. I agree, and this is not about uh, you know you know we all want a political process to take place, but there hasn't been one for many years. So really, I think whether you're um, a lawyer or a doctor, you know the first step to solving a problem is to diagnose it correctly, right? And this is not a conflict between equal parties, right? This is a um, you know an entire system engineered to ensure the domination of one people over another. We need to call a spade a spade. The problem at root is about apartheid and persecution 
against millions of Palestinians. We need to recognize that and take the steps to end that. At the very same time, that human rights approach needs to be consistent. So whether it's abuse by the Israeli government, whether it's a Palestinian authority, whether it's Hamas authorities, we need to call out human rights abuse clearly and unequivocally when it takes place. And we need to call for accountability regardless of the perpetrator and where there's any forms of complicity, whether it's provision of weapons, you know, whether it's uh, I mean, bilateral agreements, we need to be clear that we should uh, avoid all forms of complicity in these crimes because ultimately we've seen this uh, really tragic pattern that involves the killing of civilians take place for too many times on loop for years. It'll continue unless we address these root causes. All right, Israel Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch, Omar Shakir. Omar, thank you. Thank you. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll be right back with more after the break. Whenever news breaks. To crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The U.S. is responding to the war in the Middle East as President Biden pledges his support for Israel and warns its adversaries not to take advantage after a surprise attack by Hamas over the weekend. The U.S. is also ramping up security after the attacks. ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers and ABC News senior investigative reporter Aaron Kuturski join me now for more. Karen, an NSC official says at least nine Americans were killed in Israel. What do we know about that? Diane, we don't know more details about who those nine Americans are and how and where they were killed. But administration officials are warning that that number could rise as more is discovered. Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer was on ABC's Good Morning America this morning and said that they're doing everything they can to support those families and be in touch with them and get them what they need during this difficult time. Another thing that they're very closely watching right now is whether any Americans had been kidnapped and taken into Gaza. John Finer did not have details on that, but said it's something they're watching very closely. Aaron, what are law enforcement officials saying in terms of concerns about attacks here? They're really concerned. Uh, law enforcement officials immediately after the, the, the war began and the attacks unfolded started deploying police officers to sensitive locations, synagogues and mosques, government and cultural institutions from uh, both the Israeli and Palestinian sides that are in the United States and other sites that could be considered 
uh, potential targets. I was out this morning at the Israeli consulate. Two uh, police officers, marked pa uh, patrol cars, were, were sitting right there in front of it because these will be places where protesters could gather, but they could also be places where uh, people would do harm. And there's a fear of lone actors trying to take inspiration from what they see is going on overseas, but also organized groups maybe also looking to capitalize. And Karen, the administration says it's too soon to know if Iran played a formal role in this Hamas attack. But Secretary Blinken says Hamas wouldn't be Hamas without the support it gets from Iran. So how do you go about unpacking Iran's role here and why is that so important? Yeah, it's important to know that the White House right now is saying that it does not have direct information that shows Iranian involvement in the ordering or planning of this Hamas attack. But a senior administration official had said over the weekend to reporters, Hamas is funded, equipped, and armed by Iran. So they're also not holding back from pointing a little bit of blame in that direction, but still officially saying there is nothing right now directly indicating Iranian involvement. John Feiner, that national security advisor, did say this morning that there is is broad complicity, but no direct evidence right now or direct support. And he said that's something the Israeli government continues to say, too. So in signaling that the U.S. and Israel are in lockstep on how they're approaching this. But very important that they are not confirming right now that Iran was behind this, but almost saying, look, in the past, we have seen what Iran has done, given and supported for Hamas. And this is something that they have to keep exploring right now. And Aaron, a new assessment from the NYPD obtained by ABC News says the attacks against Israel will likely result in additional reciprocal acts of targeted violence and will be heavily exploited in violent extremist propaganda. What does that mean? What do you make of that? It means the images that we've all been seeing on our screens, whether the, the smoke rising from Gaza or, or the, the torturous aftermath of, of kidnappings and hostage takings in Israel, those images could inspire people who would do harm and and whether they become radicalized by them or whether they see something of themselves in them and and in this fight that's really worrying to law enforcement because it's those lone actors that they have the the most difficulty in tracking uh, it also quite uh, means quite frankly that you know the, the a country that was already grappling with an uptick in anti-semitic attacks and hate crimes overall the fear now from the NYPD assessment that we obtained is that this is only going to make that worse. Uh, Karen, the president spoke several times with Prime Minister Netanyahu. The White House also reached out to other leaders in the region. They're trying to figure out a way to contain this violence, to de-escalate this. What do we know about those conversations? Yeah, the president spoke both Saturday and Sunday with the Israeli prime minister and promised that he would be in very close contact with his uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu going forward. And the White House is making it very clear that the U.S. stands with Israel, that the Israelis have the right to defend themselves and their people, and that is something the president conveyed in those conversations with the prime minister. But in terms of that outreach to other countries in the region and partners in Europe, this is all about trying to contain this violence, big concerns about this spreading beyond Israel at this point and what that means for regional regional stability that's a big concern for the administration the president said he talked personally with the king of jordan on saturday and has tasked his senior national security team to be in touch with top leaders in all of the countries around israel but this is something that they are very concerned about and uh, the president will continue that engagement as he said with the prime minister very closely all right abc news white house correspondent karen travers and abc news senior investigative reporter aaron katursky thank you both Meanwhile, the House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until they elect a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. ABC's Jay O'Brien and ABC News political director Rick Klein join me now for more. Jay, what does this lack of a speaker of the House and this gridlock on Capitol Hill mean for Israel right now? Well, the House floor is really paralyzed until you can elect a speaker. There are some parliamentary disagreements on what you can and can't do with a temporary speaker of the House, which is what we have right now. But the reality is both parties are acknowledging not much can get done, not really anything could get done without a House speaker. And that means that the, if the administration were to call on Congress or if Congress were to think itself necessary to pass a supplemental military aid package for Israel because of what 
what's transpiring there. They could not pass that through the House until there is a House Speaker. They can't pass, as you said, anything off the House floor. It's not stopping members of Congress from weighing in, vocalizing their support for Israel. Former Speaker Kevin McCarthy is speaking right now, this morning, about what he believes should be done to help Israel. But the reality is until there is a new Speaker, you can't pass anything off the floor. So how soon could we see the House elect a new speaker? Well, the stated goal from Republicans has been they want to get this done this week. They have a conference meeting tonight, a meeting of all House Republicans this evening. Then they're going to hear from their speaker candidates tomorrow in a candidate forum. And the hope some Republicans tell me is that they're voting Wednesday, maybe Thursday. They want to try to settle this behind closed doors and not slug it out on the House floor like Kevin McCarthy encountered in January. But the reality is Republicans still have a lot of coalescing around a speaker candidate to do before they can settle it behind closed doors. There are two declared candidates right now. Steve Scalise, the number two Republican in the House, and Jim Jordan both have a slate of endorsements, but neither have a clear path right now to the 218 votes they would need to be the Republican speaker. Rick, Republicans are blaming the Biden administration in part for releasing $6 billion to the country in exchange for five U.S. citizens who were released. Uh, but the administration says no money in that account has been spent so far. What do you make of that? Well, and to be clear, this is Iranian money that was held in South Korean accounts. It had been frozen uh, because of international diplomatic uh, tie-ups, and it was the, the part of the agreement that the Biden administration reached to release these Americans who were being wrongly detained in Iran was to allow this money to be released back to the Iranians for humanitarian purposes. Now, the broader question of whether the, the, the Biden administration's uh, stance on Iran may have emboldened Iran and allowed them to support uh, th this attack um, and, and they are the Iranian regime is, is cheering the attack, we should be clear, is separate from the specific and wrong charge that we've heard from several Republican candidates, including former President Trump, that suggests that U.S. tax dollars are paying the Iranians under the Biden administration. That isn't happening. But the broader critique of Biden as being uh, too cozy with Iran or too amenable to the Iranian uh, demands, um, something that, frankly, a lot of Israeli leaders uh, share a view on, uh, has taken hold in the emerging Republican presidential primary. All right, Jay O'Brien, Rick Klein, thank you both. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll have a look at the day's other top stories as well right after the break. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a Momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting in Philadelphia, I'm Trevor Rault. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. Israel has declared war on Hamas after being bombarded by thousands of rockets. It's being called Israel's 9-11 after a surprise attack by the militant group. We have the latest in just a few minutes, but here are some of the other stories we're following today. The House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until electing a new speaker. That includes possible funding for Israel. A vote for new speaker is expected later this week. At least 2,000 people are reported dead after two earthquakes hit Afghanistan near the border with Iran. Hundreds of people are believed to be trapped in the rubble, but a lack of modern equipment is hampering the rescue efforts. This is one of Afghanistan's deadliest earthquakes in two decades. The western part of Maui has reopened to tourists after the summer's deadly wildfires. That process started Sunday, exactly two months after the fires killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The move is getting mixed reaction as some Maui residents warn tourism could result in wildfire victims being forced out of hotels. And Simone Biles is proving she is still the GOAT. The gymnast star finished the Gymnastics World Championship this weekend with gold for balance beam and floor. She also won gold in the all-around and team competitions and a silver in vault. So far, she's earned a total 37 world and Olympic medals, 37 medals. Big thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story on ABC News Live. First, the war is underway in the Middle East. Israel has announced a total siege of the Gaza Strip after Hamas militants attacked Israel Saturday morning. We're looking live at Gaza City right now, where Israel has cut off all gas, electricity, and water, calling Saturday's attack their 9-11. Right now in Israel, at least 700 people are reported dead, and nearly 500 are reported dead in Gaza. Thousands are reported injured, and Israeli authorities say at least 100 have been taken hostage by Hamas militants. Overnight, Prime Minister Netanyahu launched a major offensive with rockets and tanks, promising that Israel will retaliate with a might President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. The big questions now, how did intelligence fail to detect this attack? Will Israel now send ground forces into Gaza? And was Iran behind the attack? Could this lead to a wider war? ABC News Live has team coverage all day long. We start with World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. 
Britain, the death toll rising here in Israel, as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu now warns this could be a long and difficult war. After a brutal surprise attack, not seen in Israel in 50 years. These terrorists have one goal in mind. It's to slaughter as many civilians as possible. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday, when a complex and highly coordinated attack by the militant group Hamas began an assault by land, sea and air. More than 2,200 rockets firing into Israel, raining down on southern and central cities, with air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. Shortly after, Hamas video showing armed militants storming blockaded areas of the Gaza Strip. Officials say once inside Israeli communities along the border, they started killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the streets, some shot while sitting in their cars. At a music festival in Negev, young concertgoers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert after a Hamas rocket attack. Video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lighting the road. In other towns and villages, families were desperate to barricade themselves inside homes as militants raided their towns, going door to door, looking to kill. And many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. We met a young father, Yoni Asher, whose wife and two young daughters were visiting their grandmother. His wife called him. They were in a safe room in the house when militants got in. The call dropped out. And Yoni had no idea what happened until he saw this video. He says that's his wife, militants covering her head, taking her and his two daughters, who are just two and four. I recognized them immediately, and I saw the video twice. And the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because I melted down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was a nightmare. Prime Minister Netanyahu has declared Israel is at war. More than 700 killed here, including at least four American citizens. The Biden administration warning that number could rise. ABC News speaking with the mother of one of those American victims, 32-year-old Chaim Katzman. We thought at one point that he had been taken hostage, but it turned out that I didn't get official information about exactly what happened. His body was found in his apartment. We understand that he and his neighbor were hiding in a closet, and the neighbor, they found them. And the neighbor was released, a woman, and he was shot immediately. Now his loved ones left grieving, remembering a son, a colleague, a friend. You know, getting so many messages from people who worked with Chaim or who knew him or who met him during their travels and how warm he was, how open. He was very accepting person and very loyal friend, good sense of humor, he took things in stride. And new questions about why Israel's intelligence, long a source of pride here, how did they miss this? The worst assault since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the issue of intelligence with our George Stephanopoulos on this week. We have a very close relationship with uh, Israeli intelligence as well as with the Israeli military, as well as with Israel more broadly. So yes, of course, this is something that they and we will be looking at, but the effort right now has to be in dealing with the aggression from Hamas. To deal with that aggression, Israel now retaliating. Hammering Gaza with airstrikes and cutting off power to certain areas. The Israeli military now saying they've struck more than 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip, releasing this video of one of their strikes. The Palestinian Health Ministry saying more than 400 have been killed, thousands more civilians injured. They made elderly people, children and women scared, this man says. Copies of the Quran were shattered. But with Israel shaken, Tens of thousands of Israeli reservists have now been called up to join the fight. We are recovering, first of all, from the most devastating day in Israeli history. Every single Hamas terrorist that carried this out is going to have to look over their shoulder for the rest of their lives. And this young father is waiting for his wife and two young girls to come home. Uh, how are you staying so strong? I don't know. I guess when you're a parent, you have no choice. 
In fact, we could hear the rocket fire off in the distance just moments ago, a real reminder that this is ongoing. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The defense ministry uh, declaring just moments ago a total siege of the Gaza Strip, no power, no water, no electricity, saying we are dealing with barbaric terrorists and we will act accordingly. Diane. World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. Thank you. And ABC's Inez de la Quattara is also in Tel Aviv. Inez, what's it like there right now? Hey, good morning, Diane. Yeah, an air raid sirens going off in Jerusalem as we speak. That's the second time they've gone off in uh, Jerusalem. They were going off uh, in Ashkelon further south as well and here in Tel Aviv earlier this morning. So fresh rockets being fired at Israel. We heard those sirens earlier, earlier this morning. We were at a missing person center, a center that's been set up close to the uh, international airport here to help families who haven't heard from their loved ones uh, in a couple days, uh, help them find their family members. And as we were there, hoping to talk to some of those families, the air raid sirens did go off and we had to take uh, shelter inside that center with those families. The focus today, I think, is on Gaza. So the IDF is striking Hamas militant targets inside Gaza, but civilians, of course, caught in the uh, crossfire there. We know that uh, entire families were killed overnight during heavy shelling, and today a refugee camp was also hit, the Jabalaya refugee camp, which is the biggest refugee camp in Gaza. At least 50 people were killed, and we are expecting that death toll to rise. The IDF saying they are essentially laying siege to Gaza right now, cutting off fuel, uh, food, and electricity to the region. Hospitals say they are overwhelmed um, and real concerns about what that's going to mean for uh, civilians inside Gaza, Diane. Now, and as Israel Defense Forces say at least 100 people are, are still missing, they're believed to have been taken by Hamas. What's being done to try to find those people? Yeah, so in terms of the hostage situation, we do know that at least 100 Israelis were taken. These are both civilians and members of the military. We've seen those horrific images of, of, of people, you know, with with their wrists, uh, hands tied together, being loaded onto the backs of uh, trucks and, and motorcycles and taken away into the Gaza Strip. Uh, men, women, children, uh, the elderly as well, unclear uh, where they are and what condition uh, they are. Uh, here in Tel Aviv, there was a center that was set up. So this missing uh, person center that I was referring to, we were there this morning uh, trying to talk to some of those families. We spoke to one man who was looking for his cousin who had attended that music festival in southern Israel where uh, uh, th that was stormed by uh, armed Palestinian militants. 260 bodies were recovered at that site. This man had brought a DNA sample. That's what families are being encouraged to do. They're being told to bring things like hairbrushes or toothbrushes um, for officials to, to try and, and find their loved ones. So this man had done that and now he was going to be going to uh, different hospitals. He said every single hospital in Israel to try and find his cousin. We also spoke to, to social workers there. One social worker telling us that in the last 24 hours they had seen uh, a, a close to a thousand families stopping by this center looking for their loved one. They're expecting similar numbers today. Um, and we spoke to, to another social worker who told us a little bit about the process and what they're hearing from families. And here's what he had to say. You need somebody to talk with. Uh, don't be alone and talk, share. So he's encouraging people to come to the center, to, to, to come together. He says they're providing all sorts of assistance there for them, certainly helping with the investigations, but also providing mental health uh, support, Diane. All right, Inez de la Quintara in Tel Aviv. Thanks, Inez. And rescue workers say more than 260 bodies were recovered from a deadly attack at a music festival in southern Israel Saturday. Eyewitness Canadian-Israeli Shai Weinstein said and his friends raced to get away from that festival, making a nail-biting flight to Tel Aviv. And Shai is joining me now for more on this. Shai, first of all, I'm so sorry for what you've had to go through and for what your, you know, your friends and loved ones are going through. Talk me through this, because you say when you first heard the rockets, you thought... That's not so strange living in Israel. So when did you realize that this was different? Um, at some point, the rockets picked up and they just wouldn't stop. And there was a lot. There was rockets from Gaza. There was rockets from the Iron Dome. And at some point, I thought I heard gunfire in the distance. And I told my cousin, but I wasn't sure. And it made me want to pick up when we all 
started going a bit faster. And then uh, we heard it get closer. And we really picked up. And I just wanted us to get out of there as fast as possible. And we got our stuff packed up. We got to the parking lot. We were in the area where everyone had their camps, so to say, where everyone was resting during the festival. So we were already close to the parking lot. And, um, you know, we got there and people are starting to panic more and more. And I just wanted to get out. Uh, we got our stuff in the trunk and I was like, I'll drive. Cause I was, I don't know, me and one friend were less inebriated than the others. So I said, I'll drive and, and you guys can tell me where to go. And everybody was trying to get out and there was so much traffic. I thought maybe we'll wait. And then I thought, this is taking too long. And I decided to go around cars, left and right off the road, back into the line. Maybe it'd be faster. And then I noticed that some cars were empty and people were still waiting behind them, not knowing they're empty. And I told my cousin, these people in front of us are waiting for a dead car. Can you yell at them to move so we can all leave? And he got out and he told them to go to the left. And they did. And we went with them. We drove up the ditch onto the main road. And the police were directing people to a field. And we drove into the field. And at some point, people were fleeing their cars. I don't know if it was on their own or if because police told them to. So there was a combination of people trying to drive away and people getting out of their cars in the middle and running on foot. And that caused people to get stuck. Uh, as we drove into the field, my cousin's girlfriend, she screams and she says, get out of the car, get out of the car. And we all I'll get out and we started running and I grabbed my friend and we ran into the field and we ducked down because there was gunfire. And my cousin ran back to the car and we were all freaked out. And he grabbed the car and he brought it back to us. And we all got in and we started driving through the field. And we initially didn't know where to go. We couldn't see where to go. Just the dirt everywhere, dust. We couldn't see, we couldn't breathe. Our mouths were dry. Um, Shai, you say that you only slowed down. Shai, you say you only slowed down for checkpoints and and bodies. Can you walk me through that last that last portion of it and how so you finally got we, out? After we, after we got into the field, I spotted up on the ridge, there was like, farms or something or a grove and they thought it was a service road so i pointed us towards that and we went there and that's what it was and we took the service road and a few other cars out east and then north towards tel aviv and as we're driving on the roads we see abandoned cars we see cars with bullet holes in them we see bodies on the road uh, at some point we drove through combat there were soldiers or police, I don't remember if it was one or the other, in the road with their guns out and they're pointing towards the right and they had their guns out and there was dead soldiers on the ground and some of their cars had bullet holes in them. And we didn't want to wait there. Initially we backed up to get away from them so we wouldn't get shot. But at some point we drove through it all and we kept going not slowing down except for other checkpoints. Well, Shai, I'm so glad and that you did 
get out safely. This whole thing sounds harrowing. I appreciate you coming on it and telling your story to us today. I know this is something that's going to affect you for a while, but we're glad you got out safely and, and wishing you and your loved ones uh, the best and so much strength right now. Thank you. Shai, thank you. And do stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll be right back with more after the break. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live this week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. She's the Mormon momfluencer whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse. And all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back. You're looking live at Gaza, where it appears more strikes are happening as we see large plumes of black smoke in the sky. I want to go to ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang and ABC News contributor, former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Lieutenant Doug Lute, for more on the war now underway. Selena, an NSC official confirms at least nine Americans were killed in the attacks in Israel. What do we know about that? Well, Diane, the U.S. officials say they can confirm the death of nine American citizens, but they cannot pinpoint the exact number of Americans who may be missing or may have been taken hostage. The U.S. State Department says that number is constantly moving, but they are in close contact with Israeli authorities to try and gather more information. This, Diane, as President Biden has pledged that rock-solid support to Israel. Already, the U.S. is sending an aircraft carrier strike group towards Israeli waters, as well as sending more military equipment and fighter jets. This is an 
show of support to Israel and as a warning to others not to get involved. We've seen the Biden administration in a flurry of contact over this weekend with Israeli leadership as well as Palestinian leadership and with other leaders in the region to try and prevent this from turning into a broader war. This already shaping up to be one of the toughest geopolitical situations of the Biden presidency. Key questions here around Israeli intelligence failures here and whether U.S. intelligence failed to pick up any indications. Uh, General Lute, the U.S. is sending an aircraft carrier strike group toward Israeli waters to show support. What's the strategy there? Well, I think the, the repositioning of this naval task force uh, into the eastern Mediterranean Sea has really two purposes. First of all, symbolically, to provide support to our closest ally in the region, Israel, at a time when it is stressed uh, like no other time in the last 50 years. So symbolic support. I don't expect direct military intervention or direct military support to Israel. Uh, the Israeli Air Force, for example, is more than capable uh, of dealing with uh, Hamas. The second purpose, though, I think is a little more subtle, and that is to provide a deterrence message um, to others who may be uh, potentially interested or see an opportunity to join this conflict and the message is essentially, uh, let's contain this conflict inside Israel, and in particular, uh, between Israel and Hamas. And General, while the administration says it's too soon to know if Iran played a formal role in this Hamas attack, officials say it's unimaginable that Iran didn't have some influence. Secretary Blinken says Hamas wouldn't be Hamas without the support it gets from Iran. So how do you go about unpacking Iran's role here, and why is that so important? Well, I, I agree that Iran is Hamas's lifeline uh, in terms of military support, economic assistance, uh, and so forth. The scale and the complexity of this attack on Israel over the last several days certainly suggests outside support to Hamas, and outside support leads directly uh, to Iran. All right, ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, ABC News contributor, former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Lieutenant General Doug Lute. Thank you both. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We have a look at the day's other top stories after the break. She's the Mormon momfluencer whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then the 911 call. I just had a 12 year old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrands, and I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. 
I wasn't fast enough. On November 22, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Israel is at war after being bombarded by thousands of rockets. It's being called Israel's 9-11 after a surprise attack by the militant group Hamas. We'll have the latest in just a few minutes, but here are some of the other stories we're following today. The House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until they elect a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. A vote for new speaker is expected later this week. At least 2,000 people are dead after two earthquakes hit Afghanistan near the border with Iran. Hundreds of people are believed to be trapped in the rubble, but a lack of modern equipment is hampering the rescue efforts. This is one of Afghanistan's deadliest earthquakes in two decades. The western part of Maui has reopened to tourists after the summer's deadly wildfires. That process started Sunday, exactly two months after the fires killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The move's getting mixed reaction as some Maui residents warn tourism could result in wildfire victims being forced out of hotels. And Simone Biles is still the GOAT. The star gymnast finished the Gymnastics World Championships this weekend with gold in balance beam and floor. She also won gold in all-around and team competitions and a silver in vault. So far, she's earned a total of 37 World and Olympic medals. Big congratulations to Simone, and thanks to you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. tomorrow. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> That's a good way to start. I like it. Robin Roberts with Lionel Richie back in their hometown, Tuskegee, Alabama. What's it like for you to be back? Visiting the sites of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, including Robin's father and seeing Robin's first home. That's where I came home from the hospital. It's Robin, Lionel, and a personal American Idol hometown tour like no other. No place like home. Good morning, America, tomorrow. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania, I'm ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story on ABC News Live first. A war is underway in the Middle East. Plumes of smoke are filling the night sky in Gaza after hours of strikes. This comes after Israel declared war on Hamas in response to a massive attack on Israeli civilians over the weekend. So far, at least 700 are reported dead in Israel, including at least nine Americans, and nearly 500 are reported dead in Gaza. A spokesperson for Israel Defense Forces tells me the Hamas attack was unprecedented and, quote, it will be followed by an unprecedented Israeli response. And it looks like we're starting to see that now. We have team coverage all day long, starting with Inez de la Quattara in Tel Aviv. Inez, what's the latest? Hey, Diane. Yeah, so the focus today has really been on Gaza. Fresh strikes on Gaza throughout the day, throughout the night. Heavy shelling wiping out entire families. We know at least five mosques were targeted and destroyed. Uh, a hospital, we're just learning, has also been struck and is now out of service. This is hospitals there are overwhelmed. The uh, Gaza Strip's largest refugee camp also struck today. At least 50 people killed in that one strike. The death toll rising. We are now at uh, over 500. 160 Palestinians killed in these strikes, 2,900 injured at least. So uh, some real concerns there for the civilian population inside Gaza. This is we see the Israeli military laying siege to Gaza. The Israel's defense minister is saying they are cutting off all fuel, food and electricity supplies to the region. Lots of questions as to what's next for Gaza, whether the Israeli military will decide to uh, go in with a, a ground offensive. We have seen the IDF start to clear out uh, communities, uh, Israeli communities near the Gaza border. They are evacuating Israeli families there. We know that 15 of 24 Israeli communities in the south have been evacuated. Unclear why, uh, but certainly raising questions as to whether a ground offensive could be next, even as some of Israel's uh, neighbors are warning Israel against doing that. Uh, there are also reports that Israeli soldiers were attacked on the Lebanon border. What do you know about that? That's right. Yeah, that is uh, new as of just a, a few moments ago. So we're waiting to get some more information there. But we are learning of more infiltrations from the north. So people coming in from Lebanon. It's unclear if these were other Hamas militants, if they could have been Hezbollah militants. We just don't know at, the, at this point. But um, concerns there, fresh concerns on the northern border. That's part of the challenge here. The, the Israeli military cannot put all of its resources uh, towards Gaza because of other hotspots. Um, they, they need to make sure they, they have the situation under control in the the north as well. All right. And as Dela Quattara in Tel Aviv, thank you. And ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers joins me now for more. Karen, President Biden is pledging support to Israel, but Congress still needs to elect a Speaker of the House before they can do anything. So how much does that limit the White House right now? Yeah, that could complicate things in terms of big support going forward, but the White House does have things that they can work with. They can tap into existing stockpiles from the military. That's something we saw announced over the weekend when the Pentagon said that they would be sending things to the Israeli Defense Forces, including munitions. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said that would happen starting yesterday, and those supplies are expected to arrive at some point in the next couple of days for Israel to use. But there is chaos on Capitol Hill right now, as Republicans still have not moved forward to elect a speaker. They're going to begin that process, of course, this week with the contenders fighting for that job. But in terms of passing legislation that would be a big supplemental aid package, it seems like everything would be frozen right now on Capitol Hill until they can sort out the leadership situation. Now, Karen, an NSC official says that at least nine Americans were killed in Israel. What's the latest on that and other Americans still there? We do not know yet who those nine Americans are, Diane, or how and where they were killed. But the White House did confirm that right now they know of nine American citizens who have lost their lives. And officials have warned that number is likely to go up. We heard from the Deputy National Security Advisor, John Finer, today on Good Morning America, who said that the White House is going to do everything they can to support those families. They're in close contact with them. But they're also paying very close attention and are very concerned about Americans who might have been kidnapped and brought into Gaza. No details on the numbers of that right now, but that is something they're very closely tracking to try and find out. Now, Karen, the president spoke several times with Prime Minister Netanyahu. The White House also reached out to other leaders in the region. What are you hearing about those conversations? Yeah, for the president to reach out to Netanyahu, this was all about showing U.S. support for Israel. Diane, after he talked to him for the first time on Saturday, the president made very brief remarks, and it was notable how he said repeatedly that phrase, the U.S. stands with Israel. He said he made it very clear to Netanyahu that the administration's support for Israel's security is rock solid and that whatever 
certain Netanyahu needs to support their military and to support their people, the United States would be there. In terms of the outreach to other countries and partners in the region, the president said he had spoken directly with the King of Jordan on Saturday and that he's tasked his national security team to be in touch with leaders from countries like Egypt and the UAE and Qatar and Saudi Arabia. This is all about stability in the region with concerns that the violence in Israel could spill over. And President Biden is also warning Israel's enemies not to take advantage of the situation. Are there specific adversaries he's concerned about? Yeah, this was a striking comment from the president the other day when he spoke on Saturday by saying that actors who are hostile to Israel, countries or organizations, should not take advantage of this situation. The message there is very clear. This is about Iran. And the big question today, Diane, is what was Iran's involvement in this Hamas attack? The White House says that they right now do not have any direct information that shows Iranian involvement in ordering or planning this attack. But as a senior administration official said over the weekend, Hamas has funded, equipped, and armed Iran. They have been funded and armed and equipped by Iran in the past before. Uh, but in terms of right now direct evidence, John Finer, the deputy national security advisor, said there is broad complicity, but no evidence of direct support. All right, ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers, thank you. And ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez joins me now for more, along with ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy. Louis, there's an extensive history here. What have relations been like uh, in this area as of recent? Were there any signs that this was coming? It's unclear if they, one could say direct signs that this was about to happen, Diane. Um, but we have seen some tensions building in the West Bank. Uh, that's an area controlled by the Palestinian Authority, not by Hamas, which controls Gaza. Um, but what we've seen is the, some militant groups, uh, lots of activity there over the last year or so. And the Israeli military has gone there in force at various times in actions that they say are intended to protect Israeli settlers in the area. Um, so we've seen those tensions. And of course, we've seen the 16-year blockade of uh, Gaza uh, ever since Hamas came to power back in 2006. And that whole situation is essentially a blockade intended to prevent the flow of arms into, into specifically into Hamas. Um, and But what we've seen is that over that time, there's been ups and downs in terms of what is allowed through and sometimes food and other supplies are cut off. And you see the, uh, the discussion that there's a humanitarian crisis that has developed over time inside of uh, Gaza. Um, and so, so there's been some mild support, if you will say, about the, the, the latest actions of Hamas uh, striking into Israel. And uh, it's justification, one could say, about this 16-year blockade. Mick, this area is no stranger to conflict and fighting, uh, but how is this attack different? Because these fights don't normally end with a declaration of war. Well, that's true, Diane. We haven't seen a rocket filed from Gaza by Hamas in over two years. So that's one of the reasons why I think this was such a surprise uh, to the Israelis. So this is very substantial. The Israelis haven't seen an attack like this really since 1973 and the beginning of the Yom Kippur War. And many analysts would say this is far more significant. Uh, it's going to uh, change the, the dynamics inside Israel. And I think we'll see in the next coming weeks a substantial reaction uh, to this attack. Louis, the leader of Hamas's military wing said the assault was in response to the blockade of Gaza. But that's been going on for over a decade. So why now? It's a, it's a really good question, Diane. Again, the blockade, is that really the the, the big trigger for this? Uh, was it the West Bank activity uh, by, by the Israeli military against Palestinian factions uh, inside the West Bank? Uh, or was it even potentially Iran directing uh, this activity? And because Hamas is fully funded and supplied by Iran, were they trying to uh, distract attention from the potential diplomatic uh, relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel? Uh, we've been asking that question, and we uh, officials tell us that they have seen no evidence to corroborate that right now. But that's something that rose up as part of the speculation over the weekend. Uh, so the immediate trigger, one really can't say. Um, but what we do know is that this was a heavily complex uh, attack um, and must have taken a lot of time. And as we can tell, a lot of people knew about this, because if a 1,000 Hamas militants were able to cross the border from, Hamas, 
from Gaza uh, into Israeli territory and carry out these terror attacks. Um, a lot of people knew, and the operational security must have been very tight because it looks like Israeli intelligence was caught blindsided here. Now, Mick, this attack happened almost exactly on the 15th anniversary of the Arab-Israeli conflict. How significant is that? So I think it's significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's going to add to the fact that this was uh, an intelligence failure. Uh, they they would have should have added that into the calculation of something happening. Certainly, this complexity of an operation, something should have came out of Gaza, either the human intelligence or signalist intelligence, that indicated it was going to happen. Perhaps uh, the Israelis are relying too much on signalist intelligence, and the Hamas operative have gotten very smart in using operational. Uh, tradecraft to avoid that. That's something that will have to be determined later. Uh, but right now, I think that's what's going to be looked at is just how so much of this was missed and how such a large operation uh, could have happened right under the noses of some of the best intelligence services in the world. And Mick, we're watching live images right now. You can see lights coming through the sky, presuming more, more airstrikes appear to be underway there incredible images. They're looking at the night sky over the Gaza Strip. Uh, Mick, quickly, you talked about the intelligence failure here. Uh, this is obviously an indictment on the Israeli intelligence community, but what does it say about the U.S. intelligence community? Well, so that's a good point, Diane. This isn't, this, the intelligence collection isn't only done by Israeli. The Shin Bet is their, uh, uh, is their domestic service. It's also done by many intelligence services around the world, including my old group, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. So I think all are going to be looking at how this was missed, how something this substantial, a air, ground, and sea attack, 2,000-plus uh, missiles launched, uh, denial of service technical devices used inside Israel per reporting. These are all things that should have been picked up on. Whether Iran was involved, I think the intelligence community will come up with that assessment. There certainly are indicators, but I think it's going to be up to the intelligence community uh, who's in the best position to determine this uh, going forward, how uh, specifically they were involved, if they were. But to Louis's point, they have been historically involved in Hamas for a long period of time. They fund about 90 percent of their military budget. Uh, and that is something that I think they'll take into consideration. And, and Louis, we're seeing more explosions in Gaza right now. That's a live image of, the Ga of, of Gaza, the night sky there. L Louis, talk us through, what are you hearing about what's happening? Well, we know that the significant number of Israeli airstrikes are underway inside of Gaza, and they have been for the last few hours. Uh, we saw those reports about 130 airstrikes over the last three hours at that time frame. That was just a short time ago. And you can see from these live images that they are continuing. Those flashes that you're seeing are the ground impacts of air-to-ground missiles either being launched by drones or either being launched by manned aircraft into the Gaza area. Um, when you see that kind of imagery, over over uh, Israel, what you were seeing was the Iron Dome impacts intercepting uh, those uh, m missiles being fired by Hamas. But in this case, what you're seeing is the ground impacts and potentially if, let's say, there are munitions in these areas, you're going to get what's called a secondary impact, a secondary explosion. And that's, a, what, that's what causes like these giant fireballs in the night sky. All right, ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy, thank you. And earlier today, I spoke with Omar Shakir, the Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch. For more on this, here's what he had to say about the war. You, know, you and your organization have said there's no justification for the deliberate killings of civilians and hostage taking uh, after this weekend's attack. But you also say these events may keep happening if human rights are disregarded. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is the bloodshed, you know, did not start yesterday. We need to be unequivocal that hostage taking, deliberate killings of civilians are heinous crimes that have no justification. Um, so I think we need to say that outright. But I think there has been a perception that this is something that began yesterday. And there is there hasn't really been a recognition that Palestinians in Gaza have been, as your colleagues noted a minute ago, have been living under a closure for more than 16 years, including a generalized 
ban on travel. So 2.2 million people um, unlawfully caged in a 25 by seven mile territory, not able to leave outside of narrow exemptions. And of course, many of them, the majority of the population are themselves refugees, generations of refugees, not able to return to their homes. They've been under an occupation for more than 50 years. There have been rounds of escalations that have wiped out entire families, reduced residential buildings into rubble. So the idea is to understand that, uh, you know, that there is a context that what happened for, of course, Israeli families is unprecedented. It is awful. It is it is not justified by, by any context. Palestinians have also been facing unspeakable bloodshed and crimes that go back not days and weeks or months and not even years, but decades. Now, we're seeing new Israeli attacks in Gaza right now, and Israel has cut gas, electricity and water there. So what's it like right now in Gaza? The situation in Gaza is harrowing. Um, you know, you have families going to sleep soon that aren't sure if they're going to see the sun again because these strikes, there's nowhere to flee. There are no shelters. There's nowhere you can go. Uh, families have a few hours of electricity a day. Uh, we regularly hear the terror. You know, um, we, when we talk to people in Gaza, you hear the bombs going off in the background. We see images uh, on the screen of, of, of that. And, you know, you, you know that you could be targeted at any time, anywhere. Many families have their life possessions in a suitcase, knowing that they might have only a couple of minutes to, um, you know, survive an airstrike. Um, electricity, water, food. You have to understand that Israel maintains control over virtually every aspect of everyday life. And the statements, including today, coming out of the defense minister, saying, I mean, that is a call to commit a war crime. To say that no food, no water, no electricity. This is a strategy to starve the population. It is unlawful, and it is a reminder of why the International Criminal Court should accelerate their uh, investigation into serious crimes being committed. Palestinians face a reality of apartheid, of persecution. That needs to end, and there needs to be accountability for abuses by uh, all parties here. Uh, what can the international community do to help civilians in this conflict? Because I'm sure we could bring on many of guests that would refute some of what you're saying and you guys could have a whole political debate. But one thing I think everyone can agree on is civilians stuck in this conflict. Nobody wants to see that. Look, this is not about politics. I agree, and this is not about uh, you know you know we all want a political process to take place, but there hasn't been one for many years. So really, I think whether you're um, a lawyer or a doctor, you know the first step to solving a problem is to diagnose it correctly, right? And this is not a conflict between equal parties, right? This is a um, you know an entire system engineered to ensure the domination of one people over another. We need to call a spade a spade. The problem at root is about apartheid and persecution against millions of Palestinians. We need to recognize that and take the steps to end that at the very same time that human rights approach needs to be consistent. So whether it's abuse by the Israeli government, whether it's the Palestinian Authority, whether it's Hamas authorities, we need to call out human rights abuse clearly and unequivocally when it takes place. And we need to call for accountability regardless of the perpetrator and where there's any forms of complicity, whether it's provision of weapons, you know, whether it's uh, I mean, bilateral agreements, we need to be clear that we should uh, avoid all forms of complicity in these crimes because ultimately we've seen this uh, really tragic pattern that involves the killing of civilians take place for too many times on loop for years. It'll continue unless we address these root causes. All right, Israel Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch, Omar Shakir. Omar, thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, the House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until they elect a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill for more. Jay, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy just held a press conference on Capitol Hill to address that conflict in Israel. He's announcing a five-point plan. Let's listen to that. understands. We should supply and make sure that there's no question and no doubt that Israel will never be overwhelmed when it comes to ammunition. That if they decide to send the precision guided missiles, that they will be knocked down. We should send no doubt to anyone that holds an American citizen that we will not leave without them. This will not be Afghanistan. We will not allow this administration to do this again. But Jay, the House can't do anything without a new speaker, so what now? 
Yeah, and there isn't a speaker right now, Diane. So that's the former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, really stepping into this leadership vacuum at the moment. You can't pass anything off the House floor without a speaker. So if the president asked for it, if Congress deemed it necessary, or if Israel asked for it, you couldn't pass right now in the current situation in the House without a speaker any kind of military aid package from the U.S. to Israel. And the former speaker pointed that out. It also comes at a time that a number of Republicans here on Capitol Hill, particularly moderates who are upset that the fact that McCarthy got booted out of his job last week in the first place, are calling for the former speaker to return because of his, A, because there's a power vacuum, but B, because of his support of Israel over the years. He addressed the Israeli Knesset not long ago. He had the Israeli president here. He's got a long-standing history, McCarthy does, of support of Israel, and he made mention of that today. So McCarthy got the question. Would you come back, given the current situation in Israel right now? And McCarthy, notably, didn't say no. Instead, he said, that's up to the conference. It's up to House Republicans, essentially, to decide. Well, House Republicans are going to make that decision in the next few days. They've got a meeting tonight, and they're going to hear from their speaker candidates tomorrow. All right, Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll be right back with more after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. The New York Stock Exchange held a moment of silence ahead of the opening bell today to honor the victims of the attacks in Israel. Those attacks are having impacts around the world, including on the economy. Oil prices are already rising. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus joins me now for more on this. Alexis, Big picture here, what does this mean for the economy? This just adds another layer of uncertainty for global economic growth. Remember, global economies are still dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic. They're still dealing with the current war in Ukraine and, of course, an overall slowdown because of high inflation worldwide. So this, um, it, you know, is now a huge question mark for investors going forward. And we're seeing how they're reacting uh, today, which is their first response to the attack over the weekend. U.S. stocks were lower, not dramatically lower, but they're was a sell-off. Oil up about 3.5%. I thought perhaps we'd even see a larger rally there. And we're also seeing investors running to the relative safety of gold and the U.S. dollar, which is perceived as safe havens during these times. Now, the Middle East is oil rich. We're seeing prices jump on that right now. Are there other concerns in terms of economic impact and assets? It all depends on how long this war lasts, uh, how intense it gets, and whether or not it is no longer contained between Israel and Hamas. Does this spread to other regions of the area, including Iran? There are unsubstantiated reports that Iran was behind this attack. If the U.S. is able to confirm that, the U.S. may enforce tougher sanctions against Iranian oil, taking some of their oil off the market. We could see a big spike in the price of oil, and we know that that's inflationary. And just at, at a time when we were starting to see inflation get under wraps, it could, it could rally once again. In addition to being an oil-rich area, it's also an area that has a lot of important routes, like uh, trading routes. So our supply chains could be impacted. The Suez Canal, the Straits of Hormuz, all in that region. Uh, we could see disruption there, and we could see a big impact in worldwide supply chains. All right. ABC Business reporter Alexis Christophorus. Thanks, Alexis. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll also have a look at the day's other top stories right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Hiroshima, I'm Brett Klenick. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Israel is at war after being bombarded by thousands of rockets. It's being called Israel's 9-11 after a surprise attack by the militant group Hamas. We'll have the latest in just a few minutes, but here are some of the other stories we're following today. The House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until they elect a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. A vote for new speaker is expected later this week. At least 2,000 people are dead after two earthquakes hit Afghanistan near the border with Iran. Hundreds of people are believed to be trapped in the rubble, but a lack of modern equipment is hampering the rescue efforts. This is one of Afghanistan's deadliest earthquakes in two decades. The western part of Maui has reopened to tourists after the summer's deadly wildfires. The process started Sunday, exactly two months after the fires killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The move's getting mixed reaction as some Maui residents warn tourism could result in wildfire victims being forced out of hotels. And Simone Biles is still the GOAT. The star gymnast finished the Gymnastics World Championships this weekend with gold in balance beam and floor. She also won gold in all-around and team competitions and a silver in vault. So far, she's earned a total of 37 World and Olympic medals. Big congratulations to Simone, and thanks to you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story on ABC News Live first. A war is underway in the Middle East. Plumes of smoke are filling the night sky in Gaza after hours of strikes. This comes after Israel declared war on Hamas in response to a massive attack on Israeli civilians over the weekend. So far, at least 700 are reported dead in Israel, including at least nine Americans, and nearly 500 are reported dead in Gaza. A spokesperson for Israel Defense Forces tells me the Hamas attack was unprecedented and, quote, it will be followed by an unprecedented Israeli response. And it looks like we're starting to see that now. We have team coverage all day long, starting with Inez de la Quattara in Tel Aviv. Inez, what's the latest? Hey, Diane. Yeah, so the focus today has really been on Gaza. Fresh strikes on Gaza throughout the day, throughout the night. Heavy shelling wiping out entire families. We know at least five mosques were targeted and destroyed. Uh, a hospital, we're just learning, has also been struck and is now out of service. This is hospitals there are overwhelmed. The uh, Gaza Strip's largest refugee camp also struck today. At least 50 people killed in that one strike. The death toll rising. We are now at uh, over five. 560 Palestinians killed in these strikes, 2,900 injured at least. So uh, some real concerns there for the civilian population inside Gaza. This is we see the Israeli military laying siege to Gaza. The Israel's defense minister is saying they are cutting off all fuel, food and electricity supplies to the region. Lots of questions as to what's next for Gaza, whether the Israeli military will decide to uh, go in with a, a ground offensive. We have seen the IDF start to clear out uh, communities, uh, Israeli communities near the Gaza border. They are evacuating Israeli families there. We know that 15 of 24 Israeli communities in the south have been evacuated. Unclear why, uh, but certainly raising questions as to whether a ground offensive could be next, even as some of Israel's uh, neighbors are warning Israel against doing that. Uh, there are also reports that Israeli soldiers were attacked on the Lebanon border. What do you know about that? That's right. Yeah, that is uh, new as of just a, a few moments ago. So we're waiting to get some more information there. But we are learning of more infiltrations from the north. So people coming in from Lebanon. It's unclear if these were other Hamas militants, if they could have been Hezbollah militants. We just don't know at, the, at this point. But um, concerns there, fresh concerns on the northern border. That's part of the challenge here. The, the Israeli military cannot put all of its resources uh, towards Gaza because of other hotspots. Um, they, they need to make sure they, they have the situation under control in the north as well. All right. Inez de la Quattara in Tel Aviv. Thank you. And ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers joins me now for more. Karen, President Biden is pledging support to Israel, but Congress still needs to elect a Speaker of the House before they can do anything. So how much does that limit the White House right now? Yeah, that could complicate things in terms of big support going forward, but the White House does have things that they can work with. They can tap into existing stockpiles from the military. That's something we saw announced over the weekend when the Pentagon said that they would be sending things to the Israeli Defense Forces, including munitions. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said that would happen starting yesterday, and those supplies are expected to arrive at some point in the next couple of days for Israel to use. But there is chaos on Capitol Hill right now, as Republicans still have not moved forward forward to elect a speaker. They're going to begin that process, of course, this week with the contenders fighting for that job. But in terms of passing legislation that would be a big supplemental aid package, it seems like everything would be frozen right now on Capitol Hill until they can sort out the leadership situation. Now, Karen, an NSC official says that at least nine Americans were killed in Israel. What's the latest on that and other Americans still there? 
We do not know yet who those nine Americans are, Diane, or how and where they were killed. But the White House did confirm that right now they know of nine American citizens who have lost their lives. And officials have warned that number is likely to go up. We heard from the Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer today on Good Morning America, who said that the White House is going to do everything they can to support those families. They're in close contact with them, but they're also paying very close attention and are very concerned about Americans who might have been kidnapped and brought into Gaza. No details on the numbers of that right now, but that is something they're very closely tracking to try and find out. Now, Karen, the president spoke several times with Prime Minister Netanyahu. The White House also reached out to other leaders in the region. What are you hearing about those conversations? Yeah, for the president to reach out to Netanyahu, this was all about showing U.S. support for Israel. Diane, after he talked to him for the first time on Saturday, the president made very brief remarks, and it was notable how he said repeatedly that phrase, the U.S. stands with Israel. He said he made it very clear to Netanyahu that the administration's support for Israel's security is rock solid and that whatever Netanyahu needs to support their military and to support their people, the United States would be there. In terms of the outreach to other countries and partners in the region, the president said he had spoken directly with the King of Jordan on Saturday and that he's tasked his national security team to be in touch with leaders from countries like Egypt and the UAE and Qatar and Saudi Arabia. This is all about stability in the region with concerns that the violence in Israel could spill over. And President Biden is also warning Israel's enemies not to take advantage of the situation. Are there specific adversaries he's concerned about? Yeah, this was a striking comment from the president the other day when he spoke on Saturday by saying that actors who are hostile to Israel, countries or organizations, should not take advantage of this situation. The message there is very clear. This is about Iran. And the big question today, Diane, is what was Iran's involvement in this Hamas attack? The White House says that they right now do not have any direct information that shows Iranian involvement in ordering or planning this attack. But as a senior administration official said, over the weekend, Hamas has funded, equipped, and armed Iran. They have been funded and armed and equipped by Iran in the past before. Uh, but in terms of right now direct evidence, John Finer, the deputy national security advisor, said there is broad complicity, but no evidence of direct support. All right, ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers, thank you. And ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez joins me now for more along with ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy. Louis, there's an extensive history here. What have relations been like uh, in this area as of recent? Were there any signs that this was coming? It's unclear if they, one could say direct signs that this was about to happen, Diane. Um, but we have seen some tensions building in the West Bank. Uh, that's an area controlled by the Palestinian Authority, not by Hamas, which controls Gaza. Um, but what we've seen is the, some militant groups, uh, lots of activity there over the last year or so. And the Israeli military has gone there in force at uh, various times in actions that they say are intended to protect Israeli settlers in the area. Um, so we've seen those tensions. And of course, we've seen the 16-year blockade of uh, Gaza. Uh, ever since Hamas came to power back in 2006. And that whole situation is essentially a blockade intended to prevent the flow of arms into, into specifically into Hamas. Um, and But what we've seen is that over that time, there's been ups and downs in terms of what is allowed through and sometimes food and other supplies are cut off. And you see the, the discussion that there's a humanitarian crisis that has developed over time inside of uh, Gaza. Um, and so, so there's been some mild support, if you will say, about the, the, the latest actions of Hamas uh, striking into Israel. And uh, it's justification, one could say, about this 16-year blockade. Mick, this area is no stranger to conflict and fighting, uh, but how is this attack different? Because these fights don't normally end with a declaration of war. Well, that's true, Diane. And we haven't seen a rocket filed from Gaza by Hamas in over two years. So that's one of the reasons why I think this was such a surprise uh, to the Israelis. So this is very substantial. The Israelis haven't seen an attack like this really since 1973 and the beginning of the Yom Kippur War. And many analysts would say this is far more significant. Uh, it's going to uh, change the, the dynamics inside Israel. And I think we'll see in the next coming weeks a substantial reaction uh, to this attack. Louis, the leader of Hamas's military wing said the assault was in response to the blockade of Gaza. But that's been going on for over a decade. So why now? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Diane. Again, the blockade, is that really the the, the big trigger for this? Uh, was it the West Bank activity uh, by, by the Israeli military against Palestinian factions uh, inside the West Bank? Uh, or was it even potentially Iran directing uh, this activity? And because Hamas is fully funded and supplied by Iran, were they trying to uh, distract attention from the potential diplomatic uh, relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel? Uh, we've been asking that question, and we officials tell us that they have seen no evidence to corroborate that right now. But that's something that rose up as part of the speculation over the weekend. Uh, so the immediate trigger, one really can't say. Um, but what we do know is that this was a heavily complex uh, attack um, and must have taken a lot of time. And as we can tell, a lot of people knew about this because if a thousand Hamas militants were able to cross the border from Hamas, from Gaza uh, into Israeli territory and carry out these terror attacks, um, a lot of people knew, and the operational security must have been very tight because it looks like Israeli intelligence was caught blindsided here. Now, Mick, this attack happened almost exactly on the 15th anniversary of the Arab-Israeli conflict. How significant is that? So I think it's significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's going to add to the fact that this was uh, an intelligence failure. Uh, they they would have should have added that into the calculation of something happening. Certainly, this complexity of an operation, something should have came out of Gaza, either the human intelligence or signals intelligence, that indicated it was going to happen. Perhaps uh, the Israelis are relying too much on signals intelligence, and the Hamas operative have gotten very smart in using operational uh, tradecraft to avoid that. That's something that will have to be determined later. Uh, but right now, I think that's what's going to be looked at is just how so much of this was missed and how such a large operation uh, could have happened right under the noses of some of the best intelligence services in the world. Uh, Mick, quickly, you talked about the intelligence failure here. Uh, this is obviously an indictment on the Israeli intelligence community, but what does it say about the U.S. intelligence community? Well, so that's a good point, Diane. This isn't, this, the intelligence collection isn't only done by Israeli the Shin Bet is their uh, uh, is their domestic service. It's also done by many intelligence services around the world, including my old group, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. So I think all are going to be looking at how this was missed, how something this substantial, a air, ground, and sea attack, uh, two thousand plus missiles launched, uh, denial of service, technical devices used inside Israel per reporting. These are all things that should have been picked up on. Whether Iran was involved, I think the intelligence community will come up with that assessment. There certainly are indicators, but I think it's going to be up to the intelligence community uh, who's in the best position to determine this uh, going forward, how uh, specifically they were involved, if they were. But to Louis's point, they have been historically involved in Hamas for a long period of time. They fund about 90 percent of their military budget. Uh, and that is something that I think they'll take into consideration. And Louis, we're seeing more explosions in Gaza right now. That's a live image of the Ga of, of Gaza, the night sky there. L Louis, talk us through, what are you hearing about what's happening? Well, we know that the significant number of Israeli airstrikes are underway inside of Gaza, and they have been for the last few hours. Uh, we saw those reports about 130 airstrikes over the last three hours at that time frame. That was just a short time ago. And you can see from these live images that they are continuing. Those flashes that you're seeing are the ground impacts of air-to-ground missiles either being launched by drones or either being launched by manned aircraft into the Gaza area. Um, when you see that kind of imagery over over uh, Israel, what you were seeing was the Iron Dome impacts intercepting uh, those uh, missiles being fired by Hamas. But in this case, what you're seeing is the ground impacts and potentially if, let's say, there are munitions in these areas, you're going to get what's called a secondary impact, a secondary explosion. And that's, a, what, that's what causes like these giant fireballs in the night sky. All right, ABC News Senior Pentagon Reporter Louis Martinez, ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy, thank you. And earlier today, I spoke with Omar Shakir, the Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch. For more on this, here's what he had to say about the war. You, know, you and your organization have said there's no justification for the deliberate killings of civilians and hostage taking uh, after this weekend's attack. But you also say these events may keep happening if human rights are disregarded. What do you mean by that? 
What I mean by that is the bloodshed, you know, did not start yesterday. We need to be unequivocal that hostage taking, deliberate killings of civilians are heinous crimes that have no justification. Um, so I think we need to say that outright. But I think there has been a perception that this is something that began yesterday, and there is there hasn't really been a recognition that Palestinians in Gaza have been, as your colleagues noted a minute ago, have been living under a closure for more than 16 years, including a generalized ban on travel. So 2.2 million people um, unlawfully caged in a 25 by 7 mile territory, not able to leave outside of narrow exemptions. And of course, many of them, the majority of the population are themselves refugees, generations of refugees, not able to return to their homes. They've been under an occupation for more than 50 years. There have been rounds of escalations that have wiped out entire families, reduced residential buildings into rubble. So the idea is to understand that uh, you know that there is a context that what happened for of course Israeli families is unprecedented. It is awful. It is it is not justified by by any context. Palestinians have also been facing unspeakable bloodshed and crimes that go back not days and weeks or months and not even years but decades. Now we're seeing new Israeli attacks in Gaza right now, and Israel has cut gas, electricity, and water there. So what's it like right now in Gaza? The situation in Gaza is harrowing. Um, you know, you have families going to sleep soon that aren't sure if they're going to see the sun again because these strikes, there's nowhere to flee. There are no shelters. There's nowhere you can go. Uh, families have a few hours of electricity a day. Uh, we regularly hear the terror. You know, um, we, when we talk to people in Gaza, you hear the bombs going off in the background. We see images uh, on the screen of, of, of that. And, you know, you, you know that you could be targeted at any time, anywhere. Where many families have their life possessions in a suitcase, knowing that they might have only a couple of minutes to, um, you know, survive an airstrike. Um, electricity, water, food. You have to understand that Israel maintains control over virtually every aspect of everyday life. And the statements, including today, coming out of the defense minister, saying, I mean, that is a call to commit a war crime. To say that no food, no water, no electricity. This is a strategy to starve the population. It is unlawful, and it is a reminder of why the International Criminal Court should accelerate their uh, investigation into serious crimes being committed. Palestinians face the reality of apartheid, of persecution. That needs to end, and there needs to be accountability for abuses by uh, all parties here. Uh, what can the international community do to help civilians in this conflict? Because I'm sure we could bring on many of guests that would refute some of what you're saying, and you guys could have a whole political debate. But one thing I think everyone can agree on is the civilians stuck in this conflict, nobody wants to see that. Look, this is not about politics. I agree, and this is not about uh, you know you know we all want a political process to take place, but there hasn't been one for many years. So really, I think whether you're um, a lawyer or a doctor, you know the first step to solving a problem is to diagnose it correctly, right? And this is not a conflict between equal parties, right? This is a um, you know an entire system engineered to ensure the domination of one people over another. We need to call a spade a spade. The problem at root is about apartheid and persecution against millions of Palestinians. We need to recognize that and take the steps to end that at the very same time that human rights approach needs to be consistent. So whether it's abuse by the Israeli government, whether it's the Palestinian Authority, whether it's Hamas authorities, we need to call out human rights abuse clearly and unequivocally when it takes place. And we need to call for accountability regardless of the perpetrator and where there's any forms of complicity, whether it's provision of weapons, you know, whether it's uh, I mean, bilateral agreements, we need to be clear that we should uh, avoid all forms of complicity in these crimes because ultimately we've seen this uh, really tragic pattern that involves the killing of civilians take place for too many times on loop for years. It'll continue unless we address these root causes. All right, Israel Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch, Omar Shakir. Omar, thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, the House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until they elect a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill for more. Jay, former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy just held a press conference on Capitol Hill to address that conflict in Israel. He's announcing a five-point plan. Let's listen to that. We should have a resolution on the floor. 
condemning what's taken place so the rest of the world understands. We should supply and make sure that there's no question and no doubt that Israel will never be overwhelmed when it comes to ammunition. That if they decide to send the precision guided missiles, that they will be knocked down. We should send no doubt to anyone that holds an American citizen that we will not leave without them. This will not be Afghanistan. We will not allow this administration to do this again. But Jay, the House can't do anything without a new speaker, so what now? Yeah, and there isn't a speaker right now, Diane. So that's the former speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, really stepping into this leadership vacuum at the moment. You can't pass anything off the House floor without a speaker. So if the president asked for it, if Congress deemed it necessary, or if Israel asked for it, you couldn't pass right now in the current situation in the House without a speaker any kind of military aid package from the U.S. to Israel. And the former speaker pointed that out. It also comes at a time that a number of Republicans here on Capitol Hill, particularly moderates who are upset that the fact that McCarthy got booted out of his job last week in the first place, are calling for the former speaker to return because of his, A, because there's a power vacuum, but B, because of his support of Israel over the years. He addressed the Israeli Knesset not long ago. He had the Israeli president here. He's got a long-standing history, McCarthy does, of support of Israel, and he made mention of that today. So McCarthy got the question. Would you come back, given the current situation in Israel right now? And McCarthy, notably, didn't say no. Instead, he said, that's up to the conference. It's up to House Republicans, essentially, to decide. Well, House Republicans are going to make that decision in the next few days. They've got a meeting tonight, and they're going to hear from their speaker candidates tomorrow. All right, Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll be right back with more after the break. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest, as the GOP chaos continues, more Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt, and I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a Momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, the New York Stock Exchange held a moment of silence ahead of the opening bell today to honor the victims of the attacks in Israel. Those attacks are having impacts around the world, including on the economy. Oil prices are already rising. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus joins me now for more on this. Alexis, Big picture here, what does this mean for the economy? This just adds another layer of uncertainty for global economic growth. Remember, global economies are still dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic. They're still dealing with the current war in Ukraine and, of course, an overall slowdown because of high inflation worldwide. So this, um, it, you know, is now a huge question mark for investors going forward. And we're seeing how they're reacting uh, today, which is their first response to the attack over the weekend. U.S. stocks were lower, not dramatically lower, but they're was a sell-off. Oil up about three and a half percent. I thought perhaps we'd even see a larger rally there. And we're also seeing investors running to the relative safety of gold and the U.S. dollar, which is perceived as safe havens during these times. Now, the Middle East is oil rich. We're seeing prices jump on that right now. Are there other concerns in terms of 
economic impact and assets? It all depends on how long this war lasts, uh, how intense it gets, and whether or not it is no longer contained between Israel and Hamas. Does this spread to other regions of the area, including Iran? There are unsubstantiated reports that Iran was behind this attack. If the U.S. is able to confirm that, the U.S. may enforce tougher sanctions against Iranian oil, taking some of their oil off the market. We could see a big spike in the price of oil, and we know that that's inflationary. And just at, at a time when we were starting to see inflation get under wraps, it could, it could rally once again. In addition to being an oil-rich area, it's also an area that has a lot of important routes, like uh, trading routes. So our supply chains could be impacted. The Suez Canal, the Straits of Hormuz, all in that region. Uh, we could see disruption there, and we could see a big impact in worldwide supply chains. All right. ABC Business Report, Alexis Christophorus. Thanks, Alexis. And stay with ABC News Live all day for complete coverage of the war in Israel. We'll also have a look at the day's other top stories right after the break. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Israel is at war after being bombarded by thousands of rockets. It's being called Israel's 9-11 after a surprise attack by the militant group Hamas. We'll have the latest in just a few minutes, but here are some of the other stories we're following today. The House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until they elect a new speaker. That includes possible additional funding for Israel. A vote for new speaker is expected later this week. At least 2,000 people are dead after two earthquakes hit Afghanistan near the border with Iran. Hundreds of people are believed to be trapped in the rubble, but a lack of modern equipment is hampering the rescue efforts. This is one of Afghanistan's deadliest earthquakes in two decades. The western part of Maui has reopened to tourists after the summer's deadly wildfires. The process started Sunday, exactly two months after the fires killed 97 people and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses. The move's getting mixed reaction as some Maui residents warn tourism could result in wildfire victims being forced out of hotels. And Simone Biles is still the GOAT. The star gymnast finished the Gymnastics World Championships this weekend with gold in balance beam and floor. She also won gold in all-around and team competitions and a silver in vault. So far, she's earned a total of 37 World and Olympic medals. Big congratulations to Simone, and thanks to you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
This week, with the House at a standstill, candidates make their case to become the new speaker, and lawmakers are expected to cast their votes. The latest as the GOP chaos continues. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Carter Presidential Library, I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, Israel at war. Palestinian militant group Hamas launching a surprise assault. And now 48 hours later, the unprecedented attacks targeting Israeli city centers and civilian communities have not stopped. Israel's 9-11 is what it's being called, the harrowing and bloody images showing the barrage of rockets, hostages being taken, and buildings reduced to rubble. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. We want to give you a live look now at pictures straight from Gaza as Israeli forces pound the territory by air. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowing to settle the score as he orders a total siege of Gaza, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip. Right now, at least 700 people have been killed in Israel. More than 500 are dead in Gaza. We have team coverage all day long, and we begin with World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. The death toll rising here in Israel, as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu now warns this could be a long and difficult war. After a brutal surprise attack, not seen in Israel in 50 years. These terrorists have one goal in mind. It's to slaughter as many civilians as possible. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday, when a complex and highly coordinated attack by the militant group Hamas began an assault by land, sea, and air. More than 2,200 rockets firing into Israel, raining down on southern and central cities, with air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. <laughs> Shortly after, Hamas video showing armed militants storming blockaded areas of the Gaza Strip. Officials say once inside Israeli communities along the border, they started killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the streets, some shot while sitting in their cars. At a music festival in Negev, young concertgoers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert after a Hamas rocket attack. Video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lighting the road. In other towns and villages, families were desperate to barricade themselves inside homes as militants raided their towns, going door to door, looking to kill. And many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. We met a young father, Yoni Asher, whose wife and two young daughters were visiting their grandmother. His wife called him. They were in a safe room in the house when militants got in. The call dropped out, and Yoni had no idea what happened until he saw this video. He says that's his wife, militants covering her head, taking her and his two daughters, who are just two and four. I recognized them immediately, and I saw the video twice. And the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because I melt down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was a nightmare. 
Prime Minister Netanyahu has declared Israel is at war. More than 700 killed here, including at least four American citizens. The Biden administration warning that number could rise. ABC News speaking with the mother of one of those American victims, 32-year-old Chaim Katzman. We thought at one point that he had been taken hostage, but it turned out that I didn't get official information about exactly what happened. His body was found in his apartment. We understand that he and his neighbor were hiding in the closet, and the neighbor, they found them, and the neighbor was released, a woman, and he was shot immediately. Now his loved ones left grieving, remembering a son, a colleague, a friend. You know, getting so many messages from people who worked with Chaim or who knew him or who met him during their travels and how warm he was, how open. He was very accepting person and very loyal friend, good sense of humor. He took things in stride. And new questions about why Israel's intelligence, long a source of pride here, how did they miss this? The worst assault since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the issue of intelligence with our George Stephanopoulos on this week. We have a very close relationship with uh, Israeli intelligence as well as with the Israeli military, as well as with Israel more broadly. So yes, of course, this is something that they and we will be looking at. But the effort right now has to be in dealing with the aggression from Hamas. To deal with that aggression, Israel now retaliated. Hammering Gaza with airstrikes and cutting off power to certain areas. The Israeli military now saying they've struck more than 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip, releasing this video of one of their strikes. The Palestinian Health Ministry saying more than 400 have been killed, thousands more civilians injured. They made elderly people, children, and women scared, this man says. Copies of the Quran were shattered. But with Israel shaken, Tens of thousands of Israeli reservists have now been called up to join the fight. We are recovering, first of all, from the most devastating day in Israeli history. Every single Hamas terrorist that carried this out is going to have to look over their shoulder for the rest of their lives. And this young father is waiting for his wife and two young girls to come home. Uh, how are you staying so strong? I don't know. I guess when you're a parent, you have no choice. In fact, we could hear the rocket fire here just before we came on here. Uh, just a reminder that this is ongoing, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The Defense Ministry declaring just moments ago a total siege of the Gaza Strip. No power, no water, no electricity. They say they're dealing with barbaric terrorists and that they will act accordingly. Kira. David, thanks so much. We'll stay in close touch. Let's also bring in our foreign correspondent, James Longman, now, who is on the ground there in Tel Aviv, also former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, our national security analyst, Mick Mulroy. James, let's just start with you. Give us the latest from where you are. Well, we are watching, like the rest of the world, the massive bombardment of Gaza. Israel is raining down fury on the Gaza Strip. Uh, they are holding Palestinians uh, responsible for this terror attack, and they're not holding back, and they haven't even begun their major offensive. The world is w watching and waiting for them uh, to start their ground offensive. But for the moment, these airstrikes uh, look to have caused as many as 560 deaths. That's the latest from the Palestinian Health Authority, but that number is likely to go up. And as you heard there from David, this is totally siege. So fuel, electricity, water, all cut off to the Gaza Strip. These are things that they don't get at the best of times, uh, and yet now completely cut off. People have been told to evacuate. 125,000 people have been internally displaced, we understand, at least in Gaza. Again, by the last count, difficult to know right now. They've Some of them, uh, we understand, have been able to get to shelters uh, or um, United Nations schools. There are United Nations properties inside the Gaza Strip, but quite where uh, Palestinians in Gaza are able to fully evacuate is not clear given it has been uh, sealed now but the Israelis this as you say this is their 9-11 this was Pearl Harbor for them uh, and so they are uh, they are preparing a full throttle uh, assault on uh, on the Gaza Strip after having cleared the area next to Gaza they say earlier today they managed to completely clear it of the Hamas militants who were there and now they're going about uh, calling up reservists and in the last few minutes we've had it confirmed that they've called up 300 
100,000 reservists uh, to join their war effort. That, for the, a country this size, is a colossal number. We were driving down the highway and we saw uh, cars pulled up on the side of the highway just for, for miles and miles. And, and our driver said, this, these are reservists. They're allowed to park basically on the highway and go and uh, and and uh, sort of uh, volunteer for military service so we're all watching and waiting for the major response from the israelis it feels like it's going to come in some kind of ground invasion but uh, we'll have to wait and see guys and, and james as we're as we're listening to you we're looking at the live picture from gaza seeing what seems to be already to be the beginning of of israel's response mick i want to go to you this is such uh, such a terrible shock to the state of Israel, and the Israeli defensive forces have been the pride of that country for decades, handling uh, assaults from nation states, from, from Palestinians, from terrorists, uh, and here is this utter surprise assault on a huge level, and I wonder what does it tell you about the IDF and its preparations for this, and about the capacity of the enemy of Israel, Hamas? So, Terry, it is uh, surprising. I think you are correct. This is one of the most sophisticated militaries and one of the most sophisticated intelligence service, uh, the, the domestic intelligence service being Shin Bet. So I think it's really shocking to uh, quite a few people that are familiar with Israel, not just that it looks like many indicators were missed uh, on the signal side, on the human intelligence side of an operation of this capacity. Uh, it seems like there should have been something picked up. And then also the response of the IDF. I mean, yes, it was a surprise, but according to reports from uh, people on the ground, it took hours uh, to respond. So uh, that's something that's going to have to be looked at and then, and then obviously fixed in the future. But right now, I think they're looking uh, toward the immediate potential for a large-scale ground invasion into Gaza. Absolutely. And if I could just follow up quickly, Mick, the, Reuters is reporting that uh, Hamas was able to jam the communications, at least of those communities along the border, if not beyond. Does that, is that a capacity you would have expected Hamas to have, or is that something that a nation state might have provided? So I think this does indicate that there was a nation state behind it, potentially or on. Uh, we know historically they fund about 90 percent of Hamas's uh, military budget. I would wait uh, to hear from the U.S. intelligence community on whether they had a direct involvement in this, but that is an indicator uh, that they did, because that is a very sophisticated device, and in order to do it uh, substantially, there are probably multiple devices plus a cyber uh, attack that also occurred with it, and that does show a level of sophistication that you wouldn't necessarily expect Hamas to have uh, organically. James, what more can you tell us about the hostage situation, even the possibility of American hostages? We have all seen the chilling images uh, now from the festival and elsewhere where it appears uh, all these innocent women, children, uh, festival goers were taken by Hamas fighters there. We'd love for you to weigh in as well, Mick. But James, what can you tell us? What do you know? Yeah, these were some of the most distressing images, I think, of this entire episode. As you say, men, women, children taken away, young women ripped away from their boyfriends, children, toddlers, uh, part of entire families who've been uh, taken away uh, into the Gaza Strip. Now, when uh, in, the, in the hours that followed uh, this assault, Hamas said that they had dozens of hostages. Uh, another terrorist group that operates in the Strip, Islamic Jihad, also claimed to have uh, something like 30 hostages. Impossible to verify these claims. Uh, and so the assumption is they are in Gaza. Uh, what they will do with these hostages? I mean, it's anyone's guess. The assumption perhaps to use them as human shields, to move them around inside the Strip in different locations, perhaps uh, underground, away from the airstrikes. Uh, we have had a report earlier today, again, impossible to verify. Uh, these claims that perhaps some of these hostages had been killed in the airstrikes, an effort perhaps by these terrorists uh, to make claims to stop the strikes going ahead. But, uh, you know, it is incredibly distressing for the families of these people uh, to watch what we're all watching now in Gaza and wondering that their family members are in there somewhere. I mean, we spoke to one woman uh, whose daughter Kim was at that desert rave, 22 years old. We went to her uh, home. Jennifer uh, Damti uh, was the mother, and she said she got a call at 
at 6 a.m. on Saturday from Kim, desperate, uh, wondering what she should do. Uh, Jennifer told her to run, to hide, and they haven't heard from her since. She's just one of the many who are missing uh, and as yet un un uh, unidentified, perhaps, among the dead at that desert rave. Uh, and these families, by the way, are going from hospital to hospital uh, with anything they can find which might have the DNA of their loved ones in order to try and get a match for the dead. Uh, that, I mean, imagine that as a parent going from place to place, hoping that your child is dead, so at least you don't have to imagine the idea that they've been taken into Gaza by terrorists. And we're going to talk to one of those parents in, in just a second, but Mick, I wanted you to weigh on this as well with regard to the hostages, your former uh, CIA. Do you think there's any kind of conversations going on right now or a plan to intervene with regard to the hostage situation, especially if there's Americans among them? So, Kira, that's right. It's certainly when there's an American taking hostages, the U.S. military, the CIA will spin up and throw a lot of resources at a potential recovery. That said, it's going to be extraordinarily different. Like James said, some of these hostages are likely human shields. All of them are probably completely guarded, and they have a, a, a certain system of which it would be almost impossible to recover them. They could have them in tunnels. The tunnels could be wired. So this, any country that can help facilitate recovery of these hostages, I think is a very good thing. All right, James Longman. On the scene there, uh, and Mick Mulroy, thank you very much for helping us understand this shocking incident from all these angles. Thanks very much. I know we'll be getting back to you. Well, we are getting an outpouring of stories from inside Israel and Gaza, and our next guest has an urgent message following the attack on Israel. He is desperately searching for his son, an American citizen serving right now in the IDF at the Gaza border. He's been missing in action for more than 36 hours now without any contact. Ruby Chen joins us now. Uh, Ruby, thank you for being with us, uh, especially at, at this moment. Do you know, uh, what can you tell us about where your son Ite was last seen in action? Well, that's the billion dollar question. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me and, and amplifying my voice. So he uh, was uh, at his base at the border of Gaza. We got a uh, message from him Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m., saying that there is bombing going on. And that was the last time that we had any communication with him. Since then, he has been defined officially by the IDF as missing in action. What does that mean? It means that nobody physically has been able to identify him since. He is not in the hospitals, and he is not one of the deceased. As such, the working assumption is if he's not here in the state of Israel, he must be someplace else. So what's the IDF telling you, anything specific? And do you believe now that he may have been captured by Hamas? Well, I think that it's a valid working assumption to have that uh, the lack of communication that Hamas uh, provide Israel regarding the people that they've abducted, which is a bit, you know, sick, you know, people, Holocaust survivors to little children are the type of people that they gathered up and took them over the other side of the border. But I think, you know, the United States you know, we are all in favor of what President Biden, Secretary of State, you know, have been very uh, fierce in their comments about what they've seen and, you know, how the beliefs and values of the United States, you know, is different than what we've seen here and providing Israel an ability to protect itself. But I'd like to maybe uh, focus on the previous segment and what is happening now in Gaza. And let's take that forward another two weeks from now, where we will see for sure many Palestinians with U.S. passports urging the United States, the State Department, to come and save them for their lives because of what is happening. And you might even say it's a valid point that they are United States citizens. What I would counter and say, I like the same standard. My son, a U.S. citizen, is most likely in Gaza as we speak. And first and, first, first, first and foremost, he is an American citizen. As the Palestinian 
American citizen would say, no, I am first an American citizen. State Department, please help me. I'm asking for the same standard. And Ruby, first, uh, could you tell us about your son, about his service uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces? And have you heard from the U.S. government uh, at this point? So we are in uh, contact with the uh, embassy and the State Department. And yes, uh, I am a New Yorker, so I do have a congressman that I reached out to, uh, trying to reach uh, Senator Schumer as well and get his support. Uh, we are all uh, trying to piece the uh, pieces of the puzzle in order to build the picture and understand where not only my son is an American citizen, but there are multiple U.S. Israeli citizens that uh, are in the same situation as we are. And what we are asking from President Biden, in addition to condemning, is being more fierce in his request from the Hamas to abide to international law when it comes to POWs. That means that they need to identify each POW that they have. It means that they need to provide and take care of their health, and they need to allow the UN or the Red Cross to come and visit those prisoners of war, especially if these are US citizens that they are holding. Ruby, will you just humanize your son, why he wanted to serve in the IDF? Just tell us more about Ite. Yeah, so uh, we uh, moved here uh, about 30 years ago. I'm the uh, proud outcome of the New York public education system. Uh, we believe that this is the Jewish state for the Jewish people. Uh, Itai uh, grew up as an avid uh, NBA fan. I have to say, as a New York Knicks fan, it was difficult for me to see him becoming a Lakers fan and Kobe Bryant, but I guess that's what kids do. Uh, he uh, very much was anticipating his service, but at the end of the day, uh, the values that Itai has are similar to the values that, that I have. And as a kid, going up in the public education system, I'm sure all of you remember, we would take our right hand and pledge allegiance to the flag, and we believe in those values, the values that said, if we are in trouble, or our family, the U.S. is behind us and will take care of us. And I'll just continue that pledge and say, we are one nation, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. And I think this is all we are asking. We're asking at this point of time for the U.S. Secretary of State, as well as other uh, Western governments do as much as possible to provide the minimum requirements of at least giving what is required by international law when holding POWs, not just U.S. citizens that are in Gaza at this moment, but Holocaust survivors, children, Israelis, Europeans. Everyone should have the minimum justice and freedom and liberty that we all grew up on. Ruby Chen, we're just so grateful uh, for you. Uh, just talking about your son at this time, we'll keep his name out there. We wanna stay in close touch with you and um, we'll continue to update the situation without a doubt. Ruby, thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you for okay. having me and amplifying my voice. Of course. Also, up close and personal with the voices of first responders there on the ground in Israel, how they're saving lives amid Hamas's brutal assault. Next. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story, 
here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Glad you're streaming with us on this Monday. Well, we are just learning now that more than 900 Israels have now been, Israelis rather, have been reported dead, more than 2,500 injured. Rafael Pash is an EMT with the United Hatzalah of Israel, a community-based volunteer group where he and his fellow first responders are there on the ground working around the clock to save lives. He now joins us live from Judea. Rafael, let's talk about the latest from where you are, what you are seeming, seeing right now uh, in terms of victims that need medical attention, and do you feel confident that you have been able to save lives amid all of this? Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, in the words of one of the doctors who's at our, uh, our medical clinic on the uh, Gaza border, um, I'm close friends with, uh, he said, uh, we're seeing atrocities that no one ever wants to see. Uh, but are we saving lives? We definitely are. Um, our teams are embedded uh, around the Gaza Strip uh, in the periphery with IDF teams and IDF medical units uh, providing care for both civilians and military personnel who are injured who have been injured in this conflict. Uh, we're doing ambulance transports with volunteer, uh, with our volunteers uh, for the people who were injured uh, out from the periphery to hospitals. We're using our helicopters, medevac helicopters, to transport the more critical patients. Um, as of uh, the latest numbers I had from this morning, uh, we've already treated more than 14 or 1,500 people um, just uh, from teams that are, are currently in the Gaza periphery now. The organization is a national organization of volunteers uh, that come from all over the country. Uh, and we are uh, providing medical attention, we're providing humanitarian aid uh, to the civilian population as well. Many of them couldn't get water uh, or food. Um, some of the images you're seeing now are, are uh, people who donated uh, to help support that effort um, from all different areas of Israel. Uh, we've brought down equipment to the, uh, to the affected area, to the people in their homes in, in Sderot and the other towns uh, in the Gaza Prefer. People have been afraid to leave their homes, been told not to leave their homes in the last couple of days. Uh, so we're providing them going door to door, providing them with food and water, um, in addition to medical aid as needed. Uh, we have medical clinics, as I mentioned before, that are being set up our all periphery. There are currently 1,500 volunteers uh, that have left their jobs, their families, uh, from both Gaza Prefer and the areas around the rest of the country to go down to provide assistance. Um, we've also, you know, now there's been some, uh, I guess, uh, violence in the north of the country as well. Uh, so our teams up there in the north have also been receiving supplies uh, and equipment in order to hopefully, hopefully the things won't develop up there. Uh, but if the need arises, uh, we're providing already extra equipment, additional volunteers to the north as well to sort of bolster teams that are there. Um, so it's a very dynamic situation. Uh, it's something we've we haven't really seen on this scale before. Uh, like uh, you know, they said earlier, that we haven't seen something like this in the past 50 years since the Yom Kippur War. Um, but we do train uh, a lot of training for mass casualty incidents, for uh, dropping everything we're doing and responding to emergencies at a moment's notice. Uh, where our, our volunteers excel at that. Uh, we've gone many international missions around the world. Many of our teams just came back from Morocco less than two weeks ago uh, from the earthquake that was there. Um, and then that sort of rushed right into this after even beyond the holiday uh, itself. So there's really been no respite for the teams, um, but everyone's standing strong and working together. Uh, Thank the other you very aspect much. We're seeing a lot of just, just, just the one more question. What we're seeing is a lot of violence on against first responders themselves. People have been attacked. Right. There have been some ambulances that have been uh, shot at. Uh, we've had two volunteers already killed, unfortunately, and another few injured, and two of them are missing. Uh, we're not sure what's happened to them. They may. Uh, have been kidnapped as well. Um, so there's really a, a tension amongst the first responders themselves. They're literally putting their lives on the line to save others. All right, Raphael. Posh, uh, EMT there on the ground. Uh, we thank you for giving us that update on the work that so many are doing there and on the dangers that they face. Thanks very much.
Before we go to break, we do have uh, some breaking news. Hamas now issuing uh, this statement uh, that we have uh, warning Israel to actually stop firing rockets or they will begin executing hostages. Uh, we're getting word from Hamas now in this statement as that death toll in Israel continues to rise. We are talking about more than 900 people that have been killed in Israel so far, 600 dead in Gaza. Once again, Hamas putting out this warning that they will start executing Israeli hostages one by one, it says in this statement, and will film them as well, unless what they say, this barbaric shelling stop immediately or people given warning before destroying homes. It's chilling. Um, as why, we get this information into why us why they here. took the hostages in the first place, no question. Yeah. All right. Uh, clearly, a lot more news ahead. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. We'll be right back. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. She's the Mormon mom influencer whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now she's charged with felony child abuse and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt and I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. I'm Matt Rivers, and that is the Panama Canal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, Israel at war. Palestinian militant group Hamas launching a surprise assault. And now 48 hours later, the unprecedented attacks targeting Israeli city centers and civilian communities have not stopped. Israel's 9-11 is what it's being called, the harrowing and bloody images showing the barrage of rockets, hostages being taken, and buildings reduced to rubble. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. We want to give you a live look now at pictures straight from Gaza as Israeli forces pound the territory by air. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowing to settle the score as he orders a total siege of Gaza, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip. Right now, at least 700 people have been killed in Israel. More than 500 are dead in Gaza. We have team coverage all day long, and we begin with World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. The death toll rising here in Israel, as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu now warns this could be a long and difficult war. After a brutal surprise attack, not seen in Israel in 50 years. These terrorists have one goal in mind. It's to slaughter as many civilians as possible. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday, when a complex and highly coordinated attack by the militant group Hamas began an assault by land, sea, and air. More than 2,200 rockets firing into Israel, raining down on southern and central cities, with air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. Shortly after, Hamas video showing armed militants storming blockaded areas of the Gaza Strip. Officials say once inside Israeli communities along the border, they started killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the streets, 
Some shot while sitting in their cars. At a music festival in Negev, young concert goers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert after a Hamas rocket attack. Video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lighting the road. In other towns and villages, families were desperate to barricade themselves inside homes as militants raided their towns, going door to door, looking to kill. And many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. We met a young father, Yoni Asher, whose wife and two young daughters were visiting their grandmother. His wife called him. They were in a safe room in the house when militants got in. The call dropped out, and Yoni had no idea what happened until he saw this video. He says that's his wife, militants covering her head, taking her and his two daughters, who are just two and four. I recognized them immediately, and I saw the video twice. And the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because I melt down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was a nightmare. Prime Minister Netanyahu has declared Israel is at war. More than 700 killed here, including at least four American citizens. The Biden administration warning that number could rise. ABC News speaking with the mother of one of those American victims, 32-year-old Chaim Katzman. We thought at one point that he had been taken hostage, but it turned out that I didn't get official information about exactly what happened. His body was found in his apartment. We understand that he and his neighbor were hiding in the closet and the neighbor, they found one and the neighbor was released, a woman, and he was shot immediately. Now his loved ones left grieving, remembering a son, a colleague, a friend. You know, getting so many messages from people who worked with Chaim or who knew him or who met him during their travels and how warm he was, how open. He was a very accepting person and very loyal friend, good sense of humor. He took things in stride. And new questions about why Israel's intelligence, long a source of pride here, how did they miss this? The worst assault since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the issue of intelligence with our George Stephanopoulos on this week. We have a very close relationship with uh, Israeli intelligence as well as with the Israeli military, as well as with Israel more broadly. So yes, of course, this is something that they and we will be looking at. But the effort right now has to be in dealing with the aggression from Hamas. To deal with that aggression, Israel now retaliating. <laughs> hammering Gaza with airstrikes and cutting off power to certain areas. The Israeli military now saying they've struck more than 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip, releasing this video of one of their strikes. The Palestinian health ministry saying more than 400 have been killed, thousands more civilians injured. They made elderly people, children and women scared, this man says. Copies of the Quran were shattered. But with Israel shaken, Tens of thousands of Israeli reservists have now been called up to join the fight. We are recovering, first of all, from the most devastating day in Israeli history. Every single Hamas terrorist that carried this out is going to have to look over their shoulder for the rest of their lives. And this young father is waiting for his wife and two young girls to come home. Uh, how are you staying so strong? I don't know. I guess when you're a parent, you have no choice. In fact, we could hear the rocket fire here just before we came on here. Uh, just a reminder that this is ongoing, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The Defense Ministry declaring just moments ago a total siege of the Gaza Strip. No power, no water, no electricity. They say they're dealing with barbaric terrorists and that they will act accordingly. Kira? David, thanks so much. We'll stay in close touch. Let's also bring in our foreign correspondent, James Longman, now, who is on the ground there in Tel Aviv, also former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, our national security analyst, Mick Mulroy. James, let's just start with you. Give us the latest from where you are. Well, we are watching, like the rest of the world, the massive bombardment 
of Gaza. Israel is raining down fury on the Gaza Strip. Uh, they are holding Palestinians uh, responsible for this terror attack, and they're not holding back, and they haven't even begun their major offensive. The world is w watching and waiting for them uh, to start their ground offensive. But for the moment, these airstrikes uh, look to have caused as many as 560 deaths. That's the latest from the Palestinian Health Authority, but that number is likely to go up. And as you heard there from David, this is total siege. So fuel, electricity, water, all cut off to the Gaza Strip. These are things that they don't get at the best of times, uh, and yet now completely cut off. People have been told to evacuate. 125,000 people have been internally di displaced, we understand, at least in Gaza. Again, by the last count, difficult to know right now. They've Some of them, uh, we understand, have been able to get to shelters uh, or um, United Nations schools. There are United Nations properties inside the Gaza Strip, but quite where uh, Palestinians in Gaza are able to fully evacuate is not clear, given it has been uh, sealed now. But the Israelis, this, as you say, this is their 9-11. This was Pearl Harbor for them. Uh, and so they are, uh, they are preparing a full throttle uh, assault on, uh, on the Gaza Strip after having cleared the area next to Gaza. They say earlier today they managed to completely clear it of the Hamas militants who were there. And now they're going about uh, calling up reservists. And in the last few minutes, we've had it confirmed that they've called up 300,000 reservists uh, to join their war effort. That, for the, a country this size, is a colossal number. We were driving down the highway and we saw uh, cars pulled up on the side of the highway just for, for miles and miles. And, and our driver said, this, these are reservists. They're allowed to park basically on the highway and go and uh, and and, and uh, sort of uh, volunteer for military service so we're all watching and waiting for the major response from the israelis it feels like it's going to come in some kind of ground invasion but uh, we'll have to wait and see guys and, and james as we're as we're listening to you we're looking at the live picture from gaza seeing what seems to be already to be the beginning of of israel's response mick i want to go to you this is such uh, such a terrible shock to the state of Israel. And the Israeli defensive forces have been the pride of that country for decades, handling uh, assaults from nation states, from, from Palestinians, from terrorists. Uh, and here is this utter surprise assault on a huge level. And I wonder, what does it tell you about the IDF and its preparations for this and about the capacity of the enemy of Israel, Hamas? So, Terry, it is uh, surprising. I think you are correct. This is one of the most sophisticated militaries and one of the most sophisticated intelligence service, uh, the, the domestic intelligence service being Shin Bet. So I think it's really shocking to uh, quite a few people that are familiar with Israel, not just that it looks like many indicators were missed uh, on the signal side, on the human intelligence side of an operation of this capacity. Uh, it seems like there should have been something picked up. And then also the response of the IDF. I mean, yes, it was a surprise, but according to reports from uh, people on the ground, it took hours uh, to respond. So uh, that's something that's going to have to be looked at and then, and then obviously fixed in the future. But right now, I think they're looking uh, toward the immediate potential for a large-scale ground invasion into Gaza. Absolutely. And if I could just follow up quickly, Mick, the, Reuters is reporting that uh, Hamas was able to jam the communications, at least of those communities along the border, if not beyond. Does that, is that a capacity you would have expected Hamas to have, or is that something that a nation state might have provided? So I think this does indicate that there was a nation state behind it potentially earlier on. Uh, we know historically they fund about 90 percent of Hamas's uh, military budget. I would wait uh, to hear from the U.S. intelligence community on whether they had a direct involvement in this, but that is an indicator uh, that they did, because that is a very sophisticated device, and in order to do it uh, substantially, there are probably multiple devices plus a cyber uh, attack that also occurred with it, and that does show a level of sophistication that you wouldn't necessarily expect Hamas to have uh, organically. James, what more can you tell us about the hostage situation, even the possibility of American hostages? We have all seen the chilling images uh, now from the festival and elsewhere where it appears uh, all these innocent women, children, uh, festival goers were taken by Hamas fighters there. We'd love for you to weigh in as well, Mick. But James, what can you tell us? What do you know? 
Yeah, these were some of the most distressing images, I think, of this entire episode. As you say, men, women, children taken away, young women ripped away from their boyfriends, children, toddlers, uh, part of entire families who've been uh, taken away uh, into the Gaza Strip. Now, when uh, in, the, in the hours that followed uh, this assault, Hamas said that they had dozens of hostages. Uh, another terrorist group that operates in the Strip, Islamic Jihad, also claimed to have uh, something like 30 hostages. Impossible to verify these claims. Uh, and so the assumption is they are in Gaza. Uh, what they will do with these hostages? I mean, it's anyone's guess that the assumption perhaps to use them as human shields to move them around inside the strip in different locations perhaps uh, underground away from the airstrikes uh, we have had a report earlier today again impossible to verify uh, these claims that perhaps some of these hostages had been killed in the airstrikes an effort perhaps by these terrorists uh, to make claims to stop the strikes going ahead but uh, you know it is incredibly distressing for the families of these people uh, to watch what we're all watching now in Gaza and wondering that their family members are in there somewhere. I mean, we spoke to one woman uh, whose daughter, Kim, was at that desert rave, 22 years old. We went to her uh, home. Jennifer uh, Damty uh, was the mother, and she said she got a call at 6 a.m. on Saturday from Kim, desperate, uh, wondering what she should do. Uh, Jennifer told her to run, to hide, and they haven't heard from her since. She's just one of the many who are missing uh, and as yet un un uh, unidentified, perhaps among the dead at that desert rave. Uh, and these families, by the way, are going from hospital to hospital uh, with anything they can find which might have the DNA of their loved ones in order to try and get a match for the dead. Uh, that I mean, imagine that as a parent going from place to place, hoping that your child is dead, so at least you don't have to imagine the idea that they've been taken into Gaza by terrorists. And we're going to talk to one of those parents in, in just a second, but Mick, I wanted you to weigh on this as well with regard to the hostages, your former uh, CIA. Do you think there's any kind of conversations going on right now or a plan to intervene with regard to the hostage situation, especially if there's Americans among them? So, Kira, that's right. It's certainly when there's an American taking hostages, the U.S. military, the CIA will spin up and throw a lot of resources at a potential recovery. That said, it's going to be extraordinarily different. Like James said, some of these hostages are likely human shields. All of them are probably completely guarded, and they have a, a, a certain system of which it would be almost impossible to recover them. They could have them in tunnels. The tunnels could be wired. So this, any country that can help facilitate recovery of these hostages, I think is a very good thing. All right, James Longman. On the scene there, uh, and Mick Mulroy, thank you very much for helping us understand this shocking incident from all these angles. Thanks very much. I know we'll be getting back to you. Well, we are getting an outpouring of stories from inside Israel and Gaza, and our next guest has an urgent message following the attack on Israel. He is desperately searching for his son, an American citizen serving right now in the IDF at the Gaza border. He's been missing in action for more than 36 hours now without any contact. Ruby Chen joins us now. Uh, Ruby, thank you for being with us, uh, especially at, at this moment. Do you know, uh, what can you tell us about where your son Ite was last seen in action? Well, that's the billion dollar question. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me and, and amplifying my voice. So he uh, was uh, at his base at the border of Gaza. We got a uh, message from him Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m., saying that there is bombing going on. And that was the last time that we had any communication with him. Since then, he has been defined officially by the IDF as missing action. What does that mean? It means that nobody physically has been able to identify him since. He is not in the hospitals, and he is not one of the deceased. As such, the working assumption is if he's not here in the state of Israel, he must be someplace else. So what's the IDF telling you, anything specific? And do you believe now that he may have been captured by Hamas? Well, I think that it's a valid working assumption to have that uh, the lack of communication that Hamas uh, provide Israel regarding the people that they've abducted, which is a bit, you know, sick, you know, people, Holocaust survivors to little children are the type of people that they gathered up 
and took them over the other side of the border. But I think, you know, the United States, you know, we are all in favor of what President Biden, Secretary of State, you know, have been very uh, fierce in their comments about what they've seen and, you know, how the beliefs and values of the United States, you know, is different than what we've seen here and providing Israel an ability to protect itself. But I'd like to maybe uh, focus on the previous segment and what is happening now in Gaza. And let's take that forward another two weeks from now, where we will see for sure many Palestinians with US passports urging the United States, the State Department to come and save them for their lives because of what is happening. And you might even say it's a valid point that they are United States citizens. What I would counter and say, I like the same standard. My son, a US citizen, is most likely in Gaza as we speak. And first and, first, first, first and foremost, he is an American citizen, as the Palestinian American citizen would say. No, I am first an American citizen. State Department, please help me. I'm asking for the same standard. And Ruby, first, uh, could you tell us about your son, about his service uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces? And have you heard from the U.S. government uh, at this point? So we are in uh, contact with the uh, embassy and the State Department. And yes, uh, I am a New Yorker, so I do have a congressman that I reached out to, uh, trying to reach uh, Senator Schumer as well and get his support. Uh, we are all uh, trying to piece the uh, pieces of the puzzle in order to build the picture and understand where not only my son is an American citizen, but there are multiple U.S. Israeli citizens that uh, are in the same situation as we are. And what we are asking from President Biden, in addition to condemning, is being more fierce in his request from the Hamas to abide to international law when it comes to POWs. That means that they need to identify each POW that they have. It means that they need to provide and take care of their health, and they need to allow the UN or the Red Cross to come and visit those prisoners of war, especially if these are US citizens that they are holding. Ruby, will you just humanize your son, why he wanted to serve in the IDF? Just tell us more about Ite. Yeah, so uh, we uh, moved here uh, about 30 years ago. I'm the uh, proud outcome of the New York public education system. Uh, we believe that this is the Jewish state for the Jewish people. Uh, Itai uh, grew up as an avid uh, NBA fan. I have to say, as a New York Knicks fan, it was difficult for me to see him becoming a Lakers fan and Kobe Bryant, but I guess that's what kids do. Uh, he uh, very much was anticipating his service, but at the end of the day, uh, the values that Itai has are similar to the values that, that I have. And as a kid, going up in the public education system, I'm sure all of you remember, we would take our right hand and pledge allegiance to the flag, and we believe in those values, the values that said, if we are in trouble, or our family, the US is behind us and will take care of us. And I'll just continue that pledge and say, we are one nation, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. And I think this is all we are asking. We're asking at this point of time for the US Secretary of State, as well as other uh, Western governments do as much as possible to provide the minimum requirements of at least giving what is required by international law when holding POWs, not just US citizens that are in Gaza at this moment, but Holocaust survivors, children, Israelis, Europeans, everyone should have the minimum justice and freedom and liberty that we all grew up on.
Ruby Chen, we're just so grateful uh, for you. Uh, just talking about your son at this time, we'll keep his name out there. We want to stay in close touch with you, and um, we'll continue to update the situation without a doubt. Ruby, thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you for having okay. me and amplifying my voice. Of course. Also, up close and personal with the voices of first responders there on the ground in Israel, how they're saving lives amid Hamas's brutal assault. Next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. ABC News, America's number one news source. Glad you're streaming with us on this Monday. Well, we are just learning now that more than 900 Israels have now been, Israelis rather, have been reported dead, more than 2,500 injured. Rafael Posh is an EMT with the United Hatzalav Israel, a community-based volunteer group where he and his fellow first responders are there on the ground working around the clock to save lives. He now joins us live from Judea. Rafael, let's talk about the latest from where you are, what you are seeming, seeing right now uh, in terms of victims that need medical attention, and do you feel confident that you have been able to save lives amid all of this? Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, in the words of one of the doctors who's at our, uh, our medical clinic on the uh, Gaza border, um, I'm close friends with, uh, he said, uh, we're seeing atrocities that no one ever wants to see. Uh, but are we saving lives? We definitely are. Um, our teams are embedded uh, around the Gaza Strip uh, in the periphery with IDF teams and IDF medical units uh, providing care for both civilians and military personnel who are injured who have been injured in this conflict. Uh, we're doing ambulance transports with volunteer, uh, with our volunteers uh, for the people who were injured uh, out from the periphery to hospitals. We're using our helicopters, medevac helicopters, to transport the more critical patients. Um, as of uh, the latest numbers I had from this morning, uh, we've already treated more than 14 or 1,500 people um, just uh, from teams that are, are currently in the Gaza periphery now. The organization is a national organization of volunteers uh, that come from all over the country. Uh, and we are uh, providing medical attention, we're providing humanitarian aid uh, to the civilian population as well. Many of them can get water uh, or food. Um, some of the images you're seeing now are, are uh, people who've donated uh, to help support that effort. Um, from all different areas of Israel, uh, we've brought down equipment to the, uh, to the affected area, to the people in their homes in, in Sderot and the other towns uh, in the Gaza periphery. People have been afraid to leave their homes, been told not to leave their homes in the last couple of days. Uh, so we're providing them going door to door, providing them with food and water, um, in addition to medical aid as needed. Uh, we have medical clinics, as I mentioned before, that are being set up our own periphery. There are currently 1,500 volunteers uh, that have left their jobs, their families, uh, from both Gaza periphery and the areas around the rest of the country to go down to provide assistance. Um, we've also, you know, now there's been some, uh, I guess, uh, violence in the north of the country as well. Uh, so our teams up there in the north have also been receiving supplies uh, and equipment in order to hopefully, hopefully the things won't develop up there. Uh, but if the need arises, uh, we're providing already extra equipment, additional volunteers to the north as well to sort of bolster teams that are there. Um, so it's a very dynamic situation. Uh, it's something we've we haven't really seen on this scale before. Uh, like uh, you know, they said earlier, that we haven't seen something like this in the past 50 years since the Yom Kippur War. Um, but we do train uh, a lot of training for mass casualty incidents, for uh, dropping everything we're doing and responding to emergencies at a moment's notice. Uh, we're, our, our volunteers excel at that. Uh, we've gone many international missions around the world. Many of our teams just came back from Morocco less than two weeks ago uh, from the earthquake that was there. Um, and then that sort of rushed right into this after even on the holiday uh, itself. So there's really been no respite for the teams, um, but everyone's standing strong and working together.
Uh, Thank the other you very much. We're seeing a lot of just, just, just the one more question. We're seeing is a lot of the violence on against first responders themselves. People have been attacked. Right. There have been some ambulances that have been uh, shot at. Uh, we've had two volunteers already killed, unfortunately, and another few injured, and two of them are missing. Uh, we're not sure what's happened to them. They may uh, have been kidnapped as well. Um, so there's really a, a tension amongst the first responders themselves. They're literally putting their lives on the line to save others. All right, Raphael. Posh, uh, EMT there on the ground. Uh, we thank you for giving us that update on the work that so many are doing there and on the dangers that they face. Thanks very much. Before we go to break, we do have uh, some breaking news. Hamas now issuing uh, this statement uh, that we have uh, warning Israel to actually stop firing rockets or they will begin executing hostages. Uh, we're getting word from Hamas now in this statement as that death toll in Israel continues to rise. We are talking about more than 900 people that have been killed in Israel so far, 600 dead in Gaza. Once again, Hamas putting out this warning that they will start executing Israeli hostages one by one, it says in this statement, and will film them as well, unless what they say, this barbaric shelling stop immediately or people given warning before destroying homes. It's chilling. Um, as what? we get this information into That's us why they here. took the hostages in the first place, no question. Yeah. All right. Uh, clearly, a lot more news ahead. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. We'll be right back. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Ocala, Florida, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon, I'm Terry Moran. And I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, of course, is Israel declaring war after a terrorist attack by Palestinian militant group Hamas. And the killing hasn't stopped. Hamas taking Israel completely by surprise, launching thousands of rockets and sending ground troops targeting civilians within Israel's borders. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. Live pictures now from Gaza as Israeli forces pound the territory by air. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vow vowing, Netanyahu rather, vowing to settle the score, ordering a total siege of Gaza, vowing revenge and cutting off all resources now to the Gaza Strip. So far, at least 900 have been killed in Israel and nearly 600 more are dead in Gaza. We've got team coverage all day long, of course, and we begin with ABC News. Uh, Chief Foreign Correspondent Inez de la Quatera and Inez is in Tel Aviv. What is it like there right now? What's the feel of the place, Inez? Hey guys, yeah, I mean, certainly a, a tense atmosphere here to say the least. Air raid sirens have been going off across Israel, uh, twice in Jerusalem, in Ashkelon further south, and in Tel Aviv as well earlier today. We were actually at a missing person center earlier this morning uh, when those sirens uh, went off and we had to shelter in place with those families. These were families who have not heard from some of their loved ones in uh, a couple days. These are people who may have been killed, who may have been taken hostage. And so the government has set up this uh, center to try and help these families. We met one man there who was looking for his cousin who attended that music festival where we know 260 bodies at least were recovered. He hadn't heard from his cousin in a couple of days and he had brought a DNA sample to the center to try and get some answers. That's what uh, families are being encouraged to do. They're being told to bring DNA samples, things like hairbrushes, toothbrushes um, for investigators to, to try and, and, and figure out where these people are. Worth pointing out that the IDF says they have uh, they
They know that uh, at least 100 hostages have been taken. They say they know of all the hostages that have been taken. So far, they've informed about 30 families uh, that their loved ones have been taken, and they're still working on informing other families. Um, and we also spoke with social workers there uh, who were telling us about the psychological help they're providing these families. I'll let you listen to what one social worker had to say. And it sounds like we do not have uh, that clip, but the social worker essentially talking about how he's encouraging people to come together, to be with others. Um, he wants people to know that they're not alone, that this center is, is here for them. He's encouraging people to talk as well. And just on this hostage issue, some, some really grim news coming out in just the last few moments with a Hamas spokesman on Al Jazeera talking about how they might begin uh, executing, how they would begin uh, executing hostages one by one. So he said uh, a quote uh, starting this hour, we announced that every targeting of our people who are safe at their home without a prior warning will be regrettably met with the execution of a civilian enemy hostage, and we will be forced to broadcast it, the execution, with audio and video. They're saying this would be in retaliation for the continuous strikes that we have seen on Gaza. All right, Inez, appreciate uh, so much your reporting there from Tel Aviv. We'll stay in close touch. And right now, Palestinian leaders are reporting that more than 500 people have been killed in Gaza, including at least 90 children, more than 2,900 Palestinians injured. And according to the UN, more than 120,000 people have now been displaced there within the Gaza Strip. Thousands of homes and apartments destroyed, ambulances, health facilities, all damaged. And for more on the impact on Palestinian civilians in Gaza, we're joined now by Noura Arakat, a human rights attorney and associate professor at Rutgers University. Thank you for being with us, Noura. Uh, for an American audience, help us understand the humanitarian situation in Gaza. I've been there. It is a, it is a small area. People are, might not realize how small and very crowded. And they have been uh, under... Uh, Israeli supervision, they've been, uh, they, they were able to, uh, the Israelis pulled out, but essentially they've been governed by Israel for many, many years now. What's happening to Palestinian civilians? What's life like there leading up to these terror attacks? I appreciate the concern for the Palestinians who are held hostage in the Gaza Strip in an open air prison under a complete naval blockade and land siege for the Palestinians. 16 years. Israel is basically Palestinians nurse under a collective punishment a violation of Article 33 of the 43 uh, uh, Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibits the target of all civilians. What these Palestinians have done is nothing more than to exist. Um, and this is a man-made disaster that has been wrought by Israel. We know that this strip that you mentioned is very small. You say that Israel governs it. Israel remains the occupying power of the Gaza Strip and yet has, to, for the past 16 years, limited the amount of food that enters, has uh, limited electricity, cut off electricity, target telecommunications buildings, has limited the movement of Palestinians who are able to receive health care, even chemo treatment has prevented Palestinians from harvesting their lands for food or fishing off the coast in order to feed themselves and has told the world that it is their fault that they are being punished in that way. The World Health Organization told us in 2015 that the Gaza Strip would be unlivable in 2020. It is 2023. That means right now, the Gaza Strip is set up in a way where those trapped Palestinians in the largest ghetto right now on earth are set up to die quietly unless we do something about it. And we have not moved in order to end the siege, to end the occupation, to end the Israeli apartheid regime that sustains this worst form of violence that is leading to this episode and these atrocities that we're witnessing today. Which leads me to my next question. These attacks by Hamas are an absolute atrocity, but this type of violence and deadly force is not what all Palestinians support. I think it's crucial to point that out. Uh, so why don't the Palestinians, and there have been Palestinians who have protested peacefully in the past, why is that voice not, not louder? Why does that voice not have more influence here? I would ask your producers and I would ask other mainstream media 
uh, producers why they don't amplify those voices much more. The history of Palestinian nonviolent movement is robust and far greater than any of these episodes, and yet it doesn't get the same amount of attention. In 2018, Palestinian youth in Gaza organized the largest civil society protest. 20 to 40,000 Palestinians marched peacefully every single week in the Great March of Return, demanding the right to return to their homelands in an end of the siege. They were shot down like birds by Israeli snipers. Mum, there was no coverage of them. The boycott divestment sanctions movement takes inspiration from the anti-apartheid movement against South Africa, and yet that is maligned um, and, and castigated as being violent, even though that is the Pit, that is the quintessential form of nonviolent resistance. In 2011 and 12, civilians boarded flotillas to break the siege on Gaza, and they were commandeered by eight Israeli naval commandos. Where was the coverage of that? This is not about how Palestinians, whether or not they resist peacefully or violently, this is about the right of Palestinians to resist at all. And it really is the responsibility of media, of international diplomatic capitals, who have not only failed to celebrate and uplift and protect these Palestinians who have been leading these protests, but also uh, is a failure for all of us uh, to, 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 to uh, isolate Israel and to hold it to account so that we do not sustain these forms of ongoing violence. And, and now we are faced with this atrocity, with this savage uh, atrocity that has been committed in Israel. And Israel, any country, uh, if somebody came across a border and did what these people did, this conduct, this barbaric conduct of, you know, stealing children and women out of homes, raping the women, stripping them naked, killing them, parading their dead bodies through the street and praising God for it. I mean, any country is going to respond. Israel is now planning a, not only this major counteroffensive, it has cut off gas, electricity, and water to Gaza. They claim that's a response to this attack. Talk about the uh, impact that that will have on the civilians of Gaza. I want to point out two things. Number one, Israel has explicitly said that by cutting off electricity to the Palestinians in Gaza, that that is a collective punishment. That is a war crime. Those Palestinians need to be protected. They are under Israel. They should be protected as an uh, uh, being occupied. Number two, no that I believe in the principle that all civilian life is equal and needs to be protected. And yet we we are reacting to this moment against uh, attacks against civilians, we're describing it as barbarism. We're hearing Israeli um, generals who are calling Palestinians uh, human animals. This is basically a racial framework that is desensitizing us to Palestinian death and to be prepared to accept and even applaud that death as something being justified. We need to be aware that if we are indeed against all form of protecting all civilian life, that that includes Palestinian life. And that remember that Palestinians also have the right to self-defense. And yet we have told them, not only do you not have the right to self-defense, you do not have the right to, to, to even protest. And so we could have avoided this moment and we can avoid future atrocities by ending the main forms of structural violence in the forms of occupation, in the forms of lifting the siege and in ending Israel's system of apartheid. Israel has also attacked the Palestinians besieged in Gaza now five times since 2008 using advanced weapons technologies where they have struck homes with Palestinian families in them. Where is the international community? Why do they not step in, restrain Israel, punish it for its apartheid regime, rather than celebrate it by furthering its normalization, by normalizing apartheid, which is a crime against humanity, and then being shocked in moments like this, our failure to resolve this issue, our failure to end Israeli apartheid and ongoing settler colonization is the reason we are continuing to see these atrocities. And if we do want to fight for peace, and all of us do, then we not only have to end this particular crisis, but we have to end the conditions that sustain it, namely dismantling Israel's apartheid system, ending the occupation, lifting the siege.
Nora, I think it's fair to say Hamas doesn't want peace. That's not why they're in this. And, and they're being backed by Iran. And so what we're seeing here is what human rights advocates like you, other scholars, other citizens but, have been but saying let me ask for you years. This. Let me ask you this. If Hamas were to disappear, let me ask you this. If Hamas were to disappear, Israel would not change its policy. Look at the West Bank. In the West Bank, they have the most compliant leader in the form of Mahmoud Abbas, who leads the Fatah party. Mahmoud Abbas actually coordinates with Israel in order to police Palestinians and to protect Israeli settlements. And what has Israel done there? There have been three settler programs against Turmus Aya and Hawara. There have been attacks, naval and ground, aerial and ground invasion of the Janin refugee camp. There is a wall that is taking the Palestinian land. They have transferred the military occupation to civilian hands, saying that occupation so what is your will be answer? permanent. What is, they are what, going what is to your answer, Nora? annex the Jordan Valley. With all due respect, with Is all due Netanyahu? respect, if Hamas were to disappear, Israel does not change its policies to, towards Palestinians. So you're saying, and that is what you're we're saying it's in the hands of Netanyahu. What do we have to do for Israel to stop? You're, you're saying it's in the hands of Benjamin Netanyahu then. Let's say Hamas goes away, which unfortunately I don't think it ever will. But you're saying this lies in the hands of Benjamin That's Netanyahu. That's not true. It wasn't way... founded until 1987. And Israel occupied the Gaza Strip in 1967 and forcibly removed Palestinians 39 years before that in 1948. I Our should say it's hard to get rid of terrorism. Hamas seems to think that Hamas is the pro Hamas will disappear. Well, they're Israel the governing authority, policy, the elected, they're the elected otherwise. governing authority in Gaza at the moment and have committed a terrorist atrocity of, of surpassing uh, cruelty. And, uh, and that's who they are. And that needs to be dealt with. And that as is I say, not, I, the, look, I do not want to be here defending Hamas. As a Palestinian, I would not have voted for them. You are putting me in a very awkward position when you are not taking into account that Hamas was elected into office as a referendum against the failed Oslo Accords, which basically imprisoned Palestinians, which it was a referendum against the PA, which became part of Israel's occupation regime. Then, the Palestinians were punished by siege, and Hamas never was given the opportunity to govern and to fail. I am not here to defend Hamas, but people should remember that if they are the governing authority, they have a military wing and a political wing. This military wing is doing what it's doing, but that doesn't make all Palestinians targets. No it doesn't justify perpetual unfreedom of Palestinians and their subjugation. Oh, nope. we pointed that out. We made that very clear. Very clear. There's a big difference between the peaceful protesting so I am Palestinians. Saying, let us fight for peace together by not only ending this crisis, but also lifting the siege, ending the occupation, and ending the apartheid regime. In 2020, human rights organizations and Israeli human rights organizations says Israel oversees apartheid. That is a crime against humanity. Do you know how violent that is? Day in and day out, that's daily warfare against Palestinians. There has not been sanctions against Israel for its apartheid. They have been celebrated and rewarded in one night. The European Commission has suspended all aid to Palestinians in, the, in 691 million euros. Why can we not enact that kind of political will against apartheid, against a crime against humanity? I am with you. I want peace. Palestinians have been fighting for peace. They have waged nonviolent protest. We are not paying attention to the thousands of Gandhis. And then in moments like this, we are whittling down the situation to Hamas when there is an entire context of 75 years of dispossession, 56 years of occupation, 16 years of siege and constant warfare. Help us get to peace by placing accountability where it belongs. Israel is not above international law. Israel should not be granted a pass for overseeing an apartheid regime. We're not giving a pass to Palestinians either. And in fact, Hamas submitted itself to ju the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. There here is a lack of parity, and it's not because Hamas is getting a pass or Palestinians is getting a pass. It is because we are giving Israel a pass and not taking account this entire context. We do not heal cancer by placing Band-Aids on bodies. We must remove the tumor. We must address the root cause of this. I am with you. This is atrocious and horrifying. 565 Palestinians have also been killed in three days. That doesn't count the 215 Palestinians yeah. that have been killed this year. 
We want peace right. more than anybody. Nora Erekat, we thank you for bringing us that context. Appreciate it very much. Thank Coming you. up, a lot more developments on Israel's response to the deadly Hamas attack. How does Washington respond? We'll take you to the Hill next. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Glad you're streaming with us. We're going to take it to Capitol Hill now, where the House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare that it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until it elects a new speaker. And that includes possible additional funding for Israel at this moment of crisis. Former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy spoke to the press earlier today about the unfolding conflict in Israel and a possible five-point plan that includes rescuing hostages, refreezing the $6 billion uh, that was recently released to Iran by the Biden administration. Here's Kevin McCarthy. Now is the time for action. America needs a five-point plan to meet this moment, to help our ally Israel, and to strengthen our own future. The very first thing we need to do is rescue the American hostages. President Biden's number one priority right now must be finding out how many Americans have been taken hostage and get them home. We cannot repeat what happened in Afghanistan. Our Karen Travers and Jay O'Brien joining us now for more context from the White House to the Hill. So, Karen, uh, we haven't seen the president publicly today. The White House, well, says that it's been working behind the scenes about what's going on in Israel. What do we know? Yeah, the president has no public events today, Kira, and there is no White House briefing. It's a federal holiday, and that's standard operating procedure here. Uh, but the White House did give us some insight into what he's doing behind closed doors, saying he met today with the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, his National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, as well as other senior administration officials, to get an update on the situation in Israel. The president told all of his senior national security officials that they have to have close coordination still with Israel about what the administration can be doing doing and also to be in touch with regional partners and he again through this White House statement was issuing that warning to other countries in the region countries that he said on Saturday might be hostile to Israel that they should not try to take advantage of this situation right now they have not explicitly said Iran but Kira and Terry very clear that is what they're referring to yeah and so Jay let's let's go to you up on Capitol Hill no speaker of the house gridlock on Capitol Hill 
you know, how, how serious is that a, a problem for the people who are supporting Israel and want to get the United States Congress to work on that? Well, it freezes the House floor, Terry. You couldn't pass any kind of supplemental military aid package for Israel on the House floor until there was a Speaker of the House. You couldn't even pass a resolution condemning the attacks in Israel until there is a Speaker of the House. And former Speaker Kevin McCarthy made note of that earlier today. There isn't a Speaker, so there wasn't a Speaker to give a speech condemning those attacks in Israel. So in steps Kevin McCarthy, who has had a long career of supporting Israel. He had the Israeli parliament when he was Speaker of the House. And as you played sound of, he denounced the attacks. He called on the president to do more. But those remarks also came as Republicans are calling on Speaker McCarthy to get back into the race for Speaker, saying that this is a moment that he should come back into office for because, for numerous examples, because of those attacks on Israel. Speaker McCarthy, noticeably when he was asked about that, didn't say no. He said it's up to the conference to pick who their speaker is going to be. And we know that process is playing out. There's a meeting tonight of the conference. They're going to hear from their speaker candidates tomorrow night, guys. Uh, Jay, did you just say that Kevin McCarthy might come back as speaker? And, and how, how soon are they going to settle this? It seems, I, I don't know, it seems... Uh complicated <laughs> and immature a little bit oh we'll take him back what's going to happen here he's back uh, so there are moderate republicans who have essentially said that because uh, it, removing a speaker of the house leaves the United States in a vulnerable position. That's the argument that moderate Republicans have made. And some have called for Speaker McCarthy to essentially return to his job for the conference to nominate him again. McCarthy got that question in those remarks, and he essentially, as I said, he didn't necessarily say no, and he didn't really pour cold water on it. He kind of just sidestepped it, said it's up to his colleagues in the House of Representatives. I can tell you, we've heard from some of that anti-McCarthy faction. Matt Gates, for instance, says it is not the time for Kevin McCarthy to come back. He tweeted, it's the time to move forward. There are other candidates. Steve Scalise, the number two Republican in the House, has got some endorsements. Jim Jordan has others. Again, the conference is going to meet behind closed doors tonight. They're going to hear from those two candidates and potentially any more that there might be tomorrow morning. And they're hoping to vote this week within behind their own closed doors and bring it to a floor for a vote later on in the week if there is agreement. But all of that, guys, is dependent upon Republicans agreeing to something behind closed doors, and if we've seen anything over the last few months, that is easier said than done. So, Karen, some Republicans are making a connection between the Biden administration's move to unfreeze Iranian assets, the $6 billion, in exchange for the release of those five U.S. Uh, hostages uh, held in Iran and that massive terror attack by Hamas in Israel. Uh, the Biden administration says none of the Iranian, Iranian funds have been spent so far. How can the administration be sure? How exactly is that money being tracked? And uh, do you think they're being transparent here? The White House says they can be sure that that money hasn't moved yet because they are closely monitoring it and it still remains in that account cutter and there are going to be what they say are sufficient oversight mechanisms to make sure that that six billion dollars of Iranian oil revenue that was transferred as part of that detainee deal that the U.S. made with Iran they're going to make sure that that money does not go to anything other than humanitarian purposes the White House says that things like food and medicine the question though is that Republicans are raising is just because that money has not gone out yet can there be other funding from Iran that could be used Used for nefarious purposes. Sure, there could be oversight and strict monitoring of this six billion dollars, but what about other Iranian funds? And you know, the question came up today about Iran's direct involvement in this attack by Hamas. The administration says they have no direct evidence of that at this point, uh, but senior administration officials over the weekend did note that Iran in the past has funded, equipped, and supplied Hamas for attacks like this. Karen J. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. More news right after this. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Some other headlines we're tracking for you this hour. More than 10,000 people in Myanmar are forced to abandon their homes due to rising floodwaters. It, the south hit the hardest with 7.8 inches of rainfall. Highest record level in 59 years. No casualties, remarkably, have been reported so far. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has announced today that he is running for president as an independent candidate. Kennedy was formerly a Democratic hopeful. In remarks in Philadelphia, the candidate said that he is, quote, declaring independence from the Democratic Party, a party that his father, uncle, and family have symbolized for decades. And history at the Chicago Marathon, Kenyan runner Kelvin Kiptum smashing the world record for distance finishing the race in just two hours and 35 seconds. That's four minutes, 34 seconds per mile for 26 miles. Yeah, well, guess what else? He's looking to break the two hour barrier in an open race, a feat that was once thought to be physically impossible. Looks like he could keep going, man. He's, he's the guy. I want to check in with him in about 10 years, see how his knees are doing. <laughs> Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. We want to leave you with a shot of Paris. Now look at the Eiffel Tower. It's lit up in blue and white to honor those who've lost their lives in Israel. The colors of the Israeli flag and the Star of David right there on the Eiffel Tower. We'll be right back. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, Israel at war. Palestinian militant group Hamas launching a surprise assault. And now 48 hours later, the unprecedented attacks targeting Israeli city centers and civilian communities have not stopped. Israel's 9-11 is what it's being called, the harrowing and bloody images showing the barrage of rockets, hostages being taken, and buildings reduced to rubble. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. We want to give you a live look now at pictures straight from Gaza as Israeli forces pound the territory by air. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowing to settle the score as he orders a total siege of Gaza, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip. Right now, at least 700 people have been killed in Israel. More than 500 are dead in Gaza. We have team coverage all day long, and we begin with World News Tonight anchor David Muir in Tel Aviv. The death toll rising here in Israel, as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu now warns this could be a long and difficult war. After a brutal surprise attack not seen in Israel in 50 years. These terrorists have one goal in mind. It's to slaughter as many civilians as possible. The crisis breaking out just after dawn Saturday, when a complex and highly coordinated attack by the militant group Hamas began an assault by land, sea, and air. More than 2,200 rockets firing into Israel, raining down on southern and central cities, with air raid sirens going off as far north as Tel Aviv. Shortly after, Hamas video showing armed militants storming blockaded areas of the Gaza Strip. Officials say once inside Israeli communities along the border, they started killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the streets, 
Some shot while sitting in their cars. At a music festival in Negev, young concert goers seen running for their lives. Rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert after a Hamas rocket attack. Video posted online of this drone footage showing the aftermath, cars abandoned, lighting the road. In other towns and villages, families were desperate to barricade themselves inside homes as militants raided their towns, going door to door, looking to kill. And many who weren't killed were then forced into cars, mothers and children and seniors taken back to Gaza as hostages. We met a young father, Yoni Asher, whose wife and two young daughters were visiting their grandmother. His wife called him. They were in a safe room in the house when militants got in. The call dropped out, and Yoni had no idea what happened until he saw this video. He says that's his wife, militants covering her head, taking her and his two daughters, who are just two and four. I recognized them immediately, and I saw the video twice. And the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because I melted down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was a nightmare. Prime Minister Netanyahu has declared Israel is at war. More than 700 killed here, including at least four American citizens. The Biden administration warning that number could rise. ABC News speaking with the mother of one of those American victims, 32-year-old Chaim Katzman. We thought at one point that he had been taken hostage, but it turned out that I didn't get official information about exactly what happened. His body was found in his apartment. We understand that he and his neighbor were hiding in a closet, and the neighbor, they found one, and the neighbor was released, a woman, and he was shot immediately. Now his loved ones left grieving, remembering a son, a colleague, a friend. You know, getting so many messages from people who worked with Chaim or who knew him or who met him during their travels and how warm he was, how open. He was very accepting person and very loyal friend, good sense of humor, he took things in stride. And new questions about why Israel's intelligence, long a source of pride here, how did they miss this? The worst assault since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the issue of intelligence with our George Stephanopoulos on this week. We have a very close relationship with uh, Israeli intelligence as well as with the Israeli military, as well as with Israel more broadly. So yes, of course, this is something that they and we will be looking at, but the effort right now has to be in dealing with the aggression from Hamas. To deal with that aggression, Israel now retaliating. Hammering Gaza with airstrikes and cutting off power to certain areas. The Israeli military now saying they've struck more than 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad targets in the Gaza Strip, releasing this video of one of their strikes. The Palestinian Health Ministry saying more than 400 have been killed, thousands more civilians injured. They made elderly people, children, and women scared, this man says. Copies of the Quran were shattered. But with Israel shaken, Tens of thousands of Israeli reservists have now been called up to join the fight. We are recovering, first of all, from the most devastating day in Israeli history. Every single Hamas terrorist that carried this out is going to have to look over their shoulder for the rest of their lives. And this young father is waiting for his wife and two young girls to come home. Uh, how are you staying so strong? I don't know. I guess when you're a parent, you have no choice. In fact, we could hear the rocket fire here just before we came on here. Uh, just a reminder that this is ongoing, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The Defense Ministry declaring just moments ago a total siege of the Gaza Strip. No power, no water, no electricity. They say they're dealing with barbaric terrorists and that they will act accordingly. Kira? David, thanks so much. We'll stay in close touch. Let's also bring in our foreign correspondent, James Longman, now, who is on the ground there in Tel Aviv, also former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, our national security analyst, Mick Mulroy. James, let's just start with you. Give us the latest from where you are. Well, we are watching, like the rest of the world, the massive bombardment 
of Gaza. Israel is raining down fury on the Gaza Strip. Uh, they are holding Palestinians uh, responsible for this terror attack and they're not holding back and they haven't even begun their major offensive. The world is w watching and waiting for them uh, to start their ground offensive. But for the moment, these airstrikes uh, look to have caused as many as 560 deaths. That's the latest from the Palestinian Health Authority, but that number is likely to go up. And as you heard there from David, this is total siege. So fuel, electricity, water, all cut off to the Gaza Strip. These are things that they don't get at the best of times, uh, and yet now completely cut off. People have been told to evacuate. 125,000 people have been internally displaced, we understand, at least in Gaza. Again, by the last count, difficult to know right now. They've Some of them, uh, we understand, have been able to get to shelters uh, or um, United Nations schools. There are United Nations properties inside the Gaza Strip. But quite where uh, Palestinians in Gaza are able to fully evacuate is not clear, given it has been uh, sealed now. But the Israelis, this, as you say, this is their 9-11. This was Pearl Harbor for them. Uh, and so they are uh, they are preparing a full throttle uh, assault on, uh, on the Gaza Strip after having cleared the area next to Gaza. They say earlier today they managed to completely clear it of the Hamas militants who were there. And now they're going about uh, calling up reservists. And in the last few minutes, we've had it confirmed that they've called up 300,000 reservists uh, to join their war effort. That, for the, a country this size, is a colossal number. We were driving down the highway and we saw uh, cars pulled up on the side of the highway just for, for miles and miles. And, and our driver said, this, these are reservists. They're allowed to park basically on the highway and go and uh, and and, and uh, sort of uh, volunteer for military service so we're all watching and waiting for the major response from the israelis it feels like it's going to come in some kind of ground invasion but uh, we'll have to wait and see guys and, and james as we're as we're listening to you we're looking at the live picture from gaza seeing what seems to be already to be the beginning of of israel's response mick i want to go to you this is such uh, such a terrible shock to the state of Israel and the Israeli defensive forces have been the pride of that country for decades handling uh, assaults from nation states from from Palestinians from terrorists uh, and here is this utter surprise assault on a huge level and I wonder what does it tell you about the IDF and its preparations for this and about the capacity of the enemy of Israel Hamas so, Terry, it is uh, surprising. I think you are correct. This is one of the most sophisticated militaries and one of the most sophisticated intelligence service, uh, the, the domestic intelligence service being Shin Bet. So I think it's really shocking to uh, quite a few people that are familiar with Israel, not just that it looks like many indicators were missed uh, on the signal side, on the human intelligence side of an operation of this capacity. Uh, it seems like there should have been something picked up. And then also the response of the IDF. I mean, yes, it was a surprise, but according to reports from uh, people on the ground, it took hours uh, to respond. So uh, that's something that's going to have to be looked at and then, and then obviously fixed in the future. But right now, I think they're looking uh, toward the immediate potential for a large-scale ground invasion into Gaza. Absolutely. And if I could just follow up quickly, Mick, the, Reuters is reporting that uh, Hamas was able to jam the communications, at least of those communities along the border, if not beyond. Does that, is that a capacity you would have expected Hamas to have, or is that something that a nation state might have provided? So I think this does indicate that there was a nation state behind it potentially or on. Uh, we know historically they fund about 90 percent of Hamas's uh, military budget. I would wait uh, to hear from the U.S. intelligence community on whether they had a direct involvement in this, but that is an indicator uh, that they did, because that is a very sophisticated device, and in order to do it uh, substantially, there are probably multiple devices plus a cyber uh, attack that also occurred with it, and that does show a level of sophistication that you wouldn't necessarily expect Hamas to have uh, organically. James, what more can you tell us about the hostage situation, even the possibility of American hostages? We have all seen the chilling images uh, now from the festival and elsewhere where it appears uh, all these innocent women, children, uh, festival goers were taken by Hamas fighters there. Would love for you to weigh in as well, Mick. But James, what can you tell us? What do you know? 
Yeah, these were some of the most distressing images, I think, of this entire episode. As you say, men, women, children taken away, young women ripped away from their boyfriends, children, toddlers, uh, part of entire families who've been uh, taken away uh, into the Gaza Strip. Now, when uh, in, the, in the hours that followed uh, this assault, Hamas said that they had dozens of hostages. Uh, another terrorist group that operates in the Strip, Islamic Jihad, also claimed to have uh, something like 30 hostages. Impossible to verify these claims. Uh, and so the assumption is they are in Gaza. Uh, what they will do with these hostages, I mean, it's anyone's guess that assumption perhaps to use them as human shields to move them around inside the strip in different locations perhaps uh, underground away from the airstrikes uh, we have had a report earlier today again impossible to verify uh, these claims that perhaps some of these hostages had been killed in the airstrikes an effort perhaps by these terrorists uh, to make claims to stop the strikes going ahead but uh, you know it is incredibly distressing for the families of these people uh, to watch what we're all watching now in Gaza and wondering that their family members are in there somewhere. I mean, we spoke to one woman uh, whose daughter, Kim, was at that desert rave, 22 years old. We went to her uh, home. Jennifer uh, Damty uh, was the mother, and she said she got a call at 6 a.m. on Saturday from Kim, desperate, uh, wondering what she should do. Uh, Jennifer told her to run, to hide, and they haven't heard from her since. She's just one of the many who are missing, uh, and as yet un un uh, unidentified, perhaps among the dead at that desert rave. Uh, and these families, by the way, are going from hospital to hospital uh, with anything they can find which might have the DNA of their loved ones in order to try and get a match for the dead. Uh, that I mean, imagine that as a parent going from place to place, hoping that your child is dead, so at least you don't have to imagine the idea that they've been taken into Gaza by terrorists. We're going to talk to one of those parents in, in just a second, but Mick, I wanted you to weigh on this as well with regard to the hostages, your former uh, CIA. Do you think there's any kind of conversations going on right now or a plan to intervene with regard to the hostage situation, especially if there's Americans among them? So, Kira, that's right. It's certainly when there's an American taking hostages, the U.S. military, the CIA will spin up and throw a lot of resources at a potential recovery. That said, it's going to be extraordinarily different. Like James said, some of these hostages are likely human shields. All of them are probably completely guarded, and they have a, a, a certain system of which it would be almost impossible to recover them. They could have them in tunnels. The tunnels could be wired. So this, any country that can help facilitate recovery of these hostages, I think is a very good thing. All right, James Longman on the scene there, uh, and Mick Mulroy, thank you very much for helping us understand this shocking incident from all these angles. Thanks very much. I know we'll be getting back to you. Well, we are getting an outpouring of stories from inside Israel and Gaza, and our next guest has an urgent message following the attack on Israel. He is desperately searching for his son, an American citizen serving right now in the IDF at the Gaza border. He's been missing in action for more than 36 hours now without any contact. Ruby Chen joins us now. Uh, Ruby, thank you for being with us, uh, especially at, at this moment. Do you know, uh, what can you tell us about where your son Ite was last seen in action? Well, that's the billion dollar question. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me and, and amplifying my voice. So he uh, was uh, at his base at the border of Gaza. We got a uh, message from him Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m., saying that there is bombing going on. And that was the last time that we had any communication with him. Since then, he has been defined officially by the IDF as missing action. What does that mean? It means that nobody physically has been able to identify him since. He is not in the hospitals, and he is not one of the deceased. As such, the working assumption is if he's not here in the state of Israel, he must be someplace else. So what's the IDF telling you, anything specific? And do you believe now that he may have been captured by Hamas? Well, I think that it's a valid working assumption to have that uh, the lack of communication that Hamas uh, provide Israel regarding the people that they've abducted, which is a bit, you know, sick, you know, people, Holocaust survivors to little children, are the type of people that they gathered up and 
took them over the other side of the border. But I think, you know, the United States, you know, we are all in favor of what President Biden, Secretary of State, you know, have been very uh, fierce in their comments about what they've seen and, you know, how the beliefs and values of the United States, you know, is different than what we've seen here and providing Israel an ability to protect itself. But I'd like to maybe uh, focus on the previous segment and what is happening now in Gaza. And let's take that forward another two weeks from now, where we will see for sure many Palestinians with U.S. passports urging the United States, the State Department, to come and save them for their lives because of what is happening. And you might even say it's a valid point that they are United States citizens. What I would counter and say, I like the same standard. My son, a US citizen, is most likely in Gaza as we speak. And first and, first, first, first and foremost, he is an American citizen, as the Palestinian American citizen would say. No, I am first an American citizen. State Department, please help me. I'm asking for the same standard. And Ruby, first, uh, could you tell us about your son, about his service uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces? And have you heard from the U.S. government uh, at this point? So we are in uh, contact with the uh, embassy and the State Department. And yes, uh, I am a New Yorker, so I do have a congressman that I reached out to. Uh, trying to reach uh, Senator Schumer as well and get his support. Uh, we are all uh, trying to piece the uh, pieces of the puzzle in order to build the picture and understand where not only my son is an American citizen, but there are multiple U.S. Israeli citizens that uh, are in the same situation as we are. And what we are asking from President Biden, in addition to condemning is being more fierce in his request from the Hamas to abide to international law when it comes to POWs. That means that they need to identify each POW that they have. It means that they need to provide and take care of their health, and they need to allow the UN or the Red Cross to come and visit those prisoners of war especially if these are U.S. citizens that they are holding. Ruby, will you just humanize your son, why he wanted to serve in the IDF? Just tell us more about Ite. Yeah, so uh, we uh, moved here uh, about 30 years ago. I'm the uh, proud outcome of the New York public education system. Uh, we believe that this is the Jewish state for the Jewish people. Uh, Itai uh, grew up as an avid uh, NBA fan. I have to say, as a New York Knicks fan, it was difficult for me to see him becoming a Lakers fan and Kobe Bryant, but I guess that's what kids do. Uh, he uh, very much was anticipating his service, but at the end of the day, uh, the values that Itai has are similar to the values that, that I have. And as a kid, going up in the public education system, I'm sure all of you remember, we would take our right hand and pledge allegiance to the flag, and we believe in those values, the values that said, if we are in trouble, or our family, the US is behind us and will take care of us. And I'll just continue that pledge and say, we are one nation, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. And I think this is all we are asking. We're asking at this point of time for the US Secretary of State, as well as other uh, Western governments do as much as possible to provide the minimum requirements of at least giving what is required by international law when holding POWs, not just U.S. citizens that are in Gaza at this moment, but Holocaust survivors, children, Israelis, Europeans. Everyone should have the minimum justice and freedom and liberty that we all grew up on.
Ruby Chen, we're just so grateful uh, for you. Uh, just talking about your son at this time, we'll keep his name out there. We want to stay in close touch with you, and um, we'll continue to update the situation without a doubt. Ruby, thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you for okay. having me and amplifying my voice. Of course. Also, up close and personal with the voices of first responders there on the ground in Israel, how they're saving lives amid Hamas's brutal assault. Next. America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from the Gulf Coast of Florida, covering Hurricane Adalia. I'm Mike Ajachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us on this Monday. Well, we are just learning now that more than 900 Israels have now been, Israelis rather, have been reported dead, more than 2,500 injured. Rafael Pash is an EMT with the United Hatzalah of Israel, a community-based volunteer group where he and his fellow first responders are there on the ground working around the clock to save lives. He now joins us live from Judea. Rafael, let's talk about the latest from where you are, what you are seeming, seeing right now uh, in terms of victims that need medical attention, and do you feel confident that you have been able to save lives amid all of this? Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, in the words of one of the doctors who's at our, uh, our medical clinic on the uh, Gaza border, um, I'm close friends with, uh, he said, uh, we're seeing atrocities that no one ever wants to see. Uh, but are we saving lives? We definitely are. Um, our teams are embedded uh, around the Gaza Strip uh, in the periphery with IDF teams and IDF medical units uh, providing care for both civilians and military personnel who are injured who have been injured in this conflict. Uh, we're doing ambulance transports with volunteer, uh, with our volunteers uh, for the people who were injured uh, out from the periphery to hospitals. We're using our helicopters, medevac helicopters, to transport the more critical patients. Um, as of uh, the latest numbers I had from this morning, uh, we've already treated more than 14 or 1,500 people um, just uh, from teams that are, are currently in the Gaza periphery now. The organization is a national organization of volunteers uh, that come from all over the country. Uh, and we are uh, providing medical attention, we're providing humanitarian aid uh, to the civilian population as well. Many of them couldn't get water uh, or food. Um, and some of the images you're seeing now are, are uh, people who donated uh, to help support that effort. Um, from all different areas of Israel, uh, we've brought down equipment to the, uh, to the affected area, to the people in their homes in, in Sderot and the other towns uh, in the Gaza Prefecture. People have been afraid to leave their homes, been told not to leave their homes in the last couple of days. Uh, so we're providing them going door to door, providing them with food and water, um, in addition to medical aid as needed. Uh, we have medical clinics, as I mentioned before, that are being set up our own periphery. There are currently 1,500 volunteers uh, that have left their jobs, their families, uh, from both Gaza Prefecture and the areas around the rest of the country to go down to provide assistance. Um, we've also, you know, now there's been some, uh, I guess, uh, violence in the north of the country as well. Uh, so our teams up there in the north have also been receiving supplies uh, and equipment in order to hopefully, hopefully the things won't develop up there. Uh, but if the need arises, uh, we're providing already extra equipment, additional volunteers to the north as well to sort of bolster teams that are there. Um, so it's a very dynamic situation. Uh, it's something we we haven't really seen on this scale before. Uh, like uh, you know, they said earlier, that we haven't seen something like this in the past 50 years since the Yom Kippur War. Um, but we do train uh, a lot of training for mass casualty incidents, for uh, dropping everything we're doing and responding to emergencies at a moment's notice. Uh, we're, our, our volunteers excel at that. Uh, we've gone on many international missions around the world. Many of our teams just came back from Morocco less than two weeks ago uh, from the earthquake that was there. Um, and then that sort of rushed right into this after even beyond the holiday. 
uh, itself. So there's really been no respite for the teams, um, but everyone's standing strong and working together. Uh, Thank the other you very aspect much. That we're seeing a lot of just just, just one more question. We're seeing is a lot of violence on against first responders themselves. People have been attacked. Right. There have been some ambulances that have been uh, shot at. Uh, we've had two volunteers already killed, unfortunately, and another few injured, and two of them are missing. Uh, we're not sure what's happened to them. They may uh, have been kidnapped as well. Um, so there's really a, a tension amongst the first responders themselves. They're literally putting their lives on the line to save others. All right, Raphael Posh, uh, EMT there on the ground. Uh, we thank you for giving us that update on the work that so many are doing there and on the dangers that they face. Thanks very much. Before we go to break, we do have uh, some breaking news. Hamas now issuing uh, this statement uh, that we have uh, warning Israel to actually stop firing rockets or they will begin executing hostages. Uh, we're getting word from Hamas now in this statement as that death toll in Israel continues to rise. We are talking about more than 900 people that have been killed in Israel so far, 600 dead in Gaza. Once again, Hamas putting out this warning that they will start executing Israeli hostages one by one, it says in this statement, and will film them as well, unless what they say, this barbaric shelling stop immediately or people given warning before destroying homes. It's chilling. Um, as we get this information into That's us why they here. took the hostages in the first place, no question. Yeah. All right. Uh, clearly, a lot more news ahead. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Bedminster, New Jersey, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story at this hour, of course, Israel is at war. Palestinian militant group Hamas has launched a surprise assault. And now, 48 hours later, the unprecedented attacks targeting Israeli city centers and civilian communities have not stopped. Israel's 9-11 is what it's being called, the harrowing and bloody images showing the barrage of rockets and the aftermath, hostages being taken, buildings reduced to rubble. Live pictures now from Gaza, where Israeli forces are pounding the territory right now by air. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu speaking just moments ago, announcing that Israel has only just started and will not stop. Netanyahu ordering a total siege of Gaza in retaliation, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip now. 
So far, at least 900 people have been killed in Israel, and nearly 600 people are dead in Gaza. We have team coverage all day long, and we begin with ABC News foreign correspondent Inez de la Quatera. Inez, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu just finishing his remarks, in which, in addition to other things, he said, this is an existential fight. We are in a war to guarantee our existence, and we will win. We are fighting against an abominable enemy, truly animals, dehumanizing the other side in a way reminiscent, frankly, of World War II. Uh, and he is trying to get the world on his side as well. What do you think of what he's been saying? Hey, that's right. Yeah, some really harsh rhetoric from the uh, Israeli prime minister there. You mentioned he's trying to get the world on his, his side. He did talk about how that was one of his goals, to get international support for Israel here. He talked about President Biden being in constant contact with President Biden. He thanked thanked President Biden for his support and talked about the uh, military aid that was on its way to Israel. He's also calling for unity here, calling on all Israelis, you know, no matter how divided this country may have been prior to this horrendous uh, attack, he is calling on everyone to unite. And he says this will be a long war, but they are determined to win it. Lots of questions about what's going to be next here uh, for uh, Israel, for the IDF, for Gaza, whether a ground operation could be in the work. Uh, still lots of questions there, but certainly some, some harsh uh, rhetoric from the prime minister there. So what has it been like for you while reporting there? What are the people telling you, the conversations that you uh, have had, and just the feeling among those who just feel, well, they're literally mm. caught in the crossfire? Yeah, I mean, certainly a, a tense atmosphere here, to say the least. Air raid sirens blaring across uh, Israel for days now. So yesterday, just minutes after we'd landed, um, air raid sirens blaring in Tel Aviv and uh, reports that Hamas was actually targeting the airport. The airport does remain open, though. Today, uh, air raid sirens again blaring in Tel Aviv, blaring twice in Jerusalem, in Ashkelon, further south. Um, we had to take a cover. We were uh, just arriving at the missing person center here close to the airport to try and talk to families who are looking for their loved ones. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, within minutes of arriving there, we had to take cover with those families inside that center. Uh, you know, inside that center, the, the mood, obviously, um, incredibly sad. These are their families who haven't heard from their loved ones in the last couple of days. These are people who could be, uh, who could have been killed, who are, you know, could, could have been taken uh, hostage. Uh, on the hostage front, we do know that at least 100 Israelis were taken. The Israeli military says that they know of all the hostages who've been taken, and they are working their way towards informing all the families. At least 30 families have now been informed, um, and they say they'll have an update there on, on uh, once they've informed all the families. But some really grim news on that front with a Hamas spokesman uh, saying that they will begin executing Israeli hostages one by one if the shelling, this continuous shelling on Gaza continues without warning. They want the IDF to at, le at least warn uh, civilians in Gaza before they strike targets uh, in the Gaza Strip, guys. And threatening all also to televise those executions. Uh, it just gets worse by the hour. And as Delacuatera live for us from Tel Aviv, thank you. So the IDF uh, now says it believes at least 100 people have been taken hostage by Hamas militants, with an unknown number of people who are still missing and unaccounted for. And now Hamas has warned that it will begin, as Inez was just uh, reporting for us, executing the hostages uh, ahead of any future Israeli strikes. They're trying to get Israel to back down in its response. Among the missing is 74-year-old Vivian Silver, a mother and grandmother. She raised her two sons on a kibbutz along the border with Gaza in the 1980s. And her son, Jonathan Zeichen, joins us now from Tel Aviv. Jonathan, so when did you last hear from you on first uh, our concern and... and our, our, our sense of solidarity go out to you. What can you tell us about your mom? Where was she? What was happening around her on Saturday morning? Um, I was in contact with uh, my mother throughout the morning of Saturday um, uh, up until she wrote me that uh, she has uh, armed uh, people inside her house. And then uh, commu uh, communication uh, stopped around 11 a.m. 
Your mom dedicated her life and worked tirelessly uh, for shared society and equality between Arabs and Jews in Israel. Um, have you heard anything from the IDF about the search for her and other hostages, Yonatan? Um, no, I haven't heard uh, anything concrete from uh, the authorities. Um, I even don't know if Israeli soldiers got to her house yet or not. And Yonatan, um we understand uh, that your mom immigrated to Israel from Canada 50 years ago and raised you and your brother there. Tell us more about about that and how she's dedicated so much of her life. I guess she's she's trying to work to solve this insoluble Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Tell us about that work too. Um, yes, my mother got to Israel from Canada uh, 50 years ago. Um, we've been living uh, on Kibbutz Beri since 1990. Um, and her, uh, you know, what? peace work was her essence. Uh, not only peace work, also she fought for equality all of her life. Um, she's been involved with a lot of different organizations uh, promoting peace um pr promoting solution for the conflict um she was a co-ceo of uh, nisped the negev institute for peace and development um since she retired uh, at uh, 2015 she was uh, very much involved with the organization women wage peace um and up until recently, she would uh, drive sick Palestinians from the Gaza border to Israeli hospitals through an organization called uh, Road to Recovery. So, Yonatan, here's a woman who dedicated her whole life to try and prevent uh, the type of violence that we're seeing, the animosity, the, 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 the warring factions, and yet... Now she's gone missing. Um, I, I'm just curious, how how did she raise you and your brother? Because clearly, you you all lived there and witnessed um, this tension for for decades. But how what did she teach you and tell you, uh, you know, about moments l like this? Um, I, I'm curious, you know, what you have kept in your head and your heart, uh, being raised by her and now watching what's happening. And the fact that she, you know, of all people, ha has gone missing here. Um, I think this is exactly what she was working to prevent. Um, all all uh, kind of war. Um, it's, you know, it's not uh, completely surprising, although it's very overwhelming that we got to this point. Um, our two, these two people have been in a state of war for so long. Um, that it, uh, this is the outcome. And this is what she was working to try to prevent. Uh, and I, w I was raised on that, on those values and on those um, aspirations. And are are you angry today, Jonathan? Does it mm. feel as if it's gone all wrong for your family, for her? How do you feel? Um, no, I'm uh, primarily sad and anxious. Um, you know, being a, a war is blind. You can't, uh, what you do in your life doesn't, uh, it, it uh, doesn't make you um, a, 
any less of a target in, in uh, times of war. He's definitely one human being uh, should it, that should have never been targeted. Yonatan Zygen, we sure hope that we can stay in touch with you and hope that we can hear soon that you know exactly where your mom is and that you will be able to wrap your arms around her. Yeah. Thank you for being with us, Yonatan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's talk more about how Israel was apparently caught off guard by this weekend assault. Our national security analyst, uh, Mick Mulroy, who is also Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, joins us along with ABC News contributor and former DHS official John Cohen. So Mick, you know, this appears to be the result of an intel failure by Israel. How the heck did that happen? I mean, what are your sources telling you? And what does this tell us about the power and influence of Iran when it comes to uh, any talk of a possible uh, peace deal you know, between Israel and Saudi, which was on the line there, uh, and how Hamas has stepped in, clearly, along with Iran, and sabotaged this? Well, that's a good point, Kara. I think, obviously, this was an intelligence failure. Uh, the best intelligence services in the world do have failures. Uh, ours, the CIA, obviously, on 9-11. Uh, but that doesn't mitigate anything when it comes to what the consequences of this failure uh, were, and which is what we're seeing right now play out. So I think there'll be a full review on why that was the case. Uh, there's speculation that uh, perhaps uh, the Israelis relied too much on signals intelligence. And if uh, Hamas got the devices necessary to avoid detection that way, potentially from Iran, uh, that they might have missed it that way. Essentially, uh, there will be a lot of effort in the future, I think, to make sure that there's human uh, assets on the ground, uh, which would, may have been able to predict this or at least give an early warning that this was going to happen based on the complexity of it. To your point do. on the make a deal, as they call it, between Israel and, and Saudi Arabia, I do think that one of Hamas's purpose was to disrupt that. And quite frankly, right now, it looks like they have. Uh, they would not want uh, a, a stable Saudi Arabia. Israel relationship for their purposes. And that, again, might have been why one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why Hamas launched this, this attack. Hmm. And, and John, we now know that Hamas has taken, according to Israeli authorities, more than 100 hostages and is threatening to kill them in public in a way that they can display to the world unless Israel backs down from the kind of response that we are already seeing. So, you know, what can Israel do? now given that horror well israel's not going to back down as if history is any precedent uh, and you're hitting on a really important issue uh, what israeli and other authorities will be trying to do is to contain this situation they'll try to contain it to what has occurred thus far my concern is with the hostages with the activity we're seeing involving lebanon um, with uh, the activity we're seeing online where you see forums controlled by Russian intelligence, Iran, Hezbollah, Sunni terrorist groups calling for additional attacks, uh, that the circumstances we're experiencing now in Israel may spread beyond Israel to other parts of the region. So that's a real concern at this point in time as well. So, Mick, the Israeli military has announced it's calling up 300,000 reserve soldiers now. So does Prime Minister Netanyahu order a ground offensive in Gaza? And at what point, and is it possible, because we have heard of Navy ships coming closer into the region, uh, that the U.S. may get involved at a different level? So, Kira, 300,000 uh, troops definitely indicates to me that they're preparing for a large-scale ground invasion into Gaza with potentially a considerable amount of time in an occupation mode, potentially just to completely dismantle uh, Hamas. Uh, that certainly is enough troops that can do that. And I think that's, uh, that's ab absolutely uh, what they should do if they want to prevent this from happening in the future. And if you could ask the second part of the question again, Wondering if the U.S. We we we've already reported oh, yes. on the fact that Navy assets, right, that have always already been out in certain parts of of the waters, right, are moving closer into the region. Um, besides just messaging here, right, strategic messaging. Um, at what point, or do you see the U.S. in any way getting involved here? 
Well, absolutely. The Gerald R. Ford Aircraft Carrier Group, which is an aircraft carrier, two destroyers, and two cruisers. So it's a substantial amount of military assets. Primarily, it's there for uh, uh, deterrence, but it will also be there just in case this, this war expands. If Hezbollah gets involved, Lebanon, uh, there's, there's Israeli, I mean, excuse me, there's Iranian proxies in Syria. If this becomes a wider regional conflict, the United States will be there uh, to support. Right now, I think the U.S. role will be uh, providing munitions, which they will need for this large-scale ground invasion, and potentially intelligence uh, support on how they go about planning this very complicated mission. I don't see the United States getting directly involved unless becomes, this becomes a much larger war, of which could overwhelm uh, the Israeli defenses. Well, so that doesn't happen for sure. Uh, Mick Mulroy, John Cohen, thanks very much for that. And coming up, the future of the Middle East after the deadly attack on Israel. Israel's former ambassador to the United States under President Clinton joins us after a short break. No, it's the other way around. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Glad you're streaming with us. More than 900 people are now dead in Israel, along with hundreds of others in the Gaza Strip. And unfortunately, it's likely to get worse. So how did this happen and what happens next? To try to answer that question, let's bring in Edward Jeregin, former U.S. ambassador to Israel under President Clinton. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being with us. You've said, obviously, as many others have, this was a colossal failure of Israeli intelligence. Uh, you know, it's a formidable operation, the Israeli intelligence agencies uh, that have protected that country against all kinds of threats for many, many years. This is really a shock, as in the words of people in Israel, a Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor moment. How do you think it happened at this point? What's your assessment of that? Well, not only is it a major failure of intelligence all around, but in my view, it's the failure of Israel's deterrence policy against Hamas, which goes way back to 2005 at least. Uh, this policy of keeping Hamas hemmed in in the Gaza Strip with intermittent uh, hostilities. There have been five wars between Israel and Hamas. And it's just a failed policy of deterrence. And this to me is even more important than the intelligence failure, because after the retaliations that are going to take place that, you're, that you and your, your commentators spoke of, what's the end game? 
I think it's going to be very difficult for the parties and the region to go back to the status quo ante. Even if Israel goes in there and quote unquote dismantles Hamas, which will be a very difficult task and a very bloody one, what is the victory? How can you say that's a victory? Because the situation will remain the same. And the status quo that has existed for decades now has proven to be very, very unstable. In fact, I was taken by an Israeli military official saying uh, before th these incidents, this war, saying that Gaza is an unstable, is a stable, unstable place, a sta unstable, stable place. Well, that cannot continue. And I think also that the implications and consequences of this current war between Hamas and Israel is going to have regional implications. So, okay, so then two questions for you. Let's start, we'll get to the regional implications in, in a minute, because of course there was this peace deal that was on the line with Saudi, Israel. But let, let's back up to, to your belief here with these 300 reserve troops that Netanyahu has now called for. Um, and, the, and the talk is, it, it's about dismantling Hamas. Do you believe there is going to be a ground offensive here? Do you believe that they can dismantle Hamas? And if indeed that does happen, what do you see as, I guess, the next moment in time? And of course, that folds into the regional question of, of what's going to happen here. Um, but why don't we stay focused on, do you see a ground offensive about to happen? Do you see that entire area being occupied? And do you see Hamas being dismantled? If indeed uh, Israel moves its military troops on the ground and it becomes a ground offensive into Gaza, uh, then they will definitely try to dismantle the whole infrastructure and the leadership uh, of, of Hamas. Whether that is going to happen or not, I cannot predict. But remember, Hamas is an organization. It has a following. It has external support. And so I'm a little skeptical if they can get, quote unquote, rid of Hamas. The second thing is that with the hostages that you've reported, the Israeli hostages in Hamas's hands, the Israelis have to calibrate very carefully what the consequences of a ground offensive would be. And if they do so, uh, Hamas may be, well resort to killing the uh, some of the hostages or all of the hostages. So that's another inhibiting factor. And I'm sure this is uh, being intensely uh, analyzed uh, in Israel now before they mount uh, what is going to be a major offensive against Gaza. But at the end of the day, is Israel going to reoccupy Gaza after 2005 when it left? Uh, we will see, but that would be that would also have major consequences. On that, if I could, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you know, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that this uh, that they are going to quote change the Middle East with their response to this, not just to dismantle Hamas, but to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And whatever he meant by it change the Middle East. You were ambassador during the Oslo Accords. We remember those days. I mean, it, it's not like everything was hunky-dory, but there was hope in the air, right? There was a sense that, hey, this, this long, horrible, anguished uh, conflict might have a solution. That was in 1994, long time ago. Is there any way back to that sense? Once again, not like everything, you know, was going to rain flowers and candy, but that, that maybe there would be peace. You make a very good point. There is no hope. There's no political horizon. There's no negotiating framework. Uh, there are no principles for a final settlement between Israel and the Palestinians that's on the table. The last negotiations of any sort was under the Obama administration in 2014. I firmly believe that the absence of diplomacy the lack of leadership on all sides, on all sides, uh, has gotten us into this situation where the resort to terrorism, violence, war has been the default option. We've got to get back 
to a political horizon, as impractical as that seems to, to, to be now in the midst of this, this, this horrible, uh, the horrible events we're witnessing, there is no military solution to this crisis. I remember when I was an ambassador to Israel and Yitzhak Rabin was the prime minister, he made it, he told me once, he said, he said, there is no military solution to our conflict with the Palestinians. There has to be a political solution. And he sought a political solution. And as you know, he was assassinated by Israeli extremists for, for his position on that. So he gave his life for we've got to get back to the negotiating table. Mm. We've right. got to get well. back to a political solution. Ambassador Jaredjan, we want to thank you very much for your experience and wisdom that you bring to this in this moment. Really appreciate it. I hope we can talk to you again. Thanks. Thank you. And we will be right back after a short break. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Hit me with them good vibes, pictures on my phone lights Everything is so fine, little bit of sunshine Dance some more, just a little bit, breathe more, just a little bit Smile a little more in a minute with, ah, 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 ah I've been running through the strange lives, pictures on my phone lights Everything is so fine, little bit of sunshine A little bit of sunshine, a little bit of sunshine Good morning, America! Traveling with the president in Vietnam, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Some other headlines that we're tracking for you this hour. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. announcing today he is running for president as an independent candidate. Kennedy was formerly a Democratic hopeful. But in remarks in Philly, he says that he is declaring independence now from the Democratic Party, a party that his father, uncle, and family have symbolized for decades. And history at the Chicago Marathon. Kenyan River runner Calvin Kiptum smashed the world record for the marathon, finishing the race in just two hours and 35 seconds. That's four minutes, 34 seconds per mile for 26 miles. Kipton will now look to break the formidable two-hour barrier in an open race. That is, a, that is a feat that was once thought to be physically impossible for humans. He's out to change our minds. Pretty unbelievable. He'll be fun to track. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. The news never stops. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Good afternoon, I'm Terry Moran. And I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, of course, is Israel declaring war after a terrorist attack by Palestinian militant group Hamas. And the killing hasn't stopped. 
Hamas taking Israel completely by surprise, launching thousands of rockets and sending ground troops targeting civilians within Israel's borders. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. Live pictures now from Gaza. As Israeli forces pound the territory by air, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vow vowing Netanyahu rather vowing to settle the score, ordering a total siege of Gaza, vowing revenge and cutting off all resources now to the Gaza Strip. So far, at least 900 have been killed in Israel and nearly 600 more are dead in Gaza. We've got team coverage all day long, of course, and we begin with ABC News foreign correspondent Inez de la Quatera and Inez is in Tel Aviv. What is it like there right now? What's the feel of the place, Inez? Hey guys, yeah, I mean, certainly a, a tense atmosphere here to say the least. Air raid sirens have been going off across Israel, uh, twice in Jerusalem, in Ashkelon further south, and in Tel Aviv as well earlier today. We were actually at a missing person center earlier this morning uh, when those sirens uh, went off and we had to shelter in place with those families. These were families who have not heard from some of their loved ones in uh, a couple days. These are people who may have been killed, who may have been taken hostage. And so the government has set up this uh, center to try and help these families. We met one man there who was looking for his cousin who attended that music festival where we know 260 bodies at least were recovered. He hadn't heard from his cousin in a couple of days and he had brought a DNA sample to the center to try and get some answers. That's what uh, families are being encouraged to do. They're being told to bring DNA samples, things like hairbrushes, toothbrushes um, for investigators to, to try and, and, and figure out where these people are. Worth pointing out that the IDF says they have, uh, they know that uh, at least 100 hostages have been taken. They say they know of all the hostages that have been taken. So far, they've informed about 30 families uh, that their loved ones have been taken, and they're still working on informing other families. On this hostage issue, some, some really grim news coming out in just the last few moments with a Hamas spokesman on Al Jazeera talking about how they might begin uh, executing how they would begin uh, executing hostages one by one. So he said, uh, a quote, uh, starting this hour, we announced that every targeting of our people who are safe at their home without a prior warning will be regrettably met with the execution of a civilian enemy hostage, and we will be forced to broadcast it, the execution, with audio and video. They're saying this would be in retaliation for the continuous strikes that we have seen on Gaza. All right, Inez, appreciate uh, so much your reporting there from Tel Aviv. We'll stay in close touch. And right now, Palestinian leaders are reporting that more than 500 people have been killed in Gaza, including at least 90 children, more than 2,900 Palestinians injured. And according to the UN, more than 120,000 people have now been displaced there within the Gaza Strip. Thousands of homes and apartments destroyed, ambulances, health facilities, all damaged. And for more on the impact on Palestinian civilians in Gaza, we're joined now by Noura Arakat, a human rights attorney and associate professor at Rutgers University. Thank you for being with us, Noura. Uh, for an American audience, help us understand the humanitarian situation in Gaza. I've been there. It is a, it is a small area. People are, might not realize how small and very crowded. And they have been uh, under... Uh, Israeli supervision, they've been, uh, they, they were able to, uh, the Israelis pulled out, but essentially they've been governed by Israel for many, many years now. What's happening to Palestinian civilians? What's life like there leading up to these terror attacks? I appreciate the concern for the Palestinians who are held hostage in the Gaza Strip in an open air prison under a complete naval blockade and land siege for the Palestinians. 16 years, Israel has basically Palestinian prisoners under a collective punishment a violation of Article 33 of the 43 uh, uh, Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibits the target of all civilians. What these Palestinians have done is nothing more than to exist. Um, and this is a man-made disaster that has been wrought by Israel. We know that this strip that you mentioned is very small. You say that Israel governs it. Israel remains the occupying power of the Gaza Strip and yet has, to, for the past 16 years, limited the amount of food that enters, has uh, limited electricity, cut off electricity, target telecommunications buildings, has limited the movement of Palestinians who are able to receive health care, even chemo treatment 
has prevented Palestinians from harvesting their lands for food or fishing off the coast in order to feed themselves and has told the world that it is their fault that they are being punished in that way. The World Health Organization told us in 2015 that the Gaza Strip would be unlivable in 2020. It is 2023. That means right now, the Gaza Strip is set up in a way where those trapped Palestinians in the largest ghetto right now on earth are set up to die quietly unless we do something about it. And we have not moved in order to end the siege, to end the occupation, to end the Israeli apartheid regime that sustains this worst form of violence that is leading to this episode and these atrocities that we're witnessing today. Nora, which leads me to my next question. These attacks by Hamas are an absolute atrocity, but this type of violence and deadly force is not what all Palestinians support. I think it's crucial to point that out. Uh, so why don't the Palestinians, and there have been Palestinians who have protested peacefully in the past, why is that voice not, not louder? Why does that voice not have more influence here? I would ask your producers and I would ask other mainstream media uh, producers why they don't amplify those voices much more. The history of Palestinian nonviolent movement is robust and far greater than any of these episodes, and yet it doesn't get the same amount of attention. In 2018, Palestinian youth in Gaza organized the largest civil society protest. 20 to 40,000 Palestinians marched peacefully every single week in the Great March of Return, demanding the right to return to their homelands in an end of the siege. They were shot down like birds by Israeli snipers. Mum, there was no coverage of them. The boycott divestment sanctions movement takes inspiration from the anti-apartheid movement against South Africa, and yet that is maligned um, and, and castigated as being violent, even though that is the Pit, that is the quintessential form of nonviolent resistance. In 2011 and 12, civilians boarded flotillas to break the siege on Gaza, and they were commandeered by eight Israeli naval commandos. Where was the coverage of that? This is not about how Palestinians, whether or not they resist peacefully or violently, this is about the right of Palestinians to resist at all. And it really is the responsibility of media, of international diplomatic capitals, who have not only failed to celebrate and uplift and protect these Palestinians who have been leading these protests, but also uh, is a failure for all of us uh, to, 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 to uh, isolate Israel and to hold it to account so that we do not sustain these forms of ongoing violence. And, and now we are faced with this atrocity, with this savage uh, atrocity that has been committed in Israel. And Israel, any country, uh, if somebody came across a border and did what these people did, this conduct, this barbaric conduct of, you know, stealing children and women out of homes, raping the women, stripping them naked, killing them, parading their dead bodies through the street and praising God for it. I mean, any country is going to respond. Israel is now planning a, not only this major counteroffensive, it has cut off gas, electricity, and water to Gaza. They claim that's a response to this attack. Talk about the uh, impact that that will have on the civilians of Gaza. I want to point out two things. Number one, Israel has explicitly said that by cutting off electricity to the Palestinians in Gaza, that that is a collective punishment. That is a war crime. Those Palestinians need to be protected. They are under Israel. They should be protected as an uh, uh, being occupied. Number two, no that I believe in the principle that all civilian life is equal and needs to be protected. And yet we we are reacting to this moment against uh, attacks against civilians, we're describing it as barbarism. We're hearing Israeli um, generals who are calling Palestinians uh, human animals. This is basically a racial framework that is desensitizing us to Palestinian death and to be prepared to accept and even applaud that death as something being justified. We need to be aware that if we are indeed against all form of protecting all civilian life, that that includes Palestinian life. And that remember that Palestinians also have the right to self-defense. And yet we have told them, not only do you not have the right to self-defense, you do not have the right to, to, to even protest. And so we could have avoided this moment and we can avoid future atrocities by ending the main forms of structural violence in the forms of occupation, 
in the forms of lifting the siege and in ending Israel's system of apartheid. Israel has also attacked the Palestinians besieged in Gaza now five times since 2008 using advanced weapons technologies where they have struck homes with Palestinian families in them. Where is the international community? Why do they not step in, restrain Israel, punish it for its apartheid regime, rather than celebrate it by furthering its normalization, by normalizing apartheid, which is a crime against humanity, and then being shocked in moments like this, our failure to resolve this issue, our failure to end Israeli apartheid and ongoing settler colonization is the reason we are continuing to see these atrocities. And if we do want to fight for peace, and all of us do, then we not only have to end this particular crisis, but we have to end the conditions that sustain it, namely dismantling Israel's apartheid system, ending the occupation, lifting the siege. Nora, I think it's fair to say Hamas doesn't want peace. That's not why they're in this. And, and they're being backed by Iran. And so what we're seeing here is what human rights advocates like you, other scholars, other citizens but, have been but saying let me ask for you years. This. Let me ask you this. If Hamas were to disappear, let me ask you this. If Hamas were to disappear, Israel would not change its policy. Look at the West Bank. In the West Bank, they have the most compliant leader in the form of Mahmoud Abbas, who leads the Fatah party. Mahmoud Abbas actually coordinates with Israel Israel in order to police Palestinians and to protect Israeli settlements. And what has Israel done there? There have been three settler programs against Turmus Aya and Hawara. There have been attacks, naval and ground, aerial and ground invasion of the Jenin refugee camp. There is a wall that is taking the Palestinian land. They have transferred the military occupation to civilian hands, saying that occupation so what is your will be answer? permanent. What is, they are going what, what is to your answer, Nora? annex the Jordan Valley. With all due respect, with Is all due Netanyahu? respect, if Hamas were to disappear, Israel does not change its policies to, towards Palestinians. So you're saying, and that is you're what saying it's in the hands of Netanyahu. What do we have to do for Israel to stop? You're, you're saying it's in the hands of Benjamin Netanyahu then. Let's say Hamas goes away, which unfortunately I don't think it ever will. But you're saying this lies in the hands of Benjamin That's Netanyahu. That's not true. It wasn't way... founded until 1987. And Israel occupied the Gaza Strip in 1967 and forcibly removed Palestinians 39 years before that in 1948. I Our should say it's hard to get rid of terrorism. Hamas seems to think that Hamas is the pro Hamas will disappear. Well, they're Israel the governing authority, policy, uh, the elected, they're the elected otherwise. governing authority in Gaza at the moment and have committed a terrorist atrocity of, of surpassing uh, uh, cruelty. And, uh, and that's who they are. And that needs to be dealt with. And that as is I say, not, I, the, look, I do not want to be here defending Hamas. As a Palestinian, I would not have voted for them. You are putting me in a very awkward position when you are not taking into account that Hamas was elected into office as a referendum against the failed Oslo Accords, which basically imprisoned Palestinians, which it was a referendum against the PA, which became part of Israel's occupation regime. Then the Palestinians were punished by siege and Hamas never was given the opportunity to govern and to fail. I am not here to defend Hamas, but people should remember that if they are the governing authority, they have a military wing and a political wing. This military wing is doing what it's doing, but that doesn't make all Palestinians target. No it doesn't justify perpetual unfreedom of Palestinians and their subjugation. Oh, nope. we pointed that out. We made that very clear, very clear. There's a big difference between the peaceful protesting so Palestinians. Saying, let us fight for peace together by not only ending this crisis, but also lifting the siege, ending the occupation, and ending the apartheid regime. In 2020, human rights organizations and Israeli human rights organizations says Israel oversees apartheid. That is a crime against humanity. Do you know how violent that is? day in and day out, that's daily warfare against Palestinians. There has not been sanctions against Israel for its apartheid. They have been celebrated and rewarded. In one night, the European Commission has suspended all aid to Palestinians in, the, in 691 million euros. Why can we not enact that kind of political will against apartheid, against a crime against humanity? I am with you.
I want peace. Palestinians have been fighting for peace. They have waged nonviolent protest. We are not paying attention to the thousands of Gandhis. And then in moments like this, we are whittling down the situation to Hamas when there is an entire context of 75 years of dispossession, 56 years of occupation, 16 years of siege and constant warfare. Help us get to peace by placing accountability where it belongs. Israel is not above international law. Israel should not be granted a pass for overseeing an apartheid regime. We're not giving a pass to Palestinians either. And in fact, Hamas submitted itself to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. There here is a lack of parity, and it's not because Hamas is getting a pass or Palestinians is getting a pass. It is because we are giving Israel a pass and not taking account this entire context. We do not heal cancer by placing band-aids on bodies. We must remove the tumor. We must address the root cause of this. I am with you. This is atrocious and horrifying. 565 Palestinians have also been killed in three days. That doesn't count the 215 Palestinians that have been killed this year. We want peace right. more than anybody. Nora Erekat, we thank you for bringing us that context. Appreciate it very much. Thank Coming you. up, a lot more developments on Israel's response to the deadly Hamas attack. How does Washington respond? We'll take you to the Hill next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Glad you're streaming with us. We're going to take it to Capitol Hill now, where the House is preparing a bipartisan resolution to declare that it stands with Israel, but they can't move forward on anything until it elects a new speaker. And that includes possible additional funding for Israel at this moment of crisis. Former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy spoke to the press earlier today about the unfolding conflict in Israel and a possible five-point plan that includes rescuing hostages, refreezing the $6 billion uh, that was recently released to Iran by the Biden administration. Here's Kevin McCarthy. Now is the time for action. America needs a five-point plan to meet this moment to help our ally Israel and to strengthen our own future. The very first thing we need to do is rescue the American hostages. President Biden's number one priority right now must be finding out how many Americans have been taken hostage and get them home. We cannot repeat what happened in Afghanistan. Our Karen Travers and Jay O'Brien joining us now for more context from the White House to the Hill. So Karen, uh, we haven't seen uh, the president publicly today. The White House, well, says that it's been working behind the scenes about what's going on in Israel. What do we know? Yeah, the president has no public events today, Kira, and there is no White House briefing. It's a federal holiday, and that's standard operating procedure here. Uh, but the White House did give us some insight into what he's doing behind closed doors, saying he met today with the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, his National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, as well as other senior administration officials, to get an update on the situation in Israel. The president told all of his senior national security officials that they have to have close coordination still with Israel about what the administration can 
be doing, and also to be in touch with regional partners. And he again, through this White House statement, was issuing that warning to other countries in the region, countries that he said on Saturday might be hostile to Israel, that they should not try to take advantage of this situation right now. They have not explicitly said Iran, but Kira and Terry, very clear, that is what they're referring to. Yeah, and so Jay, let's let's go to you up on Capitol Hill. No speaker of the House, gridlock on Capitol Hill. You know, how how serious is that a problem for the people who are supporting Israel and want to get the United States Congress to work on that? Well, it freezes the House floor, Terry. You couldn't pass any kind of supplemental military aid package for Israel on the House floor until there was a Speaker of the House. You couldn't even pass a resolution condemning the attacks in Israel until there is a Speaker of the House. And former Speaker Kevin McCarthy made note of that earlier today. There isn't a Speaker, so there wasn't a Speaker to give a speech condemning those attacks in Israel. So in steps Kevin McCarthy, who has had a long career of supporting Israel. He had addressed the Israeli parliament when he was Speaker of the House. And as you played sound of, he denounced the attacks. He called on the president to do more. But those remarks also came as Republicans are calling on Speaker McCarthy to get back into the race for Speaker, saying that this is a moment that he should come back into office for, because, for numerous examples, because of those attacks on Israel. Speaker McCarthy, noticeably when he was asked about that, didn't say no. He said it's up to the conference to pick who their speaker is going to be. And we know that process is playing out. There's a meeting tonight at the conference. They're going to hear from their speaker candidates tomorrow night, guys. Uh, Jay, did you just say that Kevin McCarthy might come back as speaker? And, and how, how soon are they going to settle this? It seems, I, I don't know, it seems... Uh... Complicated. <laughs> and immature a little bit. Oh, we'll take him back. Well, what's going to happen here? He's back. Uh, so there are moderate Republicans who have essentially said that because uh, it, removing a Speaker of the House leaves the United States in a vulnerable position. That's the argument that moderate Republicans have made. And some have called for Speaker McCarthy to essentially return to his job for the conference to nominate him again. McCarthy got that question in those remarks, and he essentially, as I said, he didn't necessarily say no, and he didn't really pour cold water on it. He kind of just sidestepped it, said it's up to his colleagues in the House of Representatives. I can tell you, we've heard from some of that anti-McCarthy faction. Matt Gates, for instance, says it is not the time for Kevin McCarthy to come back. He tweeted, it's the time to move forward. There are other candidates. Steve Scalise, the number two Republican in the House, has got some endorsements. Jim Jordan has others. Again, the conference is going to meet behind closed doors tonight. They're going to hear from those two candidates and potentially any more that there might be tomorrow morning. And they're hoping to vote this week within behind their own closed doors and bring it to a floor for a vote later on in the week if there is agreement. But all of that, guys, is dependent upon Republicans agreeing to something behind closed doors, and if we've seen anything over the last few months, that is easier said than done. So, Karen, some Republicans are making a connection between the Biden administration's move to unfreeze Iranian assets, the $6 billion, in exchange for the release of those five U.S. Uh, hostages uh, held in Iran and that massive terror attack by Hamas in Israel. Uh, the Biden administration says none of the Iranian, Iranian funds have been spent so far. How can the administration be sure? How exactly is that money being tracked? And uh, do you think they're being transparent here? The White House says they can be sure that that money hasn't moved yet because they are closely monitoring it and it still remains in that account. Cutter. And there are going to be what they say are sufficient oversight mechanisms to make sure that that $6 billion of Iranian oil revenue that was transferred as part of that detainee deal that the U.S. made with Iran, they're going to make sure that that money does not go to anything other than humanitarian purposes. The White House says that things like food and medicine. The question, though, is that Republicans are raising is just because that money has not gone out yet, can there be other funding from Iran that could be used for nefarious purposes? Sure, there could be oversight and strict monitoring of this $6 billion, but what about other Iranian funds? And, you know, the question came up today about Iran's direct involvement in this attack by Hamas. The administration says they have no direct evidence of that at this point, uh, but senior administration officials over the weekend did note that Iran in the past has funded, equipped, and supplied Hamas for attacks like this. Karen, Jay, appreciate it. We'll be right back. More news right after this.
She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Some other headlines we're tracking for you this hour. More than 10,000 people in Myanmar are forced to abandon their homes due to rising floodwaters. It, the south hit the hardest with 7.8 inches of rainfall. Highest record level in 59 years. No casualties, remarkably, have been reported so far. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has announced today that he is running for president as an independent candidate. Kennedy was formerly a Democratic hopeful. In remarks in Philadelphia, the candidate said that he is, quote, declaring independence from the Democratic Party, a party that his father, uncle, and family have symbolized for decades. And history at the Chicago Marathon, Kenyan runner Kelvin Kiptum smashing the world record for distance finishing the race in just two hours and 35 seconds. That's four minutes, 34 seconds per mile for 26 miles. Yeah, well, guess what else? He's looking to break the two-hour barrier in an open race, a feat that was once thought to be physically impossible. Looks like he could keep going, man. He's, he's the guy. I want to check in with him in about 10 years, see how his knees are doing. <laughs> Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. We want to leave you with a shot of Paris. Now look at the Eiffel Tower. It's lit up in blue and white to honor those who've lost their lives in Israel. The colors of the Israeli flag and the Star of David right there on the Eiffel Tower. We'll be right back. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. GMA tomorrow. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> that's a good oh, way to start. Right. I like it. Robin Roberts with Lionel Richie back in their hometown, Tuskegee, Alabama. What's it like for you to be back? Visiting the sites of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, including Robin's father, and seeing Robin's first home. That's where I came home from the hospital. It's Robin, Lionel, and a personal American Idol hometown tour like no other. No place like home. Good morning, America tomorrow. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the 2024 campaign trail in Des Moines, Iowa, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. Israel at war. Palestinian militant group Hamas launching a surprise assault, and now 48 hours later, the unprecedented attacks targeting Israeli city centers and civilian communities have not stopped. Israel's 9-11 is what it's being called. The harrowing and bloody images showing the barrage of rockets, hostages being taken, buildings reduced to rubble. President Biden is condemning the attack, promising continued military assistance for Israel and calling on all countries to stand against terrorism. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel speaking just moments ago, announcing that his country has, quote, only just started and will not stop, unquote. Netanyahu ordering a total siege of Gaza in retaliation, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip. So far, at least 900 people have been killed in Israel and more than 600 people killed in Gaza. The closing bell on Wall Street is sounding. Stocks finishing the day in the black as investors shake off worries about the war in Israel. The Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P 500 all closing higher, led by big gains in the aerospace and defense sector. Today's biggest loser, travel and leisure. Delta, United Airlines, and Carnival Cruises are all falling more than 4%, and the price of oil also jumped to $86.36 a barrel. And there's history being made in Chicago at the marathon there. Kenyan runner Kelvin Kipton smashed the world record for the distance, finishing that race in just two hours and 35 seconds. That's four minutes, 34 seconds per mile for 26 miles. Kipton will now look to break the two-hour barrier in an open race. That's a feat that was once thought to be physically impossible for humans, but not for him. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, on Roku, on the social media apps, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops, and GMA3 will start right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. U.S. warships and fighter jets en route to Israel after this weekend's horrific terror attacks, including at a music festival. At least three Americans among the 700 dead, thousands injured, more than 100 people taken hostage. These terrorists have one goal in mind. It's to slaughter as many civilians as possible. Israel Defense Forces regaining control of all Gaza border towns, cutting off all food, fuel, gas, and electricity to the region. Our team with the latest on the ground. And we'll hear from one family. The father determined to save his daughter, now missing himself. His family praying for a miracle, what they want the world to know. To see herself up there with all of these, you know, Packer greats, it's definitely crazy. Plus, she's breaking historic ground on the football field. The Green Bay Packers' first full-time female athletic trainer. And beauty expert Millie Almodovar helps us celebrate Latina women entrepreneurs. And this Hispanic Heritage Month, some top products in the spotlight. My heart wants to wander here and over yonder. Let you come along and take it. And turn it up. That's musician Jackson Dean, the chat and special performance just for us. Now from Times Square, Eva Pilgrim and DeMarco Morgan with Dr. Jen Ashton and what you need to know. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this Monday for what you need to know. It is good to see you, and welcome back to Dr. Jan. Thank we missed you, you, my friend. Missed you, too. But we're starting with a heavy day of news. Yeah, we have a lot of serious stuff to talk about, Dr. Jan. Everyone's watching and hearing these stories out of Israel. Even if you're not there, don't have a connection to that region, it can be hard to watch. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about this. 100%, and that is because the way we process visual images and then lay down memories is complex, but the results can be profound, particularly for children who may not understand it's the same loop being shown again and again, so it can cause psychological distress regardless of your age. There are some tips, though, for any of us as we kind of process this latest uh, tragic story. 
first of all, stay connected with friends and family. That's where you're going to be able to give and receive support. Uh, try to stay updated on the latest developments from credible sources. With this particular story, there are a lot of viral videos going around. They may or may not be accurate. Um, taking good physical care of your body with making sure you get proper rest and eat well and stay with a routine as best as possible. And then watching out for signs of distress. That's anything from sleep disturbances to overwhelming sadness, social, socially feeling isolated. Those can be signs that you're really having a difficult time with this and then you want to ask for help. This is this is difficult to watch. And important to take a break as well, right? But even for us. Mm -hmm. I found myself having to do that many times during the day yesterday. All right, thank you very much. Yep. Well, Brad Milky is standing by with the latest on Israel and also a look at your headlines. Good yeah, to see right, you. That's right, guys. Good to see you too. And we start with that surprise attack on Israel that has left the world reeling. The death toll rising. Families learning loved ones have been kidnapped after the militant group Hamas stormed across across the border Saturday morning. Hundreds killed and injured, young concert goers in the desert seen running for their lives. Officials say 260 people were killed at this music festival alone. The attacks are described by some as Israel's 9-11 moment. Heightened security here in the U.S. P police across the country stepping up protection at religious sites in major cities. We'll have much more on all this later in the hour from our team on the ground. Rescue efforts intensify after a devastating earthquake in Afghanistan, a 6.3 magnitude earthquake and strong aftershocks rocked that region this weekend. More than 2,500 people killed, at least 1,600 more hurt. The milestone in West Maui, just two months after those horrific wildfires wrecked the town of Lahaina, reopening to visitors now, even though many residents are opposed to the move, thousands signing a petition to delay that reopening. And now let's check in with ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, for a look at our weather. The big story from Texas to the Great Lakes, that serious autumn chill. And yes, here in the Northeast, because Appalachia got it, first snow of the season. White Face Mountain, New York, you can see it adding up there. Just the flurries at Snowshoe, West Virginia, but down the spine of Appalachia, you had it. And then the temperatures did dip below freezing for a lot of folks, and we will see somewhat close to that. Saranac Lake will be in the mid-30s by tomorrow morning. That chilly air is going to stick around for the next couple of mornings, even deep south feeling it. And then we've got more rain. I know, we don't need in the Northeast, but it's coming next weekend. All right, thank you, Ginger. And finally here, what? You're not a billionaire? Well, me neither. We all have another shot, though. The Powerball jackpot now growing to more than one and a half billion dollars. Another drawing tonight, guys. Ah. Billion with a, mm -hmm. with a B, it's right, Brad? One billion. <laughs> that was me sighing because I didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're still here at work. Yeah, if she won, she probably wouldn't be we're here. We're all still here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, there's much more ahead right here on GMA3 on this Monday. Inside those staggering Hamas attacks on Israel, at least nine Americans among the dead, our team on the ground with the latest. Plus, terrorized families waiting for word. This dad racing to save his daughter, and now he's the one missing. We'll talk with his family when GMA3 returns to this. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! Now I knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to GMA3. Israel declares war on Hamas after the militant group launched surprise attacks by land, air, and sea that killed hundreds of people. Israel and the world left stunned by the carnage and Israeli defense forces retaliating with a barrage of airstrikes on Gaza. And now the stage is set for days of intense fighting. And ABC News 4 correspondent uh, James Longman joins us now with more on uh, this story. And James, it is good to see you. Uh, Sorry under these circumstances, but Israeli defense leaders say this could be a long and very difficult war. What are you seeing on the ground? Well, uh, it's not really begun yet, DeMarco, to be honest. Uh, the initial response from Israel was uh, wide uh, airstrikes over the Gaza Strip. We saw them go on all night, Saturday night, all night. Uh, last night uh, and now they seem to have intensified uh, as the Israelis say that they have secured areas on uh, the Israeli side which were where him Hamas militants had infiltrated now the focus really is uh, on the Gaza Strip where uh, the the whole strip is now under siege according to the uh, Israelis total siege that means they've uh, turned off all electricity or fuel or food transportation has been stopped to Gaza this is a place uh, where most of those things are pretty difficult to come by most of the time but now none of that is going in as Israel ramps up its response and we've heard just in the last few hours one airstrike on the Jabalia refugee camp uh, in Gaza uh, possibly dozens killed in that attack the number of dead in Gaza has now uh, reached close to 600 um, but like I said we're not even at the beginning really of Israel's proper response here because it does look as like they are gonna mount uh, a ground assault of Gaza quite what that looks like when you have the most dense populated strip of earth uh, with 2.3 million or so people living in it uh, well we'll have to wait and see what actually happens but at the moment uh, we're all waiting to see what Israel's true response is going to be. James the Hamas attack has been described as unprecedented so what happened how was the Israeli defense caught off guard? Yeah, Eva, that's the big question, and the whole world is asking that. Israelis are asking themselves that. I mean, initially, on the, on the Saturday morning at 6 o'clock, uh, the wall was breached. Uh, after a whole barrage of rockets, initially something like 2,000 rockets were, were, were fired into Israel, and then the breach happened. The IDF estimates something like 1,000 Hamas fighters came through the wall at something like 20 separate points. They came through sentries, uh, guard sentries, guard posts along the Gaza wall, and then they made their way uh, into communities in southern Israel, killing people where they found them, shooting them off and in their cars, entering people's homes and killing them there, and of course coming across that desert party where we understand something like 260 people were killed in one uh, location questions on just how this happened could have happened uh, these are intelligence failures that Israel has to work out the initial uh, the issue they're dealing with right now is how to respond and James uh, communities around the Gaza Strip are said to be living in fear especially with reports that Hamas has taken dozens of hostages uh, what are the challenges in rescuing these captives Look, this is a very densely populated area in Gaza. Um, people live cheek by jowl, I mean, side by side, tiny little streets, and there's every chance 
that hostages have been spread out across the strip in an effort to try to complicate an Israeli response uh, held in basements uh, away from the danger or as far away from the danger it is as possible to get from uh, Israeli airstrikes. And the stories we heard from uh, these families whose family members had been taken uh, are just heartrending. I mean, we saw the images, didn't we, of, of young women being taken from that desert party, strapped to the back of motorbikes, been taken on, on trucks and transported into Gaza. Uh, elderly people as well, young children. I think there's a suggestion, and we've heard it rumoured here, that the negotiation might be underway to try to get uh, the young, the very young and the very old out. Uh, whether or not that's actually happening is anyone's guess, but I think it's what Israelis hope might be the case, um, that perhaps Perhaps some of these hostages could be negotiated for, but it is uh, incredibly difficult to know for sure at the moment. James, you were one of the first journalists into the region after the attacks. I know you've spoken to some of those families. How are they doing? Not good. Very pure and simple, Eva. Not good at all. I spoke to uh, Jennifer Damty, whose daughter Kim, 22-year-old daughter Kim, uh, was at that desert party. And Jennifer was sit, sat on her sofa in her home in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, really unable uh, to find the words to describe her pain. But you could see it on her face as she said that Kim called her at 6 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, panic-stricken, asking her how uh, she should you know what she should do where she should go uh, her, her brother took the phone and said you should just try and hide try and hide um, and then the Toyotas these trucks turned up in the middle of the desert with these men in balaclavas and, and guns men on motorbikes and Kim may well be among the dead uh, but they don't know that's the point they don't know and they've been going to hospitals with uh, her hairbrush with DNA on it to try to see if there's a match for uh, any of the dead it was incredibly heartrending to listen to but it's just one story there are so many others like that here mm. guys just difficult to hear those stories James Longman thank you so much for being there up next the toll the unspeakable violence is taking on one family yeah the dad dropping everything to find his daughter when the attack first started and now he's among the missing the family shares their desperation with us and their growing concerns we're back in a moment Tonight, Yahoo making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Give it to me. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
I'm Rob Marciano in Tampa, Florida, reporting in Hurricane Adalia. Wherever the weather may take you, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. The world is stunned by news of Saturday's devastating attack on Israel by Hamas. The militant group has taken at least 100 hostages, and families are desperate to find their missing loved ones. And one of the missing is Mark Peretz. His family last heard from him on Saturday as he was racing towards the music festival under attack to try and rescue his daughter, Maya. Maya made it out safely and is now home, but never saw her father. And joining us now from Israel is Mark's daughter-in-law, Jessica Peretz. Jessica, thank you very much. Our hearts go out to you uh, under this, uh, during this difficult time, rather. Can you tell us what has happened to your family in the past couple days? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, Saturday morning, we woke up to rockets, um, something that we're usually used to here in Israel. We ran to the shelter and the shelter happens to be Maya's bedroom. So we saw that she wasn't there. We were calling her nonstop. She was calling us from the, she was speaking to us from the, te the nature party. And she was telling us that Hamas terrorists were entering by land, by parachutes, um, riding over their head and shooting at them nonstop. Um, they were running through bushes. They were hiding in trees, hiding in trash cans and hiding anywhere that they could to get away from these Hamas terrorists. And they were terrified for their lives. And the second that Mark, her father, uh, my father-in-law, heard that that was the situation, he didn't even think twice. No one could tell him to stop. He ran out of the house, took the keys, took flip-flops, ran out of the house, and he drove to rescue her. Um, during this whole time, we were speaking on the phone, me and my husband, um, we're speaking on the phone with um, Mark and with Maya and Maya somehow made it to a police station and she was safe there for a bit. She was safe there for about three hours, um, but injured um, innocent civilians from the party were coming in and she just saw terrifying, terrifying sights that she is traumatized from them. Um, and my father-in-law went missing. We spoke to him last at 8.48 in the morning, on Saturday morning. Uh, we heard gunshots. He was saying that he was in a war zone. He was saying that he he was screaming, I'm Israeli, I'm Israeli. Um, and we don't know what happened from there. What happened after you lost contact with your father-in-law? We lost contact with him at 9 a.m. And we just went into panic mode from that second. We were calling him nonstop. His phone was disconnected. We were calling Maya nonstop. Eventually Maya um, from the police station, one of her friend's fathers came to pick her, pick them up. Um, they drove in like a car of 12 people back home. She got home safe, but we still had no sighting of my father-in-law. Um, basically my, um, husband was in the army for seven years he was a captain and one of his friends was able to reach the site where we last know that his car was at because he has a tracking tracker on his car and his car is or was until last night still in the site they say this person the idf soldier says that they saw gunshots on the car um but they don't have more information other than that other than mark is not in the car gunshots on the car but mark is not in the car so we have no idea where he is and we're just praying that he comes home soon our prayers and our hearts again are with you. Uh, Jessica, the world is watching. What do you want people to know about what is taking place with your family and happening there right now? Um, we are living in a terrifying situation. Everyone is living in this nightmare. Israelis are hugging one another and we're there for one another. And everybody has a family member, either in the IDF as a soldier right now or in reserves that has been called back and we're praying for everybody. Um, and we really, really, really want support and need support from everyone internationally, everybody from the U.S. Thank you for all of your support. All right, Jessica Peretz, thank you very much. And again, uh, the best of luck to you in finding your father-in-law. Thank you so much. We're back in a moment. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. All right, folks, we're back now with America's favorite doctor, Dr. Jen, right here on a new research that looks at how obesity may make menopause symptoms worse and harder to treat. Break that down. Correct. So this is not yet published. It was just presented last month at the Menopause Society um, annual meeting, and it took two very common groups of women, women who are obese and women who are going through menopause, looking for that overlap in that Venn diagram, if you will, mm -hmm. in, in terms of how their subjective response in terms of that process, their symptoms may or may not be different from a woman who is not obese. What they found was an observation association between obesity and more severe menopausal symptoms, things like hot flashes, among others. That's just probably the, the more common and most common one. Why is this? We know that fat is a hormonally active organ it's literally considered that it can produce estrogen that may me may make their subjective experience with going through menopause worse i also look at it through another lens which is are women who are obese less likely to receive adequate diagnosis and prompt management or treatment of those issues and is there something physiologic going on that makes them harder to treat once they are treated. So I think a lot more research needs to be done, but I am so glad we're talking about these two common populations. Well, and seeing this association, what does it mean for patients and for doctors when they walk into the situation? Well, I think <laughs> awareness, yeah. I mean, awareness is always, always important. And if you are a woman with obesity and you are having these symptoms, I think that you shouldn't have to do this, but you can actually educate your healthcare provider and say, you know, I may have more severe symptoms. What can we do about it? Yeah, tell your doctor, this is what Dr. Jane said. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Send them the study. All right, we'll be back there after this. Go. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Tonight, Yahoo making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Hello, I'm Terry Moran, and here are some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live at this hour. Israel at war. Palestinian militant group Hamas launching a surprise assault. And now more than 48 hours later, the unprecedented attacks targeting Israeli city centers and civilian communities have not stopped. Israel's 9-11 is what it's being called, the harrowing and bloody images showing the barrage of rockets, hostages being taken, buildings being reduced to rubble. Prime Minister Benjamin and Netanyahu announcing Israel has, quote, only just started and will not stop. Netanyahu ordering a total siege, as he calls it, of Gaza in retaliation, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip. So far, at least 900 people have been killed in Israel and more than 600 people are dead in Gaza. And President Biden confirming that at least 11 Americans are among those who have been killed, and it's likely American citizens are also being held hostage. And there's history at the Chicago Marathon. Kenyan runner Kelvin Kiptum smashing the world record for the marathon distance, finishing that race in just two hours and 35 seconds. That's four minutes, 34 seconds per mile for 26 miles. Kiptum will now look to break the two hour barrier in an open race, a feat that was once thought to be physically impossible, but he looks he looks pretty certain to make it. Thanks very much for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, on Roku, on the social media apps that you use, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA3 right now. GMA3, what you need to know, Simone Biles adding to her considerable hardware collection. Three more medals at the World Championships this weekend for the balance beam and vault. Simone Biles now officially the most decorated gymnast in the history of the sport. We call her the GOAT. She is the greatest of all time. And I think you have to talk about the fact that she's been able to stay yeah. in the sport oh, longer yeah. Yeah. than most people. Who retire early. Truly remarkable. Most gymnasts are not in their 20s even competing. Nope. And look at her. And, and she's not done yet. She nope. is not nowhere close to being done. And her, I've met her here at, mm -hmm. at Good Morning America. She is so strong, but she is mentally strong. It's incredible. Yeah, we're all fans Oof. for a reason. Dr. Jen now answering your medical questions. And one of our viewers, Jordan, wants to know, are there certain foods I should include or avoid to help the healing process after a surgery? Okay, well, as someone that it used to do a lot of GYN surgery and as the sister of a reconstructive plastic surgeon, I know this wheelhouse very, very well. Your diet, your behaviors are critically important mm. preoperatively and postoperatively. Avoiding alcohol, avoiding cigarettes, smoke is critically important. A lot of surgeons will delay an operation until the patient says, it's been a week since I've had a cigarette. Mm. That is incredibly important. As to the things you should try to do, the data is not really there yet. A lot of plastic surgeons will use Arnica to try to reduce bruising and accelerate healing uh, topically, or if you ingest some of these supplements, there's just not good conclusive evidence-based data to support that. Your exactly. prescription for wellness. Okay, on the trend of what to do post-operatively to, to help uh, healing, you know, the best operation is not going to work unless your post-op management is good. So you want to make sure that you treat pain by taking your pain medications before you get out of bed or and or at bedtime. Pain delays healing. So people who say, I'm just going to, you know, tough my way through it, you're not helping your healing process. Mm -hmm. Rest and do not overexert yourself. Your tissues need time to come together and heal. Um, hot or cold therapy, if it's okay with your surgeon, can definitely help. Um, and then deep breathing is very, very important. All right, Doc, thank you. And we'd love to hear from you. So hit us up on Instagram with all of your medical questions for Dr. Jen at ABC GMA3.
And coming up when we come back, she's tackling history on one of the most famous football fields in the world and inspiring a new generation. And our friend of the show, Millie Almodovar, with the work of women entrepreneurs in this Hispanic Heritage Month. GMA3 continues after the break. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. It's time to get the change. All right, welcome back. Turning now to a very inspiring young woman who at only 25 has become the first female to hold the title of athletic trainer for the Green Bay Packers. And Erin Roberge isn't taking this barrier-breaking role lightly. She takes ABC's Jacqueline Lee behind the gridiron for a peek at her typical day at the famous mm. Lambeau Field. Take a look. It is. It's game day in the NFL, and yes, it may look the same, and it may even feel the same, but things are quickly changing behind the scenes. The number of women employed by the league is steadily rising. They're breaking barriers. And for the Green Bay Packers, that change maker is 25-year-old Erin Roberge. She's the first full-time female athletic trainer in the Packers franchise history. I thought it was cool to be the first woman. Um, it was definitely a big honor, but I didn't know how many people that could affect the number of messages and letters and things that I received. Kind of overwhelming after that. My fourth grade teacher sent me letters from her class um, saying congratulations. What do you think resonates with people about this? I think it's just finally seeing representation in sports that you watch because it gives girls and young women the idea that, oh, I could do that, like I could be in that exact position. 
You'll often find Aaron working with players, diagnosing, rehabbing, and treating any orthopedic injury. She's helping the players get ready for practice and anything else that may happen on the field. Any pain with that? A little bit. A little bit. Push your hand. I learn so many things every day, and being willing to do the small tasks still, you know, you're never too big to do those small things. Her accomplishment is so big, she even has her own exhibit in the Packers Hall of Fame. So you've never seen this before? No. Ta-da! Yeah, that's crazy. Wow. Uh, right next to Marge, who's our, our amazing sewing lady. That's awesome. That's very surreal. Walking through here has always been kind of a solemn, um, historic place. And to see yourself up there with all of these, you know, Packer greats, it's definitely crazy. I thought this would be like when I retired and had a nice long career here, but I'm 25 and I already made it, so feeling pretty good. Erin <laughs> stumbled into sports medicine. She was just looking for an hourly job on her college campus, first working with the Wisconsin Badgers and then interning with the Packers. She was hooked. This is the place where the magic happens. Yeah, Lambeau Field is a, a very special place in all of sports, really. So it's definitely an honor to get to work here and play games on Sundays here. We've been really struck by the amount of access the community has to this team. Yeah, the, the fans are very dedicated, very committed. Football's everything. You see fans sitting outside the parking lot uh, waiting for players and staff and coaches. But of course, anytime you do something that's never been done before, there are some growing pains. It's a male-dominated field. What challenges have you encountered since starting this job? Some of it's just the facilities and how they're set up. Especially when you go on the road, you might have a female locker room outside of the main locker room, but it might be 100 yards, you know, on the other side of the stadium. Like, sideline clothing was only made for men until last year, so anything you wore was, like, a size too big for you, and you just felt kind of out of place, if that makes sense. Have you felt like you had to overcompensate in any way? Yeah, I think sometimes you're just overly aware of it. You don't want to be high maintenance, but you want to be able to, you know, do the things you need to do and being aware that some of the things you do then represent all women that they may hire in the future. And as Erin looks around and thinks of those who will eventually come after her, it's really exciting because when I first got here, our locker room was empty except for me, and now every locker is full. She knows she may be the first, but definitely will not be the last. Uh, what a change maker and history maker. Yeah, and young. Yes. 25. Very young. Congrats to her and our well, thanks no. to Jacqueline. You can catch the Packers squaring off against the Raiders tonight at 8 Eastern on ABC, ESPN, ESPN Deportes, and ESPN2. Love to see it. <laughs> Just ahead here on GMA3, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, and we're going shopping. Mm -hmm. Our friend and beauty expert, Millie Almodovar, takes us through some must-have products from Latina entrepreneurs. Stay with us. Tonight, Yahoo making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting in Atlanta, Georgia, outside the Fulton County Courthouse, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3, now to our celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. Today we are shining a light on a few of the top beauty, fashion, and lifestyle brands, all founded by Hispanic women. What are you laughing at? I don't look good. <laughs> you look so, so good. good. I didn't expect you to have the hat on. I looked over and all of a sudden the hat was on. I got to join the crew right here. And with the holidays rapidly approaching, uh, these products right here are sure to make great gifts. So here to help us once again is our friend and beauty expert, Millie Alma Duvar. I to love see you being with friend. you guys. Well, and she always brings gifts as well. So what do we have? Let's talk about these beautiful hats. First, we're amazing. going to talk about Gladys Tamez, okay? She okay. is a Mexicana, born in Texas, raised in Mexico. Nice. Now, do you see these three hats? The one that you have on, the mm -hmm. one that you have on is actually really special. <gasps> she made this one specifically for Lady Gaga, and it oh. was worn on the cover of her Joanne album. Oh. Yeah, so she, Gladys nice. always oh, loved, wait. loved hats, but she couldn't really find hats that had the finesse and quality she liked, so she created them on her own. See? Can These we talk amazing. about this black boss. hat here? This is the hat that Taylor Swift was giving away to one lucky fan on her Eros Ooh, tour. Okay. I mean, her clients include Johnny Depp. All right. Okay, see. next, Carolina Contreras. She is Dominican, uh, as I am Dominican oh, as well, as you can tell from my <laughs> the earrings. earrings. Yes. But I love Carolina's story because she was actually born in the United States and then she was she went back to the excuse me, born in the Dominican Republic, went and was raised in the United States, went back to the Dominican Republic after she graduated college mm. to start Miss Resos, which is a salon that exclusively catered to curly hair, oh. which was never done before in the mm -hmm. Dominican Republic. I'm telling you, her products for curly hair are incredible. You go, girl. Amazing. Yes. Alicia Botang, she is Cubana, okay? She Now, Cubana. these are her beautiful cups. Can we look at these cups? The, do you Ooh. see this? Azuka, oh. Celia Cruz, nice. yes. Yes, so she is a Cuban. She has a mother of four. She would drink her coffee and she was like, what would make me feel more beautiful? Mm -hmm. Well, to make myself some gorgeous, gorgeous cups. So she created her line of cups. You've got the Celia Cruz cups. You've got the Afro Glam cups. You guys see this? Yeah. Every stunning. stone, every accent, every pearl, all, all by women-owned businesses. She only, oh, hire, yeah, she only hires out to women-owned businesses, which I love. I like Whoopi that. Goldberg is a fan. Tiffany Haddish is a fan of these cups. I mean, and I feel like you do. Like when you have your cup of coffee before the kids get up, you just feel like great, yeah, right? Or even when the kids are up, look at Mama. Yeah, look at Mama <laughs> with this cup. <laughs> okay, right, what's next? Lauren Picasso. She is a Peru, New York City-based Harvard grad. Mm -hmm. Very much inspired. This is her company, Cure. Very much. She was very much inspired by her Peruvian father, but she was also an athlete. She was a runner. She never wanted to drink the electrolytes from other companies because they were loaded with sugars yes. and all this artificial stuff. Mm -hmm. So she created Cure. All real ingredients. Guys, you want to taste it? They actually taste delicious. You can grab here. Here, Eva. Ooh. Yeah. All it has a, a pink Himalayan salt, lemon. I mean, just really, really. That's yeah, good. it's supposed to replace so sodium, magnesium, mm -hmm. and potassium. It's so salty, but not bad. No, not it's bad. Very yeah, only she's only using real ingredients, and you've got eight delicious flavors. That's amazing. We should keep these around for people who have late nights. Oh, yeah, hello. <laughs> we got about forty-five seconds. So Got to run through this. Okay, so for tomorrow, this is Maya Alejandro. Mm -hmm. She's Puerto Rican and Dominican. This is her amazing nail polish line. Mm -hmm. She started it because she, as an Afro-Latina woman, she was having a lot of problems navigating the clean beauty and wellness space. So she decided to create this line. 17 shades, 21 free plant-based. I have worned her nail polish. Yeah, Ooh, I have, and I've gotten like shiny. seven days of wear 
from her line. I mean, just really, wow. really incredible. I and spotted last, this right away. I'm like, Ooh. okay. So this is Aaliyah Arnold. This young lady, she is 19 years old, has had three businesses 19, yes. by 14. This is Boss Up Cosmetics. She is part Mexicana. Okay, so she alone this year has grossed one million dollars from her is. company. Okay? 19. Yes, 19. She employs. Her family, she actually doesn't even outside have an outside love. Her lip changing color oils, just so I changing think, colors, what? Yeah. So you put you use these, this is like her top seller. You use this on your lips and it works with the pH of your lips and leaves your lips with this gorgeous pink. It's constantly sells out on TikTok. I think she told me she has sold over four hundred thousand dollars worth Look of these that. just mm -hmm. in this year alone. Bravo. Way to keep it in the family too. Nine, I and love I love that. that she keeps it in the family too. Yeah. Yes. And we love having you here, Millie. Thank as you always. Family. Yes, we do. Thank, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Well, up next, when we come back, a rising star in the world of country music. Yeah, we're talking about singer-songwriter Jackson Dean. Don't go anywhere. Team A3, when we come back. If I don't come back, don't come looking. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, welcome back to GMA3. That was the breakout hit, Don't Come Lookin', which made our next guest the youngest male, by the way, the youngest male artist to earn a number one spot on country radio with their first single. From heartfelt ballads to boot-stomping anthems, country music chart topper Jackson Dean is just getting started. We like boot-stomping, yeah. don't we? Yeah. He's a rising star in the country music scene, and we are thrilled to have him here with us today to perform his single, Fearless. Please welcome singer-songwriter Jackson Dean. Yeah. Woo! You went viral singing the national anthem at your high school football game. <laughs> now you're making history <laughs> with your single. <laughs> I mean, it has to be crazy. It's, it's pretty crazy to see <laughs> how, uh, how far has how far come from then to now, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty funny. I mean, and you kicked it off out of the gate with the hardest song Yeah, ever, the national right? anthem's so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you start too high in that, you're not looking so good <laughs> on the other end, you know. <laughs> It's a, it's a climb, man, you know. I want to ask you about your summer, because you were incredibly busy. You were touring with the likes of Luke Bryan and Eric Church. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything from those country music legends? What was it like? Um, it's, we were on some pretty big tours, yeah. Um, Eric was a lot of fun. Uh, he puts, a, puts on a phenomenal show. Um, it's just really cool to watch them work a mic um, and how they work a crowd, and everybody works it different. Like, we were out with Blake, and 
he's funny as all get out. And, but to watch him work a mic and just his distance and stuff is, from a singer standpoint, is really cool to watch. Mm -hmm. I bet it is cool to watch. And speaking of things cool to watch, uh, the song, Fearless, that you're going to be performing, the video, you include your family. Why was it important to have them involved? I, I don't know, man. I just, I had this, <laughs> I just had this funny idea of, of my brother doing it and called him and he was like, are you sure, dude? Like, <laughs> you sure you want me to do this? And he was so nervous. My dad told me he was so nervous all the way up to it, but they did beautifully, I thought. Um, and it's pretty cool because I, I was just like, this is going to be easy. They had no idea what to expect, so I was just like, all will be well. <laughs> what what I tell you. All right, Jackson. Again, Jackson Dean, thank you very much for being with us today. And Jackson's critically acclaimed album, Green Broke, is available everywhere that music is sold and streamed. You can also check out Jackson on our GMA3 playlist by scanning that QR code right there on your screen. And now, without further ado, yeah. here is Jackson Dean performing Fearless. Yeah! <laughs> People don't I swear on my grandpa's grave. I've seen them in the trees, I've seen them in my dreams, and I still can't stay away. My heart wants to wander, even the way I do. Let you come along and take it. What you need to know. Thanks for spending your Monday with us. I'm Eva Pilgrim. I'm DeMarco Morgan. And I'm Dr. Jen Ashton. And for all of us here at ABC News, have a wonderful night, and we'll see you tomorrow along with Jackson Dean, everybody. Bye, guys. Yeah. Yeah. ABC News, America's number one news source. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. 
It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Kate Whitworth here in Los Angeles. Our top story today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered a complete siege on Gaza, declaring war on Hamas. This after the Palestinian militant group launched a surprise attack, resulting in the deadliest day in Israel's history over the weekend. The fighting continuing into the night. So that video shows Israel's counteroffensive with strikes in Gaza. The Israeli military calling on an unprecedented 300,000 reservists while imposing a total blockade of the Gaza Strip. Nearly 700 people reported dead in Gaza. Over 900 are reported dead in Israel. And moments ago, the White House confirming at least 11 Americans are among the dead. Now, officials in Israel also say that at least 100 Israelis have been taken hostage by Hamas as well. President Biden is calling the international community to stand against terrorism, condemning the attack and promising continued military support for Israel. Biden's promise comes as he calls on Congress to approve aid for Israel's defense as the country seeks artillery, missiles and Iron Dome interceptors from the U.S. ABC News' Inez de la Catera reports from Tel Aviv. Massive blasts rocking the Gaza Strip, with Israel Defense Forces continuing their barrage, huge plumes of black smoke filling the sky. Israeli officials saying in just a three-hour span Monday, they struck 130 targets in the area, saying they will continue to fight Hamas terrorists as long as necessary for the sake of the residents of the state of Israel. They also plan to blockade Gaza, keeping fuel, food and electricity out. This mosque in Gaza also hit by Israeli strikes. Palestinians seem crying as the injured are rushed to the hospital. This all comes after the militant group Hamas launched a surprise assault on Israel Saturday the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. More than 2,200 rockets launched as armed Hamas militants also raided towns going door to door, executing innocent people. At an Israeli music festival in Negev, rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert. It's really living hell. Never seen something like this. I've been in, a war, in two wars in my life and never seen, seen anything like this. Bodies all places for the slaughter. They didn't care if you are a man or a woman, you are young or old man. They're killers, they're murderers. Israeli officials say dozens who were not killed were kidnapped instead and taken to Gaza as hostages, including this Jewish grandmother. I'm sure she's uh, very scared and I'm sure she feels very alone. And that's not a way to live when you're 85 and they're uh, being taken away from your bed, from your house. Thousands have been injured so far in both Gaza and Israel, hundreds killed in both areas. The State Department saying at least nine Americans have died in Israel. U.S. Embassy staff now under a curfew from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. and banned from going on any personal travel to the West Bank. And the images are horrifying. So joining us now is Inez. She is reporting for us uh, from Tel Aviv this evening. Inez, first of all, this death toll continues to rise. We now have Israeli's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calling Hamas animals, declaring Israel will beat them like ISIS was beaten. So what more can you tell us about the fighting from where you're at right now there in Tel Aviv? 
Hey, Kena. Yeah, the fighting, I mean, very much still ongoing. The IDF had been fighting Hamas militants on two fronts, really. So one, of course, inside Gaza. That very much continues. Those strikes continue. Uh, they've been uh, striking Gaza throughout the day, and that continues into the night, targeting Hamas militant targets inside Gaza. But then the IDF was also fighting Hamas inside Israel. So there were a number of militants who had crossed over into Israel on Saturday during that unprecedented breach by land, by sea, by air. It was unclear just how many militants were here and just where they were, but a number of them had taken control of communities in the south, and that was kind of a second front here. IDF forces had been fighting Hamas militants there. As of today, we understand that the IDF did uh, regain control of the south. So they say there's no more ongoing fighting there between uh, IDF forces and Hamas militants in southern Israel. Right, and as to that point, Israeli's military says that they have reestablished control of its territory after ordering a full-scale siege of Gaza. So what's next for Gaza? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so now because they have regained control of the south, the focus really turns to Gaza. It's been un, you know, relentless uh, shelling of the Gaza Strip. Uh, we've seen them striking uh, hospitals, refugee camps, um, mosques. At least five mosques were destroyed. And the IDF, uh, according to Israel's defense uh, minister, they are laying siege to Gaza. So blocking all food, fuel, electricity, and now water supplies from Gaza. You can imagine what that's going to mean for the civilian population there. This is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. So some real concerns for the civilian population in Gaza. Unclear what the IDF will do next and whether a ground operation may be in the works. But um, we've seen, you know, tanks being uh, taken down close to the border. We're seeing the IDF also evacuating certain Israeli communities close to the border. At least 15 communities have now been evacuated. They're telling Israeli families to leave. Unclear why they're doing that. Uh, but there are concerns that they could be doing that because they might be considering a ground operation into Gaza, even as, you know, other militant groups and as some of Israel's neighbors have warned Israel against doing just that, Kena. Yeah, you're so right. I mean, Netanyahu even said himself that a ground offensive here on their end could be imminent here, but he's also calling up a reported 300,000 reservists. Now, prior to this attack, though, Inez, there was divisions among these reservists on whether or not they would serve under Netanyahu. So what are you hearing now? Yeah, the reservist aspect of all of this is certainly interesting. It's adding, I think, to the concerns that a ground operation could be in the works. We know that 300,000 reservists have now been called up. That is the quickest and largest call up of reservists in Israel's history. So, uh, you know, lots of questions as to what, what they're going to be uh, asked to do next. Um, and as far as the divisions, yeah, I mean, this was certainly a, a very divided country in the last uh, year. Uh, we, we saw those divisions on full display with the mass protests, the judicial overhaul. Um, but, but, but Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu talking about that during his address to the nation tonight and, and calling on all Israelis to unite here. Um, and he is, is telling them to brace for a long war, but he says they are determined to win this. And Inez, what more can you tell us about this hostage situation and the negotiations and also the threats that Hamas is making now to execute these innocent people? Yeah, so we're learning more and more every day about this hostage situation. Uh, Israeli officials say at least 100 Israelis were taken hostage. They do say that the Israeli military knows uh, who all the hostages are, and they're now working their way towards informing all the families. They say at least 30 Israeli families have been uh, notified and that the, the, the IDF will have an update for the press once all of the families have been notified. We were today at the Missing uh, Person Center here in Tel Aviv. That has been set up specifically to help uh, families look for loved ones, loved, loved ones who may have been uh, killed or who may have been taken uh, hostage. Um, they're encouraging families to bring DNA samples to that uh, missing person center, things like uh, hairbrushes or toothbrushes. But some really grim news on the hostage front uh, with a, a Hamas spokesman saying this evening that if the IDF continues to shell uh, Gaza without warning, they will begin executing some of those Israeli hostages one by one and that they will be broadcasting those executions. Execution. So some very alarming words there. Lots of, you know, very real concerns for those hostages inside the Gaza Strip, Kano.
Alarming to say the least, and the White House saying it's likely that some Americans could be among those hostages as well. Uh, Inez, thank you so much for your reporting there in Tel Aviv. And now we want to go to Washington, where the White House is racing to prevent escalation here. President Biden condemning the attacks from Hamas, saying that the U.S. will make sure that Israel has exactly what it needs to defend itself. The U.S. is boosting its military presence in the region by sending a carrier strike group, weapons, munitions, and fighter jets to Israel. This is the White House rushes to prevent a broader conflict with hopes to contain this violence. So joining us now is ABC News Jay O'Brien. He's there on Capitol Hill and ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang. Thank you both for being here with us. And Selena, first to you. Look, we know President Biden is meeting with several close allies this afternoon. He's calling on countries to stand against terrorism, promising continued military support for Israel. But we have yet to hear from him or see him today in actuality. So are there any updates there? Well, the president just announced in a statement that at least 11 Americans have been killed in Israel and that Americans are likely among the hostages taken by Hamas. The president also said that they are looking into missing Americans. They are still missing and they are working with Israeli authorities to try and gather more information. The president had vowed over the weekend, pledged that rock solid support to Israel. No public statements today, but we did get behind the scenes color from the White House that he is in close contact with allies today. The U.S. is also sending aircraft carriers your strike group towards Israeli waters, as well as sending ammunition, weapons, fighter jets, and a show not just of support to Israel, but as a signal to others not to get involved. And over the weekend, the president and his administration engaging with leaders in Israel and Palestine and in other regional leaders to try and prevent this from turning into a broader war. This is already shaping up to be one of the biggest geopolitical challenges of the Biden presidency, and it could derail what his administration has been working on for months, that major agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia to normalize relations, a deal that the White House said could be transformative in leading to peace and stability in the region. A deal that many experts say Iran did not want to happen. So, Selena, has the Biden administration commented on whether Iran played a formal role in this attack? U.S. officials are saying that they do not have direct evidence that Iran played a role in this latest attack from Hamas on Israel. However, the U.S. officials are saying that Iran is broadly complicit because for decades they have been funding and supporting Hamas through this financial and military support. The White House and U.S. officials are also saying they cannot say at this point if these attacks were motivated by a desire to derail those major talks between Israel and Saudi Arabia. But experts I've been speaking to say it likely was motivated by that desire to derail those talks and that for now those agreements that deal it is likely dead in addition to this republicans are already attacking president biden's response some GOP members, including former President Donald Trump, are claiming that the president's move, his administration's move to unfree $6 billion in Iranian funds, they're claiming that that money was used to fund Hamas. Now, the White House is hitting back, saying that not a single cent of that money has been spent and it can only be used for humanitarian purposes. And just to fact check on that $6 billion, it's not U.S. taxpayer dollars. It was Iranian oil revenue held in South Korea. All right, and Selena, thank you. And Jay, to you, you know, the uh, House is preparing this bipartisan resolution to declare its support for Israel, but it can't move forward until it elects a new speaker. So what are you hearing on that front? Well, we're hearing a lot of lawmakers, first and foremost, on both sides of the aisle, shocked, horrified by that terrorist attack in Israel and by the violence that they're seeing. But the reality is, Kena, in the House of Representatives, all they can do right now without a speaker is make those statements. Because if you don't have a speaker of the House, you can't pass legislation, which means you couldn't pass any military or humanitarian aid for the region. You also couldn't even pass a resolution, like you mentioned, condemning the violence from Hamas or condemning anything going on. So right now, there needs to be a speaker selected. The first step of that will be this evening, when Republicans meet behind closed doors. Then they will have a forum for their candidates for speaker tomorrow. The two declared candidates candidates, the number two Republican in the House, Steve Scalise, the chair of the judiciary, Jim Jordan. But we're also hearing from some moderate Republicans at this hour who want a third name thrown into the mix, which is former Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy, which was booted from the, who was booted from the Speaker's chair last week. McCarthy was asked about that today. Would he jump back into the race for his old job? He didn't say no, but he downplayed the possibility that he would be returning as Speaker. Nonetheless, Republicans have said they want to get this done quickly so they can position the House of Representatives to do whatever Israel needs in supporting them in this time. 
All right, Jay O'Brien and Selena Wang, our thanks to both of you. And coming up next here, we have a lot more of our coverage here in the Middle East. Uh, we will speak to a Palestinian American woman who was supposed to be in the region today, but that was before Israel declared war on Hamas. That's next. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Thank you for streaming with us. Uh, we have live images of Gaza and of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordering what he calls a complete siege in Gaza after declaring war on Hamas. This is after the Palestinian militant group Hamas launched a surprise attack over the weekend, resulting in the deadliest day in Israel's history. Protesters in U.S. cities reacting to the fighting overseas. Many Israeli American and Palestinian Americans raising their voices over the conflict that has killed hundreds and wounded thousands in the Middle East. So joining me now is U.S. Democratic strategist Rania Batrice, who is also a first-generation Palestinian American. Rania, thank you so much for joining us. And first of all, you know, you were supposed to be in that region today. So, so how are you and your family members? Uh, so far, everybody is safe, thankfully. But again, that's just so far, obviously, minute by minute. Um, every time one of those WhatsApp messages doesn't go through, uh, there's a lot of concern because, like I was saying, every moment things are changing. That's a terrifying way to proceed. So have you been able to contact your family, though, and speak with them at all, even if it's through WhatsApp? Uh, some of them, yes. Um, colleagues, some of my friends and, and colleagues over there, it was, it's was it been a little bit harder to reach. And obviously, with Israel shutting power off in Gaza, it makes it even more difficult. So um, it's been very spotty, to say the least. Yeah. And over the weekend, a Democrat Minnesota Representative Ilhan Omar called on the international community to provide protections for Palestinians. So what do you think those protections should look like? Well, first and foremost, the fact that a government can shut off electricity, stop water from being delivered, stop supplies and food from being delivered, basically with the touch of a button, just is a direct reflection of the occupation, oppression, and apartheid that's been taking place for decades in the country. Um, so I think that's what she's referring to, at least in part. And you know, the, the people that are literally caught in the crossfires are civilians who were already suffering, who were already oppressed, whose homes in, in, a, in a lot of situ situations have been demolished and were not allowed to be rebuilt. So already a, an exacerbated situation that's going to be even worse. 
um, with this regime in, in Israel basically saying they're going to starve folks out. They don't care about civilians, and it's playing out right in front of our right in front of our eyes right now. And how are Palestinian Americans viewing this attack on Israel by Hamas? I think it's it, the, the frustrating thing um, for me is, and for many of us, quite frankly, is two things can be true at once. We can condemn Hamas and hate their actions and understand that they do not represent us and our people, uh, and also acknowledge and condemn this extreme government. This is arguably the most extreme government we've ever seen um, from the state of Israel, the most homophobic, the most xenophobic, the most misogynistic. So two things can be true at once. And I think that is in large part the way my community feels is suffering is suffering. Humanity seems to be lost and folks are digging in their heels on all side. And the, the fact of the matter is it's the people who are suffering while the powers that be continue to do everything they can to just hold on to that power while while hurting civilians. Mm -hmm. and in your opinion, what makes diplomacy so difficult? I mean, what could help ease this conflict in your opinion? Uh, well, the, the fact that Israel is the only country in the world that receives nearly $4 billion from our government with zero um, conditions, zero checks or balances. And now you have our president saying that he's going to continue sending more and more. There's no motivation to actually sit down and, and negotiate in good faith. Um, there hasn't been for decades. And, and for the record, it's not just this administration in the United States that's failed so miserably. It's every administration for the last 75 years that's all but ensured this conflict continues and escalates. All right, Rania and Patrice, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and your time with us. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. And as the deadly tension between Israel and Hamas continues, the death toll on both sides is now in the thousands. ABC News chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is joining me now from Tel Aviv. And Matt, I know you've been moving around throughout the region uh, all day. What are you seeing on the ground there right now? We were in southern Israel earlier today, Kena, and in the town of Sderot, which is that bullet-scarred town that Hamas militants managed to essentially invade, shooting in the streets as they drove, eventually capturing this police station. Ultimately, the Israeli military just demolished the whole thing with the militants inside. Um, and as we were there filming that police station, rockets started raining down, and this town has become a ghost town. In fact, um, most of that southern area all most of the people living there have left. They've been evacuated to towns north of there. The entire cordon around the Gaza Strip is now a giant buffer zone filled with hundreds of thousands of Israeli troops and reservists. This is a country, especially in the south, on complete war footing, Kena. And Matt, Israel's, uh, Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu said that a ground operation in Gaza is imminent. So what are you hearing and what would that look like? We just spoke to a military official here in Tel Aviv who said that it is likely imminent. We're not exactly sure when it's going to happen, but he said that the goal is to destroy Hamas militarily. And what he described is a honeycomb of tunnels beneath Gaza. That is where Hamas militants are located right now as Israel is bombing from the air. That is where they are storing their rockets and their weapons. And at some point, he intimated, they're going to have to go there and get into those tunnels, either by air or by land. And he also said that they understand that this is going to be bloody, that there will be many casualties on Israel's side. But that is what Israel has to broadcast to the world right now, that it is not weak after that catastrophic failure. And he admitted that it was a catastrophic failure. They've got to change it. They said what happened on October 6th, that world is over. Starting on October 7th, a new era began. Uh, an intelligence failure like they have never seen, Matt. And Matt, you know, you've covered this region extensively. Uh, so does the Israeli military have the resources they need if they were to move forward with this ground operation? You know, I probably would have said that absolutely. Um, a week ago. I, I'm not exactly sure that that is the case. Uh, Gaza is a very dense place filled with lots of militants. They know that area so deeply well. Um, Israel is expending a vast amount of ammunition. I assume and we understand that the United States would come to its assistance if it needs something. Um, 
What I understood from this military official is that Israel is willing to do whatever it takes at this point, and they're less concerned about casualties than they have ever been. So I think the bottom line is that whatever is going to happen, it is likely to be very bloody and very ugly, Kena. Matt, Hamas leaders have threatened to execute hostages. Netanyahu has said that he has assigned a point person to handle these hostage negotiations. The White House also saying, in all likelihood, Americans are among those hostages. So what are you hearing about that? I was just texting now with the mother of an American young man who was apparently taken hostage. Um, she just told me that she had just learned that a grenade blew off part of his arm and the, he put a tourniquet on himself to stop the bleeding. But she said, and his name is Hirsch Goldberg, she said that she's afraid that they're going to lose him. She's afraid that he's going to die. Um, they know that he's alive right now, but they don't know for how long. We understand that there are nine Americans, possibly more, who have died. Um, others may have been taken hostage. We simply don't know all of the names right now. Um, but there is great concern for all of those people. Uh, we know that the State Department is involved. I understand the people from Homeland Security are trying to coordinate as well. Um, everything is being done to try to understand what the situation is, to understand who has been taken and where they are. But it is such chaos here right now. It it's very hard to pinpoint all of this information. And only about 30 of the 130 families so far of the hostages have been, um, have been told that, they, uh, that their loved ones have been taken. So still a lot of confusion here, Kano. Matt, we so appreciate your reporting and your time on the ground and your perspective in all of this. Matt Gutman, thank you very much. And our continuing coverage will be right back, everybody. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how? How many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being no, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Memphis, I'm Steve Losanzani. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Ahead, right here on ABC News Live, we have continuing coverage of the war in Israel. In today's big story, civilians caught in the middle of the conflict. The human cost at the center of this war. I'll speak with a 17-year-old survivor who ran for cover after hearing sirens early yesterday morning. How he managed to stay safe, his journey to reconnect with his family and friends. And in our spotlight, President Biden vowing to stand with Israel, but Congress still in disarray. And with no Speaker of the House, Congress cannot act and put forth any package to back up the president's promise. Our panelists weigh in. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. 
But then the 911 call. I just had a 12 year old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt, and I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. GMA tomorrow. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> that's a good way to start. I like it. Robin Roberts with Lionel Richie back in their hometown, Tuskegee, Alabama. What's it like for you to be back? Visiting the sites of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, including Robin's father, and seeing Robin's first home. That's where I came home from the hospital. It's Robin, Lionel, and a personal American Idol hometown tour like no other. No place like home. Good morning, America tomorrow. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. War in Israel, the Middle East exploding into violence, Hamas launching a surprise assault on Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordering a total siege of Gaza in retaliation, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip. I'm Kana Whitworth in Los Angeles, and that is our big story today. The human toll at the center of this war, civilians caught in the middle of this conflict. I'll speak with the 17-year-old survivor who ran for cover after hearing sirens early yesterday morning, how he managed to stay safe and his journey to reconnect with his loved ones. Also in our spotlight, President Biden vowing to stand with Israel, but Congress still in disarray. And with no Speaker of the House, Congress cannot act and put forth any aid package to back up the president's promise. Our powerhouse panel is standing by. And of course, we start with our big story here. Israel declares war after a terrorist attack by Palestinian militant group Hamas, and the killing has not stopped. Hamas taking Israel completely by surprise over the weekend, launching thousands of rockets and sending ground troops targeting civilians within Israel's borders. The death toll rising, families desperately searching for loved ones and those that are missing in the aftermath of these attacks. So joining me now is a survivor of these initial attacks, 17-year-old uh, Burak Shum Shmuel. Uh, you're currently living in Israel. You're originally from Colorado, uh, as am I. And I, I just want to extend a hand and support. And we're so happy that you're here and you're, not, and you're safe to be able to speak with us. I know you were on your way to work that morning in those early morning hours. Tell us what it was like. Uh, wow. It was just, you know, Saturday morning. It's uh, supposed to be a good day. I was uh, on my way to go. We, we go with friends. We work out. I kind of coach them. We're getting ready for the Army. And then all of a sudden, uh, we heard a siren. 
and for us it's pretty uh, standard, we're used to it, but the raw age was much more intense, the booms were much, it was just crazy, it was unreal. Uh, everything was much louder, everything felt a lot more, like, in just, just unreal, it was, it was ridiculous, and then uh, I, we made a run to get home, and that's when I started hearing about everything else that was going on. And so, how are your, how is your family, your friends, have you heard from them? Uh, at the time, uh, my mom was not here. She was in Italy, so I was alone. Um, so luckily, she is here now, but my family is okay. Most of my friends are okay. I uh, don't want to get too much into it, but lost someone. Um, it's scary knowing how many people, how many friends of friends have been lost. People are constantly sharing images, asking if they've been seen, uh, friends, family members. It's just not a situation that we want to be in. No, and I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, and we're seeing videos right now of you and some of your friends. Uh, can you tell me you said you were you're doing army training? Uh, yes, uh, for me, being able to give to my to my country is the most important thing. I want to be a fighter, like the guys that are right now protecting us. And knowing that I can't be there with a weapon uh, protecting my family is is hard. So what I did today is. Um, I decided to gather resources, uh, food, clothing, water, to go and give to the soldiers that needed it. And uh, that video was, while, while I was gathering stuff, there were some rockets, so, uh, you know, had to keep the morale up. So you're doing whatever you can to help support your country at your young age of 17, and I get the sense that as you're talking to me right now, you, you sort of feel like, you, you wish you could be doing more, you, that that is how important your country is to you. The civilians of this country are, are the country. It's the amount of reservists that went to help, the videos of people in the streets giving food, water to, these, to the tanks that are going to the border. As devastating as the situation is, we're going to come back from it and Israel is our country and we're here to stay. The civilians are here to stay and, and that's it. Well, Barack, you're incredibly resilient uh, in your youth right now. And, and tell me, as you're trying to help these soldiers, you're doing what you can, you're bringing them food, anything. Do you feel safe at all? Wow. Um, there, there are moments, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in Ashkelon, the, uh, Biggest threat is definitely the rockets. Um, there have been terrorists in the city. They were luckily caught. Uh, today, though, whilst uh, driving, I had rockets hit meters from me. When I, In that exact video that you saw earlier, uh, there were two direct hits less than 100 feet from us. It, it was, it, it's scary. I can't lie. Yeah. But it's the ability to bounce back. I do not feel complete, 100% safe, but I know that eventually it'll be, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be all right. That's unbelievable. Uh, and thank you so much for spending the time uh, to talk with us and, um, and to tell your story. Truly, we appreciate it, and we're so glad that you and your family are safe and remain that way, okay? Thank you for having me. Of course. I want to bring our big story to our panel now. Wow. Uh, joining us today is our ABC News contributor and former acting undersecretary for intelligence for the Department of Homeland Security, John Cohen, ABC News contributor and former deputy assistant secretary uh, of defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy, ABC News political contributor and former Republican congresswoman for Virginia, Barbara Comstock, and Democratic strategist and president of Next Gen America, uh, Christina Sinsoon Ramirez. Uh, thank you all so much for being 
sitting here with me and you just heard the words from this incredibly resilient young man there. Uh, Mick, starting with you, you know, largely this has been seen as a catastrophic intelligence failure on the part of Israel. What more are we learning there? Well, I think it's an accurate portrayal, unfortunately. Uh, operation of this size would have required a lot of logistic movements, planning, preparation, bringing in technical devices to do such things as jamming communications in Israel. And it, to, me, it, to me, as a former CIA officer, it seems like there would have been a lot of indicators that this was coming. Perhaps, and I don't know this, that they rely too heavily on sig signals intelligence and not enough on humans intelligence, but that is gonna be something that's looked at and right now they don't have time to really deal with that, but eventually they will look back and try to determine just went wrong here. Right, it's reaction time now. So John, intelligence officials are saying this is a very sophisticated attack for Hamas to execute on its own. Are there indications that Hamas received help from the outside? Well, there's a long standing history of Hamas receiving support from the Iranians, from Russia, from other Gulf uh, countries in the Middle East. Uh, and I just want to echo something that Mick was just saying. This wasn't two or three guys in a truck doing an right. active shooting or setting, up a setting off a suicide bomb. These were uh, almost a thousand militants we're hearing from some reports. Uh, it was a co coordinated attack. They were able to jam uh, communications. They, there was possibility some cyber elements. They were able to breach barriers along the border. They were using a combination of humans, uh, UAVs, you know, drones, uh, people on paragliders, as, long, mm -hmm. uh, as well as rockets. So there was some intense preparation that went into putting this attack together. Uh, and it seems to me, at least from my perspective, that it exceeded the sophistication capabilities of uh, Hamas or Islamic Jihad. This, th th I think they're going to look really hard to see whether there is any state sponsorship of this attack. All right, and Barbara, to you, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell just wrote this op-ed in which he suggests that Congress could essentially assist both Israel and Ukraine in one legislative action. Does that seem likely, given the discord in Washington? I certainly hope at this moment when you see this kind of violent terrorism, and that's what it is, this is terrorism, that you can see that moment of people coming together and uniting. You know, so many members of Congress have traveled to Israel. So you do have that personal connection. You know, you had two members of Congress who were there, you know, Dan Goldman uh, from New York, Cory Booker, Senator Booker. So I think mm -hmm. there is a possibility. I certainly hope so. And Christina, to you, you know, after you hear uh, from Brew Rock, there's a 17 year old young man who had to run for his life. His parents weren't even there. And he's saying, I wish. I could be out there fighting right now for my country. Uh, what is your reaction to his story? I mean, the entire situation is a terrible tragedy on all sides. As soon as I saw what was happening, I just thought of the civilian casualties, the fact that people have been kidnapped, mothers, children, um, fathers, people are waiting for their brothers and sisters to see if they're safe return. Civilian tragedy and life being lost is at the core of what's happening and on both sides. So. I feel so much pain. I think a lot of people feel pain and fear and outrage for what's happened to the Israeli people, civilians, as well as people in Gaza. We have, when you talk about Gaza, we're talking about one of the most densely populated places on earth. Mm -hmm. Half of the population are civilians. And so you have now thou, uh, over a thousand people who have been killed um, and, and the vast majority civilians. And that's why we need movement very quickly on this issue to see a peaceful resolution. And that's, I think, also the consequences we're seeing of not having a Speaker of the House. Um, we are needing leadership in government in the United States right now that we simply do not have. The dysfunction in Washington has ramifications, not just in our country, but abroad. No, certainly as we watch one of our most staunchest allies get attacked here, John Cohen, Mick Mulroy, Barbara Comstock, Christina Sinsun Ramirez, thank you all so much for being with us. And coming up next here, the intensifying violence and the diplomatic military moves to de-escalate the tensions. We'll talk about that when we come back. Whenever news breaks, 
to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas, NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. The violent and deadly fighting between Israel and Hamas intensifying with Israel now on the counteroffensive. The Israeli government asking for support from the U.S. and President Biden is calling on Congress to approve additional aid. Now, I want to bring back our panel, uh, John, Mick, Barbara, and Christina. So Israel and Hamas have been in conflict for years, and now there is concern about how this fighting could escalate even further and draw in other groups from different parts of this region. So, Mick, starting with you, Secretary of State Antony. Anthony Blinken says there's no evidence that points to direct Iranian involvement in these attacks, but the U.S. now very keen on preventing Lebanon's Hezbollah movements from joining this conflict. So why is that a priority right now for the U.S. as well? So there is indications that Iran may have had something to do with this. Certainly, as John pointed out in the last segment, uh, historically, they have funded up to 90 percent of Hamas's military budget. And this was very complicated and required so many different pieces of equipment and weaponry that it does at least in part indicate and there's been media reports to that extent uh, possible. But I do think we should wait for the intelligence community to make the assessment and they should be the definitive call on that. If they are involved and they intend to stay involved, they do have many proxies in the area, including, including the Lebanese Hezbollah. They have up to 150,000 rockets and missiles. Uh, there are also groups in Syria if they elected to try to push all of these groups, who are going to make their own decision, all these groups to attack Israel at the same time, this could expand rapidly and could pull in Iran itself mm -hmm. and even the United States. We should all hope that doesn't happen. Right. And one senior U.S. defense official did say, of course, Iran is in the picture. Iran has provided support for years uh, to Hamas and Hezbollah as well. Are, were they directly involved in this one? That is what they have yet to comment on. And so, John, the U.S. is saying, you know, it's moving an aircraft carrier, ships and jets to the eastern Mediterranean. And we'll also give Israel additional equipment and ammunition. The U.S., of course, has always been Israel's staunchest ally. Uh, what do you make of the response so far? 
So two things. One, um, I think the U.S. is preparing in the event that we do have a large-scale um, impact on U.S. citizens or U.S. interests in the region. But first and foremost, I want to build on something Mick was just saying, because he's absolutely right. Uh, containment is key here. Right now, this is a horrible set of circumstances, uh, but it's contained into Israel. The last thing we want uh, is it to expand both within re, uh, Israel and in the region more broadly. We've already seen uh, small amounts of activity uh, in the north with Lebanon. Uh, there are concerns that Hezbollah could potentially become involved. Uh, Iran could potentially become involved. We don't want this to turn into a regional conflict. I'll just say also that Russia, uh, Iran, Hezbollah are using their online information operations capabilities to try to encourage additional attacks both in the region and outside. And adding this uh, senior defense official saying, you know, they're deeply concerned about Hezbollah making the wrong decision and choosing to open a second front uh, on this conflict, to your point of containment uh, being key in this. And Barbara, to you, you know, the U.S. sends billions of dollars of military aid to Israel every year. President Biden is calling on Congress to approve more aid uh, to help Israel's defense. The House of Representatives, as we know, doesn't have a speaker right now. So how do you see that playing out? Well, I think it certainly will make it more urgent to resolve the speaker situation this week. The Senate is also out this week. Hopefully they will get back there sooner rather than later and get that all resolved this week. So again, they can get at that money there. I, I think you do have that bipartisan support that has always been strong. So I certainly hope they will respond in that way. And because the sooner and faster give that very strong, you know, not just adequate, but very muscular response there. Right. I think that will do, you know, exactly, um, you know, what they're saying there. We need to have that strong response. Response and support our ally that is asking for these things. Yes. We know there's been this stockpile exactly. of munitions there from, from wars past, but th that will only go so far. So, Christina, uh, what are your thoughts on, do you think that we will see Congress move quickly here and provide this funding? and? potentially simultaneously funding to support both Israel and Ukraine. I mean, this is exactly why we need, as just stated by uh, Representative uh, Congresswoman, former Congresswoman Comstock, we need a Speaker of the House. Respo Republican dysfunction, again, is impacting us at home and abroad. And also Republicans are holding up currently with appointment of 300 senior Pentagon officials and the next ambassador of Israel. There are certain wings of the Republican Party that simply do not care if government comes to a halt, and we and uh, Israelis and Palestinians are suffering the consequences of that. We need American leadership as rapidly and quickly as possible to prevent as much civilian casualty as possible on both sides. And I want to remind people there are Israeli Americans and there are Palestinian Americans. This is a conflict where civilians on both sides are really suffering the consequences of a failure of, of action and leadership. And John Cohen, Mick Mulroy, Barbara Comstock, and Christina Sinsen Ramirez, thank you all. We appreciate that. And coming up next here, our correspondent Matt Gutman is on the ground in Israel when we come back. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight. Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through?
to get to his target. I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Aaron Katursky at Federal Court in Boston. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has been to countless conflict zones and has covered this region many times before. In fact, he was stationed there at one point. So, Matt, tell us more about what you saw today. We drove down to Israel South today, ostensibly to interview a military analyst. And we were in the town of Stirot. And in my years covering the conflict here, I had been to Stirot many times. It is the town about two miles from the border with Gaza. It has always been a target for rocket attacks from Hamas, simply because it's so close and it's the largest nearby town. But this was different this time. It was an absolute ghost town. There was nobody in the streets. The only people we saw were the elderly trying to bring water and food into their bomb shelters. And as we were there filming this police station, a barrage of rockets started to come in. There was no warning. There was no siren. It was just the roar of the missiles overhead and the bangs of the interceptors. Um, that's what life is like. And throughout that area in the south, we saw so many hundreds of people evacuating, leaving their homes, possibly for the last time. A lot of these people can't go back to these villages right on the border that were infiltrated by Hamas militants. One woman named Avital told me that her neighbors were murdered, entire families were murdered, friends were carted off into Gaza. and. She had been a supporter of peace all these years. She has friends in Gaza. She believes that there are still many good people there, but she now has, believes that Gaza has to be bombed and that Hamas has to be eradicated. This is a complete sea change in the Israeli mentality. Um, that is not something you would have heard even a week ago or three days ago. Things here have fun fundamentally changed, especially with those 300,000 Israeli reserves now in that area around Gaza. This is a nation on war footing unlike anything it has seen in at least 50 years. And they're talking about October 7th as the deadliest day, not just in Israel's history, but in the history of the Jewish people, they're saying, since the Holocaust. Kena. Matt Gutman, incredible perspective. Thank you so much for your reporting. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kena Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for On the War in Israel and today's biggest story. She has more there. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
whenever, wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. What's good to watch? Read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Traveling with President Biden in Ireland, I'm Karen Travers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, we begin with our top story here. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ordered a complete siege on Gaza, declaring war on Hamas after the Palestinian militant group launched a surprise attack, resulting in the deadliest day in Israel's history over the weekend, the fighting continuing into the night. What you're seeing there is Israel's counteroffensive with strikes in Gaza. The Israeli military calling on an unprecedented 300,000 reservists while imposing a total blockade of the Gaza Strip. Palestinian officials say that nearly 700 people were killed in Gaza, while Israeli officials say at least 900 are dead in Israel. The White House is confirming now as many as 11 Americans are included in that number. ABC's Inez de la Catera reports now from the ground in Tel Aviv. Massive blasts rocking the Gaza Strip with Israel Defense Forces continuing their barrage, huge plumes of black smoke filling the sky. Israeli officials saying in just a three-hour span Monday, they struck 130 targets in the area, saying they will continue to fight Hamas terrorists as long as necessary for the sake of the residents of the state of Israel. They also plan to blockade Gaza, keeping fuel, food, and electricity out. This mosque in Gaza also hit by Israeli strikes. Palestinians seem crying as the injured are rushed to the hospital. Saul comes after the militant group Hamas launched a surprise assault on Israel Saturday the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. More than 2,200 rockets launched as armed Hamas militants also raided towns going door to door, executing innocent people. At an Israeli music festival in Negev, rescue workers say 260 bodies were removed from the desert. It's really living hell. Never seen something like this. I've been in a war, in two wars in my life, and never seen, seen anything like this. Bodies, all places for the slaughter. They didn't care if you are a man or a woman, you are young or old man. They are killers, they are murderers. Israeli officials say dozens who were not killed were kidnapped instead and taken to Gaza as hostages, including this Jewish grandmother. I'm sure she's uh, very scared and I'm sure she feels very alone. 
And that's not a way to live when you're 85, and they're uh, being taken away from your bed, from your house. Thousands have been injured so far in both Gaza and Israel, hundreds killed in both areas. The State Department saying at least nine Americans have died in Israel. U.S. Embassy staff now under a curfew from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. and banned from going on any personal travel to the West Bank. Well, and Inez is joining us now. She's in Tel Aviv with the latest. So Inez, Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu says that the ground operation in Gaza is imminent. So what are you hearing and what will that look like? Hey, Kana, yeah, Gaza very much in focus throughout the day today uh, with the IDF laying siege to Gaza. The Israel, uh, Israel's defense minister is saying they have cut off all uh, food, fuel, electricity, and now water to the region. You can imagine what that's going to mean for the civilian population, given this is uh, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. We're also seeing relentless shelling of Gaza throughout the day today and into the night this evening. And questions now about what's going to be next for Gaza, like you say whether a ground operation could be in the works. We are seeing tanks, uh, IDF tanks being brought to the Gaza border. We're also seeing the IDF evacuating Israeli communities close to the border. So Israeli families are being told to leave. The IDF saying at least 15 communities there have been evacuated. Unclear why they're doing that, um, but some speculating that it could be that a ground operation is in the works. And we should point out over 300,000 reservists have also been called up. That is the largest and quickest call up of reservists ever in Israel's history, Kena. And as Hamas leaders have threatened to now execute hostages, Netanyahu says he has assigned a point person to handle these negotiations. What are you learning about these rescue efforts and these threats by Hamas? Yeah, the hostage situation, a, a huge part of all of this. We were at a missing a person center earlier in the day, actually, trying to talk to families there. This is a center that's been set up close to the uh, airport here in Tel Aviv to help families who haven't heard from loved ones in a couple of days, who are uh, worried that their loved ones may have been uh, killed or taken hostage. Families are being encouraged to bring DNA samples with them. So uh, social workers telling us they were encouraging people to bring things like toothbrushes or hairbrushes. We spoke to one man who was looking for his cousin there. He hadn't heard from his cousin since he went to that Nova Music Festival where we know 260 bodies were uh, recovered from that site. So uh, the hostage situation very much still ongoing. The Israeli military saying they know that uh, at least 100 Israelis have been taken. They say they know of all the hostages who have been taken and they are now informing the families. At least 30 Israeli families have been informed. They're working their way uh, through all those uh, different families. But some really grim news on the hostage front with a spokesman for Hamas saying that if the relentless shelling of Gaza continues without warning, they will begin executing Israeli hostages one by one and that they will be broadcasting those uh, executions. What they want is for the IDF to, to give uh, the civilian population in Gaza a heads up before uh, they, they um, undertake those strikes, Kena. It's horrifying to think about that, Inez, and we know at least 11 Americans are reported dead. More are unaccounted for right now, and the White House is just now saying that in all likelihood, there are Americans also being held hostage right now. In fact, President Biden was briefed on updates with Israel a little bit earlier, and so you can see he just sent out this tweet here again. So as we hear uh, that Americans could be also among these hostages, what do we know about what's being done to locate these American citizens? Yeah, so worth pointing out that a lot of these Americans are likely dual citizens, so dual Israeli-American citizens. But we know that the U.S. has been in constant contact with Israeli officials. In fact, the uh, president uh, saying that uh, specifically when it comes to trying to figure out what happened to, to these Americans, they've been in contact with Israeli officials. The Israeli prime minister addressing the nation this evening and talking about his close relationship with President Biden, thanking the U.S. for its support and saying they've been in constant, constant communication uh, with the U.S. Uh, president, but certainly lots of concerns for those uh, American citizens. Um, and, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether any American families come forward to talk about loved ones uh, missing, that sort of thing. But yeah, constant communication there between the U.S. and Israel. 
All right, Inez in Tel Aviv, thank you so much for your reporting. I uh, Now, uh, for more on Israel and the Hamas war, I want to bring in our ABC News senior Pentagon reporter, uh, Louis Martinez. Louis, thank you so much for being with us. And, you know, the U.S. is concerned here that Lebanon's Hezbollah movement, backed by Iran, could interfere and join this conflict. Of course, this happens as the U.S. is moving an aircraft carrier into the eastern Mediterranean. So I keep hearing the word containment, Louis. How important is containment here? Containment is very important, Kane, and that's actually the message that senior U.S. officials are trying to convey uh, with all these phone calls to leaders in the region and to these direct messaging that we're getting to from senior U.S. officials about the presence of that U.S. carrier strike group that's going to be arriving soon in the eastern Mediterranean. The message to Hezbollah, the message to Iran is do not interfere. Uh, a senior U.S. defense official telling reporters uh, that Hezbollah would be making the wrong decision if they decide to open up a northern front in southern Lebanon. Um, and they are also saying that they should not, they should pay heed. And this is very important language here. It's kind of kept very vague. But the U.S. saying that no one should doubt the U.S. commitment to Israel's self-defense. When, when you have an aircraft carrier offshore, when they're carrying all the, all the firepower of all those fighter aircraft, uh, it conveys a very strong message. And so the question is, will Hezbollah heed that message? The United States is doing everything it can to make sure that they will. Right, with that deterrent there in the water, Louis. Uh, Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu called Hamas animals, comparing them to ISIS. So as you watch these recent attacks unfold, how is this so much different than the other conflicts that we have seen ongoing throughout the years? Well, that senior U.S. defense official that I was speaking about used that similar language to what Prime Minister Netanyahu used about ISIS. Uh, the official characterizing the violence that we've seen and these uh, ground forces from Hamas, these militants crossing across the border into these towns just across the border, as ISIS-like savagery. That's really tough language to hear from a U.S. official, um, but it's, it's they're trying to convey that this is what makes this different. You've never seen this level of, of force being used on ground into Israel. We're talking about a thousand Hamas militants uh, who seem to have really practiced this before, uh, have gone into these border towns and have carried out essentially atrocities against civilians. And the, I think the officials are trying to convey the message that this isn't the regular something that we've seen in the past. This is something different. It's highly escalatory and it needs to be dealt with in a different manner than in the past. It was clearly planned and executed. Uh, so what more is the Pentagon saying about additional aid to Israel? How much is actually on the table, Louis? Well, we know that some munitions that Israel has asked for are already en route by plane to uh, Israel itself. We know that Israel has asked for additional munitions in the form of those missiles for those interceptors, uh, for that Iron Dome system that they use to intercept incoming rockets and missiles. And we know that they are also looking for additional resourcing. Uh, officials have told us that the Israel has already been able to tap into this vast stockpile of U.S. military hardware uh, and equipment and ammunition that has been existing in existence in Israel now for various decades. Um, it's there just for an eventuality in case the U.S. military needs to access it in the region, but it is also available to Israel if they need it on short notice, and we're told that that's actually happening. But the officials telling us here that what's going to happen is that the United States is going to do everything it can to expedite munition supplies to Israel based on what they are asking for and that they're trying to see exactly how they can make that happen. All right, Louis Martinez live at the Pentagon for us. Louis, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate it. And now to Washington, where the White House is racing to prevent escalation. President Biden condemning the attacks from Hamas, saying the U.S. will make sure that Israel has exactly what it needs to defend itself. The U.S. boosting its military presence in the region, as we mentioned, by sending a carrier strike group, weapons, munitions, and fighter jets to Israel. This is the White House rushes to prevent a broader conflict with the hopes of containing this violence. And joining us now is ABC News Jay O'Brien, who's there on the Capitol, uh, who's there on Capitol Hill. And Jay, you know, McCarthy uh, criticized the House for not having a leader during this crisis in Israel. What can you tell us about that? 
Well, Speaker McCarthy is no longer the Speaker of the House. He's the former Speaker of the House. But here's the thing. There isn't a current Speaker of the House. And so McCarthy gave remarks earlier today in which he kind of stepped into this vacuum of this empty Speaker's chair. And he used this opportunity, as he has in the past, when he was Speaker, to criticize the administration and its handling of Israeli policy as it relates to Israel, but also to unveil what he says is his five-point plan. And it involves getting getting American hostages back and adding support for Israel. But here's one other thing in that is any additional support for Israel that isn't already allocated in the federal budget would have to pass in both the Senate and the House. And the House is paralyzed, Kena, right now because you can't pass big pieces of legislation in the current iteration of House procedure without a speaker. And we haven't had a speaker since McCarthy was booted from that job about a week ago on Tuesday night. Right, and we covered that here together. And so he has this five-point plan, but Jay, I mean, could we possibly see Republicans come together now after this unprecedented attack on Israel and move forward somehow and do it quickly? Well well, that's what they're trying to do right now. So as we speak, there is a behind closed door meeting of House Republicans who are essentially airing their grievances over the last few days. There are moderate House Republicans who are incredibly upset at those eight House Republicans who voted to boot McCarthy. 210 Republicans, remember, voted to keep McCarthy in his job. So there is this moment happening as we speak where Republicans are essentially airing all of this bad blood between them. And they're doing that because they're hoping that the conference can essentially get together and get behind a speaker candidate. There are two candidates right now, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan, and Steve Scalise, the current number two Republican in the House. They're hoping that the conference can coalesce behind one of them in a series of meetings behind closed doors. There's another candidate forum tomorrow. And then if the conference can agree on a speaker candidate behind closed doors, they can have an easy vote essentially on the House floor, not have to slug it out on the House floor like McCarthy encountered in January, but it still remains to be seen at this hour if Republicans can put all this bad blood between them aside and get a Speaker of the House. Right. We certainly don't want to see another 15 rounds of voting there. Uh, Jay O'Brien uh, on the Hill, thank you. And coming up next year, continuing coverage of the war in Israel. When we come back, the diplomatic and military moves being taken to avoid an escalation of this violence in the Middle East. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
And thank you so much for streaming with us. We have some live images to show you of Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordering, ordering what he calls a complete siege in Gaza after declaring war on Hamas. This is after the Islamic militant group launched a surprise attack, resulting in the deadliest day in Israel's history over the weekend. Several European countries condemning this deadly fighting. This is just in. France, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom releasing a joint statement denouncing Hamas, quote, appalling acts of terrorism. American citizens also impacted here. President Biden says at least 11 Americans are among the dead in Israel. And there's, there's a possibility that Americans are also among the hostages being held by Hamas. So joining us now is our ABC News contributor and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy, and ABC News contributor and former Acting Undersecretary for Intelligence for the Department of Homeland Security, John Cohen. Uh, thank you again for being with us throughout this evening. And first First of all, Mick, starting with you, you know, there's an extensive history uh, behind this conflict, and we have watched it play out so many times, but this one is different. And talk about how you are seeing all this, this difference in these past conflicts, and does that all result in what they're considering this intelligence failure? So, Kana, I think you're absolutely right. This is different. This is uh, an attack uh, in the size and scope. Uh, that hasn't been seen since uh, at least the last 50 years. And the consequences are so significant that uh, it's being said it's the most uh, uh, Jewish uh, people killed since the Holocaust. Uh, so I can't overstate that. Uh, I think you're going to see a substantial response by the Israelis. You're, gonna, you're already seeing 300,000 uh, reservists being called up. You're seeing the early stages, the preparatory fires, the denial of uh, power, which cuts down their communications. You're already seeing that, but it is just the tip uh, of the iceberg, so to speak, as we see this build and continue in the coming weeks and even months. And John, to you, you know, how do these attacks raise intelligence concerns for officials here in the United States? And again, as we mentioned, we keep calling this you know, one of the largest intelligence failures for those in Israel. But what about for us, the United States? Yeah, for years, particularly after September 11th, uh, the U.S. relies on or has relied on uh, Israeli intelligence to combat a broad range of threats, uh, threats from Iran, threats from Hezbollah, threats to the United States from foreign terrorist groups, threats from criminal organizations. So if this failure represents a a degrading or a, a reduction in capability of Israeli intelligence, that not only impacts Israeli security, but it could impact U.S. security as well. And, and Mick, you know, the president of Iran congratulating Hamas on this attack. Iran has supported Hamas for years. A senior defense official says that Iran is in the picture, but to what extent, we don't know. What can you tell us? So, Kana, there are certainly indicators that Iran had a lot to do with this. Historically, uh, they've funded most of the military support for Hamas. There's a lot of uh, uh, situations here that I think would indicate that they had some advanced help from a nation state like Iran. There's even media reports that the IRGC met with them. I think ultimately we should wait and determine and find out what the U.S. intelligence community assesses, but there's certainly a lot of, uh, I think, evidence, at least uh, out there in the press, pointing to Iranian uh, uh, participation and maybe even direction from this. But again, we should wait till the, the intelligence community makes that assessment. Mm -hmm. And Mick Tino, uh, what about Hezbollah starting this second front uh, in this conflict in the north? And I want to point out here that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu even addressed this in his statements to say he said what their third action is to fortify the other fronts. And he mentioned the northern border there against Hezbollah. So the Israelis, the IDF, will have to fortify their northern border. They cannot obviously trust Hezbollah. They have an incredible capacity when it comes to indirect fires, missiles and rockets. If they launched another front, it would be devastating. Uh, it would overwhelm the Iron Dome system, and there'd be a lot of lot more Israelis uh, that would be likely killed. So I think it's going to be really important for them to deal with that and for the United States and all of Israel and all of Israel's partners to send a clear message that they need to stay out of this entirely. Out of it entirely and keep it contained is the word that keeps coming up today is to keep this conflict contained. Uh, John, to you, 
It's really scary here. Hamas is threatening to execute these civilian hostages if the attacks on Gaza continue without warning. This is, we've learned here in the last couple of hours, that in all likelihood, Americans are also among these hostages. So what risk does Israel face here now if they try to go into Gaza, especially if they go in on the ground, as they've mentioned, and free these hostages? Yeah, Hamas is going to use these hostages as shields. They're going to use these hostages to gain an advantage from a negotiation perspective. They're going to use these hostages to try to prevent um, military action by Israel or by others. So what's happening now is a combination of diplomacy, uh, military preparedness. They're using Israel and probably being supported by other allies are using intelligence assets, whether they be human assets or uh, electronic assets or communications assets, to try to determine the location. Uh, but depending on the number of hostages and how far they're spread apart from each other, uh, the decision to use military force uh, to rescue the hostages, that's going to be a tough decision uh, because you don't want to place the hostages in greater jeopardy. So it's a very complicated issue, but it's out of the terrorist playbook. This is what they do. So uh, the Israelis have a long history in being prepared to deal with these types of issues. All right, Mick Mulroy and John Cohen, thank you so much for your expertise. We really appreciate it. And coming up next here, uh, the global superstar Bono dedicating a U2 anthem to those lost in the Middle East. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Mar-a-Lago in Florida, I'm Jay O'Brien. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
And welcome back. The Supernova Music Festival in southern Israel was billed as a journey of unity and love. But the thousands of young people who attended could never have expected the bloodshed that awaited them. More than 260 were killed. So at U2's concert last night in Las Vegas, the band dedicated their song Pride to the kids that were attacked at that festival. And they customized the lyrics. Take a listen. October 7th. As the sun is rising in the desert sky, they took your life, but they could not take your pride. Well, the band posting on Instagram, in the light of what's happened in Israel and Gaza, a song about nonviolence seems somewhat ridiculous, even laughable. But our prayers have always been for peace and for nonviolence. Well, right ahead here on ABC News Live, we have continuing coverage of the war in Israel. In today's big story, civilians caught in the middle of this conflict, the human cost at the center of this war. I'll speak with a 17-year-old survivor who ran for cover after hearing silence, sirens early yesterday morning. How he managed to stay safe and his journey to reconnect with his family and friends. Also in our spotlight, President Biden vowing to stand with Israel, but Congress is still in disarray. And with no Speaker of the House, Congress cannot act and put forth any aid package to back up the president's promise. So our panelists will weigh in. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. War in Israel, the Middle East exploding into violence, Hamas launching a surprise assault on Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordering a total siege of Gaza in retaliation, cutting off all resources to the Gaza Strip. I'm Kana Whitworth in Los Angeles, and that is our big story today. The human toll at the center of this war, civilians caught in the middle of this conflict. I'll speak with the 17-year-old survivor who ran for cover after hearing sirens early yesterday morning, how he managed to stay safe and his journey to reconnect with his loved ones. Also in our spotlight, President Biden vowing to stand with Israel, but Congress still in disarray. And with no Speaker of the House, Congress cannot act and put forth any aid package to back up the president's promise. Our powerhouse panel is standing by. And of course, we start with our big story here. Israel declares war after a terrorist attack by Palestinian militant group Hamas, and the killing has not stopped. Hamas taking Israel completely by surprise over the weekend, launching thousands of rockets and sending ground troops targeting civilians 
within Israel's borders. The death toll rising, families desperately searching for loved ones and those that are missing in the aftermath of these attacks. So joining me now is a survivor of these initial attacks, 17-year-old uh, Burak Shum Shmuel. Uh, you're currently living in Israel. You're originally from Colorado, uh, as am I. And I, I just want to extend a hand and support. And we're so happy that you're here and you're not and you're safe to be able to speak with us. I know you were on your way to work that morning in those early morning hours. Tell us what it was like. Uh, wow. It was just you know, Saturday morning. It's uh, supposed to be a good day. I was uh, on my way to go. We, we go with friends. We work out. I kind of coach them. We're getting ready for the army. And then all of a sudden, uh, we heard a siren. And for us, it's pretty uh, standard. We're used to it. But the raw age was much more intense. The booms were much, it was just crazy. It was unreal. Uh, everything was much louder. Everything felt a lot more in just, just unreal. It was, it was ridiculous. And then uh, I, we made a run to get home. And that's when I started hearing about everything else that was going on. And so how are your, how is your family, your friends? Have you heard from them? Uh, at the time, uh, my mom was not here. She was in Italy, so I was alone. Um, so luckily she is here now, but my family is okay. Most of my friends are okay. I, uh, don't want to get too much into it, but lost someone. Um, it's scary knowing how many people, how many friends of friends have been lost, people, are constantly sharing images, asking if they've been seen, uh, friends, family members. It's just not a situation that we want to be in. No, and I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, and we're seeing videos right now of you and some of your friends. Uh, can you tell me you said you were you're doing army training? Uh, yes, uh, for me, being able to give to my to my country is the most important thing. I want to be a fighter, like the guys that are right now protecting us. And knowing that I can't be there with a weapon, uh, protecting my family, is is hard. So what I did today is um, I decided to gather resources, uh, food, clothing, water to go and give to the soldiers that needed it. And uh, that video was, while, while I was gathering stuff, there were some rockets, so, uh, you know, had to keep the morale up. So you're doing whatever you can to help support your country at your young age of 17, and I get the sense that as you're talking to me right now, you, you sort of feel like you, you wish you could be doing more, you, that that is how important your country is to you. The civilians of this country are are the country. It's the amount of reservists that went to help, the videos of people in the streets giving food, water to these to the tanks that are going to the border. As devastating as the situation is, we're gonna come back from it. And Israel is our country and we're here to stay. The civilians are here to stay and and that's it. Well, Barack, you're incredibly resilient uh, in your youth right now. And, and tell me, as you're trying to help these soldiers, you're doing what you can, you're bringing them food, anything. Do you feel safe at all? Wow. Um, there, there are moments, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in Ashkelon, the uh, biggest threat is definitely the rockets. Um, there have been terrorists in the city. They were luckily caught. Uh, today though, whilst uh, driving, I had rockets hit meters from me. When I, In that exact video that you saw earlier, uh, there were two direct hits less than 100 feet from us. It, it was, it, it's scary, I can't lie. Yeah. But it's the ability to bounce back. I do not feel complete, 100% safe, but I know that eventually it'll be, you know, look at it, it'll be all right.
That's unbelievable. Uh, and thank you so much for spending the time uh, to talk with us and, um, and to tell your story. Truly, we appreciate it. And we're so glad that you and your family are safe and remain that way, okay? Thank you for having me. Of course. I want to bring our big story to our panel now. Wow. Uh, joining us today is our ABC News contributor and former acting undersecretary for intelligence for the Department of Homeland Security, John Cohen, ABC News contributor and former deputy assistant secretary uh, of defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy, ABC News political contributor and former Republican congresswoman for Virginia, Barbara Comstock, and Democratic strategist and president of Next Gen America, uh, Christina Sinsoon Ramirez. Uh, thank you all so much for being here with me and you just heard the words from this incredibly resilient young man there. Uh, Mick, starting with you, you know, largely this has been seen as a catastrophic intelligence failure on the part of Israel. What more are we learning there? Well, I think it's an accurate portrayal, unfortunately. Uh, operation of this size would have required a lot of logistic movements, planning, preparation, bringing in technical devices to do such things as jamming communications in Israel. And it, to, me, it, to me, as a former CIA officer, it seems like there would have been a lot of indicators that this was coming. Perhaps, and I don't know this, that they rely too heavily on sig signals intelligence and not enough on humans intelligence, but that is gonna be something that's looked at. And right now they don't have time to really deal with that, but eventually they will look back and try to determine just went wrong here. Right, it's reaction time now. So, John, intelligence officials are saying this is a very sophisticated attack for Hamas to execute on its own. Are there indications that Hamas received help from the outside? Well, there's a long-standing history of Hamas receiving support from the Iranians, from Russia, from other Gulf uh, countries in the Middle East. Uh, and I just want to echo something that Mick was just saying. This wasn't two or three guys in a truck doing an active shooting or setting, up a setting off a suicide bomb. These were uh, almost a thousand militants we're hearing from some reports. Uh, it was a co coordinated attack. They were able to jam uh, communications. They, there was possibility some cyber elements. They were able to breach barriers along the border. They were using a combination of humans, uh, UAVs, you know, drones, uh, people on paragliders, as, long, mm -hmm. uh, as well as rockets. So there was some intense preparation that went into putting this attack together. Uh, and it seems to me, at least from my perspective, that it exceeded the sophistication capabilities of uh, Hamas or Islamic Jihad. This, th th I think they're going to look really hard to see whether there is any state sponsorship of this attack. All right, and Barbara, to you, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell just wrote this op-ed in which he suggests that Congress could essentially assist both Israel and Ukraine in one legislative action. Does that seem likely, given the discord in Washington? I certainly hope at this moment when you see this kind of violent terrorism, and that's what it is, this is terrorism, that you can see that moment of people coming together and uniting. You know, so many members of Congress have traveled to Israel. So you do have that personal connection. You know, you had two members of Congress who were there, you know, Dan Goldman uh, from New York, Cory Booker, Senator Booker. So I think mm -hmm. there is a possibility. I certainly hope so. And Christina, to you, you know, after you hear uh, from Brew Rock, there's a 17 year old young man who had to run for his life. His parents weren't even there. And he's saying, I wish. I could be out there fighting right now for my country. Uh, what is your reaction to his story? I mean, the entire situation is a terrible tragedy on all sides. As soon as I saw what was happening, I just thought of the civilian casualties, the fact that people have been kidnapped, mothers, children, um, fathers, people are waiting for their brothers and sisters to see if they're safe return. Civilian tragedy and life being lost is at the core of what's happening and on both sides. So. I feel so much pain. I think a lot of people feel pain and fear and outrage for what's happened to the Israeli people, civilians, as well as people in Gaza. We have, when you talk about Gaza, we're talking about one of the most densely populated places on earth. Mm -hmm. Half of the population are civilians. And so you have now thou, uh, over a thousand people who have been killed um, and, and the vast majority civilians. And that's why we need 
movement very quickly on this issue to see a peaceful resolution. And that's, I think, also the consequences we're seeing of not having a Speaker of the House. Um, we are needing leadership in government in the United States right now that we simply do not have. The dysfunction in Washington has ramifications, not just in our country, but abroad. No, certainly as we watch one of our most staunchest allies get attacked here, John Cohen, Mick Mulroy, Barbara Comstock, Christina Sinsun Ramirez, thank you all so much for being with us. And coming up next here, the intensifying violence and the diplomatic military moves to de-escalate the tensions. We'll talk about that when we come back. Tonight, Netanyahu making it very clear here that Israel is at war. The deadly terrorist attacks and race to find hostages. The United States stands with the people of Israel. As Israel strikes back, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a Momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. deadly fighting between Israel and Hamas intensifying with Israel now on the counteroffensive the Israeli government asking for support from the US and President Biden is calling on Congress to approve additional aid now I want to bring back our panel uh, John Mick Barbara and Christina so Israel and Hamas have been in conflict for years and now there is concern about how this fighting could escalate even further and draw in other groups from different parts of this region so Mick starting with you Secretary of State Antony Blinken says there's no evidence that points to direct Iranian involvement in these attacks, but 
The U.S. now very keen on preventing Lebanon's Hezbollah movements from joining this conflict. So why is that a priority right now for the U.S. as well? So there is indications that Iran may have had something to do with this. Certainly, as John pointed out in the last segment, uh, historically, they have funded up to 90 percent of Hamas's military budget. And this was very complicated and required so many different pieces of equipment and weaponry that it does at least in part indicate there's been media reports to that extent uh, possible. But I do think we should wait for the intelligence community to make the assessment and they should be the definitive call on that. If they are involved and they intend to stay involved, they do have many proxies in the area, including, including the Lebanese Hezbollah. They have up to 150,000 rockets and missiles. Uh, there are also groups in Syria. If they elected to try to push all of these groups, who are going to make their own decision, all these groups to attack Israel at the same time, this could expand rapidly and could pull in Iran itself mm -hmm. and even the United States. We should all hope that doesn't happen. Right, and one senior U.S. defense official did say, of course, Iran is in the picture. Iran has provided support for years uh, to Hamas and Hezbollah as well. Are, were they directly involved in this one? That is what they have yet to comment on. And so, John, the U.S. is saying, you know, it's moving an aircraft carrier, ships and jets to the eastern Mediterranean. And we'll also give Israel additional equipment and ammunition. The U.S., of course, has always been Israel's staunchest ally. Uh, what do you make of the response so far? So two things. One, um, I think the U.S. is preparing in the event that we do have a large scale um, impact on U.S. citizens or U.S. interests in the region. But first and foremost, I want to build on something Mick was just saying, because he's absolutely right. Uh, containment is key here. Right now, this is a horrible set of circumstances, uh, but it's contained into Israel. The last thing we want uh, is it to expand both within re, uh, Israel and in the region more broadly. We've already seen uh, small amounts of activity uh, in the north with Lebanon. Uh, there are concerns that Hezbollah could potentially become involved. Uh, Iran could potentially become involved. We don't want this to turn into a regional conflict. I'll just say also that Russia, uh, Iran, Hezbollah are using their online information operations capabilities to try to encourage additional attacks both in the region and outside. And adding this uh, senior defense official saying, you know, they're deeply concerned about Hezbollah making the wrong decision and choosing to open a second front uh, on this conflict to your point of containment uh, being key in this. And Barbara, to you, you know, the U.S. sends billions of dollars of military aid to Israel every year. President Biden is calling on Congress to approve more aid uh, to help Israel's defense. The House of Representatives, as we know, doesn't have a speaker right now. So how do you see that playing out? Well, I think it certainly will make it more urgent to resolve the speaker situation this week. The Senate is also out this week. Hopefully they will get back there sooner rather than later and get that all resolved this week. So again, they can get at that money there. I, I think you do have that bipartisan support that has always been strong. So I certainly hope they will respond in that way. And because the sooner and faster give that very strong, you know, not just adequate, but very muscular response there. Right. I think that will do, you know, exactly, um, you know, what they're saying there. We need to have that strong response. Response and support our ally that is asking for these things. Yes. We know there's been this stockpile exactly. of munitions there from, from wars past, but th that will only go so far. So, Christina, uh, what are your thoughts on, do you think that we will see Congress move quickly here and provide this funding? and? potentially simultaneously funding to support both Israel and Ukraine. I mean, this is exactly why we need, as just stated by uh, Representative uh, Congresswoman, former Congresswoman Comstock, we need a Speaker of the House. Repu Republican dysfunction, again, is impacting us at home and abroad. And also Republicans are holding up currently with appointment of 300 senior Pentagon officials and the next ambassador of Israel. There are certain wings of the Republican Party that simply do not care if government comes to a halt, and we and uh, Israelis and Palestinians are suffering the consequences of that. We need American leadership as rapidly and quickly as possible to prevent as much civilian casualty as possible on both sides. And I want to remind people there are Israeli Americans and there are Palestinian Americans. This is a conflict where civilians on both sides are really suffering the consequences of a failure of, of action and leadership. 
and John Cohen, Mick Mulroy, Barbara Comstock, and Christina Sinson Ramirez. Thank you all. We appreciate that. And coming up next year, our correspondent Matt Gutman is on the ground in Israel when we come back. Stay with us. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I jumped to the rear bumper. Mrs. Kennedy was screaming. I wasn't fast enough. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. With all that's happening. Bring your friends. Everything I really need to know. A place as awesome and as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right guys? Bring your friends. Oh wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom. Boom! Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom! Good morning, America. Now that's how you start your day, people. Yep, bring your friends. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting in Philadelphia, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has been to countless conflict zones and has covered this region many times before. In fact, he was stationed there at one point. So Matt, tell us more about what you saw today. We drove down to Israel South today, ostensibly to interview a military analyst. And we were in the town of Stirot, and in my years covering 
the conflict here. I had been to Stirot many times. It is the town about two miles from the border with Gaza. It has always been a target for rocket attacks from Hamas simply because it's so close and it's the largest nearby town. But this was different this time. It was an absolute ghost town. There was nobody in the streets. The only people we saw were the elderly trying to bring water and food into their bomb shelters. And as we were there filming this police station, a barrage of rockets started to come in. There was no warning. There was no siren. It was just the roar of the missiles overhead and the bangs of the interceptors. Um, that's what life is like. And throughout that area in the south, we saw so many hundreds of people evacuating, leaving their homes, possibly for the last time. A lot of these people can't go back to these villages right on the border that were infiltrated by Hamas militants. One woman named Avital told me that her neighbors were murdered, entire families were murdered, friends were carted off into Gaza, and she had been a supporter of peace all these years. She has friends in Gaza. She believes that there are still many good people there, but she now has, believes that Gaza has to be bombed and that Hamas has to be eradicated. This is a complete sea change in the Israeli mentality. Um, that is not something you would have heard even a week ago or three days ago. Things here have fun fundamentally changed, especially with those 300,000 Israeli reserves now in that area around Gaza. This is a nation on war footing, unlike anything it has seen in at least 50 years. And they're talking about October 7th as the deadliest day, not just in Israel's history, but in the history of the Jewish people, they're saying, since the Holocaust. Kena. Matt Gutman, incredible perspective. Thank you so much for your reporting. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kena Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for On the War in Israel and today's biggest story. She has more there. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I jumped to the rear bumper. Mrs. Kennedy was screaming. I wasn't fast enough. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the cargo ship fire in Newark, New Jersey, I'm Aaron Katursky. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, Israel at war. You just had the air raid siren. There you go, you can hear the sound of an explosion overhead. I can see some smoke. More than a thousand now killed, thousands more injured as hostilities between Israel and Hamas only intensify. Our correspondents are on the ground on both sides of the war. Plus, stories of grief and horror as more than a hundred were taken hostage by hamas we'll speak with family members desperately pleading for their loved ones as hamas warns it will start to kill hostages if their demands are not met and peace deals have been brokered photo ops taken but why haven't any succeeded how we got here and how things could possibly move forward following such terror in this special edition of abc news live prime 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the horror of war and the harrowing stories after Hamas fighters stormed into Israel, killing indiscriminately, kidnapping children, women, and the elderly. It's being called Israel's Pearl Harbor, or it's 9-11. It is the worst attack on that country's soil in 50 years. Tonight, Hamas has at least 100 people hostage, and they are vowing to kill them one by one. The death toll on both sides already staggering. At least 900 Israelis, including 100 bodies found today in a small farming town. Thousands more are injured, and we know more than 260 people were killed at a music festival in the desert. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the country is preparing for a long war. Israel has called up 300,000 military reserves and has cut off all food, water, and electricity in the Gaza Strip and started airstrikes. Nearly 700 people there have died. At least 91 of them are children. But what happens to those hostages if Israel continues to bombard Gaza? And there's concern tonight Americans may be among those who are being held. We'll hear from an anguished mother in just a few minutes who tells us her two sons got taken hostage while she was on the phone with them. Tonight, we'll look at how it came to this and what an extended conflict might mean for Israel and the world. Our team is standing by from Israel and back here in the U.S. to break it all down. We begin with World News Tonight anchor David Muir reporting from Tel Aviv. We're having some technical difficulties there. In Gaza, growing grief and devastation. Israel has controlled the territory's borders for years. So how was Hamas able to organize and launch such a sophisticated attack without Israel being aware of it? ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports from the border. Tonight, Israel on a war footing. 100,000 reservists amassing in the south, moving towards Gaza. This conflict looks set to enter a new phase. A ground invasion could be imminent. We're starting to see large-scale movements of the Israeli military throughout this area in the south now. These are armored personnel carriers, essentially heading up towards the front line. We're seeing a lot of men, a lot of munitions, and a lot of movement. This is starting to look really like a country at war. And now Gaza, one of the world's most densely populated areas, is under relentless bombardment. But many civilians are being caught in the crossfire. Over 680 people killed in three days, 140 of them children, according to Gaza's health ministry. For parents on both sides of the border, the grief overwhelming. And whole neighborhoods are being wiped out. A frantic scene as rescue workers dig for miracles. Is there anyone alive? This man shouts. And from this pile of debris, six month old Sama Al Wadia pulled out, still alive. The problem has started before this crisis. We have had shortage of medications, medical supplies prior to this crisis. <laughs> And already struggling hospitals are now overwhelmed, with Israel now cutting off water, electricity and food to Gaza, one doctor with this warning. The health system will collapse. What will you do without water, electricity, medication? Of course, there will be a collapse. The problem is that every, every five minutes you have a new breaking news talking about more and more injured Palestinians, among civilians, of course. There will be no room for those people to be treated in hospitals. That's why I think the best thing to do if this war should stop at once and at the same time they should open the borders for us to send patients outside, maybe to Egypt, maybe to Jordan, maybe to the West Bank, I don't know, but they should, the border should be open. And even today, Hamas still hitting Israeli cities and civilian areas. We witnessed it firsthand. Just hearing a sound of, we just had the air raid siren. There you go, you can hear the sound of an explosion. Overhead, I can see some smoke up there. Sounds like the noise of an intercept, uh, perhaps from the Israeli Iron Dome defense system. And that's what people here have to live with all the time at now. It turns out Hamas had been planning its shock attack on Israel in secret for months. Now releasing this video, showing fighters training on motorized paragliders practicing their descent into Israel. How this all began 48 hours ago. 
but the hell Hamas unleashed for so many may only just have begun, now spilling back into Gaza. The cries of those people so difficult to hear. Ian Panel joins us now from Tel Aviv. Ian, you saw those Israeli tanks moving toward the Gaza border. Uh, describe the scene and, and what it could mean for the days ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing, it, it's not just the men and munitions, we also see logistics, like every gas station, there are large collections of soldiers. You see coach loads, bus loads of them moving into the area. It's starting to look like a staging area for a major military operation. And I think there's pressure on Netanyahu that the airstrikes, as punitive as they are for the people of Gaza, as much suffering is going on on that side of the border, that it's only the start of a much larger operation. But where does it end? Does Israel want to just have an incursion into parts of Gaza to try and eradicate Hamas, something it's tried before, unsuccessfully so. Does it want to invade Gaza? But then it owns the problem. It owns a swath of land which would be very hard to govern, and you're still going to have to deal with a problem from militants. And I think the last big unanswered question is what does Hezbollah in the north, across the border into Lebanon, do? Does it respond? Does it join the fray? In which case Israel potentially has to fight a war on two fronts. Lindsay? Mm. All right. Ian, panel for us in Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Ian. And let's get back to World News Tonight. Anchor David Muir reporting from Tel Aviv. Israel at war. <laughs> Hundreds of Israeli rockets pounding Gaza for hours. <laughs> Retaliation. For the brutal Hamas attack on Israel, thick black plumes of smoke billowing into the sky. These men capturing the destruction unfold from inside a neighboring building as the sun sets, explosions lighting up the night sky. targets in just three hours. Dozens of Israeli fighter jets. Tonight, the Israeli Defense Ministry declaring a total siege of the Gaza Strip. No power, no water, no electricity. They say they are dealing with, quote, barbaric terrorists, and that, quote, we will act accordingly. On the ground in Hamas-controlled Gaza, ambulances rushing to the scene tonight. Israel's retaliatory strikes, leaving more than 600 dead. Cries for help as buildings burn, children carried to safety. This man weeping, his head in his hands as he sits on a pile of rubble. A home hit by an Israeli airstrike, four of the seven family members who live there presumed dead. Hamas releasing this drone footage. They say an Israeli tank in the crosshairs, then the strike and explosion. Tonight, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu comparing Hamas to ISIS, saying the enemy are animals, executing children and parents in front of families. The retaliation comes 48 hours after a sweeping, coordinated and brutal assault that left much of Israel under attack. The worst attack on Israel in 50 years. More than 900 dead here in Israel, at least 11 Americans among them. Some of the first missiles seen just after 6 a.m. in the sky above a music festival near the Gaza border. Young people could be seen running for their lives. This haunting drone video posted online showing the aftermath. The cars abandoned, lining the road. A staggering 260 people were killed here. We learn of a young man at that festival who raced into a shelter, only to witness many of his own friends shot and killed right in front of him. 30-year-old Saho Bensalon. Glad you're okay. Thank you very much. Shot in the arm and the leg, telling us he ran for his life and hid in that shelter with 30 others. He estimates 20 of them did not get out alive. One of my friends, uh, she got uh, choked by the smoke. She tried to run away, and she got tackled with the, the terrorists who, got, who tried to get inside to shoot at us, and just he dropped her on the floor and started to shoot, kill her, with, shoot at that shelter. Shooter, 
The horror unleashed on that festival was just the beginning. Hamas militants going door to door in small towns and villages. Witnesses say they were killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the street, some shot in their cars. And witnesses say in homes where they didn't kill, they took hostages, mothers and children, seniors dragged away, taken back to Gaza. Yoni, I'm David, thank you for having us. I'm thank sorry, you. I'm sorry you're still waiting. Thank you for coming. This young father, Yoni Asher, was on the phone with his wife. She had brought their two young daughters, two and four, to see their grandmother. She called her husband after they rushed into a safe room in the house. They knew the militants were outside. She was whispering. I didn't hear background. I uh, didn't hear the girls. Um, she was frightening. And um, when they called disconnected, I just couldn't do anything. I just went down on the floor like this on my knees and couldn't feel my legs and try to hope for the best. The call drops. He had no idea what happened to his wife and children until this video. Yoni says this is his wife, Duran. He watches as militants start to cover his wife's head. He sees a flash of one of his daughters. I recognized them immediately and uh, I saw the video twice. And the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because um, I got, um, I got, um, I melt down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was, uh, it was a nightmare. It was the worst possible scenario. He has not heard from his wife since. Her cell phone now pings from Gaza. He is terrified for her and for his daughters. The phone is in Khan Yunis, which is inside Gaza. And that point, I, I really feared that um, she'd been taken. That too. she'd been taken. Yeah. Okay. This is your firstborn. This is my. He shows me the photos of his family, the smiles, the girls in their dresses, a father proud to hold his daughter. These are their drawings, their little play kitchen, and their shoes, right where they left them. Tonight, Israel says there are at least 100 hostages being held in Gaza. And Hamas is now warning tonight that they will start executing Israeli hostages if the bombing continues without warning. They say some of the hostages are already dead. What's your message to those who took your wife and daughters? My message to them is um, don't hurt my wife. Don't hurt my little girls. Show some decency. Show some respect. And tonight, as Israeli soldiers now amass at the border with Gaza, a young Israeli commander will not be there. He was one of the first to respond when the Hamas attacks began. 20-year-old military commander Yuval Patiev. Hi, I'm David. I'm Good to meet you. He watched as the militants charged toward him. He says they put a bomb under the tank. One terrorist climbed under the tank. He put an explosive bomb right under my seat. So when he blew it, I flew like in the air. At the moment, I really, I knew that I broke my leg. So I told my commander that he should take my tourniquet and should put it on that. You asked them to put your tourniquet yeah, on yeah. you? Yeah, you... I, I just opened the gate and told him to put it right here. And did you think you could lose your leg? Yeah, I did, but I... I just did what it trained us. His leg shattered and bleeding. Yuval says they were under attack, trapped in that tank for hours. He can still see their faces. You look at them and how could you do this to someone like that? All they saw was hate and trying to murder you. So we just fought for our lives. Everybody got together, hold everything closed, trying to pray that they won't get, uh, they won't get to open the tank, won't explode it. And, God was with us, that's all I can say. Well, glad you're okay, right. that you survived. Yeah. And you have your leg. Yeah. They say it's gonna be okay? Yeah, it's gonna be okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, man. Young soldier.
that young commander thought he was going to die in that tank. And that young husband, by the way, who's still waiting for word on his wife and two young daughters, just two and four years old, they continue to wait along with so many families. We know of at least about 100 captives being held inside Gaza. And of course, that new threat tonight from Hamas, that if this retaliation from Israel continues, they could start killing those captives one by one on video for the world to see. Just an extraordinary and haunting threat from Hamas tonight. And Lindsay, before we toss it back to you, just a reminder of that key number tonight. Israel has now amassed 300,000 Israeli soldiers on the border with Gaza. Very clear here that another chapter is soon coming. Lindsay. So much about this is haunting. David in Tel Aviv for us. Thank you. As Israel retaliates against Gaza, Hamas is now threatening to execute those 100 hostages on camera one by one. So many families fear their loved ones may never make it home. Our James Longman is also on the ground in Israel. Tonight, with Israel now pounding Gaza and Hamas reacting with a threat to kill its captives, the fate of more than 100 Israeli hostages hanging in the balance. Their loved ones grow more desperate, wondering, will they make it home alive? She, wants her, she just wants her to come home back safe and sound. The family of 19-year-old Karina Ashaev, an Israeli army recruit, recognized her in this video circulating online, bloody and bound as she was taken into Gaza. In another video, Karina is seen surrounded by other kidnapped women. Her sister Sasha tells me Karina was doing her military service at a base on the Gaza border. And she says after a few weeks of training, Karina was told she wouldn't need a weapon. The girls weren't prepared for this. They don't know, they, they have no guns. They don't know how to shoot. Karina made one last call home when she saw the militants coming. She felt she knew that she wasn't going to come home. Yes. She, she, she absolutely knew that she's going to die. Her father overcome. She said goodbye to her family. She speak with me on the phone. And she said goodbye. Yes, she said I love that. you, every of you. And yeah. it's it is just hard to fathom a phone call like that. Uh, James Longman joins us now from Israel. Uh, James, so far the military has reached out to 30 families to tell them their loved ones have been kidnapped. But are their families still waiting for word? Yeah, uh, Lindsay, a lot of families are waiting for word. They don't know if their loved ones have either died or been kidnapped uh, by Hamas militants. Remember, 260 people were killed at that festival alone, and it's just an overwhelming number for the Israeli authorities to have to go through. And that's why they're asking for uh, relatives to come forward. There's a specifically a set up a facility for families to come forward with DNA of their loved ones to try and see if there is a match. I've heard on more than one occasion now of fathers making the rounds of hospitals with hair from hairbrushes of their children to see if that is a match uh, for some of the dead. It's just the sheer number of dead and number of missing, which is overwhelming for uh, the authorities here. And that's why it's taking some time for families to get the answers they need. But as you say, 30 families have been informed by the Israeli authorities. The IDF says they have information on every single one of the captured Israelis. And the race is on to inform them to speak to them before they have the tragic ordeal of possibly watching as a militant carries through on this threat to start executing hostages uh, online. We don't know when or if that's ever going to happen, but the IDF and the Israeli authorities are really keen to make sure they speak to the families before they have to see that. Mm. Lindsay. And of course we see that the late night sky lighting up behind you. James, stay safe and thank you so much for your reporting. We are learning about more harrowing and heartbreaking stories from those Israeli border communities. Hamas fighters stormed a kibbutz, a communal settlement in southern Israel, taking hostages and destroying the community. Joining us now live is a mother who lives in one of those communities and says her two sons, who are 16 and 12, were both kidnapped by Hamas. She prefers not to be named for security reasons. First off, just want to say our thoughts and prayers. We certainly are sending those out. Uh, with you and your family tonight as you deal with this scenario that, that no parent should have to bear. Take us back to the start. You know, what happened in those first moments as Hamas came into your kibbutz? Uh, at 6.30 uh, Saturday morning, we've heard the red alert going off 
unfortunately, that's a routine we're pretty used to. So my two boys who were home alone um, went to the safe room and they, well, they know what to do uh, and got in the safe room and then called me. I was on another place nearby, uh, a different kibbutz uh, with my spouse and they were at, with their father this week, that weekend, I'm divorced. Um, and they usually they sleep at my place, uh, even on his weekends, we're only a few hundred meters away, uh, our houses. So uh, on a normal situation for 12 and 16 year olds, it's, it sounds like a normal situation and it's, you know. Uh, and then red alerts were going off and I was on the phone to them every few minutes. Uh, somewhere around half past eight, uh, they started saying that they were hearing uh, gunshots outside the house, and I tried to calm them down, telling them it's probably the army or our people uh, shooting. Um, and then texts were coming in from other members of the community saying that uh, terrorists are walking around, uh, trying to break into houses, trying to get in. And then about half past eight, they called me, um, whispering that they think they heard the door break and someone breaking into the house and it took another 10 minutes so uh and i could hear two or three people speaking in arabic outside the door getting in and my youngest who's only 12 saying to them don't take me i'm too young and that was it the line cut off that was the last time i heard from them uh, they were taken from their home, from their beds by barbarians. I, I can't really find another word for it. Um, that's it. And since then, I've heard nothing. Um, I've later found out by one of the videos Hamas put on that uh, their father, um, who was injured, and his... Uh, and his wonderful girlfriend were also taken hostage. Mm. And I'm only hoping that they're together now. Mm -hmm. That's it. Did it uh, appear that they had left the safe room at some point? No. No, they were in the safe room the whole time, but the safe room don't lock. No one ever thought that we needed to lock the doors in, you know, against a terror attack of this, of this sort. The safe rooms were built against missile attacks mm. um, or earthquakes. They weren't meant to be locked against terrorists going to the houses. They went to the houses, they broke everything they could. They stole everything they could. They burnt houses. They burnt houses with families in them. They took mm. babies, they took women, they took children, they took elderly people over 85. They took people who were sick. They took injured people. They're just, you know, it, it, barbarians. I'm sorry, but I can't find another word for it. If you could get a message out to your sons tonight, uh, what would that be? I want the world to know that they're holding innocent civilians. I want the world to know that war has rules, even war has rules. Even ancient wars had rules. This is against all rules. Against all rules of humanity, against all rules of war, against all rules of peace. You know, we gave them work permits, thinking that this would help their economy and would help get, well, regain the, the trust. I used to say to my kids, every time we were shot at missiles, that the children in Gaza has a much worse life than theirs, that the situation is much worse than theirs, and they don't have safe rooms, and that they should be sympathetic to them. Mm. We have morals. They don't. Are you getting... I want the world, I want the world to demand to release those innocent civilians. I want these children and women and babies back home, and I want my children back home. I want 
want them to fight each other. I want them to annoy each other. I want them to get in my nerves again. I want them back. I want them to be back sleeping in their beds. I can't take a shower without thinking of them being held in hostages in some dirty pit somewhere. I can't eat, I can't sleep. I don't think human beings treat people like this. I'm sorry. I want the world to demand those hostages to be returned to their homes. War has rules. Are you getting any updates at all from the government, from any officials at all? Uh, I've had uh, been contacted like most families, but they don't have much news to give me. Uh, most of the information they have is the information I gave. Uh, so no, I, I'm not getting any, any new information, anything. But I'm keeping my hopes up. I'm hoping that since they took hundreds, hundreds of people, they won't have the capacity or the nerve to keep them there. And I'm hoping the world won't let it happen. I'm begging from a mother to other mothers in every country in the world to think what she would feel like if it was their child. Even mothers in Gaza want a normal life, I'm sure. Um, as a mother myself, hearing from you, I think that um, there's no one who can hear your story and, and not be heartbroken. And it's so important to hear um, your story. And we are certainly hoping for the best um, outcome. And, and I hope that you'll continue to, to keep us informed. And, um, and we are certainly lifting up your entire community tonight. I, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. And there are horrific discoveries still being made today. 100 bodies were found in one small town in southern Israel. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, spent the day traveling around the region to the towns and villages where Hamas militants swept through. And yet another code red was declared just as Matt was there today. Tonight, the haunting discovery in a small Israeli town. Video circulating online showing Hamas militants taking Israeli citizens hostage during a deadly standoff in Be'eri, six miles from the Gaza border. It took Israeli forces two days to fight off those Hamas militants. And when they were gone, the harrowing scenes left behind. Tonight, word of more than 100 bodies found in this tiny farming community. This video posted by Hamas showing bodies on the ground. We traveled today to the bullet-scarred town of Sderot, just two miles from the Gaza border, another community under a relentless barrage of Hamas rockets. Inside, 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 Obviously, there was a code red. Two minutes. Two minutes. We're going to stay here for two more minutes. You heard the rockets coming in. That tells you how close you are. There was almost no warning. The shelter, Seven okay? seconds to go in the shelter. That's all you have here. So many residents here choosing to leave. Avital telling me that after dozens of her neighbors were killed, she no longer supports peace with the Palestinians. So many drawing lines in the sand. Our, our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, joins us now from southern Israel. And Matt, it, you've covered this region for a long time. I'm curious what strikes you the most about this conflict this time? What, what feels different? In short, everything. Um, Israel has never mobilized this many troops this quickly. That entire area around Gaza is being evacuated of civilians. I have never seen that. These towns that we went into today, there are still cars that are blown out that have been set on fire. They were removing bodies as we were in there. Um, this is different. Israelis, for the first time, are also unanimously, almost unanimously, in support of eradicating Hamas politically and militarily, despite massive opposition to Benjamin Netanyahu. As a military official told us just moments ago, this is different. October 6th was then. Everything after October 7th is now. This is a game changer. Lindsay. Matt Gutman for us in Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. 
Joining us now with more from the Palestinian perspective is Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, who is the co-founder of the Palestinian National Initiative. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, according to various organizations from Human Rights Watch to the UN, the violence in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank has claimed countless Palestinian lives over the last couple of years. Are you concerned that these attacks by Hamas on civilians in Israel are ultimately hurting the Palestinian cause? I do not uh, accept killing any civilian, whether Palestinian or Israeli. And I don't think killing civilians is a solution to any problem. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the, the, the root cause of what we see today is the continuation of Israeli illegal occupation of Palestinian land. The fact that the West Bank is still occupied after 56 years uh, and uh, becoming the longest occupation in modern history an occupation that has transformed into a system of apartheid. Gaza is also under another form of occupation, besieged from every direction. And now Israel is declaring that Palestinians are animals and, that, and, and imposing a, a complete and total siege on Gaza, depriving people from food, from medications, from water, from electricity. A whole population of 2.2 million people are punished today. And I don't think that the killing of civilians in Israel justifies now killing the Palestinians in Gaza and then blaming Palestinians for the fact that Palestinians are killed. This is unacceptable. And dehumanizing Palestinians is unacceptable. The way out of this is different. It should be a de immediate de-escalation, immediate exchange of prisoners, immediate ceasefire, and then finding a way of ending this occupation. For people who are, are unclear from afar exactly what the unrest is about, is it clearly boiled down to a land dispute or, or is it far more complicated than that? No, it's about violation of international law. As I said, uh, Palestinians are subjected to Israeli illegal military occupation. And uh, this illegal occupation has transformed into a system of apartheid, according to Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and even Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem. This is a much worse apartheid than what prevailed in South Africa at one point of time. Uh, more than that, Mr. Netanyahu has been doing everything he could since he came to power in, 2000, in 1996 to kill the possibility of peace. Uh, this is a very simple case of people who are occupied, people who have been oppressed for 56 years. Uh, my grandfather, my father, my, myself, and my daughter have never seen a day of freedom. Uh, and uh, what Palestinians need is equality like everybody else. What we need is the, our right to be independent, our right to be free from any oppression and from the system of occupation. Can you see any path forward to peace or diplomacy? The only way out of this is immediate ceasefire, immediate de-escalation, immediate exchange of prisoners, so that all Israelis who are now held in Gaza could come home safe, and all Palestinian prisoners who have been in Israeli jails for such a long time, including one that I know that has been there for 43 years. This should stop. And we can open the road to real peace by accepting Palestinians as equal human beings, by, stop, by stopping dehumanizing Palestinians and accept them as equal partners. I've always said, if Israel doesn't want two-state solution, does not want us to be free and end occupation, then let's live together in one democratic state with equal rights. But you cannot say that all of Palestine is only Jewish and Palestinians have no place to stay in especially that our number today is equal to the Israeli Jewish people. Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate the conversation. Of course, co-founder of the Palestinian National Initiative. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. And still ahead, we'll have the latest from the White House with National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby. And as Republicans criticize the White House over its handling of Iran, I'll speak with Foreign Relations Committee senior member, Senator Marco Rubio. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight.
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, Israel is ordering the complete siege of Gaza. New images show Israeli forces hammering Hamas targets as Hamas militants fire more rockets into Israel. All of this ignited by that surprise attack by Hamas by land, sea, and air on Saturday. More than 900 dead in Israel, at least 11 Americans among them, nearly 700 now dead in Gaza. We go to ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, at the White House. Mary, in addition to the 11 Americans known to be among the dead, does the U.S. believe that there are Americans among the hostages? Well, Lindsay, the White House says there are an unaccounted number of Americans still missing and that we should be bracing for the grim reality that American citizens are likely being held hostage by Hamas. The president spent his day here at the White House behind closed doors meeting with his national security team on the phone with America's allies. And the president tonight is stressing that American safety is his top priority and that he has directed his team to work closely with the Israelis on all aspects of this hostage crisis and the recovery effort. Lindsay. Mary Bruce from the White House, our thanks to you. The U.S. is rushing military supplies and air defenses to Israel, including a Navy carrier strike group. All of this in the hopes of partly sending a warning to others in the region not to make this a wider war. Here's ABC's chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz. Tonight, as Israel unleashes that relentless barrage of missiles on Gaza, the U.S. surging new supplies, weapons, and air defenses to Israel. The massive aircraft carrier USS Gerald Ford, with fighter jets ready to launch on command, there as a deterrent to Iran and its proxies, the Lebanon-based militant group Hezbollah. A U.S. defense official stating that the U.S. is deeply concerned that Hezbollah could make the wrong decision and start a second front in this conflict, which the official described as unprecedented, with ISIS-level tactics and techniques, savagery, the official called it. Israel already desperate for more munitions after being caught totally by surprise by this attack, without question, a colossal intelligence failure. The U.S. seemingly just as surprised. U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken saying the intelligence failure will be closely examined, but for now, all efforts are on dealing with the present danger from Hamas and potentially others. Lindsay? Martha, thank you. Earlier today, I spoke with White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby. President Biden pledged his full support to Prime Minister Netanyahu over the weekend. So first, just give us the latest on what assistance the U.S. is providing for Israel and, and what Israel is saying that it needs at this moment. 
In these early hours, it's largely in terms of uh, weapons replenishment. You, you can imagine they're, they're, they're going through uh, quite an expenditure of missile interceptors and artillery, ammunition, that kind of thing. So I think you can expect that that's really the, 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 the early sets of uh, security assistance that we'll be providing to Israel. And already uh, a, a package of that assistance uh, has been sent to Israel. Is there anything you can tell us on how Israel is navigating how to respond mili militarily in Gaza, knowing so many Israelis are being held hostage there, with Hamas even threatening on-camera executions? Uh, I want to be careful that I'm not speaking for the Israeli government or what their military operations are or will be. I certainly won't get ahead of them uh, in, in a public setting, uh, but you can certainly see by the response over the last 12, 18 hours that it is, it's is—it's been swift and it's been aggressive. Uh, I mean, the size and scale, the scope of the violence that have been visited upon the Israeli people by Hamas is, on, is unprecedented. Can you confirm whether any American citizens are, in fact, among those being held hostage? I cannot confirm that, but we do have a number of Americans who their whereabouts are, are unknown. They're unaccounted for. Um, and we don't really know whether they're just missing somewhere or are lost or whether they're being held hostage. I think we have to accept the possibility uh, that at least some of them uh, are being held hostage by uh, Hamas. And obviously, we, we take that very seriously. We're in constant communication with Israeli officials to try to get as much granularity and information as we can about these Americans. Uh, but sadly, we, we just don't have good, solid answers right now. As you know, the Wall Street Journal has reported that Iranian security officials helped plan the Hamas attack and, quote, gave the green light for the assault at a meeting in Beirut last week. Has the U.S. confirmed the level of Iran's involvement in planning and the execution of this attack? We have not, and neither have our Israeli counterparts. We don't have specific intelligence or evidence that says Iran was directly participating uh, and involved in these particular attacks. Now, that said, uh, make no mistake, there's, an, there's a degree of complicity here just by virtue of the fact that Iran has been supporting Hamas militarily from a resource perspective uh, with training for now a couple of decades. So this is not a new relationship. Uh, they have helped lead to the kinds of ability that Hamas uh, uh, has in the field. So there's a there's an air of complicity there. As you well know, Republicans have criticized the recent deal to unfreeze six billion dollars in Iranian assets as aiding this Hamas attack. Even if none of that money has been touched, what do you say to the critics who say just having access to those funds for humanitarian purposes allowed Tehran to free up other money to aid groups like Hamas? I would say a couple of things. First of all, uh, this is exactly the same arrangement that the previous administration uh, executed, uh, almost in exactly the same way in terms of allowing the purchase of Iranian oil and that revenue cannot be used uh, by Iran for anything other than humanitarian purposes. I would also add that not a single dinar of that $6 billion that has been transferred to Qatar uh, and unfrozen has actually been allocated into Iran. They haven't seen a single a bit of it uh, going forward. So, look, we can always refreeze that funds, uh, those funds if we feel like we need to. We're not at that uh, point. I don't have a policy decision to make on that. A spokesman for Iran's foreign ministry released a statement today saying the West should realize their responsibilities in the continuation of aggression against the Palestinian nation. What's your response to that, which I think is fair to say is a widely held view in the Middle East? Uh, it's also uh, a widely distributed set of propaganda talking points uh, by Iran. Uh, the president continues to believe in the viability of a two-state solution, which offers peace and justice for both Israelis and for Palestinians. Obviously, the focus today rightly needs to be uh, on the violence inside Israel and these, uh, these reprehensible terrorist attacks. I would also say uh, that Hamas doesn't speak for all Palestinians and for their aspirations, for their desires to, again, have uh, a state of their own and to be able to live in peace and security. That is something the United States believes in and will continue to pursue. John Kirby at the White House, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Joining us now is a senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Republican Marco Rubio. Senator, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, you've seen the harrowing images. We've heard the heartbreaking stories from parents whose children are being held hostage. What should the U.S. government be doing right now to help Israel? Well, first, like everybody else, our thoughts, our prayers, our, and our heartache uh, is with these families that are having to see these images online in real time. Uh, I cannot, I just can't imagine what that must feel like or what that's like. 
I think that the, U the most important role the U.S. has to have right now is, is support, d direct and, and moral and diplomatic and international support on behalf of Israel to make abundantly clear to their enemies that we're going to stand at Israel and we're going to provide them whatever they need to win. And the good news is that, unlike some of the challenges we've seen with Ukraine and so forth, f the U.S.-Israeli defense uh, arrangement uh, is codified. We actually passed a bill, my bill, back in uh, December of 2020, that actually puts in place, uh, that gives the uh, administration authority from now till 2028 to spend a minimum or, or to be involved in a minimum of over $3.3 billion a year in assistance. So they already have the authority to do a lot. The Israelis are also very capable. They're not asking and never have asked and never will ask us to send American soldiers. What they basically will need is resupply. Um, some of that's already been prepositioned in the before all of this, so that's good. But the most, the second most important thing is trying to prevent this from escalating into a broader conflict. And that's where the messaging that's going on right now through Qatar, through Egypt, through all these other nations to Iran is so important. And the message needs to be if the U.S. is attacked or this thing is escalated w w that implicates uh, whether it's U.S. servicemen in the region, servicewomen in the region or facilities in the region, whether it's Iran directly or through their proxies, we're going to hold Iran responsible. We're going to consider it an attack by the Iranian state, and we will respond in kind. And that is really critical here, because what you don't want to see is this devolve into a second front uh, from Lebanon uh, or, or, from, uh, or from the West Bank, uh, but primarily from Lebanon, because that, that injects a level of danger here that, that, that goes even higher. You've called for Hamas to be eradicated and for Israel to Absolutely. respond to this attack disproportionately. How do you do that with Hamas now threatening to execute hostages if Israeli airstrikes continue without warning? Yeah, look, there's no good options here, but there's only one that actually achieves the purpose that Israel needs. You cannot coexist. You cannot live near this level of depravity, this level of, 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 of such a sinister, this level of evil. Now, these are people that deliberately targeted these terrorists deliberately targeted teenage girls, children, women, the elderly. They deliberately targeted them. And then did not just for murder and rape and all these other horrific acts, but then, you know, bringing their bodies back and dumping them in the streets of Gaza so that the crowds can then defile their lifeless bodies. This is a level of depravity you simply can't coexist with. If these guys are not eliminated, these people are not eliminated, they will do this again at an even higher level. And unfortunately, in that neighborhood, it sends a message to others. If they got away with this, there are things we're gonna, it'll, we can get away with. It will encourage future attacks with much more horrifying impact. I mean, Hezbollah's military capabilities are substantially greater than what Hamas has and uh, what you would be encouraging there. I don't think this is, this is horrifying. I mean, what's going to have to happen here truly is horrifying. We have to prepare ourselves for that. But there literally is no other option at this point, especially since Hamas uses civilians, children, others, as human shields. What do you say to those who are critical of the role the U.S. has played in recent years, who say the U.S. exacerbated tensions in the region through actions advocated by people like you who supported, for example, moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and not involving a Palestinian voice in the Abraham Accords negotiated by former President Trump? Your response to those critics? Well, that's not why this is happening. They didn't murder women. First of all, there's no excuse for murdering civilians going in and deliberately targeting teenage girls out in the desert to, to, to rape them and murder them. So there's no excuse for that. But number two, I would say that that's not why any of this is happening. Hamas is not attacking because they want an embassy. Hamas is not attacking because they want to be part of the Abraham Accord. Hamas is attacking because their organizing principle, the reason why they exist, their stated purpose for existing, is they want to destroy the Jewish state. They do not want Israel to exist as a Jewish state. They want that to be a Muslim country populated by people like them. That, that's their stated goal. That's Iran's stated goal. And these attacks are designed not to militarily defeat Israel, but to destroy its economy, destroy, uh, drive people out, out of there, destroy its relationships internationally, and cause Israel to collapse from within. That is their stated goal. That is the reason why they're attacking. This is not over land. This is uh, not because they want Gaza to have economic opportunity. It's because they want to destroy the Jewish state. That's not me saying it. That's their stated mission. That's why they exist. That's, uh, th that's always been why they've existed. And that's why these attacks are happening. Senator Marco Rubio, so appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on the Thank show. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, as Israel prepares to strike back against Gaza, we'll look at why this attack was not detected in advance. But next, the history of efforts at peace in the Middle East by the numbers. This is ABC News Live.
The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back, everyone. As we cover the outbreak of war in the Middle East tonight, we want to take a step back to give a bit of perspective and a bit of background on the long-running conflict and the attempts to try to find a peaceful resolution by the numbers. 1948, that's when the state of Israel was first formed and the modern conflict began. Displaced Palestinians began fighting the new state immediately, and over the following years, tensions rose across the region. In 1979, President Jimmy Carter brought representatives from Egypt and Israel together to sign the Camp David Accord. But while that improved relations between Israel and its neighbors, the questions of Palestinian self-determination and self-governance remained unresolved. In 1991, in the wake of the first Gulf War, President George Bush co-hosted the Madrid summit. It was the first time all the parties to the Arab-Israeli conflict gathered for direct negotiations, but they failed to reach an agreement. In 1993, the Oslo Accord set up a framework for the Palestinians to govern themselves in the West Bank and Gaza. And in 1995, the accords were expanded to mandate Israel's withdrawal from settlements in the West Bank. Multiple peace talks followed, but ultimately broke down. And in 2000, President Bill Clinton brought Israeli and Palestinian leaders together at Camp David, but they failed to reach a deal, and the second Palestinian intifada soon followed. Then in 2007, President George W. Bush hosted a conference at the U.S. Naval Academy, establishing the two-state solution as the basis for future talks between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, but failed to reach a lasting agreement. Agreement. Most recently in 2020, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain agreed to normalize relations with Israel. The so-called Abraham Accords followed U.S.-hosted talks between Israel and several Arab states focused on the peace process. Palestinian leaders later rejected the accords. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The painstaking process of recovering the dead in Israel is now underway. We speak to an organization on the ground doing that difficult work. And we dive into what this attack could mean for Israel's government and Iran's potential role in directing this attack. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. We are continuing our in-depth coverage of the outbreak of war in the Middle East. And as we digest the magnitude of what has happened in the past few days and what this coordinated multi-pronged attack that killed 250 Israelis at a music festival means for Israel, for Gaza, and for the whole Middle East, we're talking with people from both sides of the story. Today, I spoke with a veteran of the bloodshed from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He works with a group charged with recovering the dead from terror attacks, identifying them, and returning them to their families for burial. He's been working at the music festival site, and he said nothing he's ever seen in all of his years working in the region prepared him for this. Uh, we've seen a lot of gruesome things over the years, but nothing compares uh, to what we have seen over the past uh, couple days. Um, the scale of what we're seeing is beyond imagination. It's like walking into a horror film, uh, just seeing the, uh, the sheer uh, magnitude of bodies of men, women, children massacred in their cars, in their houses. Uh, it's indescribable. For more context, with regard to the factors that got us to this point, I want to bring in contributing writer and columnist for The New Yorker, Robin Wright. Robin, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Israel, as you know, has one of the world's most sophisticated, well-funded intelligence networks. The question on so many minds, how did this happen? How did they not see this coming? Well, the focus at the time, both in Israel and in Washington, was really on what was happening in the West Bank. There were growing tensions and a sense that protests could erupt at any time. And so uh, 
Hamas pulled a fast one on everyone. And it's it, there'll be a lot of probes going down the road, looking at what happened, why people weren't focused. This is an issue, this was a danger that should not have been ignored and should have been gamed and understood for a very long time. Hey, what do you think the fallout's gonna be for Prime Minister Netanyahu as well as his far-right far government? Well, short term, there's a unity in response to Hamas in Israel. I think down the road, there will be a lot of questions about why either his government or his intelligence service or his focus wasn't on the dangers from Hamas. Israel's reaction to Hamas's attack has been deadly, of course. More than 600 people killed in the Gaza Strip so far, more than 3,700 wounded. What's the end game here for Israel? Well, this war is unlike any previous war between Hamas and Israel. The scope of this conflict is so utterly astonishing in the tactics, in the uniformity, in the uh, the coordination that the end game, I think, is a good way down the road. But I think it's going to be it's going to look very different than it has in the past. Israel is committed to trying to obliterate Hamas, destroy its arsenal, eliminate its leadership. But the reality is very hard. Down the road, it's hard to kill an idea. It's hard to kill uh, the kind of passions and fury that are unleashed on either side. And let's also talk about just the further complexity here is that you have the hostages. So when they're bombarding uh, these buildings where they feel like Hamas is, is hiding potentially, you, what's the risk now to, to those hostages? The, the risk to hostages is very high. Uh, the problem is that the taking of hostages and the human drama and trauma it unleashes often, often it lasts or ends up taking far longer to resolve than a war itself. So I fear that even after the end of hostilities that Hamas will have the leverage of these human lives and may exact a, a higher or longer term cost from uh, Hamas. There's, of course, been reporting from the Wall Street Journal suggesting that Iran helped plot the Hamas attacks and gave the final go ahead. Do you believe that to be true? And if so, why would Iran get involved? Iran is complicit in everything that Hamas has done. It has been since the late 1980s the primary funder, uh, arms supplier, and political supporter of the Palestinian extremist group, both Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. But the, the question remains, as both the Israelis and the United States have said in the last few days, what exact role did it have in directing, ordering this assault? The reality is that the Palestinians have their own agenda, and while they rely heavily on Iran, uh, and coordinate very closely with Iran, are trained by Iran. Uh, what We don't have answers yet about exactly what role it had. Um, but again, Iran is complicit and has been for decades. Contributing writer and columnist for The New Yorker, Robin Wright, so appreciate your time and insight. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, the devastation in Afghanistan from a 6.3 magnitude earthquake. We have the very latest. And we return to Maui. As some on the island say it's not time to welcome tourists back as the displaced still struggle for a place to call home. news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 
three. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us after news. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the horror of war and the harrowing stories after Hamas fighters stormed into Israel, killing indiscriminately, kidnapping children, women, and the elderly. It's being called Israel's Pearl Harbor, or it's 9-11. It is the worst attack on that country's soil in 50 years. Tonight, Hamas has at least 100 people hostage, and they are vowing to kill them one by one. The death toll on both sides is already staggering. At least 900 Israelis, including 100 bodies found today in a small farming town. Thousands more are injured. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the country is preparing for a long war. Israel has called up 300,000 military reserves and has cut off all food, water, and electricity to the Gaza Strip and started airstrikes. Nearly 700 people have died there. At least 91 of them are children. But what happens to those hostages if Israel continues to bombard Gaza? And there is concern tonight Americans may be among those being held. World News Tonight anchor David Muir leads us off tonight from Tel Aviv. Tonight, Israel at war. Hundreds of Israeli rockets pounding Gaza for hours. Retaliation for the brutal Hamas attack on Israel. Thick black plumes of smoke billowing into the sky. These men capturing the destruction unfold from inside a neighboring building. As the sun sets, explosions lighting up the night sky. One hundred thirty targets in just three hours. Dozens of Israeli fighter jets. Tonight, the Israeli Defense Ministry declaring a total siege of the Gaza Strip. No power, no water, no electricity. They say they are dealing with, quote, barbaric terrorists, and that, quote, we will act accordingly. On the ground in Hamas-controlled Gaza, ambulances rushing to the scene tonight. Israel's retaliatory strikes, leaving more than 600 dead. Cries for help as buildings burn, children carried to safety. This man weeping his head in his hands as he sits on a pile of rubble. A home hit by an Israeli airstrike, four of the seven family members who live there presumed dead. 
Hamas releasing this drone footage. They say an Israeli tank in the crosshairs, then the strike, an explosion. Tonight, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu comparing Hamas to ISIS, saying the enemy are animals, executing children and parents in front of families. The retaliation comes 48 hours after a sweeping, coordinated and brutal assault that left much of Israel under attack. The worst attack on Israel in 50 years. More than 900 dead here in Israel, at least 11 Americans among them. Some of the first missiles seen just after 6 a.m. in the sky above a music festival near the Gaza border. Young people could be seen running for their lives. This haunting drone video posted online showing the aftermath. The cars abandoned, lining the road. A staggering 260 people were killed here. We learn of a young man at that festival who raced into a shelter, only to witness many of his own friends shot and killed right in front of him. 30-year-old Saho Ben Salon. Glad you're okay. Thank you very much. Shot in the arm and the leg, telling us he ran for his life and hid in that shelter with 30 others. He estimates 20 of them did not get out alive. One of my friends, uh, she got uh, choked by the smoke. She tried to run away, and she got tackled with the, the terrorists who, got, who tried to get inside to shoot at us, and just he dropped her on the floor and started to shoot, kill her, with, shoot at that shelter. The horror unleashed on that festival was just the beginning. Hamas militants going door to door in small towns and villages. Witnesses say they were killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the street, some shot in their cars. And witnesses say in homes where they didn't kill, they took hostages, mothers and children, seniors, dragged away, taken back to Gaza. Yoni, I'm David, thank you for having us. I'm thank sorry, you. I'm sorry you're still waiting. Thank you for coming. This young father, Yoni Asher, was on the phone with his wife. She had brought their two young daughters, two and four, to see their grandmother. She called her husband after they rushed into a safe room in the house. They knew the militants were outside. She was whispering. I didn't hear background. Uh, didn't hear the girls. Um, she was frightening. And um, when they called disconnected, I just couldn't do anything. I just went down on the floor like this on my knees. Um, couldn't feel my legs and try to hope for the best. The call drops. He had no idea what happened to his wife and children until this video. Yoni says this is his wife, Duran. He watches as militants start to cover his wife's head. He sees a flash of one of his daughters. I recognized them immediately and uh, I saw the video twice. And the second time I couldn't watch anymore because um, I got... Um, I got, um, I melt down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was, uh, it was a nightmare. It was the worst possible scenario. He has not heard from his wife since. Her cell phone now pings from Gaza. He is terrified for her and for his daughters. The phone is in Khan Yunis, which is inside Gaza. And that point, I, I really feared that... Um, She'd been taken, that too. She'd been taken, yeah. Okay. This is your firstborn? This, this is my... He shows me the photos of his family, the smiles, the girls in their dresses, a father proud to hold his daughter. These are their drawings, their little play kitchen, and their shoes right where they left them. Tonight, Israel says there are at least 100 hostages being held in Gaza, and Hamas is now warning tonight that they will start executing Israeli hostages if the bombing continues without warning. They say some of the hostages are already dead. What's your message to those who took your wife and daughters? My message to them is um, don't hurt my wife. Don't hurt my little girls. Show some decency. Show some respect. 
And tonight, as Israeli soldiers now amass at the border with Gaza, a young Israeli commander will not be there. He was one of the first to respond when the Hamas attacks began. 20-year-old military commander Yuval Patiev. Hi, I'm David. Hi. Good to meet you. He watched as the militants charged toward him. He says they put a bomb under the tank. One terrorist climbed under the tank. He put an explosive bomb right under my seat. So when he blew it, I flew like in the air. At the moment, I really I knew that I broke my leg. So I told my commander that he should take my tourniquet and should put it on that. You asked them to put your tourniquet yeah, on yeah. you. Yeah, you... I, I just opened the gate and told him to put it right here. And did you think you could lose your leg? Yeah, I did, but I, I just did what it trained us. His leg shattered and bleeding. Yuval says they were under attack, trapped in that tank for hours. He can still see their faces. You look at them and how could you do this to someone like all they saw was hate and trying to murder you. So we just fought for our lives. Everybody got together, hold everything close, trying to pray that they won't get a, they won't get to open the tank, won't explode it. And God was with us. That's all I can say. Well, glad you're okay. Right. That you survived. Yeah. And you have your leg. Yeah. They say it's gonna be okay. Yeah, everything gonna be okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. His life and legs spared. We certainly welcome those outcomes in this dark time. Our thanks to David for that. In Gaza, growing grief and devastation. Israel has controlled the territory's borders for years. So how was Hamas able to organize and launch such a sophisticated attack without Israel becoming aware of it? ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports from the border. Tonight, Israel on a war footing. 100,000 reservists amassing in the south, moving towards Gaza. This conflict looks set to enter a new phase. A ground invasion could be imminent. We're starting to see large-scale movements of the Israeli military throughout this area in the south now. These are armoured personnel carriers essentially heading up towards the front line. We're seeing a lot of men, a lot of munitions, and a lot of movements. This is starting to look really like a country at war. And now Gaza, one of the world's most densely populated areas, is under relentless bombardment. But many civilians are being caught in the crossfire. Over 680 people killed in three days, 140 of them children, according to Gaza's health ministry. For parents on both sides of the border, the grief overwhelming. And whole neighborhoods are being wiped out. A frantic scene as rescue workers dig for miracles. Is there anyone alive? This man shouts. And from this pile of debris, six-month-old Sama Alwadia pulled out, still alive. The problem have started before this crisis. We have had shortage of medications, medical supplies prior to this crisis. <laughs> And already struggling hospitals are now overwhelmed, with Israel now cutting off water, electricity and food to Gaza, one doctor with this warning. The health system will collapse. What will you do without water, electricity, medication? Of course there will be a collapse. The problem is that every, every five minutes you have a new breaking news talking about more and more injured Palestinians, among civilians of course. There will be no room for those people to be treated in hospitals. That's why I think the best thing to do if this war should stop at once and at the same time they should open the borders for us to send patients outside, maybe to Egypt, maybe to Jordan, maybe to the West Bank, I don't know, but they should, the border should be open. And even today, Hamas still hitting Israeli cities and civilian areas. We witnessed it firsthand. Just hearing a sound of, we just had the air raid siren. There you go, you can hear the sound of an explosion. Overhead, I can see some smoke up there. Sounds like the noise of an intercept, uh, perhaps from the Israeli Iron Dome defense system. And that's what people here have to live with all the time at now. It turns out Hamas had been planning its shock attack on Israel in secret for months. Now releasing this video, showing fighters training on motorized paragliders practicing their descent into Israel. How this all began 48 hours ago. 
but the hell Hamas unleashed for so many may only just have begun, now spilling back into Gaza. Our thanks to Ian Panel, and we'll have some of the other news making headlines tonight, including the devastating te death toll from a massive earthquake in Afghanistan. We'll be right back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. We continue to monitor developments out of Israel and Gaza as tensions only grow amid the horror of war. But for now, we'll bring you some other developing stories around the world. In Afghanistan, a 6.3 magnitude earthquake has left one of the largest cities absolutely devastated. The Taliban administration said at least 2,000 people were killed and thousands more injured, with death tolls continuing to rise. Crucial infrastructure such as bridges to the destroyed region have been damaged, delaying emergency response teams. For those seeking help the region has only one government-run hospital the global response to the earthquake has been slow due to the challenges of dealing with the Taliban-led government as well as the deadly escalation between Israel and Palestinians and California Governor Gavin Newsom has vetoed a bill that would have made California the first U.S. state to ban caste-based discrimination advocates of the bill argued if passed it would protect people of South Asian descent who were treated unfairly Newsom said that the state already banned discrimination based on religion writing in a letter to California lawmakers. This bill is unnecessary. The bill was met with both praise and backlash from community members. And still ahead, two months after the devastating wildfires on Maui, why some residents are saying it's too soon for tourists to return. We'll be right back. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. For the thousands of displaced people on Maui, the word home has taken on new meaning. Maybe it isn't four walls as it once was. Instead, it might be family, neighbors, and their community. But as the displaced try to find a permanent place to stay, a controversial move on the island. Tourists are now being welcomed back in areas that were badly damaged by the wildfires. Tonight in our Maui 808 initiative, ABC's Mola Lange shows us why some on the island say it's too much too soon. that sense of slight sense of despair the drive home from Miguel Ceballos is far different than it used to be it's hard because a reality sets in that it's not the same anymore hey brother sir can you reverse as he turns onto his block there's now a checkpoint I we got clearance to be able to go in so we're gonna go ahead and take a look This is our street, Kanyao. It's generational homes. Driving home from work, you'd see families outside talking, eating dinner. That's one thing this community is all about. So this is my home here to the right. This is all that's left. On September 25th, Maui County officially reopened his neighborhood to its residents. His 13-year-old daughter, Linnell, came along to feed the wild chickens they raised in their backyard. One, when she was a little baby chick, she was only black and white, so we named her Oreo. Yeah, it's all right. They walk a small path beside the rubble and find 
what were once their bicycles. Watch out for this stuff. It's on the ground. I think they recognize you. This is actually Oreo right here. To her surprise, Oreo has a new family. They look like they're only like maybe a week old. Like less than a week old, I can tell. Too young to know what was once here, the remains of their family home, a constant reminder of what happened here. We had our rooms on this side, and then it'd go up into where we'd have our living room and kitchen. Many of the homes in Lahaina were passed down over generations. Now, as they begin to comprehend their losses and pick up the pieces to their broken lives, the rest of West Maui prepares to reopen to tourists. It's just not right to go back in into full force tourism. We're still recovering. F funerals just started and they want us to go back in. Everybody knew. Everybody knew most. Everybody on that list of names that came out. This is what it looks like when your people are put last. Miguel, his wife Lindsay, and their four children are currently calling this condo home. They've moved three times in the two months since the fire. I'm just making sure we keep everything in our suitcases. You know, don't be unpacking stuff because you don't know where we're going next. I love this shirt. All four kids share this one room. Miguelito, for some reason, prefers to sleep on the ground with some blankets and pillows. But me and Luisa sleep together, and then Layla sleeps in her own bed. Anybody get bingo yet? Catholic Charities is housing them through Airbnb vouchers, but with theirs expiring on October 10th, their next home is uncertain. The family now turning to the Red Cross for help. We're already hearing, even today, the hotels are full, you know, or the, the spots they have is full. Um, Our people are getting kicked out because yeah. the tourists are coming back. The Red Cross has housed more than 7,600 survivors across 40 hotels since the fire. Among them, Nicole Ellison, her two children, her mother, Monica, and their two dogs. This is your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, your family room, everything is right here. All of them sharing a single bed. And it's a king-size bed. Mm -hmm. When they had originally put you up in the hotel, what what did they tell you? If there, if there was a, a time frame or, or you know, that did they give you a date when you had to leave by? We found out on Saturday by a voicemail message that we had to be out this coming Friday, the 29th. And that was the first we heard that we had to be out on that date. That voicemail missing a key detail, where they'll go next, wherever it is, will be their sixth move since the fire. And while many of the wildfire victims in this community rely on tourism for work, they say they're just not ready. Resentful that the reopening is happening at the expense of their hale, or home. Weeks before the reopening, hundreds crammed into this city council meeting, uncertain of their future. Should we open? I don't think so. Residents like Charles Nahale. Uh, my house burned. Uh, it's completely gone. Charles is a wedding singer and efficient. It's my honor to pronounce you husband and wife. Once dependent on tourists, he now relies on temporary disaster assistance. He says he's far from ready for West Maui to reopen. Are we supposed to be jovial when tourists are here in their bathing suits, frolicking in the surf? driving these roads like they're on a racetrack, drinking Mai Tais and partying in our face. After losing his family home, Charles was placed in a timeshare by the Red Cross, but he may once again be on the move. This is the letter that all of us at this shelter where I'm staying at got telling us that we would have to vacate the premises on the 30th. And again, this came by September. total surprise, By right? total surprise, on your door. I have to leave where I'm at. In, in a few, couple of days. With no idea of where you're going? No idea, yeah. Nevertheless, state officials have stuck to their schedule. 
We had to choose a date. There were too many businesses that, and I'm talking big businesses, hotels would have gone bankrupt if they couldn't open. Charles has filed a civil complaint with the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, alleging the eviction notice violates state and federal fair housing laws. These facilities took FEMA money and they took Red Cross money. We're really not transients anymore. So we've become tenants right. when they took that money. Has a little partial ocean view. But on September 29th, Charles finding out that his eviction has been delayed. A small victory. All of a sudden, now that we've filed a complaint, oh, don't worry about leaving tomorrow. Displaced fire victims also facing eviction at Honoakai condos. One condo owner filing a complaint after receiving a letter from the condo board president telling owners they would have to terminate their contract with the Red Cross. Here we are. Sarah Verastro and her son Miles have been living at the Honoakai for the past month. The anticipation is all consuming. We, we can't as much as, oh, we got a notice. We got a notice under the door. Shall we see what it is? It's from... Can you read it for us, Miles? Oh, they're going to tidy up the place. When the note came under, it's kind of like, is this it? Is, is, is this, is this going to be you have three days to vacate the premise? Sarah moved into their Lahaina home just a week before the fire destroyed it. Home sweet home. Her video diaries showing what's left. <sighs> the emotions overwhelming. A few items Sarah found. This is my son's favorite thing to go to sleep to. Look at that. <laughs> a piece of home when they need it most. It's my starling that survived the fire. We are constantly on the lookout for something that we can afford. Our rental market is so expensive. You good? For Nicole Ellison's family, it's been one home to the next. Less than 24 hours we were given to move properties and have all of our stuff out by 12 o'clock. <laughs> Nicole says the Red Cross gave her two choices, move into a tent community, which the state has deemed unsafe for children, or move into a hotel that will not allow her dogs. Before the fires, Nicole and her family were living in Kahale Akiola homeless shelter, destroyed in the fire. Just because our housing situation wasn't like most everyone else, doesn't mean that we're not feeling the same things and need the same things. Finally, they've been told there's space for them at a West End hotel just outside of Lahaina. If we get to the West End and something happens, we will be living in my car. After hours of packing, and just got checked in at 6 o'clock. The family checks into their new hotel. They didn't give us a time of when we're going to be checking out. They just gave us our key, and we'll be in touch. But a glimmer of joy. And two beds, beds. Oh my with room on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. For many of these displaced Hawaiians, these temporary shelters are as close to something stable as they've had in months. It's been like cool. For now home, or as they say around here, Hale. Your Hale will go wherever you go and be wherever you are. Hale, our thanks to Mola for that. ABC News reached out to the Red Cross. The Red Cross says it's trying to meet each family's particular needs while housing thousands of displaced residents in hotels throughout Maui. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. To crush the families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt, and I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. As a child, no one told you how to do this. And I'm trying to do that for them. I'm trying to be that person that can guide them through this situation because I didn't have a guide. A child once forced to flee, now an adult. <laughs> giving back to the most innocent minds caught up in the politics of our broken immigration system. We are not the history in the past. We are in the present, we are in the future. A top global DJ joining forces with the keepers of the Amazon rainforest to conserve our future. And the fight for a museum. So when people think about a Latino museum, they think, well, why are you building a, a museum for immigrants? This museum is gonna talk about the American Latino. And many of us American Latinos are sons and daughters of immigrants. How a congressional spat is putting the history of Latinos on hold. I'm Alex Perez, and this is Entre Nos. Hispanic Heritage Month, a month to celebrate Hispanic and Latin American cultures, customs, and creativity. Entre Nos is an expression used by many Spanish speakers, which means between us. It's usually used by your favorite gossipy tia at a family gathering when she wants to share a secret with you. Pero tonight, the secret is out. One in five people in the United States is Hispanic. Our economic output, more than $3 trillion. If we were our own country, we would have the fifth largest global economy. Oh yeah, we're kind of a big deal. And a big reason behind that growth of ours is access to education. Tonight, our Mireya Villarreal brings you the story of a Colombian-American woman who is turning education into an adventure for children waiting in line for their chance at the American dream. Early in the morning, these students show up to school with big smiles. The energy on this tiny playground growing with even the most routine tasks. Vamos a bien las manos. Alongside their friends, learning in between giggles. Sitting outside their classroom, a bus fitted with all their daily needs. Daisy shares with us what she's learning. Ya aquí en la escuela llevo cuatro meses. Hemos estado viendo lo de la migración, divisiones, multiplicaciones, así matemáticas, geografía. También hemos estado viendo las partes del cuerpo en inglés. 15 minutes from the U.S.-Mexico border located in Tijuana, the Yes We Can World Foundation serves migrant children through mobile schools. Yeah, estoy muy contenta porque vamos a cruzar el otro lado y vamos a ver más cosas diferentes. A lot of the families that we work with travel this way, walking or on buses or on La Bestia, on trains, um, and they arrive to the U.S.-Mexico border ports of entry and they seek asylum. But because of the policies that have been put in place, they're made to wait on the Mexico side to be able to legally be processed. And unfortunately, there are so many cases that this creates a backlog. So that time that they have to wait here can be anywhere from 
you know, a month to three months to six months or even through the pandemic, we saw families here for a year. Yo estoy esperando la cita para ir a Estados Unidos a verme con mi papá y a conocer en persona a mi abuelita. Pasen para acá adelante, por favor. Estefania Rebellón is the co-founder behind the organization, giving the children a glimpse of normalcy Hola, before they have to leave everything behind again on their journey across the border. We prepare the children for what life is going to be like in the United States. So we're the first introduction to the English language. We also have a class that's called the Migrant Process, where we teach children about the situation that they're going through in a real life setting because it's their experience. They're aiming to bridge the gap for children who don't have access to basic education. Rebellon partnered with the Mexican government to ensure that the children would receive quality education. Something I'm very proud of, of our program is that we're the first accredited bilingual school program for migrant children that has been recognized by the Secretary of Education in Mexico. Solo brazalete. Okay. Bueno, aquí las situaciones emocionales pues están a flor de piel, ¿no? Este, estas situaciones que ellos traen de su lugar de origen pues son muy diferentes a, a lo que una, un alumno de aquí de ciudad pues está, que vive con su familia, está en su casa, ¿no? Está en su, en su comunidad y pues ellos están en una situación eh, pues diferente emocional. For teachers like Sergio, educating these students goes far beyond the classroom. It's a chance to get them ready for a potential life across the border. Si ese dice, my name is, ustedes van a poner ahí el nombre de ustedes. With over 250 students enrolled, arriving from Central America, Colombia, Haiti, and Ukraine, the Yes We Can organization provides an outlet for children to learn and simply be kids. In realidad, de donde vengo, pues, hay muchas desapariciones de niños. Y pues quiero que ellos tengan una diferente vida y vivir sin temor. Es lo que yo quiero. Having lived in a nearby migrant shelter for three months, Maria and her three children were longing for a friendly escape. Se han hecho muchas amistades. Este, si hay cambios, eh, saben un poco más. Y pues más que nada ella, pues si sabe un poco inglés, de repente me lo dice. If you care about children and the well-being of them, there shouldn't be any obstacle to want to support them. Rebellion is currently building a third mobile school bus to make room for the latest incoming surge of migrant children. We're really excited. We're currently building our third mobile school bus, and this bus is going to be a little bit different than our current ones because it's going to be having a podcast studio in the back because we want the children to be able to share their own stories with their own truth, to provide authenticity for what's really going on here at the border. We want um, listeners to be able to take away the realities and the challenges that take place for these families and for them to be able to tell their own stories. With four mobile school locations open across the U.S.-Mexican border and roughly 807 migrant children enrolled in their programs, the Yes We Can World Foundation marks their progress day by day. My family is originally from Colombia, and unfortunately our life was put at risk. Um, for security reasons, we had to leave. I was just 10 years old at that time, and I definitely see myself and the kids here all the time. I see myself and the incoming kids, uh, you know, afraid and confused of what's going on. As a child, no one told you how to do this. And I'm trying to do that for them. I'm trying to be that person that can guide them through this situation because I didn't have a guide. Okay, tomando distancia tres. Es este desarrollo que nosotros vamos notando día con día. I'm from, y allá me, me dijeron que vienen de dónde. Como maestro dices, bueno, estoy eh, poniendo ahí una semillita o, o, o estoy logrando algo en esta persona. Seeing that transformation just validates that um, we're on the right track. While the politics of their citizenship 
plays out above their heads. The children's dreams soar much higher, free of any borders. Quiero ser veterinaria porque me gustan mucho los perritos, los gatitos, muchos tipos de animales. Doctor y astronauta. Doctora porque me gustaría ayudar a las personas. Doctors, vets, and astronauts, indeed, yes, you can. Our thanks to Mireya Villarreal for that story. They are some of the keepers and guardians of the Amazon, and now the traditional songs of the Yawanawa people, who have been around for centuries, are being preserved by one of Brazil's biggest DJs. Here's ABC News Live prime anchor, Lindsay Davis. Brazilian superstar DJ Alok knows music has the power to heal. He has an impressive reach with more than 28 million followers on Instagram and a staggering 5 billion streams on Spotify. This minister of music says one chance meeting changed his life. I went to a trip to Africa and then I met a woman, like an old lady. She was blind of two eyes. She was tightening her stomach to feel less hungry. And then she told me that she was praying to God, someone to go there and help her. And I said, like, listen, God doesn't exist. And if he exists, he abandoned you. And her answer changed my life forever because she said, no, I know him and he's giving me the strange. You ended up answering that prayer. I didn't even believe in God back in days. And I realized that moment that who abandoned her was us. When I realized that I couldn't abandon it anymore. <laughs> we did a surgery in her eyes and she could see again. She changed my life way more than I changed her. It only makes sense to make all the success if I can somehow use this to transform this world in a better place. The 32-year-old is now on a mission to heal the world, starting in his own huge backyard, using his platform to help protect the Amazon rainforest and its indigenous people. Tell us about your mission. The indigenous, they never had the opportunity to tell their own story. I'm just being this platform for them. Born Alok Ashka Perish Patrio, the Brazilian DJ made his professional debut at 19. By the age of 24, he was a national sensation. His early success didn't shield him from suffering through a dark period of the soul. You talk about being depressed and that you were looking for inspiration, and then that's how you met the, the group of indigenous people. Tell me about that moment. But I felt a huge emptiness. And I went to this very isolated tribe in Brazil. I spent 10 days with them. And while I was doing music to work, on, they were doing music for healing. <laughs> but I was very disconnected with the nature and stuff. So I just started to change it, like how I can make this world a little bit better, you know? Alok's latest project, The Future is Ancestral, empowers indigenous communities to preserve their cultural heritage and protect the rainforests. The indigenous, they are the real guardians of it because they take care of more than 80% of the ecosystem of the forest. Our traditional knowledge, thanks to that, we are preserving our forests. We are preserving the biodiversity. The Amazon is the world's largest rainforest. It covers about 40% of South America and plays a vital role in regulating our climate. Yet in the last decades, the rainforest has lost an area roughly the size of California due to unlawful logging and deliberate fires set to clear land for agriculture and cattle ranching, displacing many of the hundreds of indigenous tribes, causing the loss of their culture and language. 
O Brasil são mais de 305 povos, são mais de 274 línguas indígenas e fomos reduzidos a nenhum por cento da população. The ones I connected with the indigenous, and I realized once you don't have consciousness about something, it's very normal that you do mistakes. Well, once you have consciousness, it's not a mistake anymore, it's a choice. And I had to do my choice. And the choice was just so obvious to me. And I hope it is obvious for others. In 2020, the Alok Institute was created with the proceeds from a popular mobile game. I was invited to become a character on a most downloaded battle royale game. And when they asked me which superpower I wanted to have, what I learned with the indigenous, I said, is it possible to heal people? The superpower brought a different dynamic to the game and Alok became the best seller. So I donated 100% of my royalties and I found my institute. The Alok Institute has been getting global attention. Brazil alone counts more than 200 indigenous languages. Preserving these languages all around the world is about protecting our common cultural heritage. I would also like to thank you, Alok, and the Alok Institute for bringing us together. The Yawanawa people recently joined Alok on a panel at the United Nations and gave a one-of-a-kind performance on the rooftop of its famous headquarters in New York City. Indigenous music played today with the same power that thousand years ago our ancestors did. And thousand years in the future, we sing with the same power. What was your message for the United Nations? I think the most important is like to listen what the indigenous has to say. It is important, you know, that uh, humanity comes together now as a human family. We are not in the history in the past. We are in the present, we are in the future. Alok hopes to introduce indigenous music to the world before it's lost forever. He's producing six albums of traditional and contemporary songs, and the indigenous performers will reap all the profits. I realized that I wanted to do an album inspired by indigenous roots. It's a very good way to translate what the forest has to say. I think people, when they listen to indigenous music, they feel touched by the heart. There were a lot of people working hard so that this world could be a better place and we can have more dignity. One tune at a time, Alok is taking his ministry of music, trying to heal the wounds of our world. Our thanks to Lindsay Davis for that powerful story. Still much more to come as we continue our special HHM Entre Nos. We head to our nation's capital where a fight over the portrayal of our past is putting our future on hold. When people say, why do we need a Latino museum? I tell them, because our story is not being told. Latinos are invisible in the United States of America. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Welcome back. Did you know that Latinos stream more than any other population in the U.S.? According to Nielsen, nearly 44% of Latinos' total TV viewing in July of last year was attributed to streaming, 44% compared to the overall average of 35%. A big suspected reason for that? 
our median age. More than half of Latinos are under the age of 34, according to the census. Así que todavía estamos joven. We're young. But despite our young age, we've been part of this country for centuries. And as the biggest ethnic minority, we are steering the future. But why isn't there a place where we can see and learn about our imprint and legacy, like a museum? Well, it's complicated. ABC's Maria Elena Salinas went to Washington, D.C. to find out where the battle for a potential National Museum of the American Latino stands. When I walk in, you know, it, it, the color, the vibrancy, the sounds, it all takes me aback because it, it's what it means to be Latino. So that's what stands out to me. It's really about learning how far back our history goes in the United States. And I think most people would be shocked to see that we've been here for over 500 years. How do you tell that part of the story in a museum like this? It's really about going back uh, to the beginning, to the roots of Latinos in, in the United States. From Mexico to the Caribbean to Central and South America, it's a representation of those who helped shape this country and those who were here almost a century before the pilgrims arrived to Plymouth. What about some of the immersive aspects of this, these exhibits? You have several. Well, the one here, this covers the Pueblo Nations in New Mexico, and we're really proud of this. It, you know, you can feel the figurines, the bread here in, in the horno, in the oven. Mm -hmm. But the great thing is that if you push this button here, you can smell the, the bread being baked. Mmm, <laughs> it's so good. The Molina Gallery inside the Smithsonian Museum of American History features a first-of-its-kind multi-sensory display. What do you think is the most foundational piece in, in this exhibit? It's a tree of life. It's a creation piece. But it has the flora and fauna of all the different countries we come from, right? Mm -hmm. And then all these little figurines, these clay figurines, which are the, the stories, the people we're talking about in the exhibition. Telling stories through generations and the immigrant experience we all share, including this makeshift raft, handmade by two refugees who escaped Cuba's dictatorship in economic crisis. It talks about the urgency, right? The, the need to leave, to flee. But also remembering to celebrate our successes and heritage in all aspects of life. Like Somos, a 15-minute video installation about Latino identity by Spanish, Venezuelan, American filmmaker Alberto Ferreras. And it has 150 portraits that I took with my iPhone because it was in the middle of the pandemic. And I felt like that was the way to capture the faces of, of, of the Hispanic community. When I was working on Somos, that was part of the goal. That it was, for, for some of us, it's gonna be like, oh, of course, I know this. But for a lot of people, it's not, because they just, they don't live next to you. I think it's a mistake to think that um, the Molina Gallery or the Museum at Large is just gonna be for Latinos. It's for everybody. And you see a nod to our indigenous roots. And uh, everybody has a story, uh, including the director of the Latino Museum, Jorge Samanillo, who first visited the Smithsonian back when he was a college student. I didn't see Latino stories being told, immigrant stories, but I saw the possibilities of how you can use an object, an artifact, to tell a powerful story. And that, was, that kind of blew me away. So, you know, I got back to Miami and I switched my major from, from music to anthropology and archaeology. Is this a full circle moment for it you? It really is a full circle moment, but I always tell people it's not, it's not only about me, it's about finally trying to tell our story. But this is just a first step on the road to truly celebrating the Hispanic experience with the long sought goal of establishing the National Museum of the American Latino on the National Mall, just out of reach. Well, right now it's crucial for us to get a site selected. We want to make sure that we have a presence here in the National Mall. And getting that site is an uphill political fight that's been waged on Capitol Hill for years, spearheaded by some who don't just want to showcase the Hispanic American experience, but are living it. When people say, why do we need a Latino museum? I tell them, because our story is not being told. Latinos are invisible in the United States of America. The National Museum of the American Latino Act was approved back in December 2020 to start the expansion. Now, the challenge is designating a location that requires a legislative approval, and Representative Cárdenas and Barragán, both first-generation Mexican-Americans, are leading that battle. It had been introduced for about 18 years, so it did take some time, but what's most important is we finally took the bull by the horns, and we finally said, ya basta, it's time, and we got it done. This political climate is a challenge because 
Some people have made immigration, the border, the issue that they want to weaponize and use to stop any progress. And again, it's why I'm going to continue to say we need more Latinas and Latinos at the table to get it across the finish line. Do you feel that the obstacles that the Latino Museum has faced are sort of like a symptom of bigger issues that have to do with legislation regarding Latinos? I think that too many of my colleagues have made it a Latino or anti-Latino issue. So when people think about a Latino museum, they think, well, why are you building a, a museum for immigrants? This museum is going to talk about the American Latino. And many of us American Latinos are sons and daughters of immigrants. So, I'm the daughter of immigrants. Right? Exactly. So part of your story is their story as well. We have something in common. Uh, how many brothers and sisters? I'm the youngest of 11. I'm the youngest of 11 as well. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of beautiful stories that are common and stories that we're going to find out from other people that we probably even know that their story is very different than ours. But they're all beautiful and they're all amazing. You're going to need more than a plus one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And while the fight for finding a permanent home for the Latino Museum continues, so does making sure the Latino story is told in the fullest way possible. There's so many different aspects to the Latino community and, and, and what we bring to the table here in, in the United States. And, and a lot of it has to do with culture, with arts, with music, with food, with film. Will that be um, also an important component of the Latino Museum? They're so crucial. That's really when you start seeing the commonalities, right? And those things that really stand out, that bring us together. Because I could play right now a, a piece of Sailor Cruz music to you, and even though she's a Cuban singer, it touches so many people, right? It'll and get me moving. It'll get you moving. You feel the beat immediately. You, you know when you walk into a party, you know when you walk into somewhere, you know you're Latino. Let's fast forward to the day when the museum is going to open. How do you envision what you're going to feel when you walk into that museum? And, Inauguration Day. I know for me it's going to be uh, feeling proud that, that we were able to do this, that we were able to persevere just like our people have for many years and get, get something done and, uh, and create a legacy. I envision mariachi somewhere along Absolutely. the line. Absolutely, no question right? about it. And a lot of amazing food. Um, and just really, I think we're going to see a turnout of not just Latinos. When you get Cubans together and Dominicans together and Mexicans, Mexicans and Guatemalans and Sudamericanos, etc., all of a sudden you've got a lot of talking and you've got a lot of people with a lot of different ways of looking at what the Latino experience is. And I can guarantee you this, there's going to be a lot of laughter and there's going to be a lot of joy, but there's going to be tears of just knowing we finally, finally have our museum. It's teary right now. Yes. I think we're all looking forward to that moment. It's a labor of love. Our thanks to Maria Elena for that important story. Well, that's our show. You can watch more stories honoring Hispanic Heritage Month right here on ABC News Live. I'm Alex Perez. Thanks for watching. You can also find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Ya tu sabe. ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Hit me with them good vibes, pictures on my phone, lies. Everything is so 